The Hiding of Black Bill A lank, strong, red-faced man with a Wellington beak and small, fiery eyes tempered by flaxen lashes, sat on the station platform at Los Pinos swinging his legs to and fro. At his side sat another man, fat, melancholy, and seedy, who seemed to be his friend. They had the appearance of men to whom life had appeared as a reversible coat, see me on both sides. Ain't seen you in about four years, Ham, said the seedy man. Which way you been traveling? Texas, said the red-faced man. It was too cold in Alaska for me. And I found it warm in Texas. I'll tell you about one hot spell I went through there. One morning I steps off the international at a water tank and lets it go on without me. Twas a ranch country, and fuller of spite houses than New York City. Only out there they build M twenty miles away so you can't smell what they've got for dinner, instead of running M up two inches from their neighbors' windows. There wasn't any roads in sight, so I footed it cross country. The grass was shoe top deep, and the mesquite timber looked just like a peach orchard. It was so much like a gentleman's private estate that every minute you expected a kennelful of bulldogs to run out and bite you. But I must have walked twenty miles before I came in sight of a ranch house. It was a little one, about as big as an elevated railroad station. There was a little man in a white shirt and brown overalls and a pink handkerchief around his neck rolling cigarettes under a tree in front of the door. Greetings, says I. Any refreshment, welcome, emoluments, or even work for a comparative stranger? Oh, come in, says he, in a refined tone. Sit down on that stool, please. I didn't hear your horse coming. He isn't near enough yet, says I, I walked. I don't want to be a burden, but I wonder if you have three or four gallons of water handy. You do look pretty dusty, says he. But our bathing arrangements. It's a drink I want, says I, and never mind the dust that's on the outside. He gets me a dipper of water out of a red jar hanging up, and then goes on. Do you want work? For a time, says I, this is a rather quiet section of the country, isn't it? It is, says he. Sometimes, so I have been told, one sees no human being pass for weeks at a time. I've been here only a month. I bought the ranch from an old settler who wanted to move farther west. It suits me, says I, quiet and retirement are good for a man sometimes. And I need a job. I can tend bar, salt mines, lecture, float stock, do a little middleweight slugging, and play the piano. Can you herd sheep? asks the little ranchman. Do you mean have I herd sheep? says I. Can you herd them, take charge of a flock of them, says he. Oh, says I, now I understand. You mean chase em around and bark at em like collie dogs. Well, I might, says I. I've never exactly done any sheep herding, but I've often seen em from car windows masticating daisies, and they don't look dangerous. I'm short a herder, says the ranchman. You never can depend on the Mexicans. I've only got two flocks. You may take out my bunch of muttons, there are only eight hundred of em, in the morning, if you like. The pay is twelve dollars a month and your rations furnished. You camp in a tent on the prairie with your sheep. You do your own cooking, but wood and water are brought to your camp. It's an easy job. I'm on, says I, I'll take the job even if I have to garland my brow and hold on to a crook and wear a loose effect and play on a pipe like the shepherds do in pictures. So the next morning the little ranchman helps me drive the flock of muttons from the corral to about two miles out and let M graze on a little hillside on the prairie. He gives me a lot of instructions about not letting bunches of them stray off from the herd, and driving M down to a waterhole to drink at noon. I'll bring out your tent and camping outfit and rations in the buckboard before night, says he. Fine, says I, and don't forget the rations. Nor the camping outfit. And be sure to bring the tent. Your name's Zollicoffer, ain't it? My name, says he, is Henry Ogden. All right, Mr. Ogden, says I, mine is Mr. Percival St. Clair. 
I herded sheep for five days on the Rancho Chiquito, and then the wool entered my soul. That getting next to nature certainly got next to me. I was lonesomer than Crusoe's goat. I've seen a lot of persons more entertaining as companions than those sheep were. I'd drive M to the corral and pen M every evening, and then cook my cornbread and mutton and coffee, and lie down in a tent the size of a tablecloth. And listen to the coyotes and whippoorwills singing around the camp. The fifth evening, after I had corralled my costly but uncongenial muttons, I walked over to the ranch house and stepped in the door. Mr. Ogden, says I, you and me have got to get sociable. Sheep are all very well to dot the landscape and furnish eight-dollar cotton suitings for man, but for table talk and fireside companions they rank along with five o'clock teasers. If you've got a deck of cards, or a parcheesi outfit, or a game of authors, get them out, and let's get on a mental basis. I've got to do something in an intellectual line, if it's only to knock somebody's brains out. This Henry Ogden was a peculiar kind of ranchman. He wore finger rings and a big gold watch and careful neck tees. And his face was calm, and his nose spectacles was kept very shiny. I saw once, in Muskogee, an outlaw hung for murdering six men, who was a dead ringer for him. But I knew a preacher in Arkansas that you would have taken to be his brother. I didn't care much for him either way, what I wanted was some fellowship and communion with holy saints or lost sinners, anything sheepless would do. Well, St. Clair, says he, laying down the book he was reading, I guess it must be pretty lonesome for you at first. And I don't deny that it's monotonous for me. Are you sure you corralled your sheep so they won't stray out? They're shut up as tight as the jury of a millionaire murderer, says I. And I'll be back with them long before they'll need their trained nurse. So Ogden digs up a deck of cards, and we play casino. After five days and nights of my sheep camp it was like a toot on Broadway. When I caught big casino I felt as excited as if I had made a million in Trinity. And when H.O. Loosened up a little and told the story about the lady in the Pullman car I laughed for five minutes. That showed what a comparative thing life is. A man may see so much that he'd be bored to turn his head to look at a three million dollar fire or Joe Weber or the Adriatic Sea. But let him herd sheep for a spell, and you'll see him splitting his ribs laughing at, curfew shall not ring tonight, or really enjoying himself playing cards with ladies. By and by Ogden gets out a decanter of bourbon, and then there is a total eclipse of sheep. Do you remember reading in the papers, about a month ago, says he, about a train holdup on the M. K. N. T. The express agent was shot through the shoulder and about $15,000 in currency taken. And it's said that only one man did the job. Seems to me I do, says I. But such things happen so often they don't linger long in the human Texas mind. Did they overtake, overhaul, seize, or lay hands upon the despoiler? He escaped, says Ogden. And I was just reading in a paper today that the officers have tracked him down into this part of the country. It seems the bills the robber got were all the first issue of currency to the Second National Bank of Espinosa City. And so they've followed the trail where they've been spent, and it leads this way. Ogden pours out some more bourbon, and shoves me the bottle. I imagine, says I, after ingurgitating another modicum of the royal booze. That it wouldn't be at all a disingenuous idea for a train robber to run down into this part of the country to hide for a spell. A sheep ranch, now, says I, would be the finest kind of a place. Who'd ever expect to find such a desperate character among these songbirds and muttons and wild flowers? And, by the way, says I, kind of looking H. Ogden over, was there any description mentioned of this single-handed terror? Was his lineaments or height and thickness or teeth fillings or style of habiliment set forth in print? Why, no, says Ogden, they say nobody got a good sight of him because he wore a mask. But they know it was a train robber called Black Bill, because he always works alone and because he dropped a handkerchief in the express car that had his name on it. All right, says I. I approve of Black Bill's retreat to the sheep ranges. I guess they won't find him. 
There's $1,000 reward for his capture, says Ogden. I don't need that kind of money, says I, looking Mr. Sheepman straight in the eye. The $12 a month you pay me is enough. I need a rest, and I can save up until I get enough to pay my fare to Texarkana, where my widowed mother lives. If Black Bill, I goes on, looking significantly at Ogden, was to have come down this way, say, a month ago, and bought a little sheep ranch and. Stop, says Ogden. Getting out of his chair and looking pretty vicious. Do you mean to insinuate? Nothing, says I, no insinuations. I'm stating a hypodermical case. I say, if Black Bill had come down here and bought a sheep ranch and hired me to Little Boy Blue Bam and treated me square and friendly, as you've done, he'd never have anything to fear from me. A man is a man, regardless of any complications he may have with sheep or railroad trains. Now you know where I stand. Ogden looks black as camp coffee for nine seconds, and then he laughs, amused. You'll do, St. Clair, says he. If I was Black Bill I wouldn't be afraid to trust you. Let's have a game or two of seven-up tonight. That is, if you don't mind playing with a train robber. I've told you, says I, my oral sentiments, and there's no strings to M. While I was shuffling after the first hand, I asks Ogden, as if the idea was a kind of a casualty, where he was from. Oh, says he, from the Mississippi Valley. That's a nice little place, says I, I've often stopped over there. But didn't you find the sheets a little damp and the food poor? Now, I hail, says I, from the Pacific Slope. Ever put up there? Too drafty, says Ogden. But if you're ever in the Middle West just mention my name, and you'll get foot warmers and dripped coffee. Well, says I, I wasn't exactly fishing for your private telephone number and the middle name of your aunt that carried off the Cumberland Presbyterian minister. It don't matter. I just want you to know you are safe in the hands of your shepherd. Now, don't play hearts on spades, and don't get nervous. Still harping, says Ogden, laughing again. Don't you suppose that if I was Black Bill and thought you suspected me, I'd put a Winchester bullet into you and stop my nervousness, if I had any? Not any, says I. A man who's got the nerve to hold up a train single-handed wouldn't do a trick like that. I've knocked about enough to know that them are the kind of men who put a value on a friend. Not that I can claim being a friend of yours, Mr. Ogden, says I, being only your sheepherder, but under more expeditious circumstances we might have been. Forget the sheep temporarily, I beg, says Ogden, and cut for deal. About four days afterward, while my muttons was nooning on the waterhole and I deep in the interstices of making a pot of coffee. Up rides softly on the grass a mysterious person in the garb of the being he wished to represent. He was dressed somewhere between a Kansas City detective, Buffalo Bill, and the town dog catcher of Baton Rouge. His chin and I wasn't molded on fighting lines, so I knew he was only a scout. Heard in, sheep, he asks me. Well, says I, to a man of your evident gumptional endowments, I wouldn't have the nerve to state that I am engaged in decorating old bronzes or oiling bicycle sprockets. You don't talk or look like a sheepherder to me, says he. But you talk like what you look like to me, says I. And then he asks me who I was working for, and I shows him Rancho Chiquito, two miles away, in the shadow of a low hill, and he tells me he's a deputy sheriff. There's a train robber called Black Bill supposed to be somewhere in these parts, says the scout. He's been traced as far as San Antonio, and maybe farther. Have you seen or heard of any strangers around here during the past month? I have not, says I, except a report of one over at the Mexican quarters of Loomis Ranch, on the Frio. What do you know about him? asks the deputy. He's three days old, says I. What kind of a looking man is the man you work for, he asks. Does old George Ramy own this place yet? He's run sheep here for the last ten years, but never had no success. The old man has sold out and gone west, I tells him. Another sheep fancier bought him out about a month ago. What kind of a looking man is he, asks the deputy again. 
Oh, says I, a big, fat kind of a Dutchman with long whiskers and blue specks. I don't think he knows a sheep from a ground squirrel. I guess old George soaked him pretty well on the deal, says I. After indulging himself in a lot more noncommunicative information in two-thirds of my dinner, the deputy rides away. That night I mentions the matter to Ogden. They're drawing the tendrils of the octopus around Black Bill, says I. And then I told him about the deputy sheriff, and how I'd described him to the deputy, and what the deputy said about the matter. Oh, well, says Ogden, let's don't borrow any of Black Bill's troubles. We've a few of our own. Get the bourbon out of the cupboard and we'll drink to his health, unless, says he, with his little cackling laugh, you're prejudiced against train robbers. I'll drink, says I, to any man who's a friend to a friend. And I believe that Black Bill, I goes on, would be that. So here's to Black Bill, and may he have good luck. And both of us drank. About two weeks later comes shearing time. The sheep had to be driven up to the ranch, and a lot of frowsy-headed Mexicans would snip the fur off of them with back-action scissors. So the afternoon before the barbers were to come I hustled my underdone muttons over the hill, across the dell, down by the winding brook, and up to the ranch house. Where I penned M in a corral and bade M my nightly adieus. I went from there to the ranch house. I find H. Ogden, Esquire, lying asleep on his little cot bed. I guess he had been overcome by anti-insomnia or diswakefulness or some of the diseases peculiar to the sheep business. His mouth and vest were open, and he breathed like a second-hand bicycle pump. I looked at him and gave vent to just a few musings. Imperial Caesar, says I, asleep in such a way, might shut his mouth and keep the wind away. A man asleep is certainly a sight to make angels weep. What good is all his brain, muscle, backing, nerve, influence, and family connections? He's at the mercy of his enemies, and more so of his friends. And he's about as beautiful as a cab horse leaning against the Metropolitan Opera House at 12.30 a.m. dreaming of the plains of Arabia. Now, a woman asleep you regard as different. No matter how she looks, you know it's better for all hands for her to be that way. Well, I took a drink of bourbon and one for Ogden, and started in to be comfortable while he was taking his nap. He had some books on his table on indigenous subjects, such as Japan and drainage and physical culture, and some tobacco, which seemed more to the point. After I'd smoked a few, and listened to the sartorial breathing of H.O. I happened to look out the window toward the shearing pens, where there was a kind of a road coming up from a kind of a road across a kind of a creek farther away. I saw five men riding up to the house. All of them carried guns across their saddles, and among them was the deputy that had talked to me at my camp. They rode up careful, in open formation, with their guns ready. I set apart with my eye the one I opinionated to be the boss muckraker of this law and order cavalry. Good evening, gents, says I, won't you light and tie your horses? The boss rides up close, and swings his gun over till the opening and it seems to cover my whole front elevation. Don't you move your hands none, says he, till you and me indulge in an adequate amount of necessary conversation. I will not, says I. I am no deaf-mute, and therefore will not have to disobey your injunctions in replying. We are on the lookout, says he, for Black Bill, the man that held up the Katy for $15,000 in May. We are searching the ranches and everybody on them. What is your name, and what do you do on this ranch? Captain, says I, Percival St. Clair is my occupation, and my name is Sheepherder. I've got my flock of veals, no, muttons, penned here tonight. The shearers are coming tomorrow to give them a haircut, with bar rum, I suppose. Where's the boss of this ranch? The captain of the gang asks me. Wait just a minute, captain, says I, wasn't there a kind of a reward offered for the capture of this desperate character you have referred to in your preamble? There's a thousand dollars reward offered, says the captain, but it's for his capture and conviction. There don't seem to be no provision made for an informer. It looks like it might rain in a day or so, says I, in a tired way, looking up at the cerulean blue sky. 
if you know anything about the locality, disposition, or secretiveness of this here black bill, says he, in a severe dialect, you are amiable to the law in not reporting it. I heard a fence rider say, says I, in a desultory kind of voice. That a Mexican told a cowboy named Jake over at Pigeon Store on the Nueces that he heard that Black Bill had been seen in Matamoros by a sheepman's cousin two weeks ago. Tell you what I'll do, tight mouth, says the captain, after looking me over for bargains. If you put us on so we can scoop Black Bill, I'll pay you a hundred dollars out of my own, out of our own, pockets. That's liberal, says he. You ain't entitled to anything. Now, what do you say? Cash down now? I asks. The captain has a sort of discussion with his helpmates, and they all produce the contents of their pockets for analysis. Out of the general results they figured up $102.30 in cash and $31 worth of plug tobacco. Come nearer, Capitan Mio, says I, and listen. He so did. I am mighty poor and low down in the world, says I, I am working for twelve dollars a month trying to keep a lot of animals together whose only thought seems to be to get asunder. Although, says I, I regard myself as some better than the state of South Dakota, it's a come down to a man who has heretofore regarded sheep only in the form of chops. I'm pretty far reduced in the world on account of foiled ambitions and rum and a kind of cocktail they make along the PRR. All the way from Scranton to Cincinnati, dry gin, French vermouth, one squeeze of a lime, and a good dash of orange bitters. If you're ever up that way, don't fail to let one try you. And, again, says I, I have never yet went back on a friend. I've stayed by M when they had plenty, and when adversity's overtaken me I've never forsook M. But, I goes on, this is not exactly the case of a friend. Twelve dollars a month is only bowing acquaintance money. And I do not consider brown beans and cornbread the food of friendship. I am a poor man, says I, and I have a widowed mother in Texarkana. You will find Black Bill, says I, lying asleep in this house on a cot in the room to your right. He's the man you want, as I know from his words and conversation. He was in a way a friend, I explains, and if I was the man I once was the entire product of the mines of Gondola would not have tempted me to betray him. But, says I, every week half of the beans was wormy, and not nigh enough wood in camp. Better go in careful, gentlemen, says I. He seems impatient at times, and when you think of his late professional pursuits one would look for abrupt actions if he was come upon sudden. So the whole posse unmounts and ties their horses, and unlimbers their ammunition and equipments, and tiptoes into the house. And I follows, like Delilah when she set the Philip Steins on to Samson. The leader of the posse shakes Ogden and wakes him up. And then he jumps up, and two more of the reward hunters grab him. Ogden was mighty tough with all his slimness, and he gives M as neat a single-footed tussle against odds as I ever see. What does this mean, he says, after they had him down? You're scooped in, Mr. Black Bill, says the captain. That's all. It's an outrage, says H. Ogden, matter yet. It was, says the peace and goodwill man. The Katie wasn't bothering you, and there's a law against monkeying with express packages. And he sits on H. Ogden's stomach and goes through his pockets symptomatically and careful. I'll make you perspire for this, says Ogden, perspiring some himself. I can prove who I am. So can I, says the captain, as he draws from H. Ogden's inside coat pocket a handful of new bills of the Second National Bank of Espinosa City. Your regular engraved Tuesdays and Fridays visiting card wouldn't have a louder voice in proclaiming your indemnity than this here currency. You can get up now and prepare to go with us and expatriate your sins. H. Ogden gets up and fixes his necktie. He says no more after they have taken the money off of him. A well-greased idea, says the sheriff captain, admiring, to slip off down here and buy a little sheep ranch where the hand of man is seldom heard. It was the slickest hideout I ever see, says the captain. So one of the men goes to the shearing pen and hunts up the other herder, a Mexican they call John Sallies, 
and he saddles Ogden's horse. And the sheriffs all ride up close around him with their guns in hand, ready to take their prisoner to town. Before starting, Ogden puts the ranch in John Sally's hands and gives him orders about the shearing and where to graze the sheep, just as if he intended to be back in a few days. And a couple of hours afterward one Percival St. Clair, an ex-sheepherder of the Rancho Chiquito, might have been seen, with a hundred and nine dollars, wages and blood money, in his pocket. Riding south on another horse belonging to said ranch. The red-faced man paused and listened. The whistle of a coming freight train sounded far away among the low hills. The fat, seedy man at his side sniffed, and shook his frowsy head slowly and disparagingly. What is it, snipey? asked the other. Got the blues again? No, I ain't, said the seedy one, sniffing again. But I don't like your talk. You and me have been friends, off and on, for fifteen year. And I never yet knew or heard of you giving anybody up to the law, not no one. And here was a man whose saleratus you had et and at whose table you had played games of cards, if casino can be so called. And yet you inform him to the law and take money for it. It never was like you, I say. This H. Ogden, resumed the red-faced man, through a lawyer, proved himself free by alibis and other legal terminalities, as I so heard afterward. He never suffered no harm. He did me favors, and I hated to hand him over. How about the bills they found in his pocket, asked the seedy man. I put M there, said the red-faced man, while he was asleep, when I saw the posse riding up. I was Black Bill. Look out, Snipey, here she comes. We'll board her on the bumpers when she takes water at the tank. Schools and Schools Chapter 1 Old Jerome Warren lived in a $100,000 house at 35 East 50 Soforth Street. He was a downtown broker, so rich that he could afford to walk, for his health, a few blocks in the direction of his office every morning, and then call a cab. He had an adopted son, the son of an old friend named Gilbert, Cyril Scott could play him nicely, who was becoming a successful painter as fast as he could squeeze the paint out of his tubes. Another member of the household was Barbara Ross, a step-niece. Man is born to trouble, so, as old Jerome had no family of his own, he took up the burdens of others. Gilbert and Barbara got along swimmingly. There was a tacit and tactical understanding all round that the two would stand up under a floral bell some high noon. And promise the minister to keep old Jerome's money in a state of high commotion. But at this point complications must be introduced. Thirty years before, when old Jerome was young Jerome, there was a brother of his named Dick. Dick went west to seek his or somebody else's fortune. Nothing was heard of him until one day old Jerome had a letter from his brother. It was badly written on ruled paper that smelled of salt bacon and coffee grounds. The writing was asthmatic and the spelling St. Vitacy. It appeared that instead of Dick having forced fortune to stand and deliver, he had been held up himself, and made to give hostages to the enemy. That is, as his letter disclosed, he was on the point of pegging out with a complication of disorders that even whiskey had failed to check. All that his thirty years of prospecting had netted him was one daughter, nineteen years old, as per invoice, whom he was shipping east, charges prepaid, for Jerome to clothe, feed, educate, comfort, and cherish for the rest of her natural life or until matrimony should them part. Old Jerome was a boardwalk. Everybody knows that the world is supported by the shoulders of Atlas, and that Atlas stands on a rail fence, and that the rail fence is built on a turtle's back. Now, the turtle has to stand on something, and that is a boardwalk made of men like old Jerome. I do not know whether immortality shall accrue to man. But if not so, I would like to know when men like old Jerome get what is due them. They met Nevada Warren at the station. She was a little girl, deeply sunburned and wholesomely good-looking, with a manner that was frankly unsophisticated, yet one that not even a cigar drummer would intrude upon without thinking twice. Looking at her, Somehow you would expect to see her in a short skirt and leather leggings, shooting glass balls or taming mustangs. 
but in her plain white waist and black skirt she sent you guessing again. With an easy exhibition of strength she swung along a heavy valise, which the uniformed porters tried in vain to wrest from her. I am sure we shall be the best of friends, said Barbara, pecking at the firm, sunburned cheek. I hope so, said Nevada. Dear little niece, said old Jerome, you are as welcome to my home as if it were your father's own. Thanks, said Nevada. And I am going to call you, cousin, said Gilbert, with his charming smile. Take the valise, please, said Nevada. It weighs a million pounds. It's got samples from six of Dad's old mines in it, she explained to Barbara. I calculate they'd a say about nine cents to the thousand tons, but I promised him to bring them along. Chapter 2 It is a common custom to refer to the usual complication between one man and two ladies, or one lady and two men, or a lady and a man and a nobleman, or, well, any of those problems, as the triangle. But they are never unqualified triangles. They are always isosceles, never equilateral. So, upon the coming of Nevada Warren, she and Gilbert and Barbara Ross lined up into such a figurative triangle, and of that triangle Barbara formed the hypotenuse. One morning old Jerome was lingering long after breakfast over the dullest morning paper in the city before setting forth to his downtown flytrap. He had become quite fond of Nevada, finding in her much of his dead brother's quiet independence and unsuspicious frankness. A maid brought in a note for Miss Nevada Warren. A messenger boy delivered it at the door, please, she said. He's waiting for an answer. Nevada, who was whistling a Spanish waltz between her teeth, and watching the carriages and autos roll by in the street, took the envelope. She knew it was from Gilbert, before she opened it, by the little gold palette in the upper left-hand corner. After tearing it open she poured over the contents for a while, absorbedly. Then, with a serious face, she went and stood at her uncle's elbow. Uncle Jerome, Gilbert is a nice boy, isn't he? Why, bless the child, said old Jerome, crackling his paper loudly. Of course he is. I raised him myself. He wouldn't write anything to anybody that wasn't exactly, I mean that everybody couldn't know and read, would he? I'd just like to see him try it, said uncle, tearing a handful from his newspaper. Why, what? Read this note he just sent me, uncle, and see if you think it's all right and proper. You see, I don't know much about city people and their ways. Old Jerome threw his paper down and set both his feet upon it. He took Gilbert's note and fiercely perused it twice, and then a third time. Why, child, said he, you had me almost excited, although I was sure of that boy. He's a duplicate of his father, and he was a gilt-edged diamond. He only asks if you and Barbara will be ready at four o'clock this afternoon for an automobile drive over to Long Island. I don't see anything to criticize in it except the stationery. I always did hate that shade of blue. Would it be all right to go? asked Nevada, eagerly. Yes, 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 child, of course. Why not? Still, it pleases me to see you so careful and candid. Go, by all means. I didn't know, said Nevada, demurely. I thought I'd ask you. Couldn't you go with us, uncle? I? No, 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 no. I've ridden once in a car that boy was driving. Never again. But it's entirely proper for you and Barbara to go. Yes, yes. But I will not. No, 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 no. Nevada flew to the door, and said to the maid. You bet we'll go. I'll answer for Miss Barbara. Tell the boy to say to Mr. Warren, you bet we'll go. Nevada, called old Jerome, pardon me, my dear, but wouldn't it be as well to send him a note in reply? Just a line would do. No, I won't bother about that, said Nevada, gaily. Gilbert will understand, he always does. I never rode in an automobile in my life. But I've paddled a canoe down Little Devil River through the Lost Horse Canyon, and if it's any livelier than that I'd like to know. Chapter 3 
Two months are supposed to have elapsed. Barbara sat in the study of the $100,000 house. It was a good place for her. Many places are provided in the world where men and women may repair for the purpose of extricating themselves from diverse difficulties. There are cloisters, whaling places, watering places, confessionals, hermitages, lawyers' offices, beauty parlors, airships, and studies, and the greatest of these are studies. It usually takes a hypotenuse a long time to discover that it is the longest side of a triangle. But it's a long line that has no turning. Barbara was alone. Uncle Jerome and Nevada had gone to the theater. Barbara had not cared to go. She wanted to stay at home and study in the study. If you, miss, were a stunning New York girl, and saw every day that a brown, ingenuous western witch was getting hobbles and a lasso on the young man you wanted for yourself, you, too, would lose taste for the oxidized silver setting of a musical comedy. Barbara sat by the quartered oak library table. Her right arm rested upon the table, and her dextral fingers nervously manipulated a sealed letter. The letter was addressed to Nevada Warren. And in the upper left-hand corner of the envelope was Gilbert's little gold palette. It had been delivered at nine o'clock, after Nevada had left. Barbara would have given her pearl necklace to know what the letter contained. But she could not open and read it by the aid of steam, or a pen handle, or a hairpin, or any of the generally approved methods, because her position in society forbade such an act. She had tried to read some of the lines of the letter by holding the envelope up to a strong light and pressing it hard against the paper. But Gilbert had too good a taste in stationery to make that possible. At 11.30 the theatergoers returned. It was a delicious winter night. Even so far as from the cab to the door they were powdered thickly with the big flakes downpouring diagonally from the east. Old Jerome growled good-naturedly about villainous cab service and blockaded streets. Nevada, colored like a rose, with sapphire eyes, babbled of the stormy nights in the mountains around Dad's cabin. During all these wintry apostrophes, Barbara, cold at heart, sawed wood, the only appropriate thing she could think of to do. Old Jerome went immediately upstairs to hot water bottles and quinine. Nevada fluttered into the study, the only cheerfully lighted room, subsided into an armchair, and, while at the interminable task of unbuttoning her elbow gloves, gave oral testimony as to the demerits of the show. Yes, I think Mr. Fields is really amusing, sometimes, said Barbara. Here is a letter for you, dear, that came by special delivery just after you had gone. Who is it from? Asked Nevada, tugging at a button. Well, really, said Barbara, with a smile, I can only guess. The envelope has that queer little thing in one corner that Gilbert calls a pallet, but which looks to me rather like a gilt heart on a schoolgirl's valentine. I wonder what he's writing to me about, remarked Nevada, listlessly. We're all alike, said Barbara, all women. We try to find out what is in a letter by studying the postmark. As a last resort we use scissors, and read it from the bottom upward. Here it is. She made a motion as if to toss the letter across the table to Nevada. Great catamounts, exclaimed Nevada. These centerfire buttons are a nuisance. I'd rather wear buckskins. Oh, Barbara, please shuck the hide off that letter and read it. It'll be midnight before I get these gloves off. Why, dear, you don't want me to open Gilbert's letter to you? It's for you, and you wouldn't wish anyone else to read it, of course. Nevada raised her steady, calm, sapphire eyes from her gloves. Nobody writes me anything that everybody mightn't read, she said. Go on, Barbara. Maybe Gilbert wants us to go out in his car again tomorrow. Curiosity can do more things than kill a cat. And if emotions, well recognized as feminine, are inimical to feline life, then jealousy would soon leave the whole world catless. Barbara opened the letter, with an indulgent, slightly bored air. Well, dear, said she, I'll read it if you want me to. She slit the envelope, and read the missive with swift traveling eyes. Read it again, and cast a quick, shrewd glance at Nevada, 
who, for the time, seemed to consider gloves as the world of her interest. And letters from rising artists as no more than messages from Mars. For a quarter of a minute Barbara looked at Nevada with a strange steadfastness. And then a smile so small that it widened her mouth only the sixteenth part of an inch, and narrowed her eyes no more than a twentieth, flashed like an inspired thought across her face. Since the beginning no woman has been a mystery to another woman. Swift as light travels, each penetrates the heart and mind of another, sifts her sister's words of their cunningest disguises, reads her most hidden desires. And plucks the sophistry from her wheeliest talk like hairs from a comb, twiddling them sardonically between her thumb and fingers before letting them float away on the breezes of fundamental doubt. Long ago Eve's son rang the doorbell of the family residence in Paradise Park, bearing a strange lady on his arm, whom he introduced. Eve took her daughter-in-law aside and lifted a classic eyebrow. The land of Nod, said the bride, languidly flirting the leaf of a palm. I suppose you've been there, of course. Not lately, said Eve, absolutely unstaggered. Don't you think the applesauce they serve over there is execrable? I rather like that mulberry leaf tunic effect, dear, but, of course, the real fig goods are not to be had over there. Come over behind this lilac bush while the gentlemen split a celery tonic. I think the caterpillar holes have made your dress open a little in the back. So, then and there, according to the records, was the alliance formed by the only two who's who ladies in the world. Then it was agreed that woman should forever remain as clear as a pane of glass, though glass was yet to be discovered, to other women, and that she should palm herself off on man as a mystery. Barbara seemed to hesitate. Really, Nevada, she said, with a little show of embarrassment, you shouldn't have insisted on my opening this. I, I'm sure it wasn't meant for anyone else to know. Nevada forgot her gloves for a moment. Then read it aloud, she said. Since you've already read it, what's the difference? If Mr. Warren has written to me something that anyone else oughtn't to know, that is all the more reason why everybody should know it. Well, said Barbara, this is what it says, dearest Nevada, come to my studio at twelve o'clock tonight. Do not fail. Barbara rose and dropped the note in Nevada's lap. I'm awfully sorry, she said, that I knew. It isn't like Gilbert. There must be some mistake. Just consider that I am ignorant of it, will you, dear? I must go upstairs now, I have such a headache. I'm sure I don't understand the note. Perhaps Gilbert has been dining too well, and will explain. Good night. Chapter 4 Nevada tiptoed to the hall, and heard Barbara's door close upstairs. The bronze clock in the study told the hour of twelve was fifteen minutes away. She ran swiftly to the front door, and let herself out into the snowstorm. Gilbert Warren's studio was six squares away. By aerial ferry the white, silent forces of the storm attacked the city from beyond the sullen East River. Already the snow lay a foot deep on the pavements, the drifts heaping themselves like scaling ladders against the walls of the besieged town. The avenue was as quiet as a street in Pompeii. Cabs now and then skimmed past like white-winged gulls over a moonlit ocean. And less frequent motorcars, sustaining the comparison, hissed through the foaming waves like submarine boats on their jocund, perilous journeys. Nevada plunged like a wind-driven storm petrel on her way. She looked up at the ragged sierras of cloud-capped buildings that rose above the streets, shaded by the night lights and the congealed vapors to gray, drab, ashen, lavender, dun, and cerulean tints. They were so like the wintry mountains of her western home that she felt a satisfaction such as the hundred-thousand-dollar house had seldom brought her. A policeman caused her to waver on a corner, just by his eye and wait. Hello, Mabel, said he. Kind of late for you to be out, ain't it? I, I am just going to the drug store, said Nevada, hurrying past him. The excuse serves as a passport for the most sophisticated. Does it prove that woman never progresses, or that she sprang from Adam's rib, full-fledged in intellect and wiles? Turning eastward, the direct blast cut down Nevada's speed one-half. 
She made zigzag tracks in the snow, but she was as tough as a pinion sapling, and bowed to it as gracefully. Suddenly the studio building loomed before her, a familiar landmark, like a cliff above some well-remembered canyon. The haunt of business and its hostile neighbor, Art, was darkened and silent. The elevator stopped at ten. Up eight flights of Stygian stairs Nevada climbed, and rapped firmly at the door numbered 89. She had been there many times before, with Barbara and Uncle Jerome. Gilbert opened the door. He had a crayon pencil in one hand, a green shade over his eyes, and a pipe in his mouth. The pipe dropped to the floor. Am I late? asked Nevada. I came as quick as I could. Uncle and me were at the theater this evening. Here I am, Gilbert. Gilbert did a Pygmalion Angelatia act. He changed from a statue of stupefaction to a young man with a problem to tackle. He admitted Nevada, got a whisk broom, and began to brush the snow from her clothes. A great lamp, with a green shade, hung over an easel, where the artist had been sketching in crayon. You wanted me, said Nevada simply, and I came. You said so in your letter. What did you send for me for? You read my letter, inquired Gilbert, sparring for wind. Barbara read it to me. I saw it afterward. It said, Come to my studio at twelve tonight, and do not fail. I thought you were sick, of course, but you don't seem to be. Aha, said Gilbert irrelevantly. I'll tell you why I asked you to come, Nevada. I want you to marry me immediately, tonight. What's a little snowstorm? Will you do it? You might have noticed that I would, long ago, said Nevada. And I'm rather stuck on the snowstorm idea, myself. I surely would hate one of these flowery church noon weddings. Gilbert, I didn't know you had grit enough to propose it this way. Let's shock, M, it's our funeral, ain't it? You bet, said Gilbert. Where did I hear that expression, he added to himself. Wait a minute, Nevada, I want to do a little phoning. He shut himself in a little dressing room, and called upon the lightnings of the heavens, condensed into unromantic numbers and districts. That you, Jack? You confounded sleepyhead. Yes, wake up. This is me, or I, oh, bother the difference in grammar. I'm going to be married right away. Yes. Wake up your sister, don't answer me back, bring her along, too, you must. Remind Agnes of the time I saved her from drowning in Lake Runconcoma, I know it's caddish to refer to it, but she must come with you. Yes. Nevada is here, waiting. We've been engaged quite a while. Some opposition among the relatives, you know, and we have to pull it off this way. We're waiting here for you. Don't let Agnes out-talk you, bring her. You will? Good old boy. I'll order a carriage to call for you, double-quick time. Confound you, Jack, you're all right. Gilbert returned to the room where Nevada waited. My old friend, Jack Payton, and his sister were to have been here at a quarter to twelve, he explained, but Jack is so confoundedly slow. I've just phoned them to hurry. They'll be here in a few minutes. I'm the happiest man in the world, Nevada. What did you do with the letter I sent you today? I've got it cinched here, said Nevada, pulling it out from beneath her opera cloak. Gilbert drew the letter from the envelope and looked it over carefully. Then he looked at Nevada thoughtfully. Didn't you think it rather queer that I should ask you to come to my studio at midnight? he asked. Why, no, said Nevada, rounding her eyes. Not if you needed me. Out west, when a pal sends you a hurry call, ain't that what you say here, we get there first and talk about it after the row is over. And it's usually snowing there, too, when things happen. So I didn't mind. Gilbert rushed into another room, and came back burdened with overcoats warranted to turn wind, rain, or snow. Put this raincoat on, he said, holding it for her. We have a quarter of a mile to go. Old Jack and his sister will be here in a few minutes. He began to struggle into a heavy coat. Oh, Nevada, 
he said, just look at the headlines on the front page of that evening paper on the table, will you? It's about your section of the West, and I know it will interest you. He waited a full minute, pretending to find trouble in the getting on of his overcoat, and then turned. Nevada had not moved. She was looking at him with strange and pensive directness. Her cheeks had a flush on them beyond the color that had been contributed by the wind and snow, but her eyes were steady. I was going to tell you, she said, anyhow, before you, before we, before, well, before anything. Dad never gave me a day of schooling. I never learned to read or write a darned word. Now if. Pounding their uncertain way upstairs, the feet of Jack, the somnolent, and Agnes, the grateful, were heard. Chapter 5 When Mr. and Mrs. Gilbert Warren were spinning softly homeward in a closed carriage, after the ceremony, Gilbert said. Nevada. Would you really like to know what I wrote you in the letter that you received tonight? Fire away, said his bride. Word for word, said Gilbert, it was this, my dear Miss Warren, you were right about the flower. It was a hydrangea, and not a lilac. All right, said Nevada. But let's forget it. The joke's on Barbara, anyway. The discounters of money. The spectacle of the money caliphs of the present day going about Baghdad on the subway trying to relieve the wants of the people is enough to make the great Al Raskid turn. Haroun in his grave. If not so, then the assertion should do so, the real caliph having been a wit and a scholar and therefore a hater of puns. How properly to alleviate the troubles of the poor is one of the greatest troubles of the rich. But one thing agreed upon by all professional philanthropists is that you must never hand over any cash to your subject. The poor are notoriously temperamental. And when they get money they exhibit a strong tendency to spend it for stuffed olives and enlarged crayon portraits instead of giving it to the installment man. And still, old Haroun had some advantages as an eleemosynarian. He took around with him on his rambles his vizier, Giafar, a vizier is a composite of a chauffeur, a secretary of state, and a night and a bank, and old uncle Mesrer, his executioner. Who toted a snicker's nay? With this entourage a caliphing tour could hardly fail to be successful. Have you noticed lately any newspaper articles headed, What shall we do with our ex-presidents? Well, now, Suppose that Mr. Carnegie could engage him and Joe Gans to go about assisting in the distribution of free libraries? Do you suppose any town would have had the hardihood to refuse one? That caliphalous combination would cause two libraries to grow where there had been only one set of E.P. Rose works before. But, as I said, the money caliphs are handicapped. They have the idea that earth has no sorrow that dough cannot heal, and they rely upon it solely. Al Raskid administered justice, rewarding the deserving, and punished whomsoever he disliked on the spot. He was the originator of the short story contest. Whenever he succored any chance pickup in the bazaars, he always made the succorer tell the sad story of his life. If the narrative lacked construction, style, and esprit, he commanded his vizier to dole him out a couple of thousand ten dollar notes of the First National Bank of the Bosphorus or else gave him a soft job as keeper of the bird seed for the bulbuls in the imperial gardens. If the story was a crackerjack, he had Mesrer, the executioner, whack off his head. The report that Haroun al Raskid is yet alive and is editing the magazine that your grandmother used to subscribe for lax confirmation. And now follows the story of the millionaire, the inefficacious increment, and the babes drawn from the wood. Young Howard Pilkins, the millionaire, got his money ornithologically. He was a shrewd judge of storks, and got in on the ground floor at the residence of his immediate ancestors, the Pilkins Brewing Company. For his mother was a partner in the business. Finally old man Pilkins died from a torpid liver, and then Mrs. Pilkins died from worry on account of torpid delivery wagons, and there you have young Howard Pilkins with four million. And a good fellow at that. He was an agreeable, modestly arrogant young man, who implicitly believed that money could buy anything that the world had to offer. And Baghdad on the subway for a long time did everything possible to encourage his belief. 
but the rat trap caught him at last. He heard the spring snap, and found his heart in a wire cage regarding a piece of cheese whose other name was Alice von der Rusling. The von der Ruslings still live in that little square about which so much has been said, and in which so little has been done. Today you hear of Mr. Tilden's underground passage, and you hear Mr. Gould's elevated passage, and that about ends the noise in the world made by Gramercy Square. But once it was different. The von der Ruslings live there yet, and they received the first key ever made to Gramercy Park. You shall have no description of Alice v. D. R. Just call up in your mind the picture of your own Maggie or Vera or Beatrice, straighten her nose, soften her voice, tone her down and then tone her up. Make her beautiful and unattainable, and you have a faint drypoint etching of Alice. The family owned a crumbly brick house and a coachman named Joseph in a coat of many colors, and a horse so old that he claimed to belong to the order of the Parisodactyla. And had toes instead of hoofs. In the year 1898 the family had to buy a new set of harness for the Parisodactyl. Before using it they made Joseph smear it over with a mixture of ashes and soot. It was the von der Rusling family that bought the territory between the Bowery and East River and Rivington Street and the Statue of Liberty, in the year 1649. From an Indian chief for a quart of passementry and a pair of turkey-red portieres designed for a Harlem flat. I have always admired that Indian's perspicacity and good taste. All this is merely to convince you that the von der Ruslings were exactly the kind of poor aristocrats that turn down their noses at people who have money. Oh, well, I don't mean that. I mean people who have just money. One evening Pilkins went down to the red brick house in Gramercy Square, and made what he thought was a proposal to Alice v. D. R. Alice, with her nose turned down, and thinking of his money, considered it a proposition, and refused it and him. Pilkins, summoning all his resources as any good general would have done, made an indiscreet references to the advantages that his money would provide. That settled it. The lady turned so cold that Walter Wellman himself would have waited until spring to make a dash for her in a dog's lead. But Pilkins was something of a sport himself. You can't fool all the millionaires every time the ball drops on the Western Union building. If, at any time, he said to A. V. D. R. You feel that you would like to reconsider your answer, send me a rose like that. Pilkins audaciously touched a jock rose that she wore loosely in her hair. Very well, said she. And when I do, you will understand by it that either you or I have learned something new about the purchasing power of money. You've been spoiled, my friend. No, I don't think I could marry you. Tomorrow I will send you back the presents you have given me. Presents, said Pilkins in surprise. I never gave you a present in my life. I would like to see a full-length portrait of the man that you would take a present from. Why, you never would let me send you flowers or candy or even art calendars. You've forgotten, said Alice V. D. R., with a little smile. It was a long time ago when our families were neighbors. You were seven, and I was trundling my doll on the sidewalk. You have me a little gray, hairy kitten, with shoe buttony eyes. Its head came off and it was full of candy. You paid five cents for it, you told me so. I haven't the candy to return to you, I hadn't developed a conscience at three, so I ate it. But I have the kitten yet, and I will wrap it up neatly tonight and send it to you tomorrow. Beneath the likeness of Alice v. D. R. S. talk the steadfastness of her rejection showed firm and plain. So there was nothing left for him but to leave the crumbly red brick house, and be off with his abhorred millions. On his way back, Pilkins walked through Madison Square. The hour hand of the clock hung about eight, the air was stingingly cool, but not at the freezing point. The dim little square seemed like a great, cold, unroofed room, with its four walls of houses, spangled with thousands of insufficient lights. Only a few loiterers were huddled here and there on the benches. But suddenly Pilkins came upon a youth sitting brave and, as if conflicting with summer sultriness, copeless, his white shirt sleeves conspicuous in the light from the globe of an electric. Close to his side was a girl, smiling, dreamy, happy. 
Around her shoulders was, palpably, the missing coat of the cold-defying youth. It appeared to be a modern panorama of the babes in the wood, revised and brought up to date, with the exception that the robins hadn't turned up yet with the protecting leaves. With delight the money caliphs view a situation that they think is relievable while you wait. Pilkin sat on the bench, one seat removed from the youth. He glanced cautiously and saw, as men do see, and women, oh! Never can, that they were of the same order. Pilkins leaned over after a short time and spoke to the youth, who answered smilingly, and courteously. From general topics the conversation concentrated to the bedrock of grim personalities. But Pilkins did it as delicately and heartily as any caliph could have done. And when it came to the point, the youth turned to him, soft-voiced and with his undiminished smile. I don't want to seem unappreciative, old man, he said, with a youth somewhat too early spontaneity of address, but, you see, I can't accept anything from a stranger. I know you're all right, and I'm tremendously obliged, but I couldn't think of borrowing from anybody. You see, I'm Marcus Clayton, the Claytons of Roanoke County, Virginia, you know. The young lady is Miss Eva Bedford, I reckon you've heard of the Bedfords. She's seventeen and one of the Bedfords of Bedford County. We've eloped from home to get married, and we wanted to see New York. We got in this afternoon. Somebody got my pocketbook on the ferryboat, and I had only three cents in change outside of it. I'll get some work somewhere tomorrow, and we'll get married. But, I say, old man, said Pilkins, in confidential low tones, you can't keep the lady out here in the cold all night. Now, as for hotels. I told you, said the youth, with a broader smile, that I didn't have but three cents. Besides, if I had a thousand, we'd have to wait here until morning. You can understand that, of course. I'm much obliged, but I can't take any of your money. Miss Bedford and I have lived an outdoor life, and we don't mind a little cold. I'll get work of some kind tomorrow. We've got a paper bag of cakes and chocolates, and we'll get along all right. Listen, said the millionaire, impressively. My name is Pilkins, and I'm worth several million dollars. I happen to have in my pockets about eight hundred dollars or nine hundred dollars in cash. Don't you think you are drawing it rather fine when you decline to accept as much of it as will make you and the young lady comfortable at least for the night? I can't say, sir, that I do think so, said Clayton of Roanoke County. I've been raised to look at such things differently. But I'm mightily obliged to you, just the same. Then you force me to say good night, said the millionaire. Twice that day had his money been scorned by simple ones to whom his dollars had appeared as but tin tobacco tags. He was no worshipper of the actual minted coin or stamped paper, but he had always believed in its almost unlimited power to purchase. Pilkins walked away rapidly, and then turned abruptly and returned to the bench where the young couple sat. He took off his hat and began to speak. The girl looked at him with the same sprightly glowing interest that she had been giving to the lights and statuary and sky-reaching buildings that made the old square seem so far away from Bedford County. Mr. Uh, Roanoke, said Pilkins, I admire your, your independ, your idiocy so much that I'm going to appeal to your chivalry. I believe that's what you southerners call it when you keep a lady sitting outdoors on a bench on a cold night just to keep your old, out-of-date pride going. Now, I've a friend, a lady, whom I have known all my life, who lives a few blocks from here, with her parents and sisters and aunts, and all that kind of endorsement, of course. I am sure this lady would be happy and pleased to put up, that is, to have Miss, er, Bedford give her the pleasure of having her as a guest for the night. Don't you think, Mr. Roanoke, of, Virginia, that you could unbend your prejudices that far? Clayton of Roanoke rose and held out his hand. Old man, he said, Miss Bedford will be much pleased to accept the hospitality of the lady you refer to. He formally introduced Mr. Pilkins to Miss Bedford. The girl looked at him sweetly and comfortably. It's a lovely evening, Mr. Pilkins, don't you think so? she said slowly. Pilkins conducted them to the crumbly red brick house of the Von der Ruslings. 
His card brought Alice downstairs wondering. The runaways were sent into the drawing room, while Pilkins told Alice all about it in the hall. Of course, I will take her in, said Alice. Haven't those southern girls a thoroughbred air? Of course, she will stay here. You will look after Mr. Clayton, of course. Will I? said Pilkins, delightedly. Oh yes, I'll look after him. As a citizen of New York, and therefore a part owner of its public parks, I'm going to extend to him the hospitality of Madison Square tonight. He's going to sit there on a bench till morning. There's no use arguing with him. Isn't he wonderful? I'm glad you'll look after the little lady, Alice. I tell you those babes in the wood made my, that is, er, made Wall Street and the Bank of England look like penny arcades. Miss von der Rusling whisked Miss Bedford of Bedford County up to restful regions upstairs. When she came down, she put an oblong small pasteboard box into Pilkins' hands. Your present, she said, that I am returning to you. Oh, yes, I remember, said Pilkins, with a sigh, the woolly kitten. He left Clayton on a park bench, and shook hands with him heartily. After I get work, said the youth, I'll look you up. Your address is on your card, isn't it? Thanks. Well, good night. I'm awfully obliged to you for your kindness. No, thanks, I don't smoke. Good night. In his room, Pilkins opened the box and took out the staring, funny kitten, long ago ravaged of his candy in minus one shoe button eye. Pilkins looked at it sorrowfully. After all, he said. I don't believe that just money alone will. And then he gave a shout and dug into the bottom of the box for something else that had been the kitten's resting place, a crushed but red, red. Fragrant, glorious, promising Jacqueminot rose. He also serves. If I could have a thousand years, just one little thousand years, more of life, I might, in that time, draw near enough to true romance to touch the hem of her robe. Up from ships men come, and from waste places and forest and road and garret and cellar to maunder to me in strangely distributed words of the things they have seen and considered. The recording of their tales is no more than a matter of ears and fingers. There are only two fates I dread, deafness and writer's cramp. The hand is yet steady. Let the ear bear the blame if these printed words be not in the order they were delivered to me by Hunky McGee, true camp follower of fortune. Biography shall claim you but an instant, I first knew Hunky when he was head waiter at Chubb's Little Beefsteak Restaurant and Café on 3rd Avenue. There was only one waiter besides. Then, successively, I caromed against him in the little streets of the big city after his trip to Alaska, his voyage as cook with a treasure-seeking expedition to the Caribbean, and his failure as a pearl fisher in the Arkansas River. Between these dashes into the land of adventure he usually came back to Chubbs for a while. Chubbs was a port for him when gales blew too high. But when you dined there and Hunky went for your steak you never knew whether he would come to anchor in the kitchen or in the Malayan archipelago. You wouldn't care for his description, he was soft of voice and hard of face, and rarely had to use more than one eye to quell any approach to a disturbance among Chubbs' customers. One night I found Hunky standing at a corner of 23rd Street and 3rd Avenue after an absence of several months. In ten minutes we had a little round table between us in a quiet corner, and my ears began to get busy. I leave out my sly ruses and feints to draw Hunky's word-of-mouth blows, it all came to something like this. Speaking of the next election, said Hunky, did you ever know much about Indians? No. I don't mean the Cooper, Beetle cigar store. Or laughing water kind, I mean the modern Indian, the kind that takes Greek prizes in colleges and scalps the halfback on the other side in football games. The kind that eats macaroons and tea in the afternoons with the daughter of the professor of biology, and fills up on grasshoppers and fried rattlesnake when they get back to the ancestral wikiup. Well, they ain't so bad. I like M better than most foreigners that have come over in the last few hundred years. One thing about the Indian is this, when he mixes with the white race he swaps all his own vices for them of the pale faces, 
and he retains all his own virtues. Well, his virtues are enough to call out the reserves whenever he lets them loose. But the imported foreigners adopt our virtues and keep their own vices, and it's going to take our whole standing army some day to police that gang. But let me tell you about the trip I took to Mexico with High Jack Snake Feeder, a Cherokee twice removed, a graduate of a Pennsylvania college and the latest thing in pointed toed, rubber heeled. Patent kid moccasins and madras hunting shirt with turn back cuffs. He was a friend of mine. I met him in Tahlequah when I was out there during the land boom, and we got thick. He had got all there was out of colleges and had come back to lead his people out of Egypt. He was a man of first class style and wrote essays, and had been invited to visit rich guys' houses in Boston and such places. There was a Cherokee girl in Muskogee that High Jack was foolish about. He took me to see her a few times. Her name was Florence Blue Feather, but you want to clear your mind of all ideas of squaws with nose rings and army blankets. This young lady was whiter than you are, and better educated than I ever was. You couldn't have told her from any of the girls shopping in the swell Third Avenue stores. I liked her so well that I got to calling on her now and then when High Jack wasn't along, which is the way of friends in such matters. She was educated at the Muskogee College, and was making a specialty of, let's see, eth, yes, ethnology. That's the art that goes back and traces the descent of different races of people, leading up from jellyfish through monkeys and to the O'Briens. High Jack had took up that line too, and had read papers about it before all kinds of riotous assemblies, Chautauquas and Choctaws and Chowder Parties, and such. Having a mutual taste for musty information like that was what made them like each other, I suppose. But I don't know. What they call congeniality of tastes ain't always it. Now, when Miss Blue Feather and me was talking together, I listened to her affidavits about the first families of the land of Nod being cousins German, well, if the Germans don't Nod, who does? To the mound builders of Ohio with incomprehension and respect. And when I'd tell her about the Bowery and Coney Island, and sing her a few songs that I'd heard the Jamaica niggers sing at their church lawn parties. She didn't look much less interested than she did when High Jack would tell her that he had a pipe that the first inhabitants of America originally arrived here on stilts after a freshet at Tenafly. New Jersey. But I was going to tell you more about High Jack. About six months ago I get a letter from him. Saying he'd been commissioned by the Minority Report Bureau of Ethnology at Washington to go down to Mexico and translate some excavations or dig up the meaning of some shorthand notes on some ruins, or something of that sort. And if I'd go along he could squeeze the price into the expense account. Well, I'd been holding a napkin over my arm at Chubbs about long enough then, so I wired Hi Jack, yes. And he sent me a ticket, and I met him in Washington, and he had a lot of news to tell me. First of all, was that Florence Blue Feather had suddenly disappeared from her home and environments. Run away? I asked. Vanished, says High Jack. Disappeared like your shadow when the sun goes under a cloud. She was seen on the street, and then she turned a corner and nobody ever seen her afterward. The whole community turned out to look for her, but we never found a clue. That's bad, that's bad says I, she was a mighty nice girl, and as smart as you find em. High Jack seemed to take it hard. I guess he must have esteemed Miss Blue Feather quite highly. I could see that he'd referred the matter to the whiskey jug. That was his weak point, and many another man's. I've noticed that when a man loses a girl he generally takes to drink either just before or just after it happens. From Washington we railroaded it to New Orleans, and there took a tramp steamer bound for Belize. And a gale pounded us all down the Caribbean, and nearly wrecked us on the Yucatan coast opposite a little town without a harbor called Boca de Coacoyola. Suppose the ship had run against that name in the dark. Better fifty years of Europe than a cyclone in the bay, says High Jack Snake Feeder. So we get the captain to send us ashore in a dory when the squall seemed to cease from squalling. We will find ruins here or make M, says Hi. The government doesn't care which we do. An appropriation is an appropriation. 
Boca de Coacoila was a dead town. Them biblical towns we read about, tired and siphon, after they was destroyed, they must have looked like 42nd Street and Broadway compared to this Boca place. It still claimed 1,300 inhabitants as estimated and engraved on the stone courthouse by the census taker in 1597. The citizens were a mixture of Indians and other Indians. But some of them was light-colored, which I was surprised to see. The town was huddled up on the shore, with wood so thick around it that a subpoena server couldn't have reached a monkey ten yards away with the papers. We wondered what kept it from being annexed to Kansas but we soon found out that it was Major Bing. Major Bing was the ointment around the fly. He had the cochineal, sarsaparilla, logwood, anato, hemp, and all other dyewoods and pure food adulteration concessions cornered. He had five-sixths of the Boca de thingamajiggers working for him on shares. It was a beautiful graft. We used to brag about Morgan and E. H and others of our wisest when I was in the provinces, but now no more. That peninsula has got our little country turned into a submarine without even the observation tower showing. Major Bing's idea was this. He had the population go forth into the forest and gather these products. When they brought M in he gave M one-fifth for their trouble. Sometimes they'd strike and demand a sixth. The Major always gave in to M. The major had a bungalow so close on the sea that the nine-inch tide seeped through the cracks in the kitchen floor. Me and him and High Jack Snake Feeder sat on the porch and drank rum from noon till midnight. He said he had piled up $300,000 in New Orleans banks, and High and me could stay with him forever if we would. But High Jack happened to think of the United States, and began to talk ethnology. Ruins, says Major Bing. The woods are full of M. I don't know how far they date back, but they was here before I came. High Jack asks what form of worship the citizens of that locality are addicted to. Why, says the major, rubbing his nose, I can't hardly say. I imagine it's infidel or Aztec or nonconformist or something like that. There's a church here, a Methodist or some other kind, with a parson named Skidder. He claims to have converted the people to Christianity. He and me don't assimilate except on state occasions. I imagine they worship some kind of gods or idols yet. But Skidder says he has M in the fold. A few days later High Jack and me, prowling around, strikes a plain path into the forest, and follows it a good four miles. Then a branch turns to the left. We go a mile, maybe, down that, and run up against the finest ruin you ever saw, solid stone with trees and vines and underbrush all growing up against it and in it and through it. All over it was chiseled carvings of funny beasts and people that would have been arrested if they'd ever come out in vaudeville that way. We approached it from the rear. High Jack had been drinking too much rum ever since we landed in Boca. You know how an Indian is, the pale faces fixed his clock when they introduced him to firewater. He'd brought a quart along with him. Hunky, says he, we'll explore the ancient temple. It may be that the storm that landed us here was propitious. The Minority Report Bureau of Ethnology, says he, may yet profit by the vagaries of wind and tide. We went in the rear door of the bum edifice. We struck a kind of alcove without bath. There was a granite davenport, and a stone washstand without any soap or exit for the water and some hardwood pegs drove into holes in the wall, and that was all. To go out of that furnished apartment into a Harlem Hall bedroom would make you feel like getting back home from an amateur violoncello solo at an East Side settlement house. While High was examining some hieroglyphics on the wall that the stonemasons must have made when their tools slipped, I stepped into the front room. That was at least thirty by fifty feet, stone floor, six little windows like square portholes that didn't let much light in. I looked back over my shoulder, and sees High Jack's face three feet away. Hi, says I, of all the... And then I noticed he looked funny, and I turned around. He'd taken off his clothes to the waist, and he didn't seem to hear me. I touched him, and came near beating it. High Jack had turned to stone. 
I had been drinking some rum myself. Ossified. I says to him, loudly. I knew what would happen if you kept it up. And then High Jack comes in from the alcove when he hears me conversing with nobody, and we have a look at Mr. Snake Feeder number two. It's a stone idol, or god, or revised statute or something, and it looks as much like High Jack as one green pea looks like itself. It's got exactly his face and size and color, but it's steadier on its pins. It stands on a kind of rostrum or pedestal, and you can see it's been there ten million years. He's a cousin of mine, sings high, and then he turns solemn. Hunky, he says, putting one hand on my shoulder and one on the statues, I'm in the holy temple of my ancestors. Well, if looks goes for anything, says I, you've struck a twin. Stand side by side with Buddy, and let's see if there's any difference. There wasn't. You know an Indian can keep his face as still as an iron dog's when he wants to, so when High Jack froze his features you couldn't have told him from the other one. There's some letters, says I, on his knob's pedestal, but I can't make M out. The alphabet of this country seems to be composed of sometimes A, E, I, O, and U, but generally Z's, L's, and T's. High Jack's ethnology gets the upper hand of his rum for a minute, and he investigates the inscription. Hunky, says he, this is a statue of Tlotopaxel, one of the most powerful gods of the ancient Aztecs. Glad to know him, says I, but in his present condition he reminds me of the joke Shakespeare got off on Julius Caesar. We might say about your friend. Imperious what's his name, dead and turned to stone. No use to write or call him on the phone. Hunky, says High Jack Snake Feeder, looking at me funny, do you believe in reincarnation? It sounds to me, says I, like either a clean-up of the slaughterhouses or a new kind of Boston pink. I don't know. I believe, says he, that I am the reincarnation of Tlotopaxel. My researches have convinced me that the Cherokees, of all the North American tribes, can boast of the straightest descent from the proud Aztec race. That, says he, was a favorite theory of mine and Florence Blue Feathers. And she, what if she? High Jack grabs my arm and walls his eyes at me. Just then he looked more like his eminent co-Indian murderer, Crazy Horse. Well, says I, what if she, what if she, what if she? You're drunk, says I. Impersonating idols and believing in, what was it, recarnalization? Let's have a drink, says I, it's as spooky here as a Brooklyn artificial limb factory at midnight with the gas turned down. Just then I heard somebody coming, and I dragged High Jack into the bedless bedchamber. There was peepholes bored through the wall, so we could see the whole front part of the temple. Major Bing told me afterward that the ancient priests in charge used to rubber through them at the congregation. In a few minutes an old Indian woman came in with a big oval earthen dish full of grub. She set it on a square block of stone in front of the graven image, and laid down and walloped her face on the floor a few times, and then took a walk for herself. High Jack and me was hungry, so we came out and looked it over. There was goat steaks and fried rice cakes, and plantains and cassava, and broiled land crabs and mangoes, nothing like what you get at Chubbs. We ate hearty, and had another round of rum. It must be old Tecumseh's, or whatever you call him, birthday, says I, or do they feed him every day? I thought gods only drank vanilla on Mount Catawampus. Then some more native parties in short kimonas that showed their aborigines punctured the near horizon, and me and High had to skip back into Father Axeltree's private boudoir. They came by ones, twos, and threes, and left all sorts of offerings, there was enough grub for Bingham's nine gods of war, with plenty left over for the peace conference at The Hague. They brought jars of honey, and bunches of bananas, and bottles of wine, and stacks of tortillas. And beautiful shawls worth one hundred dollars apiece that the Indian women weave of a kind of vegetable fiber like silk. All of them got down and wriggled on the floor in front of that hard Finnish god, and then sneaked off through the woods again. I wonder who gets this rake off, remarks High Jack. Oh, says I, 
there's priests or deputy idols or a committee of disarrangement somewhere in the woods on the job. Wherever you find a god you'll find somebody waiting to take charge of the burnt offerings. And then we took another swig of rum and walked out to the parlor front door to cool off, for it was as hot inside as a summer camp on the Palisades. And while we stood there in the breeze we looks down the path and sees a young lady approaching the blasted ruin. She was barefooted and had on a white robe, and carried a wreath of white flowers in her hand. When she got nearer we saw she had a long blue feather stuck through her black hair. And when she got nearer still me and High Jack Snake Feeder grabbed each other to keep from tumbling down on the floor. For the girl's face was as much like Florence Blue Feathers as his was like Old King Toxicology's. And then was when High Jack's booze drowned his system of ethnology. He dragged me inside back of the statue, and says. Lay hold of it, hunky. We'll pack it into the other room. I felt it all the time, says he. I'm the reconsideration of the god Locomotor Ataxia, and Florence Blue Feather was my bride a thousand years ago. She has come to seek me in the temple where I used to reign. All right, says I. There's no use arguing against the rum question. You take his feet. We lifted the three hundred pound stone god, and carried him into the back room of the cafe, the temple, I mean, and leaned him against the wall. It was more work than bouncing three live ones from an all night Broadway joint on New Year's Eve. Then High Jack ran out and brought in a couple of them Indian silk shawls and began to undress himself. Oh, figs, says I, is it thus? Strong drink is an adder and subtractor, too. Is it the heat or the call of the wild that's got you? But High Jack is too full of exaltation and cane juice to reply. He stops the disrobing business just short of the Manhattan Beach rules, and then winds them red and white shawls around him. And goes out and stands on the pedestal as steady as any platinum deity you ever saw. And I looks through a peak hole to see what he is up to. In a few minutes in comes the girl with the flower wreath. Dongate if I wasn't knocked a little silly when she got close, she looked so exactly much like Florence Blue Feather. I wonder, says I to myself, if she has been reincarcerated, too? If I could see, says I to myself, whether she has a mole on her left, but the next minute I thought she looked one-eighth of a shade darker than Florence, but she looked good at that. And High Jack hadn't drunk all the rum that had been drank. The girl went up within ten feet of the bum idol, and got down and massaged her nose with the floor, like the rest did. Then she went nearer and laid the flower wreath on the block of stone at High Jack's feet. Rummy as I was, I thought it was kind of nice of her to think of offering flowers instead of household and kitchen provisions. Even a stone god ought to appreciate a little sentiment like that on top of the fancy groceries they had piled up in front of him. And then High Jack steps down from his pedestal, quiet, and mentions a few words that sounded just like the hieroglyphics carved on the walls of the ruin. The girl gives a little jump backward, and her eyes fly open as big as donuts, but she don't beat it. Why didn't she? I'll tell you why I think why. It don't seem to a girl so supernatural, unlikely, strange, and startling that a stone god should come to life for her. If he was to do it for one of them snub-nosed brown girls on the other side of the woods, now, it would be different, but her. I'll bet she said to herself, well, goodness me. You've been a long time getting on your job. I've half a mind not to speak to you. But she and High Jack holds hands and walks away out of the temple together. By the time I'd had time to take another drink and enter upon the scene they was twenty yards away, going up the path in the woods that the girl had come down. With the natural scenery already in place, it was just like a play to watch, M, she looking up at him, and him giving her back the best that an Indian can hand, out in the way of a goo-goo eye. But there wasn't anything in that recarnification and revulsion to tintype for me. Hey! Injun! I yells out to High Jack. We've got a board bill due in town, and you're leaving me without a cent brace up and cut out the Neapolitan fisher maiden, and let's go back home. But on the two goes. Without looking once back until, as you might say, the forest swallowed, am up. 
and I never saw or heard of High Jack Snake Feeder from that day to this. I don't know if the Cherokees came from the Aspics, but if they did, one of them went back. All I could do was to hustle back to that Boca place and panhandle Major Bing. He detached himself from enough of his winnings to buy me a ticket home. And I'm back again on the job at Chubbs, sir, and I'm going to hold it steady. Come round, and you'll find the stakes as good as ever. I wondered what Hunky McGee thought about his own story. So I asked him if he had any theories about reincarnation and transmogrification and such mysteries as he had touched upon. Nothing like that, said Hunky, positively. What ailed High Jack was too much booze and education. They'll do an Indian up every time. But what about Miss Blue Feather? I persisted. Say, said Hunky, with a grin, that little lady that stole High Jack certainly did give me a jar when I first took a look at her, but it was only for a minute. You remember I told you High Jack said that Miss Florence Blue Feather disappeared from home about a year ago? Well, where she landed four days later was in as neat a five-room flat on East 23rd Street as you ever walked sideways through, and she's been Mrs. McGee ever since. The third ingredient. The so-called Vellambrosa apartment house is not an apartment house. It is composed of two old-fashioned, brownstone front residences welded into one. The parlor floor of one side is gay with the wraps and headgear of a modiste, the other is lugubrious with the sophistical promises and grisly display of a painless dentist. You may have a room there for two dollars a week or you may have one for twenty dollars. Among the Vallambrosa's rumors are stenographers, musicians, brokers, shop girls, space rate writers, art students, wiretappers and other people who lean far over the banister rail when the doorbell rings. This treatise shall have to do with but two of the Vallambrosians, though meaning no disrespect to the others. At six o'clock one afternoon Hetty Pepper came back to her third floor rear three dollars. Fifty room in the Vallambrosa with her nose and chin more sharply pointed than usual. To be discharged from the department store where you have been working four years, and with only fifteen cents in your purse, does have a tendency to make your features appear more finely chiseled. And now for Hetty's thumbnail biography while she climbs the two flights of stairs. She walked into the biggest store one morning four years before with seventy-five other girls, applying for a job behind the waste department counter. The phalanx of wage earners formed a bewildering scene of beauty, carrying a total mass of blonde hair sufficient to have justified the horseback gallops of a hundred Lady Godivas. The capable, cool-eyed, impersonal, young, bald-headed man whose task it was to engage six of the contestants, was aware of a feeling of suffocation as if he were drowning in a sea of frangipani. While white clouds, hand-embroidered, floated about him. And then a sail hove in sight. Hetty Pepper, homely of countenance, with small, contemptuous, green eyes and chocolate-colored hair, dressed in a suit of plain burlap and a common-sense hat stood before him with every one of her twenty-nine years of life unmistakably in sight. You're on, shouted the bald-headed young man, and was saved. And that is how Hetty came to be employed in the biggest store. The story of her rise to an eight-dollar-a-week salary is the combined stories of Hercules, Joan of Arc, Una, Job, and Little Red Riding Hood. You shall not learn from me the salary that was paid her as a beginner. There is a sentiment growing about such things, and I want no millionaire store proprietors climbing the fire escape of my tenement house to throw dynamite bombs into my skylight boudoir. The story of Hetty's discharge from the biggest store is so nearly a repetition of her engagement as to be monotonous. In each department of the store there is an omniscient, omnipresent, and omnivorous person carrying always a mileage book and a red necktie and referred to as a buyer. The destinies of the girls in his department who live on, see Bureau of Vital Statistics, so much per week are in his hands. This particular buyer was a capable, cool-eyed, impersonal, young, bald-headed man. As he walked along the aisles of his department he seemed to be sailing on a sea of frangipani, while white clouds, machine-embroidered, floated around him. Too many sweets bring surfeit. He looked upon Hetty Pepper's homely countenance, emerald eyes, 
and chocolate-colored hair as a welcome oasis of green in a desert of cloying beauty. In a quiet angle of a counter he pinched her arm kindly, three inches above the elbow. She slapped him three feet away with one good blow of her muscular and not especially lily-white right. So, now you know why Hetty Pepper came to leave the biggest store at thirty minutes' notice, with one dime and a nickel in her purse. This morning's quotations list the price of rib beef at six cents per, butcher's, pound. But on the day that Hetty was released by the BS the price was seven and one-half cents. That fact is what makes this story possible. Otherwise, the extra four cents would have. But the plot of nearly all the good stories in the world is concerned with shorts who were unable to cover. So you can find no fault with this one. Hetty mounted with her rib beef to her $3.50 third floor back. One hot, savory beef stew for supper, a night's good sleep, and she would be fit in the morning to apply again for the tasks of Hercules, Joan of Arc, Una, Job, and Little Red Riding Hood. In her room she got the graniteware stewpan out of the two-by-four-foot china, or, I mean earthenware closet, and began to dig down in a rat's nest of paper bags for the potatoes and onions. She came out with her nose and chin just a little sharper pointed. There was neither a potato nor an onion. Now, what kind of a beef stew can you make out of simply beef? You can make oyster soup without oysters, turtle soup without turtles, coffee cake without coffee, but you can't make beef stew without potatoes and onions. But rib beef alone, in an emergency, can make an ordinary pine door look like a wrought iron gambling house portal to the wolf. With salt and pepper and a tablespoonful of flour, first well stirred in a little cold water, twill serve, tis not so deep as a lobster a la Newberg nor so wide as a church festival donut. But, twill serve. Hetty took her stewpan to the rear of the third floor hall. According to the advertisements of the Vallambrosa there was running water to be found there. Between you and me and the water meter, it only ambled or walked through the faucets, but technicalities have no place here. There was also a sink where housekeeping rumors often met to dump their coffee grounds and glare at one another's kimonos. At this sink Hetty found a girl with heavy, gold-brown, artistic hair and plaintive eyes, washing two large, Irish, potatoes. Hetty knew the Vallambrosa as well as anyone not owning double hextra magnifying eyes could compass its mysteries. The kimonos were her encyclopedia, her who's what. Her clearinghouse of news, of goers and comers. From a rose-pink kimono edged with Nile green she had learned that the girl with the potatoes was a miniature painter living in a kind of attic, or studio. As they prefer to call it, on the top floor. Hetty was not certain in her mind what a miniature was, but it certainly wasn't a house. Because house painters, although they wear splashy overalls and poke ladders in your face on the street, are known to indulge in a riotous profusion of food at home. The potato girl was quite slim and small, and handled her potatoes as an old bachelor uncle handles a baby who is cutting teeth. She had a dull shoemaker's knife in her right hand, and she had begun to peel one of the potatoes with it. Hetty addressed her in the punctiliously formal tone of one who intends to be cheerfully familiar with you in the second round. Beg pardon, she said, for butting into what's not my business, but if you peel them potatoes you lose out. They're new Bermudas. You want to scrape, em. Let me show you. She took a potato and the knife, and began to demonstrate. Oh, thank you, breathed the artist. I didn't know. And I did hate to see the thick peeling go, it seemed such a waste. But I thought they always had to be peeled. When you've got only potatoes to eat, the peelings count, you know. Say, kid, said Hetty, staying her knife, you ain't up against it, too, are you? The miniature artist smiled starvedly. I suppose I am. Art, or, at least, the way I interpret it, doesn't seem to be much in demand. I have only these potatoes for my dinner. But they aren't so bad boiled and hot, with a little butter and salt. Child, said Hetty, letting a brief smile soften her rigid features, fate has sent me and you together. I've had it handed to me in the neck, too, 
but I've got a chunk of meat in my room as big as a lapdog. And I've done everything to get potatoes except pray for them. Let's me and you bunch our commissary departments and make a stew of them. We'll cook it in my room. If we only had an onion to go in it. Say, kid, you haven't got a couple of pennies that V slipped down into the lining of your last winter's sealskin, have you? I could step down to the corner and get one at old Giuseppe's stand. A stew without an onion is worse than a matinee without candy. You may call me Cecilia, said the artist. No, I spent my last penny three days ago. Then we'll have to cut the onion out instead of slicing it in, said Hetty. I'd ask the janitress for one, but I don't want M. Hep just yet to the fact that I'm pounding the asphalt for another job. But I wish we did have an onion. In the shop girl's room the two began to prepare their supper. Cecilia's part was to sit on the couch helplessly and beg to be allowed to do something, in the voice of a cooing ringdove. Hetty prepared the rib beef, putting it in cold salted water in the stewpan and setting it on the one-burner gas stove. I wish we had an onion, said Hetty, as she scraped the two potatoes. On the wall opposite the couch was pinned a flaming. Gorgeous advertising picture of one of the new ferryboats of the Puff Railroad that had been built to cut down the time between Los Angeles and New York City one-eighth of a minute. Hetty, turning her head during her continuous monologue, saw tears running from her guest's eyes as she gazed on the idealized presentment of the speeding, foam-girdled transport. Why, say, Cecilia, kid, said Hetty, poising her knife, is it as bad art as that? I ain't a critic but I thought it kind of brightened up the room. Of course, a manicure painter could tell it was a bum picture in a minute. I'll take it down if you say so. I wish to the holy saint potluck we had an onion. But the miniature miniature painter had tumbled down, sobbing, with her nose indenting the hard-woven drapery of the couch. Something was here deeper than the artistic temperament offended at crude lithography. Hetty knew. She had accepted her role long ago. How scant the words with which we try to describe a single quality of a human being. When we reach the abstract we are lost. The nearer to nature that the babbling of our lips comes, the better do we understand. Figuratively, let us say, some people are bosoms, some are hands, some are heads, some are muscles, some are feet, some are backs for burdens. Hetty was a shoulder. Hers was a sharp, sinewy shoulder, but all her life people had laid their heads upon it, metaphorically or actually, and had left their all or half their troubles. Looking at life anatomically, which is as good a way as any, she was preordained to be a shoulder. There were few truer collarbones anywhere than hers. Hetty was only thirty-three, and she had not yet outlived the little pang that visited her whenever the head of youth and beauty leaned upon her for consolation. But one glance in her mirror always served as an instantaneous painkiller. So she gave one pale look into the crinkly old looking glass on the wall above the gas stove, turned down the flame a little lower from the bubbling beef and potatoes, went over to the couch. And lifted Cecilia's head to its confessional. Go on and tell me, honey, she said. I know now that it ain't art that's worrying you. You met him on a ferryboat, didn't you? Go on, Cecilia, kid, and tell your, your Aunt Hetty about it. But youth and melancholy must first spend the surplus of sighs and tears that waft and float the bark of romance to its harbor in the delectable isles. Presently, through the stringy tendons that formed the bars of the confessional, the penitent, or was it the glorified communicant of the sacred flame, told her story without art or illumination. It was only three days ago. I was coming back on the ferry from Jersey City. Old Mr. Shrum, an art dealer, told me of a rich man in Newark who wanted a miniature of his daughter painted. I went to see him and showed him some of my work. When I told him the price would be fifty dollars he laughed at me like a hyena. He said an enlarged crayon twenty times the size would cost him only eight dollars. I had just enough money to buy my ferry ticket back to New York. I felt as if I didn't want to live another day. I must have looked as I felt, for I saw him on the row of seats opposite me, looking at me as if he understood. 
He was nice looking, but oh, above everything else, he looked kind. When one is tired or unhappy or hopeless, kindness counts more than anything else. When I got so miserable that I couldn't fight against it any longer, I got up and walked slowly out the rear door of the ferryboat cabin. No one was there, and I slipped quickly over the rail and dropped into the water. Oh, friend Hetty, it was cold, cold. For just one moment I wished I was back in the old Valambrosa, starving and hoping. And then I got numb, and didn't care. And then I felt that somebody else was in the water close by me, holding me up. He had followed me, and jumped in to save me. Somebody threw a thing like a big, white donut at us, and he made me put my arms through the hole. Then the ferryboat backed, and they pulled us on board. Oh, Hetty, I was so ashamed of my wickedness in trying to drown myself, and, besides, my hair had all tumbled down and was sopping wet, and I was such a sight. And then some men in blue clothes came around. And he gave them his card, and I heard him tell them he had seen me drop my purse on the edge of the boat outside the rail, and in leaning over to get it I had fallen overboard. And then I remembered having read in the papers that people who try to kill themselves are locked up in cells with people who try to kill other people, and I was afraid. But some ladies on the boat took me downstairs to the furnace room and got me nearly dry and did up my hair. When the boat landed, he came and put me in a cab. He was all dripping himself, but laughed as if he thought it was all a joke. He begged me, but I wouldn't tell him my name nor where I lived, I was so ashamed. You were a fool, child, said Hetty, kindly. Wait till I turn the light up a bit. I wish to heaven we had an onion. Then he raised his hat, went on Cecilia, and said, Very well. But I'll find you, anyhow. I'm going to claim my rights of salvage. Then he gave money to the cab driver and told him to take me where I wanted to go, and walked away. What is, salvage, Hetty? The edge of a piece of goods that ain't hemmed, said the shop girl. You must have looked pretty well frazzled out to the little hero boy. It's been three days, moaned the miniature painter, and he hasn't found me yet. Extend the time, said Hetty. This is a big town. Think of how many girls he might have to see soaked in water with their hair down before he would recognize you. The stew's getting on fine, but oh, for an onion. I'd even use a piece of garlic if I had it. The beef and potatoes bubbled merrily, exhaling a mouth-watering savor that yet lacked something, leaving a hunger on the palate, a haunting, wistful desire for some lost and needful ingredient. I came near drowning in that awful river, said Cecilia, shuddering. It ought to have more water in it, said Hetty, the stew, I mean. I'll go get some at the sink. It smells good, said the artist. That nasty old North River, objected Hetty. It smells to me like soap factories and wet setter dogs, oh, you mean the stew. Well, I wish we had an onion for it. Did he look like he had money? First, he looked kind, said Cecilia. I'm sure he was rich, but that matters so little. When he drew out his billfolder to pay the cabman you couldn't help seeing hundreds and thousands of dollars in it. And I looked over the cab doors and saw him leave the ferry station in a motor car. And the chauffeur gave him his bearskin to put on, for he was sopping wet. And it was only three days ago. What a fool, said Hetty, shortly. Oh, the chauffeur wasn't wet, breathed Cecilia. And he drove the car away very nicely. I mean you, said Hetty. For not giving him your address. I never give my address to chauffeurs, said Cecilia, haughtily. I wish we had one, said Hetty, disconsolately. What for? For the stew, of course, oh, I mean an onion. Hetty took a pitcher and started to the sink at the end of the hall. A young man came down the stairs from above just as she was opposite the lower step. He was decently dressed, but pale and haggard. His eyes were dull with the stress of some burden of physical or mental woe. In his hand he bore an onion, a pink, smooth, solid, shining onion as large around as a 98-cent alarm clock. Hetty stopped. 
so did the young man. There was something Joan of Arkish, Herculean, and Una-ish in the look and pose of the shop lady, she had cast off the rolls of Job and Little Red Riding Hood. The young man stopped at the foot of the stairs and coughed distractedly. He felt marooned, held up, attacked, assailed, levied upon, sacked, assessed, panhandled, browbeaten, though he knew not why. It was the look in Hetty's eyes that did it. In them he saw the jolly Roger fly to the masthead and an able seaman with a dirk between his teeth scurry up the ratlins and nail it there. But as yet he did not know that the cargo he carried was the thing that had caused him to be so nearly blown out of the water without even a parley. Beg your pardon, said Hetty, as sweetly as her dilute acetic acid tones permitted, but did you find that onion on the stairs? There was a hole in the paper bag. And I've just come out to look for it. The young man coughed for half a minute. The interval may have given him the courage to defend his own property. Also, he clutched his pungent prize greedily, and, with a show of spirit, faced his grim waylayer. No, he said huskily, I didn't find it on the stairs. It was given to me by Jack Bevens, on the top floor. If you don't believe it, ask him. I'll wait until you do. I know about Bevens, said Hetty, sourly. He writes books and things up there for the paper and rags man. We can hear the postman guy him all over the house when he brings them thick envelopes back. Say, do you live in the Vallambrosa? I do not, said the young man. I come to see Beaven sometimes. He's my friend. I live two blocks west. What are you going to do with the onion, begging your pardon, said Hetty. I'm going to eat it. Raw? Yes, as soon as I get home. Haven't you got anything else to eat with it? The young man considered briefly. No, he confessed. There's not another scrap of anything in my diggings to eat. I think old Jack is pretty hard up for grub in his shack, too. He hated to give up the onion, but I worried him into parting with it. Man, said Hetty, fixing him with her world sapient eyes, and laying a bony but impressive finger on his sleeve, you've known trouble, too, haven't you? Lots, said the onion owner, promptly. But this onion is my own property, honestly come by. If you will excuse me, I must be going. Listen, said Hetty, paling a little with anxiety. Raw onion is a mighty poor diet. And so is a beef stew without one. Now, if you're Jack Beaven's friend, I guess you're nearly right. There's a little lady, a friend of mine, in my room there at the end of the hall. Both of us are out of luck, and we had just potatoes and meat between us. They're stewing now. But it ain't got any soul. There's something lacking to it. There's certain things in life that are naturally intended to fit and belong together. One is pink cheesecloth and green roses, and one is ham and eggs, and one is Irish and trouble. And the other one is beef and potatoes with onions. And still another one is people who are up against it and other people in the same fix. The young man went into a protracted paroxysm of coughing. With one hand he hugged his onion to his bosom. No doubt, no doubt, said he, at length. But, as I said, I must be going, because. Hetty clutched his sleeve firmly. Don't be a dago, little brother. Don't eat raw onions. Chip it in toward the dinner and line yourself inside with the best stew you ever licked a spoon over. Must two ladies knock a young gentleman down and drag him inside for the honor of dining with them? No harm shall befall you, little brother. Loosen up and fall into line. The young man's pale face relaxed into a grin. Believe I'll go you, he said, brightening. If my onion is good as a credential, I'll accept the invitation gladly. It's good as that, but better as seasoning, said Hetty. You come and stand outside the door till I ask my lady friend if she has any objections. And don't run away with that letter of recommendation before I come out. Hetty went into her room and closed the door. The young man waited outside. Cecilia, kid, said the shop girl, oiling the sharp saw of her voice as well as she could, 
there's an onion outside. With a young man attached. I've asked him in to dinner. You ain't going to kick, are you? Oh, dear, said Cecilia, sitting up and patting her artistic hair. She cast a mournful glance at the ferryboat poster on the wall. Knit, said Hetty. It ain't him. You're up against real life now. I believe you said your hero friend had money and automobiles. This is a poor skeezix that's got nothing to eat but an onion. But he's easy-spoken and not a freshy. I imagine he's been a gentleman, he's so low down now. And we need the onion. Shall I bring him in? I'll guarantee his behavior. Hetty, dear, sighed Cecilia, I'm so hungry. What difference does it make whether he's a prince or a burglar? I don't care. Bring him in if he's got anything to eat with him. Hetty went back into the hall. The onion man was gone. Her heart missed a beat, and a gray look settled over her face except on her nose and cheekbones. And then the tides of life flowed in again, for she saw him leaning out of the front window at the other end of the hall. She hurried there. He was shouting to someone below. The noise of the street overpowered the sound of her footsteps. She looked down over his shoulder, saw whom he was speaking to, and heard his words. He pulled himself in from the windowsill and saw her standing over him. Hetty's eyes bored into him like two steel gimlets. Don't lie to me, she said, calmly. What were you going to do with that onion? The young man suppressed a cough and faced her resolutely. His manner was that of one who had been bearded sufficiently. I was going to eat it, said he, with emphatic slowness, just as I told you before. And you have nothing else to eat at home? Not a thing. What kind of work do you do? I am not working at anything just now. Then why, said Hetty, with her voice set on its sharpest edge, do you lean out of windows and give orders to chauffeurs in green automobiles in the street below? The young man flushed, and his dull eyes began to sparkle. Because, madam, said he, in Achelorando tones, I pay the chauffeur's wages and I own the automobile, and also this onion, this onion, madam. He flourished the onion within an inch of Hetty's nose. The shop lady did not retreat a hair's breadth. Then why do you eat onions, she said, with biting contempt, and nothing else. I never said I did, retorted the young man, heatedly. I said I had nothing else to eat where I live. I am not a delicatessen storekeeper. Then why, pursued Hetty, inflexibly, were you going to eat a raw onion? My mother, said the young man, always made me eat one for a cold. Pardon my referring to a physical infirmity. But you may have noticed that I have a very, very severe cold. I was going to eat the onion and go to bed. I wonder why I am standing here and apologizing to you for it. How did you catch this cold? went on Hetty, suspiciously. The young man seemed to have arrived at some extreme height of feeling. There were two modes of descent open to him, a burst of rage or a surrender to the ridiculous. He chose wisely, and the empty hall echoed his hoarse laughter. You're a dandy, said he. And I don't blame you for being careful. I don't mind telling you. I got wet. I was on a North River ferry a few days ago when a girl jumped overboard. Of course, I. Hetty extended her hand, interrupting his story. Give me the onion, she said. The young man set his jaw a trifle harder. Give me the onion, she repeated. He grinned, and laid it in her hand. Then Hetty's infrequent, grim, melancholy smile showed itself. She took the young man's arm and pointed with her other hand to the door of her room. Little brother, she said, go in there. The little fool you fished out of the river is there waiting for you. Go on in. I'll give you three minutes before I come. Potatoes is in there, waiting. Go on in, onions. After he had tapped at the door and entered, Hetty began to peel and wash the onion at the sink. She gave a gray look at the gray roofs outside, and the smile on her face vanished by little jerks and twitches. But it's us, she said, 
grimly, to herself, it's us that furnished the beef. Thimble, thimble. These are the directions for finding the office of Carteret and Carteret, mill supplies, and leather belting. You follow the Broadway trail down until you pass the cross-down line. The bread line, and the dead line, and come to the big canyons of the Money Grubber tribe. Then you turn to the left, to the right, dodge a pushcart and the tongue of a two-ton four-horse dray and hop, skip, and jump to a granite ledge on the side of a twenty-one-story synthetic mountain of stone and iron. In the twelfth story is the office of Carteret and Carteret. The factory where they make the mill supplies and leather belting is in Brooklyn. Those commodities, to say nothing of Brooklyn, not being of interest to you, let us hold the incidents within the confines of a one-act, one-scene play. Thereby lessening the toil of the reader and the expenditure of the publisher. So, if you have the courage to face four pages of type and Carteret and Carteret office boy, Percival. You shall sit on a varnished chair in the inner office and peep at the little comedy of the old nigger man, the hunting case watch. And the open-faced question, mostly borrowed from the late Mr. Frank Stockton, as you will conclude. First, biography, but paired to the quick, must intervene. I am for the inverted sugar-coated quinine pill, the bitter on the outside. The Carterets were, or was, Columbia College professors please rule, an old Virginia family. Long time ago the gentlemen of the family had worn lace ruffles and carried tinless foils and owned plantations and had slaves to burn. But the war had greatly reduced their holdings. Of course you can perceive at once that this flavor has been shoplifted from Mr. F. Hopkinson Smith, in spite of the DT after Carter. Well, anyhow. In digging up the Carteret history I shall not take you farther back than the year 1620. The two original American Carterets came over in that year, but by different means of transportation. One brother, named John, came in the Mayflower and became a pilgrim father. You've seen his picture on the covers of the Thanksgiving magazines, hunting turkeys in the deep snow with a blunderbuss. Blanford Carteret, the other brother, crossed the pond in his own brigantine, landed on the Virginia coast, and became an FFV John became distinguished for piety and shrewdness in business. Blanford for his pride, juleps, marksmanship, and vast slave-cultivated plantations. Then came the Civil War. I must condense this historical interpolation. Stonewall Jackson was shot. Lee surrendered, Grant toured the world, cotton went to nine cents, Old Crow whiskey and Jim Crow cars were invented. The 79th Massachusetts Volunteers returned to the 97th Alabama Zouaves the battle flag of Lundy's Lane which they bought at a second-hand store in Chelsea. Kept by a man named Skskinski. Georgia sent the president a 60-pound watermelon, and that brings us up to the time when the story begins. My! But that was sparring for an opening. I really must brush up on my Aristotle. The Yankee Carterets went into business in New York long before the war. Their house, as far as leather belting and mill supplies was concerned, was as musty and arrogant and solid as one of those old East India tea importing concerns that you read about in Dickens. There were some rumors of a war behind its counters, but not enough to affect the business. During and after the war, Blanford Carteret, FFV lost his plantations, juleps, marksmanship, and life. He bequeathed little more than his pride to his surviving family. So it came to pass that Blanford Carteret, the fifth, aged fifteen, was invited by the Leather and Mill Supplies branch of that name to come north and learn business instead of hunting foxes and boasting of the glory of his fathers on the reduced acres of his impoverished family. The boy jumped at the chance, and, at the age of twenty-five, sat in the office of the firm equal partner with John, the fifth, of the Blunderbuss and Turkey branch. Here the story begins again. The young men were about the same age, smooth of face, alert, easy of manner, and with an air that promised mental and physical quickness. They were razored, blue-surged, straw-hatted, and pearl-stick-pinned like other young New Yorkers who might be millionaires or bill clerks. One afternoon at four o'clock, in the private office of the firm, 
Blanford Carteret opened a letter that a clerk had just brought to his desk. After reading it, he chuckled audibly for nearly a minute. John looked around from his desk inquiringly. It's from mother, said Blanford. I'll read you the funny part of it. She tells me all the neighborhood news first, of course, and then cautions me against getting my feet wet and musical comedies. After that come vital statistics about calves and pigs and an estimate of the wheat crop. And now I'll quote some. And what do you think? Old Uncle Jake, who was 76 last Wednesday, must go traveling. Nothing would do but he must go to New York and see his young Marster Blandford. Old as he is, he has a deal of common sense, so I've let him go. I couldn't refuse him, he seemed to have concentrated all his hopes and desires into this one adventure into the wide world. You know he was born on the plantation, and has never been ten miles away from it in his life. And he was your father's body servant during the war, and has been always a faithful vassal and servant of the family. He has often seen the gold watch, the watch that was your father's and your father's father's. I told him it was to be yours, and he begged me to allow him to take it to you and to put it into your hands himself. So he has it, carefully enclosed in a buckskin case, and is bringing it to you with all the pride and importance of a king's messenger. I gave him money for the round trip and for a two-week stay in the city. I wish you would see to it that he gets comfortable quarters, Jake won't need much looking after, he's able to take care of himself. But I have read in the papers that African bishops and colored potentates generally have much trouble in obtaining food and lodging in the Yankee metropolis. That may be all right. But I don't see why the best hotel there shouldn't take Jake in. Still, I suppose it's a rule. I gave him full directions about finding you, and packed his valise myself. You won't have to bother with him, but I do hope you'll see that he is made comfortable. Take the watch that he brings you, it's almost a decoration. It has been worn by true carterets, and there isn't a stain upon it nor a false movement of the wheels. Bringing it to you is the crowning joy of old Jake's life. I wanted him to have that little outing and that happiness before it is too late. You have often heard us talk about how Jake, pretty badly wounded himself, crawled through the reddened grass at Chancellorsville to where your father lay with the bullet in his dear heart and took the watch from his pocket to keep it from the yanks. So, my son, when the old man comes consider him as a frail but worthy messenger from the old-time life and home. You have been so long away from home and so long among the people that we have always regarded as aliens that I'm not sure that Jake will know you when he sees you. But Jake has a keen perception, and I rather believe that he will know a Virginia Carteret at sight. I can't conceive that even ten years in Yankee land could change a boy of mine. Anyhow, I'm sure you will know Jake. I put eighteen collars in his valise. If he should have to buy others, he wears a number fifteen and a half. Please see that he gets the right ones. He will be no trouble to you at all. If you are not too busy, I'd like for you to find him a place to board where they have white meal cornbread, and try to keep him from taking his shoes off in your office or on the street. His right foot swells a little, and he likes to be comfortable. If you can spare the time, count his handkerchiefs when they come back from the wash. I bought him a dozen new ones before he left. He should be there about the time this letter reaches you. I told him to go straight to your office when he arrives. As soon as Blanford had finished the reading of this, something happened, as there should happen in stories and must happen on the stage. Percival, the office boy, with his air of despising the world's output of mill supplies and leather belting, came in to announce that a colored gentleman was outside to see Mr. Blanford Carteret. Bring him in, said Blanford, rising. John Carteret swung around in his chair and said to Percival, ask him to wait a few minutes outside. We'll let you know when to bring him in. Then he turned to his cousin with one of those broad, slow smiles that was an inheritance of all the Carterets, and said. Bland. I've always had a consuming curiosity to understand the differences that you haughty Southerners believe to exist between, you all, and the people of the North. Of course, 
I know that you consider yourselves made out of finer clay and look upon Adam as only a collateral branch of your ancestry, but I don't know why. I never could understand the differences between us. Well, John, said Blandford, laughing, what you don't understand about it is just the difference, of course. I suppose it was the feudal way in which we live that gave us our lordly baronial airs and feeling of superiority. But you are not feudal, now, went on John. Since we licked you and stole your cotton and mules you've had to go to work just as we damn Yankees, as you call us, have always been doing. And you're just as proud and exclusive and upper-classy as you were before the war. So it wasn't your money that caused it. Maybe it was the climate, said Blandford, lightly, or maybe our negroes spoiled us. I'll call old Jake in, now. I'll be glad to see the old villain again. Wait just a moment, said John. I've got a little theory I want to test. You and I are pretty much alike in our general appearance. Old Jake hasn't seen you since you were fifteen. Let's have him in and play fair and see which of us gets the watch. The old darky surely ought to be able to pick out his young Marster without any trouble. The alleged aristocratic superiority of a Reb ought to be visible to him at once. He couldn't make the mistake of handing over the timepiece to a Yankee, of course. The loser buys the dinner this evening and two dozen fifteen and a half collars for Jake. Is it a go? Blandford agreed heartily. Percival was summoned, and told to usher the colored gentleman in. Uncle Jake stepped inside the private office cautiously. He was a little old man, as black as soot, wrinkled and bald except for a fringe of white wool, cut decorously short, that ran over his ears and around his head. There was nothing of the stage uncle about him, his black suit nearly fitted him, his shoes shone, and his straw hat was banded with a gaudy ribbon. In his right hand he carried something carefully concealed by his closed fingers. Uncle Jake stopped a few steps from the door. Two young men sat in their revolving desk chairs ten feet apart and looked at him in friendly silence. His gaze slowly shifted many times from one to the other. He felt sure that he was in the presence of one, at least, of the revered family among whose fortunes his life had begun and was to end. One had the pleasing but haughty Carteret air. The other had the unmistakable straight, long family nose. Both had the keen black eyes, horizontal brows, and thin, smiling lips that had distinguished both the Carteret of the Mayflower and him of the Brigantine. Old Jake had thought that he could have picked out his young master instantly from a thousand northerners, but he found himself in difficulties. The best he could do was to use strategy. Howdy, Moss Blanford, howdy, Sue, he said, looking midway between the two young men. Howdy, Uncle Jake, they both answered pleasantly and in unison. Sit down. Have you brought the watch? Uncle Jake chose a hard-bottom chair at a respectful distance, sat on the edge of it, and laid his hat carefully on the floor. The watch in its buckskin case he gripped tightly. He had not risked his life on the battlefield to rescue that watch from his old master's foes to hand it over again to the enemy without a struggle. Yes, Sue, I got it in my hand, Sue. I'm gwine give it to you right away in just a minute. Old Missus told me to put it in young Moss Blandford's hand and tell him to wear it for the family pride and honor. It was a mighty longsome trip for an old nigger man to make, ten thousand miles, it must be, back to old Virginia, Sue. You've growed mightily, young Mars Tur. I wouldn't have recognized you but for yo powerful resemblance to old Mars Tur. With admirable diplomacy the old man kept his eyes roaming in the space between the two men. His words might have been addressed to either. Though neither wicked nor perverse, he was seeking for a sign. Blandford and John exchanged winks. I reckon you done got you ma's letter, went on Uncle Jake. She said she was gwine to write to you about my comin' along up this er way. Yes, yes, Uncle Jake, said John briskly. My cousin and I have just been notified to expect you. We are both Carterets, you know. Although one of us, said Blandford, was born and raised in the North. So if you will hand over the watch, said John. 
My cousin and I, said Blandford. We'll then see to it, said John. That comfortable quarters are found for you, said Blandford. With creditable ingenuity, old Jake set up a cackling, high-pitched, protracted laugh. He beat his knee, picked up his hat and bent the brim in an apparent paroxysm of humorous appreciation. The seizure afforded him a mask behind which he could roll his eyes impartially between, above, and beyond his two tormentors. I sees what, he chuckled, after a while. You Jen Lemon is trying to have fun with the po' old nigger. But you can't fool old Jake. I knowed you, Moss Blandford, the minute I sot eyes on you. You was a poor, skimpy little boy no mo than about F. O. T. when you left home to come no th, but I knowed you the minute I sot eyes on you. You is the motel image of old Mars Tur. The other Jen Lehman resembles you mightily, Sue, but you can't fool old Jake on a member of the old Virginia family. No, Sue. At exactly the same time both Carteret smiled and extended a hand for the watch. Uncle Jake's wrinkled, black face lost the expression of amusement to which he had vainly twisted it. He knew that he was being teased, and that it made little real difference, as far as its safety went, into which of those outstretched hands he placed the family treasure. But it seemed to him that not only his own pride and loyalty but much of the Virginia Carteret's was at stake. He had heard down south during the war about that other branch of the family that lived in the north and fought on the other side, and it had always grieved him. He had followed his old master's fortunes from stately luxury through war to almost poverty. And now, with the last relic and reminder of him, blessed by old missus, and entrusted implicitly to his care. He had come ten thousand miles, as it seemed, to deliver it into the hands of the one who was to wear it and wind it and cherish it and listen to it tick off the unsullied hours that marked the lives of the Carterets, of Virginia. His experience and conception of the Yankees had been an impression of tyrants, low down, common trash, in blue, laying waste with fire and sword. He had seen the smoke of many burning homesteads almost as grand as Carteret Hall ascending to the drowsy southern skies. And now he was face to face with one of them, and he could not distinguish him from his young Marster, whom he had come to find and bestow upon him the emblem of his kingship, even as the arm, clothed in white samite. Mystic, wonderful, laid Excalibur in the right hand of Arthur. He saw before him two young men, easy, kind, courteous, welcoming, either of whom might have been the one he sought. Troubled, bewildered, sorely grieved at his weakness of judgment, old Jake abandoned his loyal subterfuges. His right hand sweated against the buckskin cover of the watch. He was deeply humiliated and chastened. Seriously, now, his prominent, yellow-white eyes closely scanned the two young men. At the end of his scrutiny he was conscious of but one difference between them. One wore a narrow black tie with a white pearl stickpin. The other's, four in hand, was a narrow blue one pinned with a black pearl. And then, to old Jake's relief, there came a sudden distraction. Drama knocked at the door with imperious knuckles, and forced comedy to the wings, and Drama peeped with a smiling but set face over the footlights. Percival, the hater of mill supplies, brought in a card, which he handed, with the manner of one bearing a cartel, to blue tie. Olivia de Ormond, read blue tie from the card. He looked inquiringly at his cousin. Why not have her in, said black tie, and bring matters to a conclusion. Uncle Jake, said one of the young men, would you mind taking that chair over there in the corner for a while? A lady is coming in, on some business. We'll take up your case afterward. The lady whom Percival ushered in was young and petulantly, decidedly, freshly, consciously, and intentionally pretty. She was dressed with such expensive plainness that she made you consider lace and ruffles as mere tatters and rags. But one great ostrich plume that she wore would have marked her anywhere in the army of beauty as the wearer of the merry helmet of Navarre. Miss de Ormond accepted the swivel chair at Blue Tie's desk. Then the gentleman drew leather upholstered seats conveniently near, and spoke of the weather. Yes, said she, I noticed it was warmer. 
but I mustn't take up too much of your time during business hours. That is, she continued, unless we talk business. She addressed her words to Blue Tie, with a charming smile. Very well, said he. You don't mind my cousin being present, do you? We are generally rather confidential with each other, especially in business matters. Oh no, caroled Miss Dormond. I'd rather he did here. He knows all about it, anyhow. In fact, he's quite a material witness because he was present when you, when it happened. I thought you might want to talk things over before, well, before any action is taken, as I believe the lawyers say. Have you anything in the way of a proposition to make? asked Black Tie. Miss de Ormond looked reflectively at the neat toe of one of her dull kid pumps. I had a proposal made to me, she said. If the proposal sticks it cuts out the proposition. Let's have that settled first. Well, as far as, began Blue Tie. Excuse me, cousin, interrupted Black Tie, if you don't mind my cutting in. And then he turned, with a good-natured air, toward the lady. Now, let's recapitulate a bit, he said cheerfully. All three of us, besides other mutual acquaintances, have been out on a good many larks together. I'm afraid I'll have to call the birds by another name, said Miss Dormond. All right, responded Black Tie, with unimpaired cheerfulness, suppose we say, squabs, when we talk about the proposal and larks, when we discuss the proposition. You have a quick mind, Miss Dormond. Two months ago some half-dozen of us went in a motorcar for a day's run into the country. We stopped at a roadhouse for dinner. My cousin proposed marriage to you then and there. He was influenced to do so, of course, by the beauty and charm which no one can deny that you possess. I wish I had you for a press agent, Mr. Carteret, said the beauty, with a dazzling smile. You are on the stage, Miss de Ormond, went on black tie. You have had, doubtless, many admirers, and perhaps other proposals. You must remember, too, that we were a party of merrymakers on that occasion. There were a good many corks pulled. That the proposal of marriage was made to you by my cousin we cannot deny. But hasn't it been your experience that, by common consent, such things lose their seriousness when viewed in the next day's sunlight? Isn't there something of a code among good sports? I use the word in its best sense, that wipes out each day the follies of the evening previous? Oh yes, said Miss Dormond. I know that very well. And I've always played up to it. But as you seem to be conducting the case, with the silent consent of the defendant, I'll tell you something more. I've got letters from him repeating the proposal. And they're signed, too. I understand, said Black Tie gravely. What's your price for the letters? I'm not a cheap one, said Miss Dormond. But I had decided to make you a rate. You both belong to a swell family. Well, if I am on the stage nobody can say a word against me truthfully. And the money is only a secondary consideration. It isn't the money I was after. I, I believed him, and, and I liked him. She cast a soft, entrancing glance at Blue Tie from under her long eyelashes. And the price? Went on Black Tie, inexorably. Ten thousand dollars, said the lady, sweetly. Or. Or the fulfillment of the engagement to marry. I think it is time, interrupted Blue Tie, for me to be allowed to say a word or two. You and I, cousin, belong to a family that has held its head pretty high. You have been brought up in a section of the country very different from the one where our branch of the family lived. Yet both of us are Carterets, even if some of our ways and theories differ. You remember, it is a tradition of the family, that no Carteret ever failed in chivalry to a lady or failed to keep his word when it was given. Then Blue Tie, with frank decision showing on his countenance, turned to Miss Dormond. Olivia, said he, on what date will you marry me? Before she could answer, Black Tie again interposed. It is a long journey, said he, from Plymouth Rock to Norfolk Bay. Between the two points we find the changes that nearly three centuries have brought. 
In that time the old order has changed. We no longer burn witches or torture slaves. And today we neither spread our cloaks on the mud for ladies to walk over nor treat them to the ducking stool. It is the age of common sense, adjustment, and proportion. All of us, ladies, gentlemen, women, men, northerners, southerners, lords, caitiffs, actors, hardware drummers, senators, hot carriers, and politicians, are coming to a better understanding. Chivalry is one of our words that changes its meaning every day. Family pride is a thing of many constructions, it may show itself by maintaining a moth-eaten arrogance in a cobwebbed colonial mansion or by the prompt paying of one's debts. Now, I suppose you've had enough of my monologue. I've learned something of business and a little of life. And I somehow believe, cousin, that our great-great-grandfathers, the original Carterets, would endorse my view of this matter. Black Tie wheeled around to his desk, wrote in a checkbook and tore out the check, the sharp rasp of the perforated leaf making the only sound in the room. He laid the check within easy reach of Miss de Ormond's hand. Business is business, said he. We live in a business age. There is my personal check for ten thousand dollars. What do you say, Miss de Ormond, will it be orange blossoms or cash? Miss de Ormond picked up the cheek carelessly, folded it indifferently, and stuffed it into her glove. Oh, this'll do, she said, calmly. I just thought I'd call and put it up to you. I guess you people are all right. But a girl has feelings, you know. I've heard one of you was a southerner, I wonder which one of you it is. She arose, smiled sweetly, and walked to the door. There, with a flash of white teeth and a dip of the heavy plume, she disappeared. Both of the cousins had forgotten Uncle Jake for the time. But now they heard the shuffling of his shoes as he came across the rug toward them from his seat in the corner. Young Marster, he said, take yo, watch. And without hesitation he laid the ancient timepiece in the hand of its rightful owner. Helping the other fellow. But can them that helps others help themselves? Mulvaney. This is the story that William Trotter told me on the beach at Aguas Frescas while I waited for the gig of the captain of the fruit steamer Andador which was to take me abroad. Reluctantly I was leaving the land of always afternoon. William was remaining, and he favored me with a condensed oral autobiography as we sat on the sands in the shade cast by the Bodega Nacional. As usual, I became aware that the man from Bombay had already written the story. But as he had compressed it to an eight-word sentence, I have become an expansionist, and have quoted his phrase above, with apologies to him and best regards to Terence. Chapter 2 Don't you ever have a desire to go back to the land of derby hats and starched collars? I asked him. You seem to be a handyman and a man of action, I continued, and I am sure I could find you a comfortable job somewhere in the States. Ragged, shiftless, barefooted, a confirmed eater of the lotus, William Trotter had pleased me much, and I hated to see him gobbled up by the tropics. I've no doubt you could, he said, idly splitting the bark from a section of sugarcane. I've no doubt you could do much for me. If every man could do as much for himself as he can for others, every country in the world would be holding millenniums instead of centennials. There seemed to be pabulum in W. T. S. words. And then another idea came to me. I had a brother in Chicopee Falls who owned manufactories, cotton, or sugar, or AA sheetings, or something in the commercial line. He was vulgarly rich, and therefore reverenced art. The artistic temperament of the family was monopolized at my birth. I knew that Brother James would honor my slightest wish. I would demand from him a position in cotton, sugar, or sheetings for William Trotter, something, say, at two hundred a month or thereabouts. I confided my beliefs and made my large propositions to William. He had pleased me much, and he was ragged. While we were talking, there was a sound of firing guns, four or five, rattlingly, as if by a squad. The cheerful noise came from the direction of the Qartel, which is a kind of makeshift barracks for the soldiers of the Republic. Hear that, said William Trotter. Let me tell you about it. 
A year ago I landed on this coast with one solitary dollar. I have the same sum in my pocket today. I was second cook on a tramp fruiter. And they marooned me here early one morning, without benefit of clergy, just because I poulticed the face of the first mate with cheese omelette at dinner. The fellow had kicked because I'd put horseradish in it instead of cheese. When they threw me out of the yawl into three feet of surf, I waded ashore and sat down under a palm tree. By and by a fine-looking white man with a red face and white clothes, genteel as possible, but somewhat under the influence, came and sat down beside me. I had noticed there was a kind of a village back of the beach, and enough scenery to outfit a dozen moving picture shows. But I thought, of course, it was a cannibal suburb, and I was wondering whether I was to be served with carrots or mushrooms. And, as I say, this dressed-up man sits beside me, and we become friends in the space of a minute or two. For an hour we talked, and he told me all about it. It seems that he was a man of parts, conscientiousness, and plausibility, besides being educated and a wreck to his appetites. He told me all about it. Colleges had turned him out, and distilleries had taken him in. Did I tell you his name? It was Clifford Wainwright. I didn't exactly catch the cause of his being cast away on that particular stretch of South America, but I reckon it was his own business. I asked him if he'd ever been second cook on a tramp fruiter, and he said no, so that concluded my line of surmises. But he talked like the encyclopedia from uh, Berlin to Trilo, Zyria. And he carried a watch, a silver arrangement with works, and up to date within twenty-four hours, anyhow. I'm pleased to have met you, says Wainwright. I'm a devotee to the great Joss Booz. But my ruminating facilities are unrepaired, says he, or words to that effect. And I hate, says he, to see fools trying to run the world. I never touch a drop, says I, and there are many kinds of fools, and the world runs on its own apex, according to science, with no meddling from me. I was referring, says he, to the president of this republic. His country is in a desperate condition. Its treasury is empty, it's on the verge of war with Nicamala, and if it wasn't for the hot weather the people would be starting revolutions in every town. Here is a nation, goes on Wainwright, on the brink of destruction. A man of intelligence could rescue it from its impending doom in one day by issuing the necessary edicts and orders. President Gomez knows nothing of statesmanship or policy. Do you know Adam Smith? Let me see, says I. There was a one-eared man named Smith in Fort Worth, Texas, but I think his first name was. I am referring to the political economist, says Wainwright. Snother Smith, then, says I. The one I speak of never was arrested. So Wainwright boils some more with indignation at the insensibility of people who are not corpulent to fill public positions. And then he tells me he is going out to the president's summer palace, which is four miles from Aguas Frescas, to instruct him in the art of running steam-heated republics. Come along with me, Trotter, says he, and I'll show you what brains can do. Anything in it? I asks. The satisfaction, says he, of redeeming a country of 200,000 population from ruin back to prosperity and peace. Great, says I, I'll go with you. I'd prefer to eat a live broiled lobster just now, but give me liberty as second choice if I can't be in at the death. Wainwright and me permeates through the town, and he halts at a rum dispensary. Have you any money, he asks. I have, says I, fishing out my silver dollar. I always go about with adequate sums of money. Then we'll drink, says Wainwright. Not me, says I, and not any demon rum or any of its ramifications for mine. It's one of my non-weaknesses. It's my failing, says he. What's your particular soft point? Industry, says I, promptly. I'm hard-working, diligent, industrious, and energetic. My dear Mr. Trotter, says he, Surely I've known you long enough to tell you you are a liar. Every man must have his own particular weakness, and his own particular strength in other things. Now, you will buy me a drink of rum, and we will call on President Gomez. 
Chapter 3 Well, sir, Trotter went on, we walks the four miles out, through a virgin conservatory of palms and ferns and other roof garden products, to the President's summer White House. It was blue, and reminded you of what you see on the stage in the third act, which they describe as, same as the first, on the programs. There was more than fifty people waiting outside the iron fence that surrounded the house and grounds. There was generals and agitators and ipperns in gold-laced uniforms, and citizens in diamonds and Panama hats, all waiting to get an audience with the royal five-card draw. And in a kind of a summer house in front of the mansion we could see a burnt sienna man eating breakfast out of gold dishes and taking his time. I judged that the crowd outside had come out for their morning orders and requests, and was afraid to intrude. But see, Wainwright wasn't. The gate was open, and he walked inside and up to the president's table as confident as a man who knows the head waiter in a fifteen-cent restaurant. And I went with him, because I had only seventy-five cents, and there was nothing else to do. The Gomez man rises from his chair, and looks, colored man as he was, like he was about to call out for corporal of the guard, post number one. But Wainwright says some phrases to him in a peculiarly lubricating manner. And the first thing you know we was all three of us seated at the table, with coffee and rolls and iguana cutlets coming as fast as about ninety peons could rustle, m. And then Wainwright begins to talk, but the president interrupts him. You Yankees, says he, polite, assuredly take the cake for assurance, I assure you, or words to that effect. He spoke English better than you or me. You've had a long walk, says he, but it's nicer in the cool morning to walk than to ride. May I suggest some refreshments, says he. Rum, says Wainwright. Gimme a cigar, says I. Well, sir, the two talked an hour, keeping the generals and equities all in their good uniforms waiting outside the fence. And while I smoked, Silent, I listened to Clifford Wainwright making a solid republic out of the wreck of one. I didn't follow his arguments with any special collocation of international intelligibility, but he had Mr. Gomez's attention glued and riveted. He takes out a pencil and marks the white linen tablecloth all over with figures and estimates and deductions. He speaks more or less disrespectfully of import and export duties and custom house receipts and taxes and treaties and budgets and concessions and such truck that politics and government require. And when he gets through the Gomez man hops up and shakes his hand and says he saved the country and the people. You shall be rewarded, says the president. Might I suggest another, rum? Says Wainwright. Cigar for me, darker brand, says I. Well, sir, the president sent me and Wainwright back to the town in a Victoria hitched to two flea-bitten selling platers, but the best the country afforded. I found out afterward that Wainwright was a regular beachcomber, the smartest man on the whole coast, but kept down by rum. I liked him. One day I inveigled him into a walk out a couple of miles from the village, where there was an old grass hut on the bank of a little river. While he was sitting on the grass, talking beautiful of the wisdom of the world that he had learned in books. I took hold of him easy and tied his hands and feet together with leather thongs that I had in my pocket. Lie still, says I, and meditate on the exigencies and irregularities of life till I get back. I went to a shack in Aguas Frescas where a mighty wise girl named Timodia Carrizo lived with her mother. The girl was just about as nice as you ever saw. In the States she would have been called a brunette but she was better than a brunette, I should say she was what you might term an ecru shade. I knew her pretty well. I told her about my friend Wainwright. She gave me a double handful of bark, calicea, I think it was, and some more herbs that I was to mix with it, and told me what to do. I was to make tea of it and give it to him, and keep him from rum for a certain time. And for two weeks I did it. You know, I liked Wainwright. Both of us was broke. But Timodia sent us goat meat and plantains and tortillas every day, and at last I got the curse of drink lifted from Clifford Wainwright. He lost his taste for it. And in the cool of the evening him and me would sit on the roof of Timodia's mother's hut, eating harmless truck-like coffee and rice and stewed crabs, and playing the accordion. 
About that time President Gomez found out that the advice of C. Wainwright was the stuff he had been looking for. The country was pulling out of debt, and the treasury had enough boodle in it for him to amuse himself occasionally with the night latch. The people were beginning to take their two-hour siestas again every day, which was the surest sign of prosperity. So down from the regular capital he sends for Clifford Wainwright and makes him his private secretary at twenty thousand Peru dollars a year. Yes, sir, so much. Wainwright was on the water wagon, thanks to me and Timodia, and he was soon in clover with the government gang. Don't forget what done it, Calasia bark with the mother herbs mixed, make a tea of it, and give a cupful every two hours. Try it yourself. It takes away the desire. As I said, a man can do a lot more for another party than he can for himself. Wainwright, with his brains, got a whole country out of trouble and on its feet, but what could he do for himself? And without any special brains, but with some nerve and common sense, I put him on his feet because I never had the weakness that he did, nothing but a cigar for mine, thanks. Anne. Trotter paused. I looked at his tattered clothes and at his deeply sunburnt, hard, thoughtful face. Didn't Cartwright ever offer to do anything for you? I asked. Wainwright, corrected Trotter. Yes, he offered me some pretty good jobs. But I'd have had to leave Aguas Frescas, so I didn't take any of them up. Say, I didn't tell you much about that girl, Timodia. We rather hit it off together. She was as good as you find M anywhere, Spanish, mostly, with just a twist of lemon peel on top. What if they did live in a grass hut and went bare-armed? A month ago, went on Trotter, she went away. I don't know where to. But. You'd better come back to the States, I insisted. I can promise you positively that my brother will give you a position in cotton, sugar, or sheetings, I am not certain which. I think she went back with her mother, said Trotter, to the village in the mountains that they come from. Tell me, what would this job you speak of pay? Why, said I, hesitating over commerce, I should say fifty or a hundred dollars a month, maybe two hundred. Ain't it funny, said Trotter, digging his toes in the sand, what a chump a man is when it comes to paddling his own canoe? I don't know. Of course, I'm not making a living here. I'm on the bum. But, well, I wish you could have seen that Timodia. Every man has his own weak spot. The gig from the Andador was coming ashore to take out the captain, purser, and myself, the lone passenger. I'll guarantee, said I confidently, that my brother will pay you seventy-five dollars a month. All right, then, said William Trotter. I'll. But a soft voice called across the blazing sands. A girl, faintly lemon-tinted, stood in the calle reel and called. She was bare-armed, but what of that? It's her. Said William Trotter, looking. She's come back. I'm obliged, but I can't take the job. Thanks, just the same. Ain't it funny how we can't do nothing for ourselves, but we can do wonders for the other fellow? You was about to get me with your financial proposition but we've all got our weak points. Timotia's mine. And, say. Trotter had turned to leave, but he retraced the step or two that he had taken. I like to have left you without saying goodbye, said he. It kind of rattles you when they go away unexpected for a month and come back the same way. Shake hands. So long. Say, do you remember them gunshots we heard a while ago up at the Cuartel? Well, I knew what they was, but I didn't mention it. It was Clifford Wainwright being shot by a squad of soldiers against a stone wall for giving away secrets of state to that Nicamela Republic. Oh, yes, it was Rum that did it. He backslided and got his. I guess we all have our weak points, and can't do much toward helping ourselves. Mine's waiting for me. I'd have liked to have that job with your brother we've all got our weak points. So long. Chapter 4 A big black carib carried me on his back through the surf to the ship's boat. 
On the way the purser handed me a letter that he had brought for me at the last moment from the post office in Aguas Frescas. It was from my brother. He requested me to meet him at the Esti. Charles Hotel in New Orleans and accept a position with his house, in either cotton, sugar, or sheetings, and with $5,000 a year as my salary. When I arrived at the Crescent City I hurried away, far away from the St. Charles to a dim chamber garni in Bienville Street. And there, looking down from my attic window from time to time at the old, yellow, absinthe house across the street, I wrote this story to buy my bread and butter. Can them that helps others help themselves? Supply and Demand Finch keeps a hats clean by electricity while you wait establishment, 9 feet by 12, in 3rd Avenue. Once a customer, you are always his. I do not know his secret process, but every four days your hat needs to be cleaned again. Finch is a leathern, sallow, slow-footed man, between twenty and forty. You would say he had been brought up a bushel man in Essex Street. When business is slack he likes to talk, so I had my hat cleaned even oftener than it deserved, hoping Finch might let me into some of the secrets of the sweatshops. One afternoon I dropped in and found Finch alone. He began to anoint my headpiece to Panama with his mysterious fluid that attracted dust and dirt like a magnet. They say the Indians weave them underwater, said I, for a leader. Don't you believe it, said Finch. No Indian or white man could stay underwater that long. Say, do you pay much attention to politics? I see in the paper something about a law they've passed called, the law of supply and demand. I explained to him as well as I could that the reference was to a politico-economical law, and not to a legal statute. I didn't know, said Finch. I heard a good deal about it a year or so ago, but in a one-sided way. Yes, said I, political orators use it a great deal. In fact, they never give it a rest. I suppose you heard some of those cartel fellows spouting on the subject over here on the east side. I heard it from a king, said Finch, the white king of a tribe of Indians in South America. I was interested but not surprised. The big city is like a mother's knee to many who have strayed far and found the roads rough beneath their uncertain feet. At dusk they come home and sit upon the doorstep. I know a piano player in a cheap café who has shot lions in Africa, a bellboy who fought in the British army against the Zulus. An express driver whose left arm had been cracked like a lobster's claw for a stewpot of Patagonian cannibals when the boat of his rescuers hove in sight. So a hat cleaner who had been a friend of a king did not oppress me. A new band? asked Finch, with his dry, barren smile. Yes, said I, and half an inch wider. I had had a new band five days before. I meets a man one night, said Finch, beginning his story, a man brown as snuff, with money in every pocket, eating Schweinernuckel in Schlegels. That was two years ago, when I was a hosecart driver for number 98. His discourse runs to the subject of gold. He says that certain mountains in a country down south that he calls Guatemala is full of it. He says the Indians wash it out of the streams in plural quantities. Oh, Geronimo, says I, Indians. There's no Indians in the south, I tell him, except Elks, Maccabees, and the buyers for the fall dry goods trade. The Indians are all on the reservations, says I. I'm telling you this with reservations, says he. They ain't Buffalo Bill Indians, they're squattier and more pedigreed. They call, am Incas and Aspics, and they was old inhabitants when Mazuma was king of Mexico. They wash the gold out of the mountain streams, says the brown man, and fill quills with it. And then they empty, am into red jars till they are full. And then they pack it in buckskin sacks of one aroba each, an aroba is twenty-five pounds, and store it in a stone house, with an engraving of a idol with marcelled hair, playing a flute. Over the door. How do they work off this unearth increment? I asks. They don't, says the man. It's a case of, ill fares the land with a great deal of velocity where wealth accumulates and there ain't any reciprocity. After this man and me got through our conversation, 
which left him dry of information, I shook hands with him and told him I was sorry I couldn't believe him. And a month afterward I landed on the coast of this Guatemala with $1,300 that I had been saving up for five years. I thought I knew what Indians liked, and I fixed myself accordingly. I loaded down four pack mules with red woolen blankets, wrought iron pails, jeweled side combs for the ladies, glass necklaces, and safety razors. I hired a black mozo, who was supposed to be a mule driver and an interpreter too. It turned out that he could interpret mules all right, but he drove the English language much too hard. His name sounded like a Yale key when you push it in wrong side up, but I called him McClintock, which was close to the noise. Well, this gold village was forty miles up in the mountains, and it took us nine days to find it. But one afternoon McClintock led the other mules and myself over a rawhide bridge stretched across a precipice five thousand feet deep, it seemed to me. The hoofs of the beasts drummed on it just like before George M. Cohan makes his first entrance on the stage. This village was built of mud and stone, and had no streets. Some few yellow and brown persons popped their heads out of doors, looking about like Welsh rabbits with Worcester sauce on em. Out of the biggest house, that had a kind of a porch around it, steps a big white man, red as a beet in color, dressed in fine tan deerskin clothes, with a gold chain around his neck. Smoking a cigar. I've seen United States senators of his style of features and build, also head waiters and cops. He walks up and takes a look at us, while McClintock disembarks and begins to interpret to the lead mule while he smokes a cigarette. Hello, Batinsky, says the fine man to me. How did you get in the game? I didn't see you by any chips. Who gave you the keys of the city? I'm a poor traveler, says I, especially muleback. You'll excuse me. Do you run a hack line or only a bluff? Segregate yourself from your pseudo-equine quadruped, says he, and come inside. He raises a finger, and a villager runs up. This man will take care of your outfit, says he, and I'll take care of you. He leads me into the biggest house, and sets out the chairs and a kind of a drink the color of milk. It was the finest room I ever saw. The stone walls was hung all over with silk shawls, and there was red and yellow rugs on the floor, and jars of red pottery and angora goat skins. And enough bamboo furniture to misfurnish half a dozen seaside cottages. In the first place, says the man, you want to know who I am. I'm sole lessee and proprietor of this tribe of Indians. They call me the Grand Yakuma, which is to say king or main finger of the bunch. I've got more power here than a charged affair, a charge of dynamite, and a charge account at Tiffany's combined. In fact, I'm the big stick, with as many extra knots on it as there is on the record run of the Lusitania. Oh, I read the papers now and then, says he. Now, let's hear your entitlements, he goes on, and the meeting will be open. Well, says I, I am known as 1WD Finch. Occupation, Capitalist. Address, 541 East 32nd. New York, Chips in the Noble Grand. I know, says he, grinning. It ain't the first time you've seen it go down on the blotter. I can tell by the way you hand it out. Well, explain, capitalist. I tells this boss plain what I come for and how I come to came. Gold dust? Says he, looking as puzzled as a baby that's got a feather stuck on its molasses finger. That's funny. This ain't a gold mining country. And you invested all your capital on a stranger's story? Well, well. These Indians of mine, they are the last of the tribe of Pechis, are simple as children. They know nothing of the purchasing power of gold. I'm afraid you've been imposed on, says he. Maybe so, says I, but it sounded pretty straight to me. W. D., says the king, all of a sudden, I'll give you a square deal. It ain't often I get to talk to a white man, and I'll give you a show for your money. It may be these constituents of mine have a few grains of gold dust hid away in their clothes. Tomorrow you may get out these goods you've brought up and see if you can make any sales. Now, I'm going to introduce myself unofficially. 
My name is Shane, Patrick Shane. I own this tribe of Pechi Indians by right of conquest, single-handed and unafraid. I drifted up here four years ago, and won them by my size and complexion and nerve. I learned their language in six weeks, it's easy, you simply emit a string of consonants as long as your breath holds out and then point at what you're asking for. I conquered them spectacularly, goes on King Shane, and then I went at them with economical politics, law, sleight of hand, and a kind of New England ethics and parsimony. Every Sunday, or as near as I can guess at it, I preach to them in the council house, I'm the council, on the law of supply and demand. I praise supply and knock demand. I use the same text every time. You wouldn't think, W.D., says Shane, that I had poetry in me, would you? Well, says I, I wouldn't know whether to call it poetry or not. Tennyson, says Shane, furnishes the poetic gospel I preach. I always considered him the boss poet. Here's the way the text goes. For, not to admire, if a man could learn it, were more. Then to walk all day like a sultan of old in a garden of spice. You see, I teach M to cut out demand, that supply is the main thing. I teach M not to desire anything beyond their simplest needs. A little mutton, a little cocoa, and a little fruit brought up from the coast, that's all they want to make M happy. I've got M well trained. They make their own clothes and hats out of a vegetable fiber and straw, and they're a contented lot. It's a great thing, winds up Shane, to have made a people happy by the incultivation of such simple institutions. Well, the next day, with the king's permission, I has the McClintock open up a couple of sacks of my goods in the little plaza of the village. The Indians swarmed around by the hundred and looked the bargain counter over. I shook red blankets at M, flashed finger rings and ear bobs, tried pearl necklaces and side combs on the women, and a line of red hosiery on the men. Twas no use. They looked on like hungry graven images, but I never made a sale. I asked McClintock what was the trouble. Mac yawned three or four times, rolled a cigarette, made one or two confidential side remarks to a mule, and then condescended to inform me that the people had no money. Just then up strolls King Patrick, big and red and royal as usual, with the gold chain over his chest and his cigar in front of him. How's business, W. D., he asks. Fine, says I. It's a bargain day rush. I've got one more line of goods to offer before I shut up shop. I'll try them with safety razors. I've got two gross that I bought at a fire sale. Shane laughs till some kind of mameluke or private secretary he carries with him has to hold him up. Oh my sainted Aunt Jerusha, says he, ain't you one of the babes in the goods, W. D. Don't you know that no Indians ever shave? They pull out their whiskers instead. Well, says I, that's just what these razors would do for M, they wouldn't have any kick coming if they used M once. Shane went away, and I could hear him laughing a block, if there had been any block. Tell M, says I to McClintock, it ain't money I want, tell M I'll take gold dust. Tell M I'll allow M sixteen dollars an ounce for it in trade. That's what I'm out for, the dust. Mac interprets, and you'd have thought a squadron of cops had charged the crowd to disperse it. Every uncle's nephew and aunt's niece of them faded away inside of two minutes. At the royal palace that night me and the king talked it over. They've got the dust hit out somewhere, says I, or they wouldn't have been so sensitive about it. They haven't, says Shane. What's this gag you've got about gold? You been reading Edward Allan Poe? They ain't got any gold. They put it in quills, says I, and then they empty it in jars, and then into sacks of twenty-five pounds each. I got it straight. W. D., says Shane, laughing and chewing his cigar, I don't often see a white man, and I feel like putting you on. I don't think you'll get away from here alive, anyhow, so I'm going to tell you. Come over here. He draws aside a silk fiber curtain in a corner of the room and shows me a pile of buckskin sacks. Forty of M, says Shane. 
one aroba in each one. In round numbers, $220,000 worth of gold dust you see there. It's all mine. It belongs to the Grand Yakuma. They bring it all to me. $220,000, think of that, you glass bead peddler, says Shane, and all mine. Little good it does you, says I, contemptuously and hatefully. And so you are the government depository of this gang of moneyless moneymakers? Don't you pay enough interest on it to enable one of your depositors to buy an Augusta, Maine, Pullman carbon diamond worth $200 for $4.85? Listen, says Patrick Shane, with the sweat coming out on his brow. I'm confident with you, as you have, somehow, enlisted my regards. Did you ever, he says, feel the avoirdupois power of gold, not the troy weight of it, but the sixteen ounces to the pound force of it? Never, says I, I never take in any bad money. Shane drops down on the floor and throws his arms over the sacks of gold dust. I love it, says he. I want to feel the touch of it day and night. It's my pleasure in life. I come in this room, and I'm a king and a rich man. I'll be a millionaire in another year. The pile's getting bigger every month. I've got the whole tribe washing out the sands in the creeks. I'm the happiest man in the world, W.D. I just want to be near this gold, and know it's mine and it's increasing every day. Now, you know, says he, why my Indians wouldn't buy your goods. They can't. They bring all the dust to me. I'm their king. I've taught M not to desire or admire. You might as well shut up shop. I'll tell you what you are, says I. You're a plain, contemptible miser. You preach supply and you forget demand. Now, supply, I goes on, is never anything but supply. On the contrary, says I, demand is a much broader syllogism and assertion. Demand includes the rights of our women and children, and charity and friendship, and even a little begging on the street corners. They've both got to harmonize equally. And I've got a few things up my commercial sleeve yet, says I, that may jostle your preconceived ideas of politics and economy. The next morning I had McClintock bring up another mule load of goods to the plaza and open it up. The people gathered around the same as before. I got out the finest line of necklaces, bracelets, hair combs, and earrings that I carried, and had the women put them on. And then I played trumps. Out of my last pack I opened up a half gross of hand mirrors, with solid tinfoil backs, and passed M around among the ladies. That was the first introduction of looking glasses among the Pechi Indians. Shane walks by with his big laugh. Business looking up any? he asks. It's looking at itself right now, says I. By and by a kind of a murmur goes through the crowd. The women had looked into the magic crystal and seen that they were beautiful, and was confiding the secret to the men. The men seemed to be urging the lack of money and the hard times just before the election, but their excuses didn't go. Then was my time. I called McClintock away from an animated conversation with his mules and told him to do some interpreting. Tell M, says I, that gold dust will buy for them these befitting ornaments for kings and queens of the earth. Tell M the yellow sand they wash out of the waters for the high sanctified yakame and chop suey of the tribe will buy the precious jewels and charms that will make them beautiful and preserve and pickle them from evil spirits. Tell M the Pittsburgh banks are paying 4% interest on deposits by mail, while this get rich frequently custodian of the public funds ain't even paying attention. Keep telling M, Mac, says I, to let the gold dust family do their work. Talk to M like a born anti Bryanite, says I, remind M that Tom Watson's gone back to Georgia, says I. McClintock waves his hand affectionately at one of his mules, and then hurls a few stickfuls of minion type at the mob of shoppers. A gutta percha Indian man, with a lady hanging on his arm, with three strings of my fish scale jewelry in imitation marble beads around her neck. Stands up on a block of stone and makes a talk that sounds like a man shaking dice in a box to fill aces and sixes. He says, says McClintock, 
that the people not know that gold dust will buy their things. The women very mad. The Grand Yakuma tell them it no good but for keep to make bad spirits keep away. You can't keep bad spirits away from money, says I. They say, goes on McClintock, the Yakuma fool them. They raise plenty row. Going. Going, says I. Gold dust or cash takes the entire stock. The dust weighed before you, and taken at sixteen dollars the ounce, the highest price on the Guatemala coast. Then the crowd disperses all of a sudden, and I don't know what's up. Mac and me packs away the hand mirrors and jewelry they had handed back to us, and we had the mules back to the corral they had set apart for our garage. While we was there we hear great noises of shouting, and down across the plaza runs Patrick Shane, hotfoot, with his clothes ripped half off. And scratches on his face like a cat had fought him hard for every one of its lives. They're looting the treasury, W. D., he sings out. They're going to kill me and you, too. Unlimber a couple of mules at once. We'll have to make a getaway in a couple of minutes. They've found out, says I, the truth about the law of supply and demand. It's the women, mostly, says the king. And they used to admire me so. They hadn't seen looking glasses then, says I. They've got knives and hatchets, says Shane, hurry. Take that roan mule, says I, you and your law of supply. I'll ride the dun, for he's two knots per hour the faster. The roan has a stiff knee, but he may make it, says I. If you'd included reciprocity in your political platform I might have given you the dun, says I. Shane and McClintock and me mounted our mules and rode across the rawhide bridge just as the Pechies reached the other side and began firing stones and long knives at us. We cut the thongs that held up our end of the bridge and headed for the coast. A tall, bulky policeman came into Finch's shop at that moment and leaned an elbow on the showcase. Finch nodded at him friendly. I heard down at Casey's, said the cop, in rumbling, husky tones, that there was going to be a picnic of the hat cleaners union over at Bergen Beach, Sunday. Is that right? Sure, said Finch. There'll be a dandy time. Gimme five tickets, said the cop, throwing a five-dollar bill on the showcase. Why, said Finch, ain't you going it a little too? Go to H, said the cop, you got M to sell, ain't you? Somebody's got to buy M. Wish I could go along. I was glad to see Finch so well thought of in his neighborhood. And then in came a wee girl of seven, with dirty face and pure blue eyes and a smutched and insufficient dress. Mama says, she recited shrilly, that you must give me eighty cents for the grocer and nineteen for the milkman and five cents for me to buy hokey pokey with, but she didn't say that. The elf concluded, with a hopeful but honest grin. Finch shelled out the money, counting it twice, but I noticed that the total sum that the small girl received was one dollar and four cents. That's the right kind of a law, remarked Finch, as he carefully broke some of the stitches of my hatband so that it would assuredly come off within a few days, the law of supply and demand. But they've both got to work together. I'll bet, he went on, with his dry smile, she'll get jelly beans with that nickel, she likes them. What supply if there's no demand for it? Whatever became of the king? I asked, curiously. Oh, I might have told you, said Finch. That was Shane came in and bought the tickets. He came back with me, and he's on the force now. To him who waits. The hermit of the Hudson was hustling about his cave with unusual animation. The cave was on or in the top of a little spur of the Catskills that had strayed down to the river's edge, and, not having a ferry ticket, had to stop there. The Bijou Mountains were densely wooded and were infested by ferocious squirrels and woodpeckers that forever menaced the summer transients. Like a badly sewn strip of white braid, a macadamized road ran between the green skirt of the hills and the foamy lace of the river's edge. A dim path wound from the comfortable road up a rocky height to the hermit's cave. One mile upstream was the viewpoint in, to which summer folk from the city came. Leaving cool, electric-fanned apartments that they might be driven about in burning sunshine, 
shrieking, in gasoline launches, by spindle-legged madrids bearing the blankiest of shields. Train your lorgnette upon the hermit and let your eye receive the personal touch that shall endear you to the hero. A man of forty, judging him fairly, with long hair curling at the ends, dramatic eyes. And a forked brown beard like those that were imposed upon the West some years ago by self-appointed, divine healers, who succeeded the grasshopper crop. His outward vesture appeared to be kind of gunny sacking, cut and made into a garment that would have made the fortune of a London tailor. His long, well-shaped fingers, delicate nose, and poise of manner raised him high above the class of hermits who fear water and bury money in oyster cans in their caves in spots indicated by rude crosses chipped in the stone wall above. The hermit's home was not altogether a cave. The cave was an addition to the hermitage, which was a rude hut made of poles daubed with clay and covered with the best quality of rust-proof zinc roofing. In the house proper there were stone slabs for seats, a rustic bookcase made of unplanned poplar planks, and a table formed of a wooden slab laid across two upright pieces of granite, something between the furniture of a druid temple and that of a Broadway beefsteak dungeon. Hung against the walls were skins of wild animals purchased in the vicinity of 8th Street and University Place, New York. The rear of the cabin merged into the cave. There the hermit cooked his meals on a rude stone hearth. With infinite patience and an old axe he had chopped natural shelves in the rocky walls. On them stood his stores of flour, bacon, lard, talcum powder, kerosene, baking powder, soda mint tablets, pepper, salt, and olivo cremo emulsion for chaps and roughness of the hands and face. The hermit had hermit there for ten years. He was an asset of the viewpoint in. To its guests he was second in interest only to the mysterious echo in the haunted glen. And the lover's leap beat him only a few inches, flat-footed. He was known far, but not very wide, on account of the topography, as a scholar of brilliant intellect who had forsworn the world because he had been jilted in a love affair. Every Saturday night the viewpoint in sent to him surreptitiously a basket of provisions. He never left the immediate outskirts of his hermitage. Guests of the inn who visited him said his store of knowledge, wit, and scintillating philosophy were simply wonderful, you know. That summer the Viewpoint Inn was crowded with guests. So, on Saturday nights, there were extra cans of tomatoes, and sirloin steak, instead of, rounds, in the hermit's basket. Now you have the material allegations in the case. So, make way for romance. Evidently the hermit expected a visitor. He carefully combed his long hair and parted his apostolic beard. When the 98-cent alarm clock on a stone shelf announced the hour of five he picked up his gunny-sacking skirts, brushed them carefully, gathered an oaken staff, and strolled slowly into the thick woods that surrounded the hermitage. He had not long to wait. Up the faint pathway, slippery with its carpet of pine needles, toiled Beatrix, youngest and fairest of the famous Trenholm sisters. She was all in blue from hat to canvas pumps. Varying in tint from the shade of the tinkle of a bluebell at daybreak on a spring Saturday to the deep hue of a Monday morning at nine when the washerwoman has failed to show up. Beatrix dug her cerulean parasol deep into the pine needles and sighed. The hermit, on the QT, removed a grass burr from the ankle of one sandaled foot with the big toe of his other one. She blued, and almost starched and ironed him with her cobalt eyes. It must be so nice, she said in little, tremulous gasps, to be a hermit, and have ladies climb mountains to talk to you. The hermit folded his arms and leaned against a tree. Beatrix, with a sigh, settled down upon the mat of pine needles like a bluebird upon her nest. The hermit followed suit. Drawing his feet rather awkwardly under his gunny sacking. It must be nice to be a mountain, said he, with ponderous lightness, and have angels in blue climb up you instead of flying over you. Mama had neuralgia, said Beatrix, and went to bed, or I couldn't have come. It's dreadfully hot at that horrid old inn. But we hadn't the money to go anywhere else this summer. Last night, said the hermit, I climbed to the top of that big rock above us. 
I could see the lights of the inn and hear a strain or two of the music when the wind was right. I imagined you moving gracefully in the arms of others to the dreamy music of the waltz amid the fragrance of flowers. Think how lonely I must have been. The youngest, handsomest, and poorest of the famous Trenholm sisters sighed. You haven't quite hit it, she said, plaintively. I was moving gracefully at the arms of another. Mama had one of her periodical attacks of rheumatism in both elbows and shoulders, and I had to rub them for an hour with that horrid old liniment. I hope you didn't think that smelled like flowers. You know, there were some West Point boys and a yacht load of young men from the city at last evening's weekly dance. I've known Mama to sit by an open window for three hours with one half of her registering 85 degrees and the other half frostbitten, and never sneeze once. But just let a bunch of ineligibles come around where I am, and she'll begin to swell at the knuckles and shriek with pain. And I have to take her to her room and rub her arms. To see Mama dressed you'd be surprised to know the number of square inches of surface there are to her arms. I think it must be delightful to be a hermit. That, cassock, or gabardine, isn't it? That you wear is so becoming. Do you make it, or them, of course you must have changes, yourself. And what a blessed relief it must be to wear sandals instead of shoes. Think how we must suffer no matter how small I buy my shoes they always pinch my toes. Oh, why can't there be lady hermits, too? The beautifulest and most adolescent Trenholm sister extended two slender blue ankles that ended in two enormous blue silk bows that almost concealed two fairy oxfords. Also of one of the forty-seven shades of blue. The hermit, as if impelled by a kind of reflex telepathic action, drew his bare toes farther beneath his gunny sacking. I have heard about the romance of your life, said Miss Trenholm, softly. They have it printed on the back of the menu card at the inn. Was she very beautiful and charming? On the bills of fare, muttered the hermit, but what do I care for the world's babble? Yes, she was of the highest and grandest type. Then, he continued, then I thought the world could never contain another equal to her. So I forsook it and repaired to this mountain fastness to spend the remainder of my life alone, to devote and dedicate my remaining years to her memory. It's grand, said Miss Trenholm, absolutely grand. I think a hermit's life is the ideal one. No bill collectors calling, no dressing for dinner, how I'd like to be one. But there's no such luck for me. If I don't marry this season I honestly believe Mama will force me into settlement work or trimming hats. It isn't because I'm getting old or ugly. But we haven't enough money left to butt in at any of the swell places anymore. And I don't want to marry, unless it's somebody I like. That's why I'd like to be a hermit. Hermits don't ever marry, do they? Hundreds of them, said the hermit, when they found the right one. But they're hermits, said the youngest and beautifulest, because they've lost the right one, aren't they? Because they think they have, answered the recluse, fatuously. Wisdom comes to one in a mountain cave as well as to one in the world of swells, as I believe they are called in the Argo. When one of the swells brings it to them, said Miss Trenholm. And my folks are swells. That's the trouble. But there are so many swells at the seashore in the summertime that we hardly amount to more than ripples. So we've had to put all our money into river and harbor appropriations. We were all girls, you know. There were four of us. I'm the only surviving one. The others have been married off. All to money. Mama is so proud of my sisters. They send her the loveliest pen wipers and art calendars every Christmas. I'm the only one on the market now. I'm forbidden to look at anyone who hasn't money. But, began the hermit. But, oh, said the beautifulest, of course hermits have great pots of gold and doubloons buried somewhere near three great oak trees. They all have. I have not, said the hermit, regretfully. I'm so sorry, said Miss Trenholm. I always thought they had. I think I must go now. Oh, beyond question, she was the beautifulest. Fair lady, began the hermit. I am Beatrix Trenholm, 
Some call me tricks, she said. You must come to the inn to see me. I haven't been a stone's throw from my cave in ten years, said the hermit. You must come to see me there, she repeated. Any evening except Thursday. The hermit smiled weakly. Goodbye, she said, gathering the folds of her pale blue skirt. I shall expect you. But not on Thursday evening, remember. What an interest it would give to the future menu cards of the Viewpoint Inn to have these printed lines added to them, only once during the more than ten years of his lonely existence did the mountain hermit leave his famous cave. That was when he was irresistibly drawn to the inn by the fascinations of Miss Beatrix Trenholm, youngest and most beautiful of the celebrated Trenholm sisters, whose brilliant marriage to I. To whom? The hermit walked back to the hermitage. At the door stood Bob Binkley, his old friend and companion of the days before he had renounced the world, Bob, himself. Arrayed like the orchids of the greenhouse in the summer man's polychromatic garb, Bob, the millionaire, with his fat, firm, smooth, shrewd face, his diamond rings, sparkling fob chain, and pleated bosom. He was two years older than the hermit, and looked five years younger. Your Hamp Ellison, in spite of those whiskers and that going-away bathrobe, he shouted. I read about you on the bill of fare at the inn. They've run your biography in between the cheese and not responsible for coats and umbrellas. What did you do it for, Hamp? And ten years, too, G. Willikins. You're just the same, said the hermit. Come in and sit down. Sit on that limestone rock over there it's softer than the granite. I can't understand it, old man, said Binkley. I can see how you could give up a woman for ten years, but not ten years for a woman. Of course I know why you did it. Everybody does. Edith Carr. She jilted four or five besides you. But you were the only one who took to a hole in the ground. The others had recourse to whiskey, the Klondike, politics, and that similia similibus cure. But, say, Hamp, Edith Carr was just about the finest woman in the world, high-toned and proud and noble, and playing her ideals to win at all kinds of odds. She certainly was a crackerjack. After I renounced the world, said the hermit, I never heard of her again. She married me, said Binkley. The hermit leaned against the wooden walls of his ante-cave and wriggled his toes. I know how you feel about it, said Binkley. What else could she do? There were her four sisters and her mother and old man Carr, you remember how he put all the money he had into dirigible balloons? Well, everything was coming down and nothing going up with them, as you might say. Well, I know Edith as well as you do, although I married her. I was worth a million then, but I've run it up since to between five and six. It wasn't me she wanted as much as, well, it was about like this. She had that bunch on her hands, and they had to be taken care of. Edith married me two months after you did the ground squirrel act. I thought she liked me, too, at the time. And now? inquired the recluse. We're better friends than ever now. She got a divorce from me two years ago. Just incompatibility. I didn't put in any defense. Well, 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 Hamp, this is certainly a funny dugout you've built here. But you always were a hero of fiction. Seems like you'd have been the very one to strike Edith's fancy. Maybe you did, but it's the bankroll that catches, M, my boy, your caves and whiskers won't do it. Honestly, Hamp, don't you think you've been a darned fool? The hermit smiled behind his tangled beard. He was and always had been so superior to the crude and mercenary Binkley that even his vulgarities could not anger him. Moreover, his studies and meditations in his retreat had raised him far above the little vanities of the world. His little mountainside had been almost an Olympus, over the edge of which he saw, smiling, the bolts hurled in the valleys of man below. Had his ten years of renunciation, of thought, of devotion to an ideal, of living scorn of a sordid world, been in vain? Up from the world had come to him the youngest and beautifulest, fairer than Edith, 
one and three-seventh times lovelier than the seven-year-served Rachel. So the hermit smiled in his beard. When Binkley had relieved the hermitage from the blot of his presence and the first faint star showed above the pines, the hermit got the can of baking powder from his cupboard. He still smiled behind his beard. There was a slight rustle in the doorway. There stood Edith Carr, with all the added beauty and stateliness and noble bearing that ten years had brought her. She was never one to chatter. She looked at the hermit with her large, thinking, dark eyes. The hermit stood still, surprised into a pose as motionless as her own. Only his subconscious sense of the fitness of things caused him to turn the baking powder can slowly in his hands until its red label was hidden against his bosom. I am stopping at the inn, said Edith, in low but clear tones. I heard of you there. I told myself that I must see you. I want to ask your forgiveness. I sold my happiness for money. There were others to be provided for, but that does not excuse me. I just wanted to see you and ask your forgiveness. You have lived here ten years, they tell me, cherishing my memory. I was blind, Hampton. I could not see then that all the money in the world cannot weigh in the scales against a faithful heart. If, but it is too late now, of course. Her assertion was a question clothed as best it could be in a loving woman's pride. But through the thin disguise the hermit saw easily that his lady had come back to him, if he chose. He had won a golden crown, if it pleased him to take it. The reward of his decade of faithfulness was ready for his hand, if he desired to stretch it forth. For the space of one minute the old enchantment shone upon him with a reflected radiance. And then by turns he felt the manly sensations of indignation at having been discarded, and of repugnance at having been, as it were, sought again. And last of all, how strange that it should have come at last, the pale blue vision of the beautifulest of the Trenholm sisters illuminated his mind's eye and left him without a waver. It is too late, he said, in deep tones, pressing the baking powder can against his heart. Once she turned after she had gone slowly twenty yards down the path. The hermit had begun to twist the lid off his can, but he hid it again under his sacking robe. He could see her great eyes shining sadly through the twilight. But he stood inflexible in the doorway of his shack and made no sign. Just as the moon rose on Thursday evening the hermit was seized by the world madness. Up from the inn, fainter than the horns of Elfland, came now and then a few bars of music played by the casino band. The Hudson was broadened by the night into an illimitable sea, those lights, dimly seen on its opposite shore, were not beacons for prosaic trolley lines, but low-set stars millions of miles away. The waters in front of the inn were gay with fireflies, or were they motorboats, smelling of gasoline and oil. Once the hermit had known these things and had sported with Amaryllis in the shade of the red and white striped awnings. But for ten years he had turned a heedless ear to these far-off echoes of a frivolous world. But tonight there was something wrong. The casino band was playing a waltz, a waltz. What a fool he had been to tear deliberately ten years of his life from the calendar of existence for one who had given him up for the false joys that wealth, tum ti tum ti tum ti, how did that waltz go? But those years had not been sacrificed, had they not brought him the star and pearl of all the world, the youngest and beautifulest of. But do not come on Thursday evening, she had insisted. Perhaps by now she would be moving slowly and gracefully to the strains of that waltz, held closely by West Pointers or city commuters, while he, who had read in her eyes things that had recompensed him for ten lost years of life, moped like some wild animal in its mountain den. Why should? Damn it, said the hermit, suddenly, I'll do it. He threw down his Marcus Aurelius and threw off his gunny sack toga. He dragged a dust-covered trunk from a corner of the cave, and with difficulty wrenched open its lid. Candles he had in plenty, and the cave was soon aglow. Clothes, ten years old in cut, scissors, razors, hats, shoes, all his discarded attire and belongings, were dragged ruthlessly from their renunciatory rest and strewn about in painful disorder. 
A pair of scissors soon reduced his beard sufficiently for the dulled razors to perform approximately their office. Cutting his own hair was beyond the hermit's skill. So he only combed and brushed it backward as smoothly as he could. Charity forbids us to consider the heartburnings and exertions of one so long removed from haberdashery and society. At the last the hermit went to an inner corner of his cave and began to dig in the soft earth with a long iron spoon. Out of the cavity he thus made he drew a tin can, and out of the can three thousand dollars in bills, tightly rolled and wrapped in oiled silk. He was a real hermit, as this may assure you. You may take a brief look at him as he hastens down the little mountainside. A long, wrinkled black frock coat reached to his calves. White duck trousers, unacquainted with the tailor's goose, a pink shirt, white standing collar with brilliant blue butterfly tie, and buttoned congress gaiters. But think, sir and madam, ten years. From beneath a narrow-brimmed straw hat with a striped band flowed his hair. Seeing him, with all your shrewdness you could not have guessed him. You would have said that he played Hamlet, or the tuba, or Pinnacle, you would never have laid your hand on your heart and said, he is a hermit who lived ten years in a cave for love of one lady, to win another. The dancing pavilion extended above the waters of the river. Gay lanterns and frosted electric globes shed a soft glamour within it. A hundred ladies and gentlemen from the inn and summer cottages flitted in and about it. To the left of the dusty roadway down which the hermit had tramped were the inn and grill room. Something seemed to be on there, too. The windows were brilliantly lighted, and music was playing, music different from the two steps and waltzes of the casino band. A negro man wearing a white jacket came through the iron gate, with its immense granite posts and wrought iron lamp holders. What is going on here tonight? asked the hermit. Well, sa, said the servitor, day is having de reglar Thursday evening dance in de casino. And in de grill room dears a beefsteak dinner, sa. The hermit glanced up at the inn on the hillside whence burst suddenly a triumphant strain of splendid harmony. And up there, said he, they are playing Mendelssohn, what is going on up there? Up in de inn, said the dusky one, day is a wed din goin' on. Mr. Binkley, a mighty rich man, am marine, Miss Trenholm, sa, de young lady who am quite de belle of de place, sa. The Higher Pragmatism Chapter 1 Where to go for wisdom has become a question of serious import. The ancients are discredited, Plato is boilerplate, Aristotle is tottering. Marcus Aurelius is reeling, Aesop has been copyrighted by Indiana, Solomon is too solemn, you couldn't get anything out of Epictetus with a pick. The ant, which for many years served as a model of intelligence and industry in the school readers, has been proven to be a doddering idiot and a waster of time and effort. The owl today is hooted at. Chautauqua conventions have abandoned culture and adopted Diabolo. Greybeards give glowing testimonials to the vendors of patent hair restorers. There are typographical errors in the almanacs published by the daily newspapers. College professors have become. But there shall be no personalities. To sit in classes, to delve into the encyclopedia or the past performances page, will not make us wise. As the poet says, knowledge comes, but wisdom lingers. Wisdom is due, which, while we know it not, soaks into us, refreshes us, and makes us grow. Knowledge is a strong stream of water turned on us through a hose. It disturbs our roots. Then, let us rather gather wisdom. But how to do so requires knowledge. If we know a thing, we know it, but very often we are not wise to it that we are wise, n. But let's go on with the story. Chapter 2 once upon a time I found a ten-cent magazine lying on a bench in a little city park. Anyhow, that was the amount he asked me for when I sat on the bench next to him. He was a musty, dingy, and tattered magazine, with some queer stories bound in him, I was sure. He turned out to be a scrapbook. I am a newspaper reporter, I said to him, to try him. I have been detailed to write up some of the experiences of the unfortunate ones who spend their evenings in this park. 
May I ask you to what you attribute your downfall in? I was interrupted by a laugh from my purchase, a laugh so rusty and unpracticed that I was sure it had been his first for many a day. Oh, no, no, said he. You ain't a reporter. Reporters don't talk that way. They pretend to be one of us, and say they've just got in on the blind baggage from St. Louis. I can tell a reporter on sight. U.S. Park bums get to be fine judges of human nature. We sit here all day and watch the people go by. I can size up anybody who walks past my bench in a way that would surprise you. Well, I said, go on and tell me. How do you size me up? I should say, said the student of human nature with unpardonable hesitation, that you was, say, in the contracting business, or maybe worked in a store, or was a sign painter. You stopped in the park to finish your cigar, and thought you'd get a little free monologue out of me. Still, you might be a plasterer or a lawyer, it's getting kind of dark, you see. And your wife won't let you smoke at home. I frowned gloomily. But, judging again, went on the reader of men, I'd say you ain't got a wife. No, said I, rising restlessly. No, 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 I ain't. But I will have, by the arrows of Cupid. That is, if. My voice must have trailed away and muffled itself in uncertainty and despair. I see you have a story yourself, said the dusty vagrant, impudently, it seemed to me. Suppose you take your dime back and spin your yarn for me. I'm interested myself in the ups and downs of unfortunate ones who spend their evenings in the park. Somehow, that amused me. I looked at the frozy derelict with more interest. I did have a story. Why not tell it to him? I had told none of my friends. I had always been a reserved and bottled up man. It was psychical timidity or sensitiveness, perhaps both. And I smiled to myself in wonder when I felt an impulse to confide in this stranger and vagabond. Jack, said I. Mac, said he. Mac, said I, I'll tell you. Do you want the dime back in advance, said he. I handed him a dollar. The dime, said I, was the price of listening to your story. Right on the point of the jaw, said he. Go on. And then, incredible as it may seem to the lovers in the world who confide their sorrows only to the night wind and the gibbous moon. I laid bare my secret to that wreck of all things that you would have supposed to be in sympathy with love. I told him of the days and weeks and months that I had spent in adoring Mildred Telfair. I spoke of my despair, my grievous days and wakeful nights, my dwindling hopes and distress of mind. I even pictured to this night prowler her beauty and dignity, the great sway she had in society. And the magnificence of her life as the elder daughter of an ancient race whose pride overbalanced the dollars of the city's millionaires. Why don't you cop the lady out? asked Mac, bringing me down to earth and dialect again. I explained to him that my worth was so small, my income so minute, and my fears so large that I hadn't the courage to speak to her of my worship. I told him that in her presence I could only blush and stammer and that she looked upon me with a wonderful, maddening smile of amusement. She kind of moves in the professional class, don't she? Asked Mac. The Telfair family, I began, haughtily. I mean professional beauty, said my hearer. She is greatly and widely admired, I answered, cautiously. Any sisters? One. You know any more girls? Why, several, I answered and a few others. Say, said Mac, tell me one thing, can you hand out the dope to other girls? Can you chin M and make matinee eyes at M and squeeze them? You know what I mean. You're just shy when it comes to this particular dame, the professional beauty, ain't that right? In a way you have outlined the situation with approximate truth, I admitted. I thought so, said Mac, grimly. Now, that reminds me of my own case. I'll tell you about it. I was indignant, but concealed it. What was this loafer's case or anybody's case compared with mine? Besides, I had given him a dollar and ten cents. 
Feel my muscle, said my companion, suddenly, flexing his biceps. I did so mechanically. The fellows in gyms are always asking you to do that. His arm was as hard as cast iron. Four years ago, said Mac, I could lick any man in New York outside of the professional ring. Your case and mine is just the same. I come from the west side, between 30th and 14th, I won't give the number on the door. I was a scrapper when I was 10, and when I was 20 no amateur in the city could stand up four rounds with me. Essay Fact You know Bill McCarty? No? He managed the smokers for some of them swell clubs. Well, I knocked out everything Bill brought up before me. I was a middleweight, but could train down to a welter when necessary. I boxed all over the west side at bouts and benefits and private entertainments, and was never put out once. But, say, the first time I put my foot in the ring with a professional I was no more than a canned lobster. I dunno how it was, I seemed to lose heart. I guess I got too much imagination. There was a formality and publicness about it that kind of weakened my nerve. I never won a fight in the ring. Lightweights and all kinds of scrubs used to sign up with my manager and then walk up and tap me on the wrist and see me fall. The minute I seen the crowd and a lot of gents in evening clothes down in front, and seen a professional come inside the ropes, I got as weak as ginger ale. Of course, it wasn't long till I couldn't get no backers, and I didn't have any more chances to fight a professional, or many amateurs, either. But let me tell you, I was as good as most men inside the ring or out. It was just that dumb, dead feeling I had when I was up against a regular that always done me up. Well, sir, after I had got out of the business, I got a mighty grouch on. I used to go round town licking private citizens and all kinds of unprofessionals just to please myself. I'd lick cops in dark streets and car conductors and cab drivers and draymen whenever I could start a row with them. It didn't make any difference how big they were, or how much science they had, I got away with them. If I'd only just have had the confidence in the ring that I had beating up the best men outside of it, I'd be wearing black pearls and heliotrope silk socks today. One evening I was walking along near the Bowery, thinking about things, when along comes a slumming party. About six or seven they was, all in swallowtails, and these silk hats that don't shine. One of the gang kind of shoves me off the sidewalk. I hadn't had a scrap in three days, and I just says, delight Ed, and hits him back of the ear. Well, we had it. That Johnny put up as decent a little fight as you'd want to see in the moving pictures. It was on a side street, and no cops around. The other guy had a lot of science, but it only took me about six minutes to lay him out. Some of the swallowtails dragged him up against some steps and began to fan him. Another one of them comes over to me and says. Young man, do you know what you've done? Oh, beat it, says I, I've done nothing but a little punching bag work. Take Freddy back to Yale and tell him to quit studying sociology on the wrong side of the sidewalk. My good fellow, says he, I don't know who you are, but I'd like to. You've knocked out Reddy Burns, the champion middleweight of the world. He came to New York yesterday, to try to get a match on with Jim Jeffries. If you. But when I come out of my faint I was laying on the floor in a drugstore saturated with aromatic spirits of ammonia. If I'd known that was Reddy Burns, I'd have got down in the gutter and crawled past him instead of handing him one like I did. Why, if I'd ever been in a ring and seen him climbing over the ropes, I'd have been all to the salvolatile. So that's what imagination does, concluded Mac. And, as I said, your case and mine is simultaneous. You'll never win out. You can't go up against the professionals. I tell you, it's a park bench for yours in this romance business. Mac, the pessimist, laughed harshly. I'm afraid I don't see the parallel, I said, coldly. I have only a very slight acquaintance with the prize ring. The derelict touched my sleeve with his forefinger, for emphasis, as he explained his parable. Every man, said he, with some dignity, has got his lamps on something that looks good to him. With you, 
it's this dame that you're afraid to say your say to. With me, it was to win out in the ring. Well, you'll lose just like I did. Why do you think I shall lose? I asked warmly. Cause, said he, you're afraid to go in the ring. You dasn't stand up before a professional. Your case and mine is just the same. You're a amateur. And that means that you'd better keep outside of the ropes. Well, I must be going, I said, rising and looking with elaborate care at my watch. When I was twenty feet away the park bencher called to me. Much obliged for the dollar, he said. And for the dime. But you'll never get, er. You're in the amateur class. Serves you right, I said to myself, for hobnobbing with a tramp. His impudence. But, as I walked, his words seemed to repeat themselves over and over again in my brain. I think I even grew angry at the man. I'll show him. I finally said, aloud. I'll show him that I can fight Reddy Burns, too, even knowing who he is. I hurried to a telephone booth and rang up the Telfair residence. A soft, sweet voice answered. Didn't I know that voice? My hand holding the receiver shook. Is that you? Said I, employing the foolish words that form the vocabulary of every talker through the telephone. Yes, this is I, came back the answer in the low, clear-cut tones that are an inheritance of the Telfairs. Who is it, please? It's me, said I, less ungrammatically than egotistically. It's me, and I've got a few things that I want to say to you right now and immediately and straight to the point. Dear me, said the voice. Oh, it's you, Mr. Arden. I wondered if any accent on the first word was intended, Mildred was fine at saying things that you had to study out afterward. Yes, said I, I hope so. And now to come down to brass tacks. I thought that rather a vernacularism, if there is such a word, as soon as I had said it, but I didn't stop to apologize. You know, of course, that I love you, and that I have been in that idiotic state for a long time. I don't want any more foolishness about it, that is, I mean I want an answer from you right now. Will you marry me or not? Hold the wire, please. Keep out, central. Hello, hello. Will you, or will you not? That was just the uppercut for Reddy Burns' chin. The answer came back. Why, Phil, dear, of course I will. I didn't know that you, that is, you never said, oh, come up to the house, please, I can't say what I want to over the phone. You are so importunate. But please come up to the house, won't you? Would I? I rang the bell of the Telfair house violently. Some sort of a human came to the door and shooed me into the drawing room. Oh, well, said I to myself, looking at the ceiling, anyone can learn from anyone. That was a pretty good philosophy of Max, anyhow. He didn't take advantage of his experience, but I get the benefit of it. If you want to get into the professional class, you've got to. I stopped thinking then. Someone was coming down the stairs. My knees began to shake. I knew then how Mac had felt when a professional began to climb over the ropes. I looked around foolishly for a door or a window by which I might escape. If it had been any other girl approaching, I mightn't have. But just then the door opened, and Bess, Mildred's younger sister, came in. I'd never seen her look so much like a glorified angel. She walked straight tip to me, and, Anne. I'd never noticed before what perfectly wonderful eyes and hair Elizabeth Telfair had. Phil, she said, in the Telfair, sweet, thrilling tones, why didn't you tell me about it before? I thought it was sister you wanted all the time, until you telephoned to me a few minutes ago. I suppose Mac and I always will be hopeless amateurs. But, as the thing has turned out in my case, I'm mighty glad of it. Best Seller Chapter 1 one day last summer I went to Pittsburgh, well, I had to go there on business. My chair car was profitably well filled with people of the kind one usually sees on chair cars. Most of them were ladies in brown silk dresses cut with square yokes, with lace insertion, 
and dotted veils, who refused to have the windows raised. Then there was the usual number of men who looked as if they might be in almost any business and going almost anywhere. Some students of human nature can look at a man in a Pullman and tell you where he is from, his occupation and his stations in life, both flag and social, but I never could. The only way I can correctly judge a fellow traveler is when the train is held up by robbers, or when he reaches at the same time I do for the last towel in the dressing room of the sleeper. The porter came and brushed the collection of soot on the windowsill off to the left knee of my trousers. I removed it with an air of apology. The temperature was 88. One of the dotted veiled ladies demanded the closing of two more ventilators, and spoke loudly of Interlaken. I leaned back idly in chair no. 7, and looked with the tepidest curiosity at the small, black, bald-spotted head just visible above the back of number 9. Suddenly no. 9 hurled a book to the floor between his chair and the window, and, looking, I saw that it was The Rose Lady in Trevelyan, one of the best-selling novels of the present day. And then the critic or Philistine, whichever he was, veered his chair toward the window, and I knew him at once for John A. Pascud, of Pittsburgh, traveling salesman for a plate glass company, an old acquaintance whom I had not seen in two years. In two minutes we were faced, had shaken hands, and had finished with such topics as rain, prosperity, health, residence, and destination. Politics might have followed next. But I was not so ill fated. I wish you might know John at Pascud. He is of the stuff that heroes are not often lucky enough to be made of. He is a small man with a wide smile, and an eye that seems to be fixed upon that little red spot on the end of your nose. I never saw him wear but one kind of necktie, and he believes in cuff holders and button shoes. He is as hard and true as anything ever turned out by the Cambria Steel Works. And he believes that as soon as Pittsburgh makes smoke consumers compulsory, st. Peter will come down and sit at the foot of Smithfield Street, and let somebody else attend to the gate up in the branch heaven. He believes that our plate glass is the most important commodity in the world, and that when a man is in his hometown he ought to be decent and law-abiding. During my acquaintance with him in the city of diurnal night I had never known his views on life, romance, literature, and ethics. We had browsed, during our meetings, on local topics, and then parted, after Chateau Margot, Irish stew, flannel cakes, cottage pudding, and coffee, hay, there, with milk separate. Now I was to get more of his ideas. By way of facts, he told me that business had picked up since the party conventions, and that he was going to get off at Coketown. Chapter 2 Say, said Pascud, stirring his discarded book with the toe of his right shoe, did you ever read one of these bestsellers? I mean the kind where the hero is an American swell, sometimes even from Chicago, who falls in love with a royal princess from Europe who is traveling under an alias. And follows her to her father's kingdom or principality? I guess you have. They're all alike. Sometimes this going-away masher is a Washington newspaper correspondent, and sometimes he is a Van Something from New York, or a Chicago wheat broker worthy fifty millions. But he's always ready to break into the king row of any foreign country that sends over their queens and princesses to try the new plush seats on the Big Four or the B&O. There doesn't seem to be any other reason in the book for their being here. Well, this fellow chases the royal chairwarmer home, as I said, and finds out who she is. He meets her on the Corso or the Strasse one evening and gives us ten pages of conversation. She reminds him of the difference in their stations, and that gives him a chance to ring in three solid pages about America's uncrowned sovereigns. If you'd take his remarks and set M to music, and then take the music away from M, they'd sound exactly like one of George Cohan's songs. Well, you know how it runs on, if you've read any of M, he slaps the king's Swiss bodyguards around like everything whenever they get in his way. He's a great fencer, too. Now, I've known of some Chicago men who were pretty notorious fences, but I never heard of any fencers coming from there. He stands on the first landing of the royal staircase in Castle Schutzenfestenstein with a gleaming rapier in his hand. 
and makes a Baltimore broil of six platoons of traitors who come to massacre the said king. And then he has to fight duels with a couple of chancellors, and foil a plot by four Austrian archdukes to seize the kingdom for a gasoline station. But the great scene is when his rival for the princess hand, Count Fiefer, attacks him between the portcullis and the ruined chapel, armed with a Mitrias, a Yadigan, and a couple of Siberian bloodhounds. This scene is what runs the bestseller into the 29th edition before the publisher has had time to draw a check for the advance royalties. The American hero shucks his coat and throws it over the heads of the bloodhounds, gives the Mitrias a slap with his mitt, says, Ya! Yeah. to the Yadigan, and lands in Kid McCoy's best style on the Count's left eye. Of course, we have a neat little prize fight right then and there. The Count, in order to make the go possible, seems to be an expert at the art of self-defense, himself, and here we have the Corbett Sullivan fight done over into literature. The book ends with the broker and the princess doing a John Cecil Clay cover under the linden trees on the Gorgonzola walk. That winds up the love story plenty good enough. But I notice that the book dodges the final issue. Even a bestseller has sense enough to shy at either leaving a Chicago grain broker on the throne of Lobster Potsdam or bringing over a real princess to eat fish and potato salad in an Italian chalet. On Michigan Avenue. What do you think about, M? Why, said I, I hardly know, John. There's a saying, love levels all ranks, you know. Yes, said Pascud, but these kind of love stories are rank, on the level. I know something about literature, even if I am in plate glass. These kind of books are wrong, and yet I never go into a train but what they pile, am up on me. No good can come out of an international clinch between the old world aristocracy and one of us fresh Americans. When people in real life marry, they generally hunt up somebody in their own station. A fellow usually picks out a girl that went to the same high school and belonged to the same singing society that he did. When young millionaires fall in love, they always select the chorus girl that likes the same kind of sauce on the lobster that he does. Washington newspaper correspondents always marry widow ladies ten years older than themselves who keep boarding houses. No, sir, you can't make a novel sound right to me when it makes one of C.D. Gibson's bright young men go abroad and turn kingdoms upside down just because he's a Taft American and took a course at a gymnasium. And listen how they talk, too. Pascud picked up the bestseller and hunted his page. Listen at this, said he. Trevelyan is chinning with the Princess Elwina at the back end of the tulip garden. This is how it goes. Say not so, dearest and sweetest of earth's fairest flowers. Would I aspire? You are a star set high above me in a royal heaven, I am only, myself. Yet I am a man, and I have a heart to do and dare. I have no title save that of an uncrowned sovereign. But I have an arm and a sword that yet might free Schutz and Festenstein from the plots of traitors. Think of a Chicago man packing a sword, and talking about freeing anything that sounded as much like canned pork as that. He'd be much more likely to fight to have an import duty put on it. I think I understand you, John, said I, you want fiction writers to be consistent with their scenes and characters. They shouldn't mix Turkish pashas with Vermont farmers, or English dukes with Long Island clam diggers, or Italian countesses with Montana cowboys. Or Cincinnati brewery agents with the Rajas of India. Or plain business men with aristocracy high above, m, added Pascud. It don't jibe. People are divided into classes, whether we admit it or not, and it's everybody's impulse to stick to their own class. They do it, too. I don't see why people go to work and buy hundreds of thousands of books like that. You don't see or hear of any such didos and capers in real life. Chapter 3 Well, John, said I, I haven't read a bestseller in a long time. Maybe I've had notions about them somewhat like yours. But tell me more about yourself. Getting along all right with the company? Bully, said Pascud, brightening at once. I've had my salary raised twice since I saw you, and I get a commission, too. 
I've bought a neat slice of real estate out in the East End, and have run up a house on it. Next year the firm is going to sell me some shares of stock. Oh, I'm in on the line of general prosperity, no matter who's elected. Met your affinity yet, John? I asked. Oh, I didn't tell you about that, did I? said Pascud with a broader grin. Oh ho. I said. So you've taken time enough off from your plate glass to have a romance? No, no, said John. No romance, nothing like that. But I'll tell you about it. I was on the southbound, going to Cincinnati, about eighteen months ago, when I saw, across the aisle, the finest-looking girl I'd ever laid eyes on. Nothing spectacular, you know, but just the sort you want for keeps. Well, I never was up to the flirtation business, either handkerchief, automobile, postage stamp, or doorstep, and she wasn't the kind to start anything. She read a book and minded her business, which was to make the world prettier and better just by residing on it. I kept on looking out of the side doors of my eyes, and finally the proposition got out of the Pullman class into a case of a cottage with a lawn and vines running over the porch. I never thought of speaking to her, but I let the plate glass business go to smash for a while. She changed cars at Cincinnati, and took a sleeper to Louisville over the L and N. There she bought another ticket, and went on through Shelbyville, Frankfurt, and Lexington. Along there I began to have a hard time keeping up with her. The trains came along when they pleased, and didn't seem to be going anywhere in particular, except to keep on the track and the right-of-way as much as possible. Then they began to stop at junctions instead of towns, and at last they stopped altogether. I'll bet Pinkerton would outbid the plate glass people for my services any time if they knew how I managed to shadow that young lady. I contrived to keep out of her sight as much as I could, but I never lost track of her. The last station she got off at was away down in Virginia, about six in the afternoon. There were about fifty houses and four hundred niggers in sight. The rest was red mud, mules, and speckled hounds. A tall old man, with a smooth face and white hair, looking as proud as Julius Caesar and Roscoe Conkling on the same postcard, was there to meet her. His clothes were frazzled, but I didn't notice that till later. He took her little satchel, and they started over the plank walks and went up a road along the hill. I kept along a piece behind Bem, trying to look like I was hunting a garnet ring in the sand that my sister had lost at a picnic the previous Saturday. They went in a gate on top of the hill. It nearly took my breath away when I looked up. Up there in the biggest grove I ever saw was a tremendous house with round white pillars about a thousand feet high. And the yard was so full of rose bushes and box bushes and lilacs that you couldn't have seen the house if it hadn't been as big as the Capitol at Washington. Here's where I have to trail, says I to myself. I thought before that she seemed to be in moderate circumstances, at least. This must be the governor's mansion, or the agricultural building of a new world's fair, anyhow. I'd better go back to the village and get posted by the postmaster, or drug the druggist for some information. In the village I found a pine hotel called the Bayview House. The only excuse for the name was a bay horse grazing in the front yard. I set my sample case down, and tried to be ostensible. I told the landlord I was taking orders for plate glass. I don't want no plates, says he, but I do need another glass molasses pitcher. By and by I got him down to local gossip and answering questions. Why, says he, I thought everybody knowed who lived in the big white house on the hill. It's Colonel Allen, the biggest man and the finest quality in Virginia, or anywhere else. They're the oldest family in the state. That was his daughter that got off the train. She's been up to Illinois to see her aunt, who is sick. I registered at the hotel, and on the third day I caught the young lady walking in the front yard, down next to the paling fence. I stopped and raised my hat, there wasn't any other way. Excuse me, says I, can you tell me where Mr. Hinkle lives? She looks at me as cool as if I was the man come to see about the weeding of the garden, but I thought I saw just a slight twinkle of fun in her eyes. No one of that name lives in Birchton, says she. That is, 
she goes on, as far as I know. Is the gentleman you are seeking white? Well, that tickled me. No kidding, says I. I'm not looking for smoke, even if I do come from Pittsburgh. You are quite a distance from home, says she. I'd have gone a thousand miles farther, says I. Not if you hadn't waked up when the train started in Shelbyville, says she, and then she turned almost as red as one of the roses on the bushes in the yard. I remembered I had dropped off to sleep on a bench in the Shelbyville station, waiting to see which train she took, and only just managed to wake up in time. And then I told her why I had come, as respectful and earnest as I could. And I told her everything about myself, and what I was making, and how that all I asked was just to get acquainted with her and try to get her to like me. She smiles a little, and blushes some, but her eyes never get mixed up. They look straight at whatever she's talking to. I never had anyone talk like this to me before, Mr. Pascud, says she. What did you say your name is, John? John A., says I. And you came mighty near missing the train at Powhatan Junction, too, says she, with a laugh that sounded as good as a mileage book to me. How did you know? I asked. Men are very clumsy, said she. I knew you were on every train. I thought you were going to speak to me, and I'm glad you didn't. Then we had more talk. And at last a kind of proud, serious look came on her face, and she turned and pointed a finger at the big house. The Allens, says she, have lived in Elmcroft for a hundred years. We are a proud family. Look at that mansion. It has fifty rooms. See the pillars and porches and balconies. The ceilings in the reception rooms and the ballroom are twenty-eight feet high. My father is a lineal descendant of belted earls. I belted one of M once in the Duquesne Hotel, in Pittsburgh, says I, and he didn't offer to resent it. He was there dividing his attentions between Monongahela whiskey and heiresses, and he got fresh. Of course, she goes on, my father wouldn't allow a drummer to set his foot in Elmcroft. If he knew that I was talking to one over the fence he would lock me in my room. Would you let me come there, says I, would you talk to me if I was to call? For, I goes on, if you said I might come and see you, the earls might be belted or suspended, or pinned up with safety pins, as far as I am concerned. I must not talk to you, she says, because we have not been introduced. It is not exactly proper. So I will say goodbye, mister. Say the name, says I, you haven't forgotten it. Pascud, says she, a little mad. The rest of the name. I demands, cool as could be. John, says she. John, what? I says. John A., says she, with her head high. Are you through, now? I'm coming to see the belted earl tomorrow, I says. He'll feed you to his foxhounds, says she, laughing. If he does, it'll improve their running, says I. I'm something of a hunter myself. I must be going in now, says she. I oughtn't to have spoken to you at all. I hope you'll have a pleasant trip back to Minneapolis, or Pittsburgh, was it? Goodbye. Good night, says I and it wasn't Minneapolis. What's your name, first, please? She hesitated. Then she pulled a leaf off a bush, and said. My name is Jessie, says she. Good night, Miss Allen, says I. The next morning at eleven, sharp, I rang the doorbell of that world's fair main building. After about three quarters of an hour an old nigger man about eighty showed up and asked what I wanted. I gave him my business card, and said I wanted to see the colonel. He showed me in. Say, did you ever crack open a wormy English walnut? That's what that house was like. There wasn't enough furniture in it to fill an eight-dollar flat. Some old horsehair lounges and three-legged chairs and some framed ancestors on the walls were all that met the eye. But when Colonel Allen comes in, the place seemed to light up. You could almost hear a band playing and see a bunch of old-timers in wigs and white stockings dancing a quadrille. It was the style of him, although he had on the same shabby clothes I saw him wear at the station. 
For about nine seconds he had me rattled, and I came mighty near getting cold feet and trying to sell him some plate glass. But I got my nerve back pretty quick. He asked me to sit down, and I told him everything. I told him how I followed his daughter from Cincinnati, and what I did it for, and all about my salary and prospects. And explained to him my little code of living, to be always decent and right in your hometown. And when you're on the road, never take more than four glasses of beer a day or play higher than a 25-cent limit. At first I thought he was going to throw me out of the window, but I kept on talking. Pretty soon I got a chance to tell him that story about the western congressman who had lost his pocketbook and the grass widow, you remember that story. Well, that got him to laughing, and I'll bet that was the first laugh those ancestors and horsehair sofas had heard in many a day. We talked two hours. I told him everything I knew. And then he began to ask questions, and I told him the rest. All I asked of him was to give me a chance. If I couldn't make a hit with the little lady, I'd clear out, and not bother any more. At last he says. There was a Sir Courtney Pascud in the time of Charles I, if I remember rightly. If there was, says I, he can't claim kin with our bunch. We've always lived in and around Pittsburgh. I've got an uncle in the real estate business, and one in trouble somewhere out in Kansas. You can inquire about any of the rest of us from anybody in Old Smoky Town, and get satisfactory replies. Did you ever run across that story about the captain of the whaler who tried to make a sailor say his prayers, says I. It occurs to me that I have never been so fortunate, says the colonel. So I told it to him. Laugh. I was wishing to myself that he was a customer. What a bill of glass I'd sell him. And then he says. The relating of anecdotes and humorous occurrences has always seemed to me, Mr. Pascud. To be a particularly agreeable way of promoting and perpetuating amenities between friends. With your permission, I will relate to you a fox hunting story with which I was personally connected, and which may furnish you some amusement. So he tells it. It takes forty minutes by the watch. Did I laugh? Well, say. When I got my face straight he calls in old Pete, the superannuated darky, and sends him down to the hotel to bring up my valise. It was Elmcroft for me while I was in the town. Two evenings later I got a chance to speak a word with Miss Jessie alone on the porch while the colonel was thinking up another story. It's going to be a fine evening, says I. He's coming, says she. He's going to tell you, this time, the story about the old negro and the green watermelons. It always comes after the one about the Yankees and the game rooster. There was another time, she goes on, that you nearly got left, it was at Pulaski City. Yes, says I, I remember. My foot slipped as I was jumping on the step, and I nearly tumbled off. I know, says she. And, and I, I was afraid you had, John A. I was afraid you had. And then she skips into the house through one of the big windows. Chapter 4 Coketown, droned the porter, making his way through the slowing car. Pascud gathered his hat and baggage with the leisurely promptness of an old traveler. I married her a year ago, said John. I told you I built a house in the East End. The belted, I mean the colonel, is there, too. I find him waiting at the gate whenever I get back from a trip to hear any new story I might have picked up on the road. I glanced out of the window. Coketown was nothing more than a ragged hillside dotted with a score of black dismal huts propped up against dreary mounds of slag and clinkers. It rained in slanting torrents, too, and the rills foamed and splashed down through the black mud to the railroad tracks. You won't sell much plate glass here, John, said I. Why do you get off at this end o' the world? Why, said Pascud, the other day I took Jessie for a little trip to Philadelphia. And coming back she thought she saw some petunias in a pot in one of those windows over there just like some she used to raise down in the old Virginia home. So I thought I'd drop off here for the night, and see if I could dig up some of the cuttings or blossoms for her. Here we are. Good night, old man. I gave you the address. 
Come out and see us when you have time. The train moved forward. One of the dotted brown ladies insisted on having windows raised, now that the rain beat against them. The porter came along with his mysterious wand and began to light the car. I glanced downward and saw the bestseller. I picked it up and set it carefully farther along on the floor of the car, where the raindrops would not fall upon it. And then, suddenly, I smiled, and seemed to see that life has no geographical meets and bounds. Good luck to you, Trevelyan, I said. And may you get the petunias for your princess. No story. To avoid having this book hurled into corner of the room by the suspicious reader, I will assert in time that this is not a newspaper story. You will encounter no shirt-sleeved, omniscient city editor, no prodigy, cub, reporter just off the farm, no scoop, no story, no anything. But if you will concede me the setting of the first scene in the reporter's room of the morning beacon, I will repay the favor by keeping strictly my promises set forth above. I was doing space work on the beacon, hoping to be put on a salary. Someone had cleared with a rake or a shovel a small space for me at the end of a long table piled high with exchanges, congressional records, and old files. There I did my work. I wrote whatever the city whispered or roared or chuckled to me on my diligent wanderings about its streets. My income was not regular. One day Trip came in and leaned on my table. Trip was something in the mechanical department. I think he had something to do with the pictures, for he smelled of photographer's supplies, and his hands were always stained and cut up with acids. He was about twenty-five and looked forty. Half of his face was covered with short, curly red whiskers that looked like a doormat with the welcome left off. He was pale and unhealthy and miserable and fawning, and an assiduous borrower of sums ranging from twenty-five cents to a dollar. One dollar was his limit. He knew the extent of his credit as well as the Chemical National Bank knows the amount of H2O that collateral will show on analysis. When he sat on my table he held one hand with the other to keep both from shaking. Whiskey. He had a spurious air of lightness and bravado about him that deceived no one, but was useful in his borrowing because it was so pitifully and perceptibly assumed. This day I had coaxed from the cashier five shining silver dollars as a grumbling advance on a story that the Sunday editor had reluctantly accepted. So if I was not feeling at peace with the world, at least an armistice had been declared, and I was beginning with ardor to write a description of the Brooklyn Bridge by moonlight. Well, Trip, said I, looking up at him rather impatiently, how goes it? He was looking today more miserable, more cringing and haggard and downtrodden than I had ever seen him. He was at that stage of misery where he drew your pity so fully that you longed to kick him. Have you got a dollar? Asked Trip, with his most fawning look and his dog-like eyes that blinked in the narrow space between his high-growing matted beard and his low-growing matted hair. I have, said I. And again I said, I have, more loudly and inhospitably, and four besides. And I had hard work corkscrewing them out of old Atkinson, I can tell you. And I drew them, I continued, to meet a want, a hiatus, a demand, a need, an exigency, a requirement of exactly five dollars. I was driven to emphasis by the premonition that I was to lose one of the dollars on the spot. I don't want to borrow any, said Tripp, and I breathed again. I thought you'd like to get put onto a good story, he went on. I've got a rattling fine one for you. You ought to make it run a column at least. It'll make a dandy if you work it up right. It'll probably cost you a dollar or two to get the stuff. I don't want anything out of it myself. I became placated. The proposition showed that Tripp appreciated past favors, although he did not return them. If he had been wise enough to strike me for a quarter then he would have got it. What is the story? I asked, poising my pencil with a finely calculated editorial air. I'll tell you, said Tripp. It's a girl. A beauty. One of the howlingest Amstons Junes you ever saw. Rosebuds covered with dew, violets in their mossy bed, and truck like that. She's lived on Long Island twenty years and never saw New York City before. I ran against her on 34th Street. 
she'd just got in on the East River Ferry. I tell you, she's a beauty that would take the hydrogen out of all the peroxides in the world. She stopped me on the street and asked me where she could find George Brown. Asked me where she could find George Brown in New York City. What do you think of that? I talked to her, and found that she was going to marry a young farmer named Dodd, Hiram Dodd, next week. But it seems that George Brown still holds the championship in her youthful fancy. George had greased his cowhide boots some years ago, and came to the city to make his fortune. But he forgot to remember to show up again at Greenberg, and Hiram got in as second best choice. But when it comes to the scratch Ada, her name's Ada Lowry, saddles a nag and rides eight miles to the railroad station and catches the 6.45 a.m. train for the city. Looking for George, you know, you understand about women, George wasn't there, so she wanted him. Well, you know, I couldn't leave her loose in Wolftown on the Hudson. I suppose she thought the first person she inquired of would say, George Brown, why, yes, let me see, he's a short man with light blue eyes, ain't he? Oh yes, you'll find George on 125th Street, right next to the grocery. He's bill clerk in a saddle and harness store. That's about how innocent and beautiful she is. You know those little Long Island waterfront villages like Greenberg, a couple of duck farms for sport, and clams and about nine summer visitors for industries. That's the kind of a place she comes from. But, say, you ought to see her. What could I do? I don't know what money looks like in the morning. And she'd paid her last cent of pocket money for her railroad ticket except a quarter, which she had squandered on gumdrops. She was eating them out of a paper bag. I took her to a boarding house on 32nd Street where I used to live, and hawked her. She's in soak for a dollar. That's old Mother McGinnis' price per day. I'll show you the house. What words are these, Trip? said I, I thought you said you had a story. Every ferryboat that crosses the East River brings or takes away girls from Long Island. The premature lines on Tripp's face grew deeper. He frowned seriously from his tangle of hair. He separated his hands and emphasized his answer with one shaking forefinger. Can't you see, he said, what a rattling fine story it would make. You could do it fine. All about the romance, you know, and describe the girl, and put a lot of stuff in it about true love, and sling in a few stickfuls of funny business, joshing the Long Islanders about being green. And, well, you know how to do it. You ought to get fifteen dollars out of it, anyhow. And it'll cost you only about four dollars. You'll make a clear profit of eleven. How will it cost me four dollars? I asked, suspiciously. One dollar to Mrs. McGinnis, Tripp answered, promptly, and two dollars to pay the girl's fare back home. And the fourth dimension? I inquired, making a rapid mental calculation. One dollar to me, said Tripp. Four whiskey. Are you on? I smiled enigmatically and spread my elbows as if to begin writing again. But this grim, abject, specious, subservient, like wreck of a man would not be shaken off. His forehead suddenly became shiningly moist. Don't you see, he said, with a sort of desperate calmness, that this girl has got to be sent home today, not tonight nor tomorrow, but today? I can't do anything for her. You know, I'm the janitor and corresponding secretary of the Down and Out Club. I thought you could make a newspaper story out of it and win out a piece of money on general results. But, anyhow, don't you see that she's got to get back home before night? And then I began to feel that dull, leaden, soul-depressing sensation known as the sense of duty. Why should that sense fall upon one as a weight and a burden? I knew that I was doomed that day to give up the bulk of my store of hard-run coin to the relief of this Ada Lowry. But I swore to myself that Tripp's whiskey dollar would not be forthcoming. He might play knight-errant at my expense, but he would indulge in no wassail afterward, commemorating my weakness and gullibility. In a kind of chilly anger I put on my coat and hat. Trip, submissive, cringing, vainly endeavoring to please,
conducted me via the streetcars to the human pawn shop of Mother McGuinness. I paid the fares. It seemed that the collodion scented Don Quixote and the smallest minted coin were strangers. Tripp pulled the bell at the door of the moldy red brick boarding house. At its faint tinkle he paled, and crouched as a rabbit makes ready to spring away at the sound of a hunting dog. I guessed what a life he had led, terror haunted by the coming footsteps of landladies. Give me one of the dollars, quick, he said. The door opened six inches. Mother McGuinness stood there with white eyes, they were white, I say, and a yellow face, holding together at her throat with one hand a dingy pink flannel dressing sack. Tripp thrust the dollar through the space without a word, and it bought us entry. She's in the parlor, said the McGuinness, turning the back of her sack upon us. In the dim parlor a girl sat at the cracked marble center table weeping comfortably and eating gumdrops. She was a flawless beauty. Crying had only made her brilliant eyes brighter. When she crunched a gumdrop you thought only of the poetry of motion and envied the senseless confection. Eve at the age of five minutes must have been a ringer for Miss Ada Lowry at nineteen or twenty. I was introduced, and a gumdrop suffered neglect while she conveyed to me a naive interest, such as a puppy dog, a prize winner, might bestow upon a crawling beetle or a frog. Tripp took his stand by the table, with the fingers of one hand spread upon it, as an attorney or a master of ceremonies might have stood. But he looked the master of nothing. His faded coat was buttoned high, as if it sought to be charitable to deficiencies of tie and linen. I thought of a Scotch terrier at the sight of his shifty eyes in the glade between his tangled hair and beard. For one ignoble moment I felt ashamed of having been introduced as his friend in the presence of so much beauty in distress. But evidently Tripp meant to conduct the ceremonies, whatever they might be. I thought I detected in his actions and pose an intention of foisting the situation upon me as material for a newspaper story, in a lingering hope of extracting from me his whiskey dollar. My friend, I shuddered, Mr. Chalmers, said Tripp, will tell you, Miss Lowry, the same that I did. He's a reporter, and he can hand out the talk better than I can. That's why I brought him with me. Oh Tripp, wasn't it the silver-tongued orator you wanted? He's wise to a lot of things, and he'll tell you now what's best to do. I stood on one foot, as it were, as I sat in my rickety chair. Why, er, Miss Lowry, I began, secretly enraged at Tripp's awkward opening, I am at your service, of course, but, er, as I haven't been apprised of the circumstances of the case, I, er. Oh! said Miss Lowry, beaming for a moment, it ain't as bad as that, there ain't any circumstances. It's the first time I've ever been in New York except once when I was five years old, and I had no idea it was such a big town. And I met Mr., Mr. Snip on the street and asked him about a friend of mine, and he brought me here and asked me to wait. I advise you, Miss Lowry, said Tripp, to tell Mr. Chalmers all. He's a friend of mine, I was getting used to it by this time, and he'll give you the right tip. Why, certainly, said Miss Ada, chewing a gumdrop toward me. There ain't anything to tell except that, well, everything's fixed for me to marry Hiram Dodd next Thursday evening. Hi has got two hundred acres of land with a lot of shorefront, and one of the best truck farms on the island. But this morning I had my horse saddled up, he's a white horse named Dancer, and I rode over to the station. I told them at home I was going to spend the day with Susie Adams. It was a story, I guess, but I don't care. And I came to New York on the train, and I met Mr., Mr. Flip on the street and asked him if he knew where I could find G., G. Now, Miss Lowry, broke in trip, loudly, and with much bad taste. I thought, as she hesitated with her word, you like this young man, Hiram Dodd, don't you? He's all right, and good to you, ain't he? Of course I like him, said Miss Lowry emphatically. Hi's all right. And of course he's good to me. So is everybody. I could have sworn it myself. Throughout Miss Ada Lowry's life all men would be too good to her. They would strive, contrive, struggle, and compete to hold umbrellas over her hat, 
check her trunk, pick up her handkerchief, and buy for her soda at the fountain. But, went on Miss Lowry, last night I got to thinking about G, George, and I. Down went the bright gold head upon dimpled, clasped hands on the table. Such a beautiful April storm. Unrestrainedly she sobbed. I wished I could have comforted her. But I was not George. And I was glad I was not Hiram, and yet I was sorry, too. By and by the shower passed. She straightened up, brave and halfway smiling. She would have made a splendid wife, for crying only made her eyes more bright and tender. She took a gumdrop and began her story. I guess I'm a terrible hayseed, she said between her little gulps and sighs, but I can't help it. Gee, George Brown and I were sweethearts since he was eight and I was five. When he was nineteen, that was four years ago, he left Greenberg and went to the city. He said he was going to be a policeman or a railroad president or something. And then he was coming back for me. But I never heard from him any more. And I, I, liked him. Another flow of tears seemed imminent, but Tripp hurled himself into the crevasse and damned it. Confound him, I could see his game. He was trying to make a story of it for his sordid ends and profit. Go on, Mr. Chalmers, said he, and tell the lady what's the proper caper. That's what I told her, you'd hand it to her straight. Spiel up. I coughed, and tried to feel less wrathful toward Trip. I saw my duty. Cunningly I had been inveigled, but I was securely trapped. Tripp's first dictum to me had been just and correct. The young lady must be sent back to Greenberg that day. She must be argued with, convinced, assured, instructed, ticketed, and returned without delay. I hated Hiram and despised George. But duty must be done. Noblesse oblige and only five silver dollars are not strictly romantic compatibles, but sometimes they can be made to jibe. It was mine to be Sir Oracle, and then pay the freight. So I assumed an air that mingled Solomon's with that of the general passenger agent of the Long Island Railroad. Miss Lowry, said I, as impressively as I could, life is rather a queer proposition, after all. There was a familiar sound to these words after I had spoken them, and I hoped Miss Lowry had never heard Mr. Cohan's song. Those whom we first love we seldom wed. Our earlier romances, tinged with the magic radiance of youth, often fail to materialize. The last three words sounded somewhat trite when they struck the air. But those fondly cherished dreams, I went on, may cast a pleasant afterglow on our future lives, however impracticable and vague they may have been. But life is full of realities as well as visions and dreams. One cannot live on memories. May I ask, Miss Lowry, if you think you could pass a happy, that is, a contented and harmonious life with Mr. Dodd, if in other ways than romantic recollections he seems to fill the bill? As I might say? Oh, hi's all right, answered Miss Lowry. Yes, I could get along with him fine. He's promised me an automobile and a motorboat. But somehow, when it got so close to the time I was to marry him, I couldn't help wishing, well, just thinking about George. Something must have happened to him or he'd have written. On the day he left, he and me got a hammer and a chisel and cut a dime into two pieces. I took one piece and he took the other, and we promised to be true to each other and always keep the pieces till we saw each other again. I've got mine at home now in a ring box in the top drawer of my dresser. I guess I was silly to come up here looking for him. I never realized what a big place it is. And then Tripp joined in with a little grating laugh that he had, still trying to drag in a little story or drama to earn the miserable dollar that he craved. Oh, the boys from the country forget a lot when they come to the city and learn something. I guess George, maybe, is on the bum, or got roped in by some other girl, or maybe gone to the dogs on account of whiskey or the races. You listen to Mr. Chalmers and go back home, and you'll be all right. But now the time was come for action, for the hands of the clock were moving close to noon. Frowning upon Trip, I argued gently and philosophically with Miss Lowry, 
delicately convincing her of the importance of returning home at once. And I impressed upon her the truth that it would not be absolutely necessary to her future happiness that she mentioned to Hai the wonders or the fact of her visit to the city that had swallowed up the unlucky George. She said she had left her horse, unfortunate Rosinanti, tied to a tree near the railroad station. Tripp and I gave her instructions to mount the patient steed as soon as she arrived and ride home as fast as possible. There she was to recount the exciting adventure of a day spent with Susie Adams. She could fix Susie, I was sure of that, and all would be well. And then, being susceptible to the barbed arrows of beauty, I warmed to the adventure. The three of us hurried to the ferry, and there I found the price of a ticket to Greenberg to be but a dollar and eighty cents. I bought one, and a red, red rose with the twenty cents for Miss Lowry. We saw her aboard her ferryboat, and stood watching her wave her handkerchief at us until it was the tiniest white patch imaginable. And then Tripp and I faced each other, brought back to earth, left dry and desolate in the shade of the somber verities of life. The spell wrought by beauty and romance was dwindling. I looked at Tripp and almost sneered. He looked more careworn, contemptible, and disreputable than ever. I fingered the two silver dollars remaining in my pocket and looked at him with the half-closed eyelids of contempt. He mustered up an imitation of resistance. Can't you get a story out of it? He asked, huskily. Some sort of a story, even if you have to fake part of it? Not a line, said I, I can fancy the look on Grimes' face if I should try to put over any slush like this. But we've helped the little lady out, and that'll have to be our only reward. I'm sorry, said Tripp, almost inaudibly. I'm sorry you're out your money. Now, it seemed to me like a find of a big story, you know, that is, a sort of thing that would write up pretty well. Let's try to forget it, said I, with a praiseworthy attempt at gaiety, and take the next car, cross town. I steeled myself against his unexpressed but palpable desire. He should not coax, cajole, or wring from me the dollar he craved. I had had enough of that wild goose chase. Tripp feebly unbuttoned his coat of the faded pattern and glossy seems to reach for something that had once been a handkerchief deep down in some obscure and cavernous pocket. As he did so I caught the shine of a cheap silver-plated watch chain across his vest, and something dangling from it caused me to stretch forth my hand and seize it curiously. It was the half of a silver dime that had been cut in halves with a chisel. What? I said, looking at him keenly. Oh yes, he responded, dully. George Brown, alias Tripp. What's the use? Barring the WCTU, I'd like to know if anybody disapproves of my having produced promptly from my pocket Tripp's whiskey dollar and unhesitatingly laying it in his hand. A poor rule. I have always maintained, and asserted time to time, that woman is no mystery, that man can foretell, construe, subdue, comprehend, and interpret her. That she is a mystery has been foisted by herself upon credulous mankind. Whether I am right or wrong we shall see. As Harper's Drawer used to say in bygone years, the following good story is told of Miss, Mr., Mr., and Mr. We shall have to omit Bishop X and the Rev. For they do not belong. In those days Paloma was a new town on the line of the Southern Pacific. A reporter would have called it a mushroom town, but it was not. Paloma was, first and last, of the toadstool variety. The train stopped there at noon for the engine to drink and for the passengers both to drink and to dine. There was a new yellow pine hotel, also a wool warehouse, and perhaps three dozen box residences. The rest was composed of tents, cow ponies, black waxy mud, and mesquite trees, all bound round by a horizon. Paloma was an about-to-be city. The houses represented faith, the tents hope. The twice-a-day train, by which you might leave, creditably sustained the role of charity. The Parisian restaurant occupied the muddiest spot in the town while it rained, and the warmest when it shone. It was operated, owned, and perpetrated by a citizen known as Old Man Hinkle, who had come out of Indiana to make his fortune in this land of condensed milk and sorghum. 
There was a four-room, unpainted, weather-boarded box house in which the family lived. From the kitchen extended a shelter made of poles covered with chaparral brush. Under this was a table and two benches, each twenty feet long, the product of Paloma home carpentry. Here was set forth the roast mutton, the stewed apples, boiled beans, soda biscuits, putinorpi, and hot coffee of the Parisian menu. Ma Hinkle and a subordinate known to the ears as Betty, but denied to the eyesight, presided at the range. Pa Hinkle himself, with salamandrous thumbs, served the scalding viands. During rush hours a Mexican youth, who rolled and smoked cigarettes between courses, aided him in waiting on the guests. As is customary at Parisian banquets, I placed the sweets at the end of my wordy menu. Eileen Hinkle. The spelling is correct, for I have seen her write it. No doubt she had been named by ear. But she so splendidly bore the orthography that Tom Moore himself, had he seen her, would have endorsed the phonography. Eileen was the daughter of the house, and the first lady cashier to invade the territory south of an east and west line drawn through Galveston and Del Rio. She sat on a high stool in a rough pine grandstand, or was it a temple, under the shelter at the door of the kitchen. There was a barbed wire protection in front of her, with a little arch under which you passed your money. Heaven knows why the barbed wire. For every man who dined Parisianly there would have died in her service. Her duties were light, each meal was a dollar, you put it under the arch, and she took it. I set out with the intent to describe Eileen Hinkle to you. Instead, I must refer you to the volume by Edmund Burke entitled, A Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our Ideas of the Sublime and Beautiful. It is an exhaustive treatise, dealing first with the primitive conceptions of beauty, roundness and smoothness, I think they are, according to Burke. It is well said. Rotundity is a patent charm. As for smoothness, the more new wrinkles a woman acquires, the smoother she becomes. Eileen was a strictly vegetable compound, guaranteed under the pure ambrosia and balm of Gilead act of the year of the fall of Adam. She was a fruit stand blonde, strawberries, peaches, cherries, etc. Her eyes were wide apart, and she possessed the calm that precedes a storm that never comes. But it seems to me that words, at any rate per, are wasted in an effort to describe the beautiful. Like fancy, it is engendered in the eyes. There are three kinds of beauties, I was foreordained to be homiletic, I can never stick to a story. The first is the freckle-faced, snub-nosed girl whom you like. The second is Maud Adams. The third is, or are, the ladies in Bouguereau's paintings. Eileen Hinkle was the fourth. She was the mayoress of Spotless Town. There were a thousand golden apples coming to her as Helen of the Troy Laundries. The Parisian restaurant was within a radius. Even from beyond its circumference men rode into Paloma to win her smiles. They got them. One meal, one smile, one dollar. But, with all her impartiality, Eileen seemed to favor three of her admirers above the rest. According to the rules of politeness, I will mention myself last. The first was an artificial product known as Brian Jacks, a name that had obviously met with reverses. Jacks was the outcome of paved cities. He was a small man made of some material resembling flexible sandstone. His hair was the color of a brick Quaker meeting house, his eyes were twin cranberries. His mouth was like the aperture under a drop letters here sign. He knew every city from Bangor to San Francisco, thence north to Portland, thence S. 45E to a given point in Florida. He had mastered every art, trade, game, business, profession, and sport in the world, had been present at, or hurrying on his way to. Every headline event that had ever occurred between oceans since he was five years old. You might open the atlas, place your finger at random upon the name of a town, and Jax would tell you the front names of three prominent citizens before you could close it again. He spoke patronizingly and even disrespectfully of Broadway, Beacon Hill, Michigan, Euclid, and Fifth Avenues, and the St. Louis Four Courts. Compared with him as a cosmopolite, the wandering Jew would have seemed a mere hermit. 
He had learned everything the world could teach him, and he would tell you about it. I hate to be reminded of Pollock's course of time, and so do you, but every time I saw Jack's I would think of the poet's description of another poet by the name of G. E. G. Byron who drank early. Deeply drank, drank draughts that common millions might have quenched, then died of thirst because there was no more to drink. That fitted Jack's, except that, instead of dying, he came to Paloma, which was about the same thing. He was a telegrapher and station and express agent at $75 a month. Why a young man who knew everything and could do everything was content to serve in such an obscure capacity I never could understand. Although he let out a hint once that it was as a personal favor to the president and stockholders of the S. P. Re. Company. One more line of description, and I turn Jacks over to you. He wore bright blue clothes, yellow shoes, and a bow tie made of the same cloth as his shirt. My rival no. Two was Bud Cunningham, whose services had been engaged by a ranch near Paloma to assist in compelling refractory cattle to keep within the bounds of decorum and order. Bud was the only cowboy off the stage that I ever saw who looked like one on it. He wore the sombrero, the chaps, and the handkerchief tied at the back of his neck. Twice a week Bud rode in from the Val Verde ranch to sup at the Parisian restaurant. He rode a many high-handed Kentucky horse at a tremendously fast lope. Which animal he would rein up so suddenly under the big mesquite at the corner of the brush shelter that his hoofs would plow canals yards long in the loam. Jacks and I were regular boarders at the restaurant, of course. The front room of the Hinkle House was as neat a little parlor as there was in the black waxy country. It was all willow rocking chairs, and home-knit tidies, and albums, and conch shells in a row. And a little upright piano in one corner. Here Jackson, and Bud and I, or sometimes one or two of us, according to our good luck, used to sit of evenings when the tide of trade was over, and visit Miss Hinkle. Eileen was a girl of ideas. She was destined for higher things, if there can be anything higher, than taking in dollars all day through a barbed wire wicket. She had read and listened and thought. Her looks would have formed a career for a less ambitious girl, but, rising superior to mere beauty, she must establish something in the nature of a salon, the only one in Paloma. Don't you think that Shakespeare was a great writer? She would ask, with such a pretty little knit of her arched brows that the late Ignatius Donnelly, himself, had he seen it, could scarcely have saved his bacon. Eileen was of the opinion, also, that Boston is more cultured than Chicago, that Rosa Bonheur was one of the greatest of women painters. That Westerners are more spontaneous and open-hearted than Easterners, that London must be a very foggy city, and that California must be quite lovely in the springtime. And of many other opinions indicating a keeping up with the world's best thought. These, however, were but gleaned from hearsay and evidence, Eileen had theories of her own. One, in particular, she disseminated to us untiringly. Flattery she detested. Frankness and honesty of speech and action, she declared, were the chief mental ornaments of man and woman. If ever she could like anyone, it would be for those qualities. I'm awfully weary, she said, one evening, when we three musketeers of the mesquite were in the little parlor, of having compliments on my looks paid to me. I know I'm not beautiful. Bud Cunningham told me afterward that it was all he could do to keep from calling her a liar when she said that. I'm only a little Middle Western girl, went on Eileen, who just wants to be simple and neat, and tries to help her father make a humble living. Old man Hinkle was shipping a thousand silver dollars a month, clear profit, to a bank in San Antonio. Bud twisted around in his chair and bent the rim of his hat, from which he could never be persuaded to separate. He did not know whether she wanted what she said she wanted or what she knew she deserved. Many a wiser man has hesitated at deciding. Bud decided. Why, ah, uh, Miss Eileen, beauty, as you might say, ain't everything. Not saying that you haven't your share of good looks, I always admired more than anything else about you the nice, kind way you treat your ma and pa. Anyone what's good to their parents and is a kind of homebody don't specially need to be too pretty. Eileen gave him one of her sweetest smiles. 
Thank you, Mr. Cunningham, she said. I consider that one of the finest compliments I've had in a long time. I'd so much rather hear you say that than to hear you talk about my eyes and hair. I'm glad you believe me when I say I don't like flattery. Our cue was there for us. Bud had made a good guess. You couldn't lose Jax. He chimed in next. Sure thing, Miss Eileen, he said. The good lookers don't always win out. Now, you ain't bad looking, of course, but that's Nick's come rouse. I knew a girl once in Dubuque with a face like a coconut, who could skin the cat twice on a horizontal bar without changing hands. Now, a girl might have the California peach crop mashed to a marmalade and not be able to do that. I've seen, er, worse lookers than you, Miss Eileen. But what I like about you is the business way you've got of doing things. Cool and wise, that's the winning way for a girl. Mr. Hinkle told me the other day you'd never taken in a lead silver dollar or a plugged one since you've been on the job. Now, that's the stuff for a girl, that's what catches me. Jack's got his smile, too. Thank you, Mr. Jacks, said Eileen. If you only knew how I appreciate anyone's being candid and not a flatterer. I get so tired of people telling me I'm pretty. I think it is the loveliest thing to have friends who tell you the truth. Then I thought I saw an expectant look on Eileen's face as she glanced toward me. I had a wild, sudden impulse to dare fate. And tell her of all the beautiful handiwork of the great artificer she was the most exquisite, that she was a flawless pearl gleaming pure and serene in a setting of black mud and emerald prairies, that she was, uh, a corker. And as for mine, I cared not if she were as cruel as a serpent's tooth to her fond parents, or if she couldn't tell a plugged dollar from a bridal buckle, if I might sing, chant, praise, glorify, and worship her peerless and wonderful beauty. But I refrained. I feared the fate of a flatterer. I had witnessed her delight at the crafty and discreet words of Bud and Jacks. No. Miss Hinkle was not one to be beguiled by the plated silver tongue of a flatterer. So I joined the ranks of the candid and honest. At once I became mendacious and didactic. In all ages, Miss Hinkle, said I, in spite of the poetry and romance of each, intellect in woman has been admired more than beauty. Even in Cleopatra, herself, men found more charm in her queenly mind than in her looks. Well, should think so, said Eileen. I've seen pictures of her that weren't so much. She had an awfully long nose. If I may say so, I went on, you remind me of Cleopatra, Miss Eileen. Why, my nose isn't so long. Said she, opening her eyes wide and touching that comely feature with a dimpled forefinger. Why, er, I mean, said I, I mean as to mental endowments. Oh, said she. And then I got my smile just as Bud and Jax had got theirs. Thank every one of you, she said, very, very sweetly, for being so frank and honest with me. That's the way I want you to be always. Just tell me plainly and truthfully what you think, and we'll all be the best friends in the world. And now, because you've been so good to me, and understand so well how I dislike people who do nothing but pay me exaggerated compliments, I'll sing and play a little for you. Of course, we expressed our thanks and joy, but we would have been better pleased if Eileen had remained in her low rocking chair face to face with us and let us gaze upon her. For she was no Adelina Patty, not even on the farewellest of the Divas' farewell tours. She had a cooing little voice like that of a turtle dove that could almost fill the parlor when the windows and doors were closed, and Betty was not rattling the lids of the stove in the kitchen. She had a gamut that I estimate at about eight inches on the piano, and her runs and trills sounded like the clothes bubbling in your grandmother's iron washpot. Believe that she must have been beautiful when I tell you that it sounded like music to us. Eileen's musical taste was Catholic. She would sing through a pile of sheet music on the left-hand top of the piano, laying each slaughtered composition on the right-hand top. The next evening she would sing from right to left. Her favorites were Mendelssohn, and Moody and Sankey. 
by request she always wound up with sweet violets and when the leaves begin to turn. When we left at ten o'clock the three of us would go down to Jack's little wooden station and sit on the platform. Swinging our feet and trying to pump one another for clues as to which way Miss Eileen's inclinations seem to lean. That is the way of rivals, they do not avoid and glower at one another, they convene and converse and construe, striving by the art politic to estimate the strength of the enemy. One day there came a dark horse to Paloma, a young lawyer who at once flaunted his shingle and himself spectacularly upon the town. His name was C. Vincent Vesey. You could see at a glance that he was a recent graduate of a southwestern law school. His Prince Albert coat, light-striped trousers, broad-brimmed soft black hat, and narrow white muslin bow tie proclaimed that more loudly than any diploma could. V.C. was a compound of Daniel Webster, Lord Chesterfield, Beau Brummel, and little Jack Horner. His coming boomed Paloma. The next day after he arrived an addition to the town was surveyed and laid off in lots. Of course, V.C., to further his professional fortunes, must mingle with the citizenry in outliers of Paloma. And, as well as with the soldier men, he was bound to seek popularity with the gay dogs of the place. So Jax and Bud Cunningham and I came to be honored by his acquaintance. The doctrine of predestination would have been discredited had not V.C. seen Eileen Hinkle and become fourth in the tourney. Magnificently, he boarded at the Yellow Pine Hotel instead of at the Parisian restaurant, but he came to be a formidable visitor in the Hinkle parlor. His competition reduced Bud to an inspired increase of profanity, drove Jax to an outburst of slang so weird that it sounded more horrible than the most trenchant of Bud's imprecations. And made me dumb with gloom. For Vesey had the rhetoric. Words flowed from him like oil from a gusher. Hyperbole, compliment, praise, appreciation, honeyed gallantry, golden opinions, eulogy, and unveiled panegyric vied with one another for preeminence in his speech. We had small hopes that Eileen could resist his oratory and Prince Albert. But a day came that gave us courage. About dusk one evening I was sitting on the little gallery in front of the Hinkle parlor, waiting for Eileen to come, when I heard voices inside. She had come into the room with her father, and old man Hinkle began to talk to her. I had observed before that he was a shrewd man, and not unphilosophic. Eile, said he, I notice there's three or four young fellers that have been callin' to see you regular for quite a while. Is there any one of em you like better than another? Why, pa, she answered, I like all of em very well. I think Mr. Cunningham and Mr. Jax and Mr. Harris are very nice young men. They are so frank and honest in everything they say to me. I haven't known Mr. V.C. very long, but I think he's a very nice young man, he's so frank and honest in everything he says to me. Now, that's what I'm gettin' at, says old Hinkle. You've always been sayin' you like people what tell the truth and don't go humbuggin' you with compliments and bogus talk. Now, suppose you make a test of these fellers, and see which one of them will talk the straightest to you. But how I do it, pa? I'll tell you how. You know you sing a little bit, Eilie. You took music lessons nearly two years in Logansport. It wasn't long, but it was all we could afford then. And your teacher said you didn't have any voice, and it was a waste of money to keep on. Now, suppose you ask the fellers what they think of your singin', and see what each one of em tells you. The man that'll tell you the truth about it'll have a mighty lot of nerve, and'll do to tie to. What do you think of the plan? All right, pa, said Eileen. I think it's a good idea. I'll try it. Eileen and Mr. Hinkle went out of the room through the inside doors. Unobserved, I hurried down to the station. Jax was at his telegraph table waiting for eight o'clock to come. It was Bud's night in town, and when he rode and I repeated the conversation to them both. I was loyal to my rivals as all true admirers of all Eileen's should be. Simultaneously the three of us were smitten by an uplifting thought. Surely this test would eliminate V.C. from the contest. He, with his unctuous flattery, would be driven from the lists. 
Well we remembered Eileen's love of frankness and honesty, how she treasured truth and candor above vain compliment and blandishment. Linking arms, we did a grotesque dance of joy up and down the platform, singing, Muldoon was a solid man, at the top of our voices. That evening four of the willow rocking chairs were filled besides the lucky one that sustained the trim figure of Miss Hinkle. Three of us awaited with suppressed excitement the application of the test. It was tried on Bud first. Mr. Cunningham, said Eileen, with her dazzling smile, after she had sung, when the leaves begin to turn, what do you really think of my voice? Frankly and honestly, now, as you know I want you to always be toward me. Bud squirmed in his chair at his chance to show the sincerity that he knew was required of him. Tell you the truth, Miss Eileen, he said, earnestly, you ain't got much more voice than a weasel, just a little squeak, you know. Of course, we all like to hear you sing, for it's kind of sweet and soothin', after all, and you look most as mighty well sittin' on the piano stool as you do faced around. But as for real singin', I reckon you couldn't call it that. I looked closely at Eileen to see if Bud had overdone his frankness, but her pleased smile and sweetly spoken thanks assured me that we were on the right track. And what do you think, Mr. Jax? She asked next. Take it from me, said Jax, you ain't in the prima donna class. I've heard M. Warble in every city in the United States, and I tell you your vocal output don't go. Otherwise, you've got the grand opera bunch sent to the soap factory, in looks, I mean, for the high screechers generally look like Mary and on her Thursday out. But nix for the gargle work. Your epiglottis ain't a real sidestepper, its footwork ain't good. With a merry laugh at Jack's criticism, Eileen looked inquiringly at me. I admit that I faltered a little. Was there not such a thing as being too frank? Perhaps I even hedged a little in my verdict, but I stayed with the critics. I am not skilled in scientific music, Miss Eileen, I said, but, frankly, I cannot praise very highly the singing voice that nature has given you. It has long been a favorite comparison that a great singer sings like a bird. Well, there are birds and birds. I would say that your voice reminds me of the thrushes, throaty and not strong, nor of much compass or variety, but still, sweet, in, er, its, way, an, er. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Interrupted Miss Hinkle. I knew I could depend upon your frankness and honesty. And then see, Vincent Vesey drew back one sleeve from his snowy cuff, and the water came down at Lodor. My memory cannot do justice to his masterly tribute to that priceless, God-given treasure, Miss Hinkle's voice. He raved over it in terms that, if they had been addressed to the morning stars when they sang together, would have made that stellar choir explode in a meteoric shower of flaming self-satisfaction. He marshaled on his white fingertips the grand opera stars of all the continents, from Jenny Lind to Emma Abbott, only to depreciate their endowments. He spoke of larynxes, of chest notes, of phrasing, arpeggios, and other strange paraphernalia of the throaty art. He admitted, as though driven to a corner, that Jenny Lind had a note or two in the high register that Miss Hinkle had not yet acquired, but that was a mere matter of practice and training. And, as a peroration, he predicted, solemnly predicted, a career in vocal art for the coming star of the Southwest, and one of which grand old Texas may well be proud. Hitherto unsurpassed in the annals of musical history. When we left at ten, Eileen gave each of us her usual warm, cordial handshake, entrancing smile, and invitation to call again. I could not see that one was favored above or below another, but three of us knew, we knew. We knew that frankness and honesty had won, and that the rivals now numbered three instead of four. Down at the station Jacks brought out a pint bottle of the proper stuff, and we celebrated the downfall of a blatant interloper. For days went by without anything happening worthy of recount. On the fifth, Jacks and I, entering the brush arbor for our supper, saw the Mexican youth, instead of a divinity in a spotless waist and a navy blue skirt taking in the dollars through the barbed wire wicket. 
We rushed into the kitchen, meeting Pa Hinkle coming out with two cups of hot coffee in his hands. Where's Eileen? we asked, in recitative. Pa Hinkle was a kindly man. Well, gents, said he, it was a sudden notion she took, but I've got the money, and I let her have her way. She's gone to a corn, a conservatory in Boston for four years for to have her voice cultivated. Now, excuse me to pass, gents, for this coffee's hot, and my thumbs is tender. That night there were four instead of three of us sitting on the station platform and swinging our feet. See, Vincent Vesey was one of us. We discussed things while dogs barked at the moon that rose, as big as a five-cent piece or a flower barrel, over the chaparral. And what we discussed was whether it is better to lie to a woman or to tell her the truth. And as all of us were young then, we did not come to a decision. Russ in Herb Considering men in relation to money, there are three kinds whom I dislike, men who have more money than they can spend, men who have more money than they do spend, and men who spend more money than they have. Of the three varieties, I believe I have the least liking for the first. But, as a man, I liked Spencer Grenville North pretty well, although he had something like two or ten or thirty millions, I've forgotten exactly how many. I did not leave town that summer. I usually went down to a village on the south shore of Long Island. The place was surrounded by duck farms. And the ducks and dogs and whippoorwills and rusty windmills made so much noise that I could sleep as peacefully as if I were in my own flat six doors from the elevated railroad in New York. But that summer I did not go. Remember that. One of my friends asked me why I did not. I replied. Because, old man, New York is the finest summer resort in the world. You have heard that phrase before. But that is what I told him. I was press agent that year for Binkley and Bing, the theatrical managers and producers. Of course you know what a press agent is. Well, he is not. That is the secret of being one. Binkley was touring France in his new C&N. Williamson Carr and Bing had gone to Scotland to learn curling, which he seemed to associate in his mind with hot tongs rather than with ice. Before they left they gave me June and July, on salary, for my vacation, which act was in accord with their large spirit of liberality. But I remained in New York, which I had decided was the finest summer resort in. But I said that before. On July the 10th, North came to town from his camp in the Adirondacks. Try to imagine a camp with sixteen rooms, plumbing, eiderdown quilts, a butler, a garage, solid silver plate, and a long-distance telephone. Of course it was in the woods, if Mr. Pinchot wants to preserve the forests let him give every citizen two or ten or thirty million dollars, and the trees will all gather around the summer camps. As the Burnham Woods came to Dunsinane, and be preserved. North came to see me in my three rooms and bath, extra charge for light when used extravagantly or all night. He slapped me on the back, would rather have my shins kicked any day, and greeted me with outdoor obstreperousness and revolting good spirits. He was insolently brown and healthy-looking, and offensively well-dressed. Just ran down for a few days, said he, to sign some papers and stuff like that. My lawyer wired me to come. Well, you indolent cockney, what are you doing in town? I took a chance and telephoned, and they said you were here. What's the matter with that utopia on Long Island where you used to take your typewriter and your villainous temper every summer? Anything wrong with the, er, swans, weren't they, that used to sing on the farms at night? Ducks, said I, the songs of swans are for luckier ears. They swim and curve their necks in artificial lakes on the estates of the wealthy to delight the eyes of the favorites of fortune. Also in Central Park, said North, to delight the eyes of immigrants and bummers. I've seen em there lots of times. But why are you in the city so late in the summer? New York City, I began to recite, is the finest sum. No, you don't, said North, emphatically. You don't spring that old one on me. I know you know better. Man, you ought to have gone up with us this summer. The Prestons are there, 
and Tom Volney and the Monroes and Lulu Stanford and the Miss Kennedy and her aunt that you liked so well. I never liked Miss Kennedy's aunt, I said. I didn't say you did, said North. We are having the greatest time we've ever had. The pickerel and trout are so ravenous that I believe they would swallow your hook with a Montana Coppermine prospectus fastened on it. And we've a couple of electric launches. And I'll tell you what we do every night or two, we tow a rowboat behind each one with a big phonograph and a boy to change the discs in them. On the water, and twenty yards behind you, they are not so bad. And there are passably good roads through the woods where we go motoring. I shipped two cars up there. And the Pine Cliff Inn is only three miles away. You know the Pine Cliff. Some good people are there this season, and we run over to the dances twice a week. Can't you go back with me for a week, old man? I laughed. Northy, said I, if I may be so familiar with a millionaire, because I hate both the name Spencer and Grenville, your invitation is meant kindly, but, the city in the summertime for me. Here, while the bourgeoisie is away, I can live as Nero lived, barring, thank heaven, the fiddling, while the city burns at ninety in the shade. The tropics and the zones wait upon me like handmaidens. I sit under Florida palms and eat pomegranates while Boreas himself, electrically conjured up, blows upon me his arctic breath. As for trout, you know, yourself, that Jean, at Morris's, cooks them better than anyone else in the world. Be advised, said North. My chef has pinched the blue ribbon from the lot. He lays some slices of bacon inside the trout, wraps it all in corn husks, the husks of green corn, you know, buries them in hot ashes and covers them with live coals. We build fires on the bank of the lake and have fish suppers. I know, said I and the servants bring down tables and chairs and damask cloths, and you eat with silver forks. I know the kind of camps that you millionaires have. And there are champagne pails set about, disgracing the wild flowers, and, no doubt, Madame Tetrazzini to sing in the boat pavilion after the trout. Oh no, said North, concernedly, we were never as bad as that. We did have a variety troupe up from the city three or four nights, but they weren't stars by as far as light can travel in the same length of time. I always like a few home comforts even when I'm roughing it. But don't tell me you prefer to stay in the city during summer. I don't believe it. If you do, why did you spend your summers there for the last four years, even sneaking away from town on a night train, and refusing to tell your friends where this Arcadian village was? Because, said I, they might have followed me and discovered it. But since then I have learned that Amaryllis has come to town. The coolest things, the freshest, the brightest, the choicest, are to be found in the city. If you've nothing on hand this evening I will show you. I'm free, said North, and I have my light car outside. I suppose, since you've been converted to the town. That your idea of rural sport is to have a little whirl between bicycle cops in Central Park and then a mug of sticky ale in some stuffy rotskeller under a fan that can't stir up as many revolutions in a week as Nicaragua can in a day. We'll begin with the spin through the park, anyhow, I said. I was choking with the hot, stale air of my little apartment, and I wanted that breath of the cool to brace me for the task of proving to my friend that New York was the greatest, and so forth. Where can you find air any fresher or purer than this? I asked, as we sped into Central's Bosquius Dell. Air, said North, contemptuously. Do you call this air? This muggy vapor, smelling of garbage and gasoline smoke. Man, I wish you could get one sniff of the real Adirondack article in the pine woods at daylight. I have heard of it, said I. But for fragrance and tang and a joy in the nostrils I would not give one puff of sea breeze across the bay, down on my little boat dock on Long Island. For ten of your turpentine-scented tornadoes. Then why, asked North, a little curiously, don't you go there instead of staying cooped up in this greater bakery? Because, said I, doggedly, I have discovered that New York is the greatest summer. Don't say that again, interrupted North. 
unless you've actually got a job as general passenger agent of the subway. You can't really believe it. I went to some trouble to try to prove my theory to my friend. The Weather Bureau and the season had conspired to make the argument worthy of an able advocate. The city seemed stretched on a broiler directly above the furnaces of Avernus. There was a kind of tepid gaiety afoot and a wheel in the boulevards, mainly evinced by languid men strolling about in straw hats and evening clothes, and rows of idle taxicabs with their flags up. Looking like a blockaded Fourth of July procession. The hotels kept up a specious brilliancy in hospitable outlook, but inside one saw vast empty caverns. And the footrails at the bars gleamed brightly from long disacquaintance with the sole leather of customers. In the cross-down streets the steps of the old brownstone houses were swarming with stupors that motley race hailing from skylight room and basement. Bringing out their straw doorstep mats to sit and fill the air with strange noises and opinions. North and I dined on the top of a hotel, and here, for a few minutes, I thought I had made a score. An east wind, almost cool, blew across the roofless roof. A capable orchestra concealed in a bower of wisteria played with sufficient judgment to make the art of music probable and the art of conversation possible. Some ladies in reproachless summer gowns at other tables gave animation and color to the scene. And an excellent dinner, mainly from the refrigerator, seemed to successfully back my judgment as to summer resorts. But North grumbled all during the meal, and cursed his lawyers and prated so of his confounded camp in the woods that I began to wish he would go back there and leave me in my peaceful city retreat. After dining we went to a roof garden vaudeville that was being much praised. There we found a good bill, an artificially cooled atmosphere, cold drinks, prompt service, and a gay, well-dressed audience. North was bored. If this isn't comfortable enough for you on the hottest August night for five years, I said, a little sarcastically. You might think about the kids down in Delancey and Hester Streets lying out on the fire escapes with their tongues hanging out, trying to get a breath of air that hasn't been fried on both sides. The contrast might increase your enjoyment. Don't talk socialism, said North. I gave $500 to the Free Ice Fund on the 1st of May. I'm contrasting these stale, artificial, hollow, wearisome, amusements with the enjoyment a man can get in the woods. You should see the firs and pines do skirt dances during a storm. And lie down flat and drink out of a mountain branch at the end of a day's tramp after the deer. That's the only way to spend a summer. Get out and live with nature. I agree with you absolutely, said I, with emphasis. For one moment I had relaxed my vigilance, and had spoken my true sentiments. North looked at me long and curiously. Then why, in the name of Pan and Apollo, he asked, have you been singing this deceitful paean to summer in town? I suppose I looked my guilt. Ha, huh, said North, I see. May I ask her name? Annie Ashton, said I, simply. She played Nanette in Binkley and Bing's production of The Silver Chord. She is to have a better part next season. Take me to see her, said North. Miss Ashton lived with her mother in a small hotel. They were out of the West, and had a little money that bridged the seasons. As press agent of Binkley and Bing I had tried to keep her before the public. As Robert James Vandiver I had hoped to withdraw her. For if ever one was made to keep company with said Vandiver and smell the salt breeze on the south shore of Long Island and listen to the ducks quack in the watches of the night. It was the Ashton set forth above. But she had a soul above ducks, above nightingales, aye, even above birds of paradise. She was very beautiful, with quiet ways, and seemed genuine. She had both taste and talent for the stage, and she liked to stay at home and read and make caps for her mother. She was unvaryingly kind and friendly with Binkley and Bing's press agent. Since the theater had closed she had allowed Mr. Vandiver to call in an unofficial role. I had often spoken to her of my friend, Spencer Grenville North. And so, as it was early, the first turn of the vaudeville being not yet over, we left to find a telephone. Miss Ashton would be very glad to see Mr. Vandiver and Mr. North. 
we found her fitting a new cap on her mother. I never saw her look more charming. North made himself disagreeably entertaining. He was a good talker, and had a way with him. Besides, he had two, ten, or thirty millions, I've forgotten which. I incautiously admired the mother's cap, whereupon she brought out her store of a dozen or two, and I took a course in edgings and frills. Even though Annie's fingers had pinked, or ruched, or hemmed, or whatever you do to them, they palled upon me. And I could hear North driveling to Annie about his odious Adirondack camp. Two days after that I saw North in his motor car with Miss Ashton and her mother. On the next afternoon he dropped in on me. Bobby, said he, this old burg isn't such a bad proposition in the summertime, after all. Since I've keen knocking around it looks better to me. There are some first-rate musical comedies and light operas on the roofs and in the outdoor gardens. And if you hunt up the right places and stick to soft drinks, you can keep about as cool here as you can in the country. Hang it. When you come to think of it, there's nothing much to the country, anyhow. You get tired and sunburned and lonesome, and you have to eat any old thing that the cook dishes up to you. It makes a difference, doesn't it? said I. It certainly does. Now, I found some whitebait yesterday, at Morris's, with a new sauce that beats anything in the trout line I ever tasted. It makes a difference, doesn't it? I said. Immense. The sauce is the main thing with whitebait. It makes a difference, doesn't it? I asked, looking him straight in the eye. He understood. Look here, Bob, he said, I was going to tell you. I couldn't help it. I'll play fair with you, but I'm going in to win. She is the one particular for me. All right, said I. It's a fair field. There are no rights for you to encroach upon. On Thursday afternoon Miss Ashton invited North and myself to have tea in her apartment. He was devoted, and she was more charming than usual. By avoiding the subject of caps I managed to get a word or two into and out of the talk. Miss Ashton asked me in a make-conversational tone something about the next season's tour. Oh, said I, I don't know about that. I'm not going to be with Binkley and Bing next season. Why, I thought, said she, that they were going to put the number one road company under your charge. I thought you told me so. They were, said I, but they won't. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to the south shore of Long Island and buy a small cottage I know there on the edge of the bay. And I'll buy a catboat and a rowboat and a shotgun and a yellow dog. I've got money enough to do it. And I'll smell the salt wind all day when it blows from the sea and the pine odor when it blows from the land. And, of course, I'll write plays until I have a trunk full of them on hand. And the next thing and the biggest thing I'll do will be to buy that duck farm next door. Few people understand ducks. I can watch them for hours. They can march better than any company in the National Guard, and they can play follow my leader better than the entire Democratic Party. Their voices don't amount to much, but I like to hear them. They wake you up a dozen times a night, but there's a homely sound about their quacking that is more musical to me than the cry of fresh strawberries. Under your window in the morning when you want to sleep. And, I went on, enthusiastically, do you know the value of ducks besides their beauty and intelligence and order and sweetness of voice? Picking their feathers gives you an unfailing and never-ceasing income. On a farm that I know the feathers were sold for $400 in one year. Think of that. And the ones shipped to the market will bring in more money than that. Yes, I am for the ducks and the salt breeze coming over the bay. I think I shall get a Chinaman cook, and with him and the dog and the sunsets for company I shall do well. No more of this dull, baking, senseless, roaring city for me. Miss Ashton looked surprised. North laughed. I am going to begin one of my plays tonight, I said, so I must be going. And with that I took my departure. A few days later Miss Ashton telephoned to me, asking me to call at four in the afternoon. I did. You have been very good to me, 
she said, hesitatingly, and I thought I would tell you. I am going to leave the stage. Yes, said I, I suppose you will. They usually do when there's so much money. There is no money, she said, or very little. Our money is almost gone. But I am told, said I, that he has something like two or ten or thirty millions, I have forgotten which. I know what you mean, she said. I will not pretend that I do not. I am not going to marry Mr. North. Then why are you leaving the stage? I asked, severely. What else can you do to earn a living? She came closer to me, and I can see the look in her eyes yet as she spoke. I can pick ducks, she said. We sold the first year's feathers for $350. The Venturers Let the story wreck itself on the spreading rails of the Non Sequitur Limited, if it will, first you must take your seat in the observation car, raison d'etre, for one moment. It is for no longer than to consider a brief essay on the subject, let us call it, What's Around the Corner. Omni mundus in duas parties devisum est, men who wear rubbers and pay poll taxes, and men who discover new continents. There are no more continents to discover. But by the time overshows are out of date and the poll has developed into an income tax, the other half will be paralleling the canals of Mars with radium railways. Fortune, chance, and adventure are given as synonymous in the dictionaries. To the knowing each has a different meaning. Fortune is a prize to be won. Adventure is the road to it. Chance is what may lurk in the shadows at the roadside. The face of fortune is radiant and alluring, that of adventure is flushed and heroic. The face of chance is the beautiful countenance, perfect because vague and dream-born, that we see in our teacups at breakfast while we growl over our chops and toast. The adventurer is one who keeps his eye on the hedgerows and wayside groves and meadows while he travels the road to fortune. That is the difference between him and the adventurer. Eating the forbidden fruit was the best record ever made by a venturer. Trying to prove that it happened is the highest work of the adventuresome. To be either is disturbing to the cosmogony of creation. So, as bracketsawed and city directoried citizens, let us light our pipes, chide the children and the cat. Arrange ourselves in the willow rocker under the flickering gas jet at the coolest window and scan this little tale of two modern followers of chance. Did you ever hear that story about the man from the West? asked Billinger, in the little dark oak room to your left as you penetrate the interior of the Powhatan Club. Doubtless, said John Reginald Forster rising and leaving the room. Forster got his straw hat, straws will be in and may be out again long before this is printed, from the checkroom boy, and walked out of the air, as Hamlet says. Billinger was used to having his stories insulted and would not mind. Forster was in his favorite mood and wanted to go away from anywhere. A man, in order to get on good terms with himself, must have his opinions corroborated and his moods matched by someone else. I had written that, somebody, but an ADT. Boy who once took a telegram for me pointed out that I could save money by using the compound word. This is a vice versa case. Forster's favorite mood was that of greatly desiring to be a follower of chance. He was a venturer by nature, but convention, birth, tradition and the narrowing influences of the tribe of Manhattan had denied him full privilege. He had trodden all the main traveled thoroughfares and many of the side roads that are supposed to relieve the tedium of life. But none had sufficed. The reason was that he knew what was to be found at the end of every street. He knew from experience and logic almost precisely to what end each digression from routine must lead. He found a depressing monotony in all the variations that the music of his sphere had grafted upon the tune of life. He had not learned that, Although the world was made round, the circle has been squared, and that its true interest is to be in what's around the corner. Forster walked abroad aimlessly from the Powhatan, trying not to tax either his judgment or his desire as to what streets he traveled. He would have been glad to lose his way if it were possible. But he had no hope of that. Adventure and fortune move at your beck and call in the greater city, but chance is oriental. She is a veiled lady in a sedan chair, 
protected by a special traffic squad of Dragonians. Cross down, uptown, and downtown you may move without seeing her. At the end of an hour's stroll, Forster stood on a corner of a broad, smooth avenue, looking disconsolately across it at a picturesque old hotel softly but brilliantly lit. Disconsolately, because he knew that he must dine, and dining in that hotel was no venture. It was one of his favorite caravansaries, and so silent and swift would be the service and so delicately choice the food, that he regretted the hunger that must be appeased by the dead perfection of the place's cuisine. Even the music there seemed to be always playing de capo. Fancy came to him that he would dine at some cheap, even dubious, restaurant lower down in the city. Where the erratic chefs from all countries of the world spread their national cookery for the omnivorous American. Something might happen there out of the routine, he might come upon a subject without a predicate, a road without an end, a question without an answer, a cause without an effect. A gulf stream in life's salt ocean. He had not dressed for evening, he wore a dark business suit that would not be questioned even where the waiters served the spaghetti in their shirt sleeves. So John Reginald Forster began to search his clothes for money, because the more cheaply you dine, the more surely must you pay. All of the thirteen pockets, large and small, of his business suit he explored carefully and found not a penny. His bank book showed a balance of five figures to his credit in the old Ironsides Trust Company. But. Forster became aware of a man nearby at his left hand who was really regarding him with some amusement. He looked like any businessman of thirty or so, neatly dressed and standing in the attitude of one waiting for a street car. But there was no car line on that avenue. So his proximity and unconcealed curiosity seemed to Forster to partake of the nature of a personal intrusion. But, as he was a consistent seeker after what's around the corner, instead of manifesting resentment he only turned a half-embarrassed smile upon the other's grin of amusement. All in? Asked the intruder, drawing nearer. Seems so, said Forster. Now, I thought there was a dollar in. Oh, I know, said the other man, with a laugh. But there wasn't. I've just been through the same process myself, as I was coming around the corner. I found in an upper vest pocket, I don't know how they got there, exactly two pennies. You know what kind of a dinner exactly two pennies will buy. You haven't dined, then, asked Forster. I have not. But I would like to. Now, I'll make you a proposition. You look like a man who would take up one. Your clothes look neat and respectable. Excuse personalities. I think mine will pass the scrutiny of a head waiter, also. Suppose we go over to that hotel and dine together. We will choose from the menu like millionaires, or, if you prefer, like gentlemen in moderate circumstances dining extravagantly for once. When we have finished we will match with my two pennies to see which of us will stand the brunt of the house's displeasure and vengeance. My name is Ives. I think we have lived in the same station of life, before our money took wings. You're on, said Forster, joyfully. Here was a venture at least within the borders of the mysterious country of chance, anyhow, it promised something better than the stale infestivity of a table d'hote. The two were soon seated at a corner table in the hotel dining room. Ives chucked one of his pennies across the table to Forster. Match for which of us gives the order, he said. Forster lost. Ives laughed and began to name liquids and viands to the waiter with the absorbed but calm deliberation of one who was to the menu born. Forster, listening, gave his admiring approval of the order. I am a man, said Ives, during the oysters, who has made a lifetime search after the to be continued in our next. I am not like the ordinary adventurer who strikes for a coveted prize. Nor yet am I like a gambler who knows he is either to win or lose a certain set stake. What I want is to encounter an adventure to which I can predict no conclusion. It is the breath of existence to me to dare fate in its blindest manifestations. The world has come to run so much by rote and gravitation that you can enter upon hardly any footpath of chance in which you do not find signboards informing you of what you may expect at its end. 
I am like the clerk in the circumlocution office who always complained bitterly when anyone came in to ask information. He wanted to know, you know, was the kick he made to his fellow clerks. Well, I don't want to know, I don't want to reason, I don't want to guess, I want to bet my hand without seeing it. I understand, said Forster delightedly. I've often wanted the way I feel put into words. You've done it. I want to take chances on what's coming. Suppose we have a bottle of Moselle with the next course. Agreed, said Ives. I'm glad you catch my idea. It will increase the animosity of the house toward the loser. If it does not weary you, we will pursue the theme. Only a few times have I met a true venturer, one who does not ask a schedule and map from fate when he begins a journey. But, as the world becomes more civilized and wiser, the more difficult it is to come upon an adventure the end of which you cannot foresee. In the Elizabethan days you could assault the watch, ring knockers from doors and have a jolly set to with the blades in any convenient angle of a wall and get away with it. Nowadays, if you speak disrespectfully to a policeman, all that is left to the most romantic fancy is to conjecture in what particular police station he will land you. I know, I know, said Forster, nodding approval. I returned to New York today, continued Ives, from a three years ramble around the globe. Things are not much better abroad than they are at home. The whole world seems to be overrun by conclusions. The only thing that interests me greatly is a premise. I've tried shooting big game in Africa. I know what an express rifle will do at so many yards. And when an elephant or a rhinoceros falls to the bullet, I enjoy it about as much as I did when I was kept in after school to do a sum in long division on the blackboard. I know, I know, said Forster. There might be something in aeroplanes, went on Ives, reflectively. I've tried ballooning, but it seems to be merely a cut and dried affair of wind and ballast. Women, suggested Forster, with a smile. Three months ago, said Ives. I was pottering around in one of the bazaars in Constantinople. I noticed a lady, veiled, of course, but with a pair of especially fine eyes visible, who was examining some amber and pearl ornaments at one of the booths. With her was an attendant, a big Nubian, as black as coal. After a while the attendant drew nearer to me by degrees and slipped a scrap of paper into my hand. I looked at it when I got a chance. On it was scrawled hastily in pencil, the arched gate of the Nightingale Garden at nine tonight. Does that appear to you to be an interesting premise, Mr. Forster? I made inquiries and learned that the Nightingale Garden was the property of an old Turk, a Grand Vizier, or something of the sort. Of course I prospected for the arched gate and was there at nine. The same Nubian attendant opened the gate promptly on time, and I went inside and sat on a bench by a perfumed fountain with the veiled lady. We had quite an extended chat. She was Myrtle Thompson, a lady journalist, who was writing up the Turkish harems for a Chicago newspaper. She said she noticed the New York cut of my clothes in the bazaar and wondered if I couldn't work something into the metropolitan papers about it. I see, said Forster. I see. I've canoed through Canada, said Ives, down many rapids and over many falls. But I didn't seem to get what I wanted out of it because I knew there were only two possible outcomes, I would either go to the bottom or arrive at the sea level. I've played all games at cards. But the mathematicians have spoiled that sport by computing the percentages. I've made acquaintances on trains, I've answered advertisements, I've rung strange doorbells, I've taken every chance that presented itself. But there has always been the conventional ending, the logical conclusion to the premise. I know, repeated Forster. I've felt it all. But I've had few chances to take my chance at chances. Is there any life so devoid of impossibilities as life in this city? There seems to be a myriad of opportunities for testing the undeterminable but not one in a thousand fails to land you where you expected it to stop. I wish the subways and streetcars disappointed one as seldom. The sun has risen, said Ives, on the Arabian nights. There are no more caliphs. The fisherman's vase is turned to a vacuum bottle, 
warranted to keep any genie boiling or frozen for 48 hours. Life moves by rote. Science has killed adventure. There are no more opportunities such as Columbus and the man who ate the first oyster had. The only certain thing is that there is nothing uncertain. Well, said Forster, my experience has been the limited one of a city man. I haven't seen the world as you have, but it seems that we view it with the same opinion. But, I tell you I am grateful for even this little venture of ours into the borders of the haphazard. There may be at least one breathless moment when the bill for the dinner is presented. Perhaps, after all. The pilgrims who traveled without scrip or purse found a keener taste to life than did the knights of the round table who rode abroad with a retinue and King Arthur's certified checks in the lining of their helmets. And now, if you've finished your coffee, suppose we match one of your insufficient coins for the impending blow of fate. What have I up? Heads, called Ives. Heads it is, said Forster, lifting his hand. I lose. We forgot to agree upon a plan for the winner to escape. I suggest that when the waiter comes you make a remark about telephoning to a friend. I will hold the fort and the dinner check long enough for you to get your hat and be off. I thank you for an evening out of the ordinary, Mr. Ives, and wish we might have others. If my memory is not at fault, said Ives, laughing, the nearest police station is in McDougall Street. I have enjoyed the dinner, too, let me assure you. Forster crooked his finger for the waiter. Victor, with a locomotive effort that seemed to owe more to pneumatics than to pedestrianism, glided to the table and laid the card, face downward, by the loser's cup. Forster took it up and added the figures with deliberate care. Ives leaned back comfortably in his chair. Excuse me, said Forster. But I thought you were going to ring Grimes about that theater party for Thursday night. Had you forgotten about it? Oh, said Ives, settling himself more comfortably, I can do that later on. Get me a glass of water, waiter. Want to be in at the death, do you? asked Forster. I hope you don't object, said Ives, pleadingly. Never in my life have I seen a gentleman arrested in a public restaurant for swindling it out of a dinner. All right, said Forster, calmly. You are entitled to see a Christian die in the arena as your pousse café. Victor came with the glass of water and remained, with the disengaged air of an inexorable collector. Forster hesitated for fifteen seconds, and then took a pencil from his pocket and scribbled his name on the dinner check. The waiter bowed and took it away. The fact is, said Forster, with a little embarrassed laugh, I doubt whether I'm what they call a game sport, which means the same as a soldier of fortune. I'll have to make a confession. I've been dining at this hotel two or three times a week for more than a year. I always sign my checks. And then, with a note of appreciation in his voice, it was first rate of you to stay to see me through with it when you knew I had no money, and that you might be scooped in, too. I guess I'll confess, too, said Ives, with a grin. I own the hotel. I don't run it, of course, but I always keep a suite on the third floor for my use when I happen to stray into town. He called a waiter and said, Is Mr. Gilmore still behind the desk? All right. Tell him that Mr. Ives is here, and ask him to have my rooms made ready and aired. Another venture cut short by the inevitable, said Forster. Is there a conundrum without an answer in the next number? But let's hold to our subject just for a minute or two, if you will. It isn't often that I meet a man who understands the flaws I pick in existence. I am engaged to be married a month from today. I reserve comment, said Ives. Right. I am going to add to the assertion. I am devotedly fond of the lady, but I can't decide whether to show up at the church or make a sneak for Alaska. It's the same idea, you know, that we were discussing, it does for a fellow as far as possibilities are concerned. Everybody knows the routine, you get a kiss flavored with salon tea after breakfast, you go to the office. You come back home and dress for dinner, theater twice a week, bills, moping around most evenings trying to make conversation, a little quarrel occasionally, maybe sometimes a big one. And a separation, 
or else a settling down into a middle-aged contentment, which is worst of all. I know, said Ives, nodding wisely. It's the dead certainty of the thing, went on Forster, that keeps me in doubt. There'll never more be anything around the corner. Nothing after the little church, said Ives. I know. Understand, said Forster, that I am in no doubt as to my feelings toward the lady. I may say that I love her truly and deeply. But there is something in the current that runs through my veins that cries out against any form of the calculable. I do not know what I want, but I know that I want it. I'm talking like an idiot, I suppose, but I'm sure of what I mean. I understand you, said Ives, with a slow smile. Well, I think I will be going up to my rooms now. If you would dine with me here one evening soon, Mr. Forster, I'd be glad. Thursday, suggested Forster. At seven, if it's convenient, answered Ives. Seven goes, assented Forster. At half past eight, Ives got into a cab and was driven to a number in one of the correct West Seventies. His card admitted him to the reception room of an old fashioned house into which the spirits of fortune, chance, and adventure had never dared to enter. On the walls were the Whistler etchings, the steel engravings by O. Watts his name. The still life paintings of the grapes and garden truck with the watermelon seeds spilled on the table as natural as life, and the groy's head. It was a household. There was even brass and irons. On a table was an album, half Morocco, with oxidized silver protections on the corners of the lids. A clock on the mantel ticked loudly, with a warning click at five minutes to nine. Ives looked at it curiously, remembering a timepiece in his grandmother's home that gave such a warning. And then down the stairs and into the room came Mary Marsden. She was twenty-four, and I leave her to your imagination. But I must say this much, youth and health and simplicity and courage and greenish-violet eyes are beautiful, and she had all these. She gave Ives her hand with the sweet cordiality of an old friendship. You can't think what a pleasure it is, she said, to have you drop in once every three years or so. For half an hour they talked. I confess that I cannot repeat the conversation. You will find it in books in the circulating library. When that part of it was over, Mary said. And did you find what you wanted while you were abroad? What I wanted, said Ives. Yes. You know you were always queer. Even as a boy you wouldn't play marbles or baseball or any game with rules. You wanted to dive in water where you didn't know whether it was ten inches or ten feet deep. And when you grew up you were just the same. We've often talked about your peculiar ways. I suppose I am an incorrigible, said Ives. I am opposed to the doctrine of predestination, to the rule of three, gravitation, taxation, and everything of the kind. Life has always seemed to me something like a serial story would be if they printed above each installment a synopsis of succeeding chapters. Mary laughed merrily. Bob Ames told us once, she said, of a funny thing you did. It was when you and he were on a train in the South. And you got off at a town where you hadn't intended to stop just because the brakeman hung up a sign in the end of the car with the name of the next station on it. I remember, said Ives. That next station has been the thing I've always tried to get away from. I know it, said Mary. And you've been very foolish. I hope you didn't find what you wanted not to find, or get off at the station where there wasn't any, or whatever it was you expected wouldn't happen to you during the three years you've been away. There was something I wanted before I went away, said Ives. Mary looked in his eyes clearly, with a slight, but perfectly sweet smile. There was, she said. You wanted me. And you could have had me, as you very well know. Without replying, Ives let his gaze wander slowly about the room. There had been no change in it since last he had been in it, three years before. He vividly recalled the thoughts that had been in his mind then. The contents of that room were as fixed, in their way, as the everlasting hills. No change would ever come there except the inevitable ones wrought by time and decay. That silver-mounted album would occupy that corner of that table, those pictures would hang on the walls. 
those chairs be found in their same places every morn and noon and night while the household hung together. The brass andirons were monuments to order and stability. Here and there were relics of a hundred years ago which were still living mementos and would be for many years to come. One going from and coming back to that house would never need to forecast or doubt. He would find what he left, and leave what he found. The veiled lady, Chance, would never lift her hand to the knocker on the outer door. And before him sat the lady who belonged in the room. Cool and sweet and unchangeable she was. She offered no surprises. If one should pass his life with her, though she might grow white-haired and wrinkled, he would never perceive the change. Three years he had been away from her, and she was still waiting for him as established and constant as the house itself. He was sure that she had once cared for him. It was the knowledge that she would always do so that had driven him away. Thus his thoughts ran. I am going to be married soon, said Mary. On the next Thursday afternoon Forster came hurriedly to Ives' hotel. Old man, said he, we'll have to put that dinner off for a year or so, I'm going abroad. The steamer sails at four. That was a great talk we had the other night, and it decided me. I'm going to knock around the world and get rid of that incubus that has been weighing on both you and me, the terrible dread of knowing what's going to happen. I've done one thing that hurts my conscience a little but I know it's best for both of us. I've written to the lady to whom I was engaged and explained everything, told her plainly why I was leaving, that the monotony of matrimony would never do for me. Don't you think I was right? It is not for me to say, answered Ives. Go ahead and shoot elephants if you think it will bring the element of chance into your life. We've got to decide these things for ourselves. But I tell you one thing, Forster, I've found the way. I've found out the biggest hazard in the world, a game of chance that never is concluded, a venture that may end in the highest heaven or the blackest pit. It will keep a man on edge until the clods fall on his coffin, because he will never know, not until his last day, and not then will he know. It is a voyage without a rudder or compass, and you must be captain and crew and keep watch, every day and night, yourself, with no one to relieve you. I have found the venture. Don't bother yourself about leaving Mary Marsden, Forster. I married her yesterday at noon. A municipal report. The cities are full of pride. Challenging each to each. This from her mountainside. That from her burdened beach. R. Kipling. Fancy a novel about Chicago or Buffalo, let us say, or Nashville, Tennessee. There are just three big cities in the United States that are story cities, New York, of course, New Orleans, and, best of the lot, San Francisco. Frank Norris. East is East, and West is San Francisco, according to Californians. Californians are a race of people, they are not merely inhabitants of a state. They are the Southerners of the West. Now, Chicagoans are no less loyal to their city but when you ask them why, they stammer and speak of Lake Fish and the new Odd Fellows building. But Californians go into detail. Of course they have, in the climate, an argument that is good for half an hour while you are thinking of your coal bills and heavy underwear. But as soon as they come to mistake your silence for conviction, madness comes upon them, and they picture the city of the Golden Gate as the Baghdad of the New World. So far, as a matter of opinion, no refutation is necessary. But, dear cousins all, from Adam and Eve descended, it is a rash one who will lay his finger on the map and say, in this town there can be no romance, what could happen here? Yes, it is a bold and a rash deed to challenge in one sentence history, romance, and Rand and McNally. Nashville, a city, port of delivery, and the capital of the state of Tennessee, is on the Cumberland River and on the N.C. and St. L. and the L. and N. railroads. This city is regarded as the most important educational center in the South. I stepped off the train at 8 a.m. Having searched the thesaurus in vain for adjectives, I must, as a substitution, hie me to comparison in the form of a recipe. Take a London fog 30 parts, malaria 10 parts, gas leaks 20 parts. 
Dewdrops gathered in a brickyard at sunrise, 25 parts, odor of honeysuckle 15 parts. Mix. The mixture will give you an approximate conception of a Nashville drizzle. It is not so fragrant as a mothball nor as thick as pea soup, but, tis enough, twill serve. I went to a hotel in a tumbrel. It required strong self-suppression for me to keep from climbing to the top of it and giving an imitation of Sidney Carton. The vehicle was drawn by beasts of a bygone era and driven by something dark and emancipated. I was sleepy and tired, so when I got to the hotel I hurriedly paid it the fifty cents it demanded, with approximate lenyap, I assure you. I knew its habits. And I did not want to hear it prate about its old marster or anything that happened bifo de wa. The hotel was one of the kind described as renovated. That means $20,000 worth of new marble pillars, tiling, electric lights and brass cuspidors in the lobby, and a new L and N. Timetable and a lithograph of Lookout Mountain in each one of the great rooms above. The management was without reproach, the attention full of exquisite southern courtesy, the service as slow as the progress of a snail and as good-humored as Rip Van Winkle. The food was worth traveling a thousand miles for. There is no other hotel in the world where you can get such chicken livers and brochette. At dinner I asked a negro waiter if there was anything doing in town. He pondered gravely for a minute, and then replied, Well, boss, I don't really reckon there's anything at all doing, after sundown. Sundown had been accomplished. It had been drowned in the drizzle long before. So that spectacle was denied me. But I went forth upon the streets in the drizzle to see what might be there. It is built on undulating grounds. And the streets are lighted by electricity at a cost of $32,470 per annum. As I left the hotel there was a race riot. Down upon me charged a company of freedmen, or Arabs, or Zulus, armed with, no, I saw with relief that they were not rifles, but whips. And I saw dimly a caravan of black, clumsy vehicles. And at the reassuring shouts, Kire you anywhere in the town, boss, for fifty cents, I reasoned that I was merely a fare instead of a victim. I walked through long streets, all leading uphill. I wondered how those streets ever came down again. Perhaps they didn't until they were graded. On a few of the main streets, I saw lights in stores here and there. Saw streetcars go by conveying worthy burgers hither and yon. Saw people pass engaged in the art of conversation, and heard a burst of semi-lively laughter issuing from a soda water and ice cream parlor. The streets other than Maine seemed to have enticed upon their borders houses consecrated to peace and domesticity. In many of them lights shone behind discreetly drawn window shades. In a few pianos tinkled orderly and irreproachable music. There was, indeed, little doing. I wished I had come before sundown. So I returned to my hotel. In November, 1864, the Confederate General Hood advanced against Nashville, where he shut up a national force under General Thomas. The latter then sallied forth and defeated the Confederates in a terrible conflict. All my life I have heard of, admired, and witnessed the fine marksmanship of the South in its peaceful conflicts in the tobacco-chewing regions. But in my hotel a surprise awaited me. There were twelve bright, new, imposing, capacious brass cuspidors in the great lobby. Tall enough to be called urns and so wide-mouthed at the crack pitcher of a lady baseball team should have been able to throw a ball into one of them at five paces distant. But, although a terrible battle had raged and was still raging, the enemy had not suffered. Bright, new, imposing, capacious, untouched, they stood. But, shades of Jefferson brick. The tile floor, the beautiful tile floor. I could not avoid thinking of the Battle of Nashville, and trying to draw, as is my foolish habit, some deductions about hereditary marksmanship. Here I first saw Major, by misplaced courtesy, Wentworth Caswell. I knew him for a type the moment my eyes suffered from the sight of him. A rat has no geographical habitat. My old friend, A. Tennyson, said, as he so well said almost everything. 
Prophet, curse me the blabbing lip. And curse me the British vermin, the rat. Let us regard the word British as interchangeable ad lib. A rat is a rat. This man was hunting about the hotel lobby like a starved dog that had forgotten where he had buried a bone. He had a face of great acreage, red, pulpy, and with a kind of sleepy massiveness like that of Buddha. He possessed one single virtue, he was very smoothly shaven. The mark of the beast is not indelible upon a man until he goes about with a stubble. I think that if he had not used his razor that day I would have repulsed his advances, and the criminal calendar of the world would have been spared the addition of one murder. I happened to be standing within five feet of a cuspidor when Major Caswell opened fire upon it. I had been observant enough to perceive that the attacking force was using gatlings instead of squirrel rifles. So I sidestepped so promptly that the Major seized the opportunity to apologize to a non-combatant. He had the blabbing lip. In four minutes he had become my friend and had dragged me to the bar. I desire to interpolate here that I am a southerner. But I am not one by profession or trade. I eschew the string tie, the slouch hat, the Prince Albert, the number of bales of cotton destroyed by Sherman, and plug chewing. When the orchestra plays Dixie I do not cheer. I slide a little lower on the leather-cornered seat and, well, order another Würzburger and wish that Longstreet had, but what's the use? Major Caswell banged the bar with his fist, and the first gun at Fort Sumter re-echoed. When he fired the last one at Appomattox I began to hope. But then he began on family trees, and demonstrated that Adam was only a third cousin of a collateral branch of the Caswell family. Genealogy disposed of, he took up, to my distaste, his private family matters. He spoke of his wife, traced her descent back to Eve, and profanely denied any possible rumor that she may have had relations in the land of Nod. By this time I was beginning to suspect that he was trying to obscure by noise the fact that he had ordered the drinks, on the chance that I would be bewildered into paying for them. But when they were down he crashed a silver dollar loudly upon the bar. Then, of course, another serving was obligatory. And when I had paid for that I took leave of him brusquely. For I wanted no more of him. But before I had obtained my release he had prated loudly of an income that his wife received, and showed a handful of silver money. When I got my key at the desk the clerk said to me courteously, If that man Caswell has annoyed you, and if you would like to make a complaint, we will have him ejected. He is a nuisance, a loafer, and without any known means of support, although he seems to have some money most the time. But we don't seem to be able to hit upon any means of throwing him out legally. Why, no, said I, after some reflection, I don't see my way clear to making a complaint. But I would like to place myself on record as asserting that I do not care for his company. Your town, I continued, seems to be a quiet one. What manner of entertainment, adventure, or excitement have you to offer to the stranger within your gates? Well, sir, said the clerk, there will be a show here next Thursday. It is. I'll look it up and have the announcement sent up to your room with the ice water. Good night. After I went up to my room I looked out the window. It was only about ten o'clock, but I looked upon a silent town. The drizzle continued, spangled with dim lights, as far apart as currants in a cake sold at the ladies' exchange. A quiet place, I said to myself, as my first shoe struck the ceiling of the occupant of the room beneath mine. Nothing of the life here that gives color and variety to the cities in the east and west. Just a good, ordinary, humdrum, business town. Nashville occupies a foremost place among the manufacturing centers of the country. It is the fifth boot and shoe market in the United States, the largest candy and cracker manufacturing city in the south, and does an enormous wholesale dry goods, grocery, and drug business. I must tell you how I came to be in Nashville and I assure you the digression brings as much tedium to me as it does to you. I was traveling elsewhere on my own business. But I had a commission from a northern literary magazine to stop over there and establish a personal connection between the publication and one of its contributors, Azalea Adair. Adair, there was no clue to the personality except the handwriting, had sent in some essays, Lost Art, 
and poems that had made the editors swear approvingly over their one o'clock luncheon. So they had commissioned me to round up said Adair and Corner by contract his or her output at two cents a word before some other publisher offered her ten or twenty. At nine o'clock the next morning, after my chicken livers and brochette, try them if you can find that hotel, I strayed out into the drizzle, which was still on for an unlimited run. At the first corner I came upon Uncle Caesar. He was a stalwart negro, older than the pyramids, with grey wool and a face that reminded me of Brutus, and a second afterwards of the late King Setiweo. He wore the most remarkable coat that I ever had seen or expect to see. It reached to his ankles and had once been a confederate grey in colours. But rain and sun and age had so variegated it that Joseph's coat, beside it, would have faded to a pale monochrome. I must linger with that coat, for it has to do with the story, the story that is so long in coming, because you can hardly expect anything to happen in Nashville. Once it must have been the military coat of an officer. The cape of it had vanished, but all adown its front it had been frogged and tasseled magnificently. But now the frogs and tassels were gone. In their stead had been patiently stitched, I surmised by some surviving black mammy, new frogs made of cunningly twisted common hemp and twine. This twine was frayed and disheveled. It must have been added to the coat as a substitute for vanished splendors, with tasteless but painstaking devotion, for it followed faithfully the curves of the long-missing frogs. And, to complete the comedy and pathos of the garment, all its buttons were gone save one. The second button from the top alone remained. The coat was fastened by other twine strings tied through the buttonholes and other holes rudely pierced in the opposite side. There was never such a weird garment so fantastically bedecked and of so many mottled hues. The lone button was the size of a half dollar, made of yellow horn and sewed on with coarse twine. This negro stood by a carriage so old that Ham himself might have started a hack line with it after he left the ark with the two animals hitched to it. As I approached he threw open the door, drew out a feather duster, waved it without using it, and said in deep, rumbling tones. Step right in, Sue. Ain't a speck of dust in it, just got back from a funeral, Sue. I inferred that on such gala occasions carriages were given an extra cleaning. I looked up and down the street and perceived that there was little choice among the vehicles for hire that lined the curb. I looked in my memorandum book for the address of Azalea Adair. I want to go to 861 Jessamine Street, I said, and was about to step into the hack. But for an instant the thick, long, gorilla-like arm of the old negro barred me. On his massive and saturnine face a look of sudden suspicion and enmity flashed for a moment. Then, with quickly returning conviction, he asked blandishingly, What are you gwine there for, boss? What is it to you? I asked, a little sharply. Nothing, Sue, just nothing. Only it's a lonesome kind of part of town and few folks ever has business out there. Step right in. The seats is clean, Jess got back from a funeral, Sue. A mile and a half it must have been to our journey's end. I could hear nothing but the fearful rattle of the ancient hack over the uneven brick paving. I could smell nothing but the drizzle, now further flavored with coal smoke and something like a mixture of tar and oleander blossoms. All I could see through the streaming windows were two rows of dim houses. The city has an area of ten square miles, 181 miles of streets, of which 137 miles are paved. A system of waterworks that cost two million dollars, with 77 miles of mains. 861 Jessamine Street was a decayed mansion. Thirty yards back from the street it stood, outmerged in a splendid grove of trees and untrimmed shrubbery. A row of box bushes overflowed and almost hid the paling fence from sight. The gate was kept closed by a rope noose that encircled the gate post and the first paling of the gate. But when you got inside you saw that 861 was a shell, a shadow, a ghost of former grandeur and excellence. But in the story, I have not yet got inside. When the hack had ceased from rattling and the weary quadrupeds came to a rest I handed my Jeyu his fifty cents with an additional quarter, feeling a glow of conscious generosity, as I did so. 
he refused it. It's two dollars, Sue, he said. How's that? I asked. I plainly heard you call out at the hotel, fifty cents to any part of the town. It's two dollars, Sue, he repeated obstinately. It's a long ways from the hotel. It is within the city limits and well within them. I argued. Don't think that you have picked up a greenhorn Yankee. Do you see those hills over there? I went on, pointing toward the east, I could not see them, myself, for the drizzle. Well, I was born and raised on their other side. You old fool nigger, can't you tell people from other people when you see them? The grim face of King Setiweo softened. Is you from the south, Sue? I reckon it was them shoes of yourn fooled me. They is something sharp in the toes for a southern gentleman man to wear. Then the charge is fifty cents, I suppose? Said I inexorably. His former expression, a mingling of cupidity and hostility, returned, remained ten seconds, and vanished. Boss, he said, fifty cents is right, but I needs two dollars, Sue. I'm obliged to have two dollars. I ain't demandin it now, Sue, after I know where you's from, I'm just sayin' that I has to have two dollars tonight, and business is mighty p. Peace and confidence settled upon his heavy features. He had been luckier than he had hoped. Instead of having picked up a greenhorn, ignorant of rates, he had come upon an inheritance. You confounded old rascal, I said, reaching down to my pocket, you ought to be turned over to the police. For the first time I saw him smile. He knew, he knew. He knew. I gave him two one dollar bills. As I handed them over I noticed that one of them had seen parlous times. Its upper right hand corner was missing, and it had been torn through the middle, but joined again. A strip of blue tissue paper, pasted over the split, preserved its negotiability. Enough of the African bandit for the present, I left him happy, lifted the rope and opened a creaky gate. The house, as I said, was a shell. A paintbrush had not touched it in twenty years. I could not see why a strong wind should not have bowled it over like a house of cards until I looked again at the trees that hugged it close, the trees that saw the Battle of Nashville and still drew their protecting branches around it against storm and enemy and cold. Azalea Adair, fifty years old, white-haired, a descendant of the Cavaliers, as thin and frail as the house she lived in, robed in the cheapest and cleanest dress I ever saw. With an air as simple as a queen's, received me. The reception room seemed a mile square, because there was nothing in it except some rows of books, on unpainted white pine bookshelves, a cracked marble top table, a rag rug, a hairless horsehair sofa, and two or three chairs. Yes, there was a picture on the wall, a colored crayon drawing of a cluster of pansies. I looked around for the portrait of Andrew Jackson and the pinecone hanging basket, but they were not there. Azalea Adair and I had conversation, a little of which will be repeated to you. She was a product of the Old South, gently nurtured in the sheltered life. Her learning was not broad, but was deep and of splendid originality in its somewhat narrow scope. She had been educated at home, and her knowledge of the world was derived from inference and by inspiration. Of such is the precious, small group of essayists made. While she talked to me I kept brushing my fingers, trying, unconsciously, to rid them guiltily of the absent dust from the half-calf backs of Lamb, Chaucer, Hazlitt, Marcus Aurelius. Montaigne and Hood. She was exquisite, she was a valuable discovery. Nearly everybody nowadays knows too much, oh, so much too much, of real life. I could perceive clearly that Azalea Adair was very poor. A house and a dress she had, not much else, I fancied. So, divided between my duty to the magazine and my loyalty to the poets and essayists who fought Thomas in the Valley of the Cumberland, I listened to her voice, which was like a harpsichord's, and found that I could not speak of contracts. In the presence of the nine muses and the three graces one hesitated to lower the topic to two cents. There would have to be another colloquy after I had regained my commercialism. But I spoke of my mission, 
and three o'clock of the next afternoon was set for the discussion of the business proposition. Your town, I said, as I began to make ready to depart, which is the time for smooth generalities, seems to be a quiet, sedate place. A home town, I should say, where few things out of the ordinary ever happen. It carries on an extensive trade in stoves and hollow ware with the west and south, and its flouring mills have a daily capacity of more than 2,000 barrels. Azalea Adair seemed to reflect. I have never thought of it that way, she said, with a kind of sincere intensity that seemed to belong to her. Isn't it in the still, quiet places that things do happen? I fancy that when God began to create the earth on the first Monday morning one could have leaned out one's window and heard the drops of mud splashing from his trowel as he built up the everlasting hills. What did the noisiest project in the world, I mean the building of the Tower of Babel, result in finally? A page and a half of Esperanto in the North American Review. Of course, said I platitudinously, human nature is the same everywhere, but there is more color more drama and movement and romance in some cities than in others. On the surface, said Azalea Adair. I have traveled many times around the world in a golden airship wafted on two wings, print and dreams. I have seen, on one of my imaginary tours, the Sultan of Turkey bowstring with his own hands one of his wives who had uncovered her face in public. I have seen a man in Nashville tear up his theater tickets because his wife was going out with her face covered, with rice powder. In San Francisco's Chinatown I saw the slave girl sing ye dipped slowly, inch by inch, in boiling almond oil to make her swear she would never see her American lover again. She gave in when the boiling oil had reached three inches above her knee. At a euchre party in East Nashville the other night I saw Kitty Morgan cut dead by seven of her schoolmates and lifelong friends because she had married a house painter. The boiling oil was sizzling as high as her heart, but I wish you could have seen the fine little smile that she carried from table to table. Oh, yes, it is a humdrum town. Just a few miles of red brick houses and mud and lumber yards. Someone knocked hollowly at the back of the house. Azalea Adair breathed a soft apology and went to investigate the sound. She came back in three minutes with brightened eyes, a faint flush on her cheeks, and ten years lifted from her shoulders. You must have a cup of tea before you go, she said, and a sugar cake. She reached and shook a little iron bell. In shuffled a small negro girl about twelve, barefoot, not very tidy, glowering at me with thumb in mouth and bulging eyes. Azalea Adair opened a tiny, worn purse and drew out a dollar bill, a dollar bill with the upper right-hand corner missing, torn in two pieces. And pasted together again with a strip of blue tissue paper. It was one of the bills I had given the piratical negro, there was no doubt about it. Go up to Mr. Baker's store on the corner, Impy, she said, handing the girl the dollar bill, and get a quarter of a pound of tea, the kind he always sends me and ten cents worth of sugar cakes. Now, hurry. The supply of tea in the house happens to be exhausted, she explained to me. Impy left by the back way. Before the scrape of her hard, bare feet had died away on the back porch, a wild shriek, I was sure it was hers, filled the hollow house. Then the deep, gruff tones of an angry man's voice mingled with the girl's further squeals and unintelligible words. Azalea Adair rose without surprise or emotion and disappeared. For two minutes I heard the hoarse rumble of the man's voice, then something like an oath and a slight scuffle, and she returned calmly to her chair. This is a roomy house, she said, and I have a tenant for part of it. I am sorry to have to rescind my invitation to tea. It was impossible to get the kind I always use at the store. Perhaps tomorrow, Mr. Baker will be able to supply me. I was sure that Impey had not had time to leave the house. I inquired concerning streetcar lines and took my leave. After I was well on my way I remembered that I had not learned Azalea Adair's name. But tomorrow would do. That same day I started in on the course of iniquity that this uneventful city forced upon me. I was in the town only two days, but in that time I managed to lie shamelessly by telegraph, and to be an accomplice, after the fact, 
if that is the correct legal term, to a murder. As I rounded the corner nearest my hotel the affright coachman of the polychromatic, nonpareil coat seized me, swung open the dungeony door of his peripatetic sarcophagus. Flirted his feather duster and began his ritual, step right in, boss. Carriage is clean, just got back from a funeral. Fifty cents to any. And then he knew me and grinned broadly. Excuse me, boss, you is de gentleman what rid out with me dis morning. Thank you kindly, Sue. I am going out to 861 again tomorrow afternoon at three, said I, and if you will be here, I'll let you drive me. So you know Miss Adair? I concluded, thinking of my dollar bill. I belong to her father, Judge Adair, Sue, he replied. I judge that she is pretty poor, I said. She hasn't much money to speak of, has she? For an instant I looked again at the fierce countenance of King Sediweo, and then he changed back to an extortionate old negro hack driver. She ain't gwine to starve, Sue, he said slowly. She has reso ces, Sue, she has reso ces. I shall pay you fifty cents for the trip, said I. Dat is perfectly correct, Sue, he answered humbly. I just had to have dat two dollars dis morning, boss. I went to the hotel and lied by electricity. I wired the magazine, a, Adair holds out for eight cents a word. The answer that came back was, give it to her quick you duffer. Just before dinner, Major, Wentworth Caswell bore down upon me with the greetings of a long-lost friend. I have seen few men whom I have so instantaneously hated, and of whom it was so difficult to be rid. I was standing at the bar when he invaded me. Therefore I could not wave the white ribbon in his face. I would have paid gladly for the drinks, hoping, thereby, to escape another. But he was one of those despicable, roaring, advertising bibbers who must have brass bands and fireworks attend upon every cent that they waste in their follies. With an air of producing millions he drew two one-dollar bills from a pocket and dashed one of them upon the bar. I looked once more at the dollar bill with the upper right-hand corner missing, torn through the middle, and patched with a strip of blue tissue paper. It was my dollar bill again. It could have been no other. I went up to my room. The drizzle and the monotony of a dreary, eventless southern town had made me tired and listless. I remember that just before I went to bed I mentally disposed of the mysterious dollar bill, which might have formed the clue to a tremendously fine detective story of San Francisco, by saying to myself sleepily, seems as if a lot of people here own stock in the hack driver's trust. Pays dividends promptly, too. Wonder if, then I fell asleep. King Setiweo was at his post the next day, and rattled my bones over the stones out to 861. He was to wait and rattle me back again when I was ready. Azalea Adair looked paler and cleaner and frilier than she had looked on the day before. After she had signed the contract at eight cents per word she grew still paler and began to slip out of her chair. Without much trouble I managed to get her up on the antediluvian horsehair sofa and then I ran out to the sidewalk and yelled to the coffee-colored pirate to bring a doctor. With a wisdom that I had not expected in him, he abandoned his team and struck off up the street afoot, realizing the value of speed. In ten minutes he returned with a grave, gray-haired and capable man of medicine. In a few words, worth much less than eight cents each, I explained to him my presence in the hollow house of mystery. He bowed with stately understanding, and turned to the old negro. Uncle Caesar, he said calmly, run up to my house and ask Miss Lucy to give you a cream pitcher full of fresh milk and half a tumbler of port wine. And hurry back. Don't drive, run. I want you to get back sometime this week. It occurred to me that Dr. Merriman also felt a distrust as to the speeding powers of the land pirate's steeds. After Uncle Caesar was gone, lumberingly, but swiftly, up the street, the doctor looked me over with great politeness and as much careful calculation until he had decided that I might do. It is only a case of insufficient nutrition, he said. In other words, the result of poverty, pride, and starvation. Mrs. Caswell has many devoted friends who would be glad to aid her, 
but she will accept nothing except from that old negro, Uncle Caesar, who was once owned by her family. Mrs. Caswell. Said I, in surprise. And then I looked at the contract and saw that she had signed it, Azalea Adair Caswell. I thought she was Miss Adair, I said. Married to a drunken, worthless loafer, sir, said the doctor. It is said that he robs her even of the small sums that her old servant contributes toward her support. When the milk and wine had been brought the doctor soon revived Azalea Adair. She sat up and talked of the beauty of the autumn leaves that were then in season, and their height of color. She referred lightly to her fainting seizure as the outcome of an old palpitation of the heart. Impey fanned her as she lay on the sofa. The doctor was due elsewhere, and I followed him to the door. I told him that it was within my power and intentions to make a reasonable advance of money to Azalea Adair on future contributions to the magazine, and he seemed pleased. By the way, he said, perhaps you would like to know that you have had royalty for a coachman. Old Caesar's grandfather was a king in Congo. Caesar himself has royal ways, as you may have observed. As the doctor was moving off I heard Uncle Caesar's voice inside, did he get both of dem two dollars from you, Miss Zalia? Yes, Caesar, I heard Azalea Adair answer weakly. And then I went in and concluded business negotiations with our contributor. I assumed the responsibility of advancing fifty dollars, putting it as a necessary formality in binding our bargain. And then Uncle Caesar drove me back to the hotel. Here ends all of the story as far as I can testify as a witness. The rest must be only bare statements of facts. At about six o'clock I went out for a stroll. Uncle Caesar was at his corner. He threw open the door of his carriage, flourished his duster and began his depressing formula, step right in, Sue. Fifty cents to anywhere in the city, hacks perfectly clean, Sue, just got back from a funeral. And then he recognized me. I think his eyesight was getting bad. His coat had taken on a few more faded shades of color, the twine strings were more frayed and ragged, the last remaining button, the button of yellow horn, was gone. A motley descendant of kings was Uncle Caesar. About two hours later I saw an excited crowd besieging the front of a drug store. In a desert where nothing happens this was manna. So I wedged my way inside. On an extemporized couch of empty boxes and chairs was stretched the mortal corporeality of Major Wentworth Caswell. A doctor was testing him for the immortal ingredient. His decision was that it was conspicuous by its absence. The erstwhile major had been found dead on a dark street and brought by curious and ennuied citizens to the drugstore. The late human being had been engaged in terrific battle, the details showed that. Loafer and reprobate though he had been, he had been also a warrior. But he had lost. His hands were yet clinched so tightly that his fingers would not be opened. The gentle citizens who had known him stood about and searched their vocabularies to find some good words, if it were possible, to speak of him. One kind-looking man said, after much thought, when Cass was about F. O. T. he was one of the best spellers in school. While I stood there the fingers of the right hand of, the man that was, which hung down the side of a white pine box, relaxed, and dropped something at my feet. I covered it with one foot quietly, and a little later on I picked it up and pocketed it. I reasoned that in his last struggle his hand must have seized that object unwittingly and held it in a death grip. At the hotel that night the main topic of conversation, with the possible exceptions of politics and prohibition, was the demise of Major Caswell. I heard one man say to a group of listeners. In my opinion, gentlemen, Caswell was murdered by some of these no-account niggers for his money. He had fifty dollars this afternoon which he showed to several gentlemen in the hotel. When he was found the money was not on his person. I left the city the next morning at nine, and as the train was crossing the bridge over the Cumberland River I took out of my pocket a yellow horn overcoat button the size of a fifty-cent piece. With frayed ends of coarse twine hanging from it, and cast it out of the window into the slow, muddy waters below. I wonder what's doing in Buffalo. A Christmas Pie
I am not without claim to distinction. Although I still stick to suspenders, which, happily, reciprocate, I am negatively egregious. I have never, for instance, seen a professional baseball game, never said that George M. Cohan was, clever, never started to keep a diary, never called Eugene Walter by his first name, never parroted, the raven, never written a Christmas story. Never, but what denizen of Never Never Land can boast so much? Or would, I overhear you think, if he could? Always have I been on the lookout for the impossible, always on the trail of the unattainable. Some day, perhaps, I shall find a sleeping car with a name that means something, an intelligent West Indian hall boy in a New York apartment building, a boarding house whose inmates occasionally smile. A man born in Manhattan, a sixty-cent table d'hote that serves six oysters the portion instead of four. A southerner who leaves you in doubt as to his birthplace longer than ten minutes after the introduction, and myself writing a Christmas story. But that will happen ten days after the millennium, and as the millennium is to be magazineless. Every June I am asked to write a Christmas story. Every August I promise, vow, insist, swear that it shall be ready in two weeks. And every November I protest that I am sorry, but I couldn't think of anything new and, well, next year, sure. It was so last year and the year before. It was so this year. And I said to myself that next year it would not be so. I would spend Christmas Eve looking about me. I would get copy from a cop, material from a modder, plot from a messenger boy. And behold! It was Christmas Eve. It was Christmas Eve, to give a synopsis of preceding chapters. I will find Toothcomb the town for an idea next summer, quoth I. And so I walked, rode, and taxicabbed. I spoke to waiters, subway guards, chauffeurs and newsboys and tried to draw from them some bit of life some experience that might make a story, a Christmas story, C.O.D., at twenty cents a word. But there was not a syllable in the silly bunch, not a comma in the comatose lot. And then I wandered into Grand Street and I saw that which made me instinctively clutch my fountain pen. A man, unswept, unmunned and unstrung, was about to hurl a brick into a pawnbroker's window. His arm was raised and he was as deliberate as Mr. Tridigital Brown of Chicago trying to lessen the average of Mr. John P. Hans Wagner of Pittsburgh. I always spell Pittsburgh with the final H. It's a final H of a town. Here, Bill, I said, I wouldn't do that. Oh, yes, you would, he responded. Which was my chance. Let us withdraw to yonder inn, I said, like a head chorus man whose object is to get M off, and we can discuss things. What's the game? I asked, after the waiter had received instructions. I wanted to get money enough to buy my wife a Christmas present. Been out oh work for a year. I'm desperate. I. Nothing of the kind, I contradicted. People don't try to steal diamonds on a crowded street for any such purpose. I'm not a detective, as you might know by my guessing so correctly. Well, he laughed, pulling out a bill and giving it to the waiter for the check, it's a good joke and I'll let you in, though you can't appreciate it. I thought if I hurled that brick in I'd get arrested quick and be sent to a cell or over on the island or something like that. You see, I'm a magazine writer and I wanted to get a real story, Yuletide on the island, or something. What's your line, spoiler of a good story? I. I said. My name is John Horner, and I'm a plumber. A technical error. I never cared especially for feuds, believing them to be even more overrated products of our country than grapefruit, scrapple, or honeymoons. Nevertheless, if I may be allowed, I will tell you of an Indian territory feud of which I was press agent, camp follower, and in accessory during the fact. I was on a visit to Sam Durkee's ranch, where I had a great time falling off unmanicured ponies and waving my bare hand at the lower jaws of wolves about two miles away. Sam was a hardened person of about twenty-five, with a reputation for going home in the dark with perfect equanimity, though often with reluctance. Over in the Creek Nation was a family bearing the name of Tatum. 
I was told that the Deckies and Tatums had been feuding for years. Several of each family had bitten the grass, and it was expected that more Nebuchadnezzars would follow. A younger generation of each family was growing up, and the grass was keeping pace with them. But I gathered that they had fought fairly. That they had not lain in cornfields and aimed at the division of their enemies' suspenders in the back, partly, perhaps, because there were no cornfields, and nobody wore more than one suspender. Nor had any woman or child of either house ever been harmed. In those days, and you will find it so yet, their women were safe. Sam Durkee had a girl. If it were an all-fiction magazine that I expect to sell this story to, I should say, Mr. Durkee rejoiced in a fiancé. Her name was Ella Baines. They appeared to be devoted to each other, and to have perfect confidence in each other, as all couples do who are and have or aren't and haven't. She was tolerably pretty, with a heavy mass of brown hair that helped her along. He introduced me to her, which seemed not to lessen her preference for him. So I reasoned that they were surely soulmates. Miss Baines lived in Kingfisher, twenty miles from the ranch. Sam lived on a gallop between the two places. One day there came to Kingfisher a courageous young man, rather small, with smooth face and regular features. He made many inquiries about the business of the town, and especially of the inhabitants cognominally. He said he was from Muskogee, and he looked it, with his yellow shoes and crocheted four in hand. I met him once when I rode in for the mail. He said his name was Beverly Travers, which seemed rather improbable. There were active times on the ranch, just then, and Sam was too busy to go to town often. As an incompetent and generally worthless guest, it devolved upon me to ride in for little things such as postcards, barrels of flour, baking powder, smoking tobacco, and, letters from Ella. One day, when I was messenger for half a gross of cigarette papers and a couple of wagon tires, I saw the alleged Beverly Travers in a yellow-wheeled buggy with Ella Baines. Driving about town as ostentatiously as the black, waxy mud would permit. I knew that this information would bring no balm of Gilead to Sam's soul, so I refrained from including it in the news of the city that I retailed on my return. But on the next afternoon an elongated ex-cowboy of the name of Simmons, an old-time pal of Sam's, who kept a feed store in Kingfisher, rode out to the ranch and rolled and burned many cigarettes before he would talk. When he did make oration, his words were these. Say, Sam. There's been a description of a galut miscallan himself beveledged travels impairing the atmospheric air of Kingfisher for the past two weeks. You know who he was? He was not otherwise than Ben Tatum, from the Creek Nation, son of old Gopher Tatum that your Uncle Newt shot last February. You know what he done this morning? He killed your brother Lester, shot him in the coat house yard. I wondered if Sam had heard. He pulled a twig from a mesquite bush, chewed it gravely, and said. He did, did he? He killed Lester? The same, said Simmons. And he did more. He run away with your girl, the same as to say Miss Ella Baines. I thought you might like to know, so I rode out to impart the information. I am much obliged, Jim, said Sam, taking the chewed twig from his mouth. Yes, I'm glad you rode out. Yes, I'm right glad. Well, I'll be ridin' back, I reckon. That boy I left in the feed store don't know hay from oats. He shot Lester in the back. Shot him in the back? Yes, while he was hitchin' his hoss. I'm much obliged, Jim. I kind of thought you'd like to know as soon as you could. Come in and have some coffee before you ride back, Jim. Why, no, I reckon not, I must get back to the store. And you say? Yes, Sam. Everybody seen M drive away together in a buckboard, with a big bundle, like clothes, tied up in the back of it. He was driving, the team he brought over with him from Muskogee. They'll be hard to overtake right away. And which? I was going on to tell you. They left on the Guthrie Road. But there's no tellin' which forks they'll take, you know that. All right, Jim, much obliged. 
You're welcome, Sam. Simmons rolled a cigarette and stabbed his pony with both heels. Twenty yards away he reined up and called back. You don't want no, assistance, as you might say? Not any, thanks. I didn't think you would. Well, so long. Sam took out and opened a bone-handled pocket knife and scraped a dried piece of mud from his left boot. I thought at first he was going to swear a vendetta on the blade of it, or recite the gypsy's curse. The few feuds I had ever seen or read about usually opened that way. This one seemed to be presented with a new treatment. Thus offered on the stage, it would have been hissed off, and one of Belasco's thrilling melodramas demanded instead. I wonder, said Sam, with a profoundly thoughtful expression, if the cook has any cold beans left over. He called Wash, the Negro cook, and finding that he had some, ordered him to heat up the pot and make some strong coffee. Then we went into Sam's private room, where he slept, and kept his armory, dogs, and the saddles of his favorite mounts. He took three or four six-shooters out of a bookcase and began to look them over, whistling, the cowboy's lament, abstractedly. Afterward he ordered the two best horses on the ranch saddled and tied to the hitching post. Now, in the feud business, in all sections of the country, I have observed that in one particular there is a delicate but strict etiquette belonging. You must not mention the word or refer to the subject in the presence of a feudist. It would be more reprehensible than commenting upon the mole on the chin of your rich aunt. I found, later on, that there is another unwritten rule, but I think that belongs solely to the West. It yet lacked two hours to supper time. But in twenty minutes Sam and I were plunging deep into the reheated beans, hot coffee, and cold beef. Nothing like a good meal before a long ride, said Sam. Eat hearty. I had a sudden suspicion. Why did you have two horses saddled? I asked. One, two, one, two, said Sam. You can count, can't you? His mathematics carried with it a momentary qualm and a lesson. The thought had not occurred to him that the thought could possibly occur to me not to ride at his side on that red road to revenge and justice. It was the higher calculus. I was booked for the trail. I began to eat more beans. In an hour we set forth at a steady gallop eastward. Our horses were Kentucky bred, strengthened by the mesquite grass of the west. Ben Tatum's steeds may have been swifter, and he had a good lead. But if he had heard the punctual thuds of the hoofs of those trailers of ours, born in the heart of feudland, he might have felt that retribution was creeping up on the hoofprints of his dapper nags. I knew that Ben Tatum's card to play was flight, flight until he came within the safer territory of his own henchmen and supporters. He knew that the man pursuing him would follow the trail to any end where it might lead. During the ride Sam talked of the prospect for rain, of the price of beef, and of the musical glasses. You would have thought he had never had a brother or a sweetheart or an enemy on earth. There are some subjects too big even for the words in the unabridged. Knowing this phase of the feud code, but not having practiced it sufficiently, I overdid the thing by telling some slightly funny anecdotes. Sam laughed at exactly the right place, laughed with his mouth. When I caught sight of his mouth, I wished I had been blessed with enough sense of humor to have suppressed those anecdotes. Our first sight of them we had in Guthrie. Tired and hungry, we stumbled, unwashed, into a little yellow pine hotel and sat at a table. In the opposite corner we saw the fugitives. They were bent upon their meal, but looked around at times uneasily. The girl was dressed in brown, one of these smooth, half-shiny, silky-looking affairs with lace collar and cuffs, and what I believe they call an accordion-plated skirt. She wore a thick brown veil down to her nose, and a broad-brimmed straw hat with some kind of feathers adorning it. The man wore plain, dark clothes, and his hair was trimmed very short. He was such a man as you might see anywhere. There they were, the murderer and the woman he had stolen. There we were, the rightful avenger, according to the code, and the supernumerary who writes these words. For one time, at least, in the heart of the supernumerary there rose the killing instinct. 
For one moment he joined the force of combatants, orally. What are you waiting for, Sam? I said in a whisper. Let him have it now. Sam gave a melancholy sigh. You don't understand. But he does, he said. He knows. Mr. Tenderfoot, there's a rule out here among white men in the nation that you can't shoot a man when he's with a woman. I never knew it to be broke yet. You can't do it. You've got to get him in a gang of men or by himself. That's why. He knows it, too. We all know. So, that's Mr. Ben Tatum. One of the pretty men. I'll cut him out of the herd before they leave the hotel, and regulate his account. After supper the flying pair disappeared quickly. Although Sam haunted lobby and stairway and halls half the night, in some mysterious way the fugitives eluded him. And in the morning the veiled lady in the brown dress with the accordion-plated skirt and the dapper young man with the close-clipped hair, and the buckboard with the prancing nags, were gone. It is a monotonous story, that of the ride, so it shall be curtailed. Once again we overtook them on a road. We were about fifty yards behind. They turned in the buckboard and looked at us. Then drove on without whipping up their horses. Their safety no longer lay in speed. Ben Tatum knew. He knew that the only rock of safety left to him was the code. There is no doubt that, had he been alone, the matter would have been settled quickly with Sam Durkee in the usual way, but he had something at his side that kept still the trigger finger of both. It seemed likely that he was no coward. So, you may perceive that woman, on occasions, may postpone instead of precipitating conflict between man and man. But not willingly or consciously. She is oblivious of codes. Five miles farther, we came upon the future great western city of Chandler. The horses of pursuers and pursued were starved and weary. There was one hotel that offered danger to man and entertainment to beast. So the four of us met again in the dining room at the ringing of a bell so resonant and large that it had cracked the welkin long ago. The dining room was not as large as the one at Guthrie. Just as we were eating apple pie, how Ben Devises and tragedy impinge upon each other, I noticed Sam looking with keen intentness at our quarry where they were seated at a table across the room. The girl still wore the brown dress with lace collar and cuffs, and the veil drawn down to her nose. The man bent over his plate, with his close-cropped head held low. There's a code, I heard Sam say, either to me or to himself, that won't let you shoot a man in the company of a woman. But, by thunder, there ain't one to keep you from killing a woman in the company of a man. And, quicker than my mind could follow his argument. He whipped a Colt's automatic from under his left arm and pumped six bullets into the body that the brown dress covered, the brown dress with the lace collar and cuffs and the accordion-plated skirt. The young person in the dark sack suit, from whose head and from whose life a woman's glory had been clipped, laid her head on her arms stretched upon the table. While people came running to raise Ben Tatum from the floor in his feminine masquerade that had given Sam the opportunity to set aside, technically, the obligations of the code. Let me feel your pulse. So I went to a doctor. How long has it been since you took any alcohol into your system, he asked. Turning my head sidewise, I answered, oh, quite a while. He was a young doctor, somewhere between twenty and forty. He wore heliotrope socks, but he looked like Napoleon. I liked him immensely. Now, said he, I am going to show you the effect of alcohol upon your circulation. I think it was, circulation, he said, though it may have been, advertising. He bared my left arm to the elbow, brought out a bottle of whiskey, and gave me a drink. He began to look more like Napoleon. I began to like him better. Then he put a tight compress on my upper arm, stopped my pulse with his fingers, and squeezed a rubber bulb connected with an apparatus on a stand that looked like a thermometer. The mercury jumped up and down without seeming to stop anywhere, but the doctor said it registered 237 or 165 or some such number. Now, said he, you see what alcohol does to the blood pressure. It's marvelous, said I, but do you think it a sufficient test? 
Have one on me, and let's try the other arm. But, no. Then he grasped my hand. I thought I was doomed and he was saying goodbye. But all he wanted to do was to jab a needle into the end of a finger and compare the red drop with a lot of 50 cent poker chips that he had fastened to a card. It's the hemoglobin test, he explained. The color of your blood is wrong. Well, said I, I know it should be blue, but this is a country of mix ups. Some of my ancestors were cavaliers. But they got thick with some people on Nantucket Island, so. I mean, said the doctor, that the shade of red is too light. Oh, said I, it's a case of matching instead of matches. The doctor then pounded me severely in the region of the chest. When he did that I don't know whether he reminded me most of Napoleon or Battling or Lord Nelson. Then he looked grave and mentioned a string of grievances that the flesh is heir to, mostly ending in, itis. I immediately paid him fifteen dollars on account. Is or are it or some or any of them necessarily fatal? I asked. I thought my connection with the matter justified my manifesting a certain amount of interest. All of them, he answered cheerfully. But their progress may be arrested. With care and proper continuous treatment you may live to be eighty-five or ninety. I began to think of the doctor's bill. Eighty-five would be sufficient, I am sure, was my comment. I paid him ten dollars more on account. The first thing to do, he said, with renewed animation, is to find a sanitarium where you will get a complete rest for a while, and allow your nerves to get into a better condition. I myself will go with you and select a suitable one. So he took me to a madhouse in the Catskills. It was on a bare mountain frequented only by infrequent frequenters. You could see nothing but stones and boulders, some patches of snow, and scattered pine trees. The young physician in charge was most agreeable. He gave me a stimulant without applying a compress to the arm. It was luncheon time, and we were invited to partake. There were about twenty inmates at little tables in the dining room. The young physician in charge came to our table and said, It is a custom with our guests not to regard themselves as patients, but merely as tired ladies and gentlemen taking a rest. Whatever slight maladies they may have are never alluded to in conversation. My doctor called loudly to a waitress to bring some phosphoglycerate of lime hash, dog bread, bromo seltzer pancakes, and nux vomica tea for my repast. Then a sound arose like a sudden wind storm among pine trees. It was produced by every guest in the room whispering loudly, neurasthenia. Except one man with a nose, whom I distinctly heard say, chronic alcoholism. I hope to meet him again. The physician in charge turned and walked away. An hour or so after luncheon he conducted us to the workshop, say fifty yards from the house. Thither the guests had been conducted by the physician in charge's understudy and sponge holder, a man with feet and a blue sweater. He was so tall that I was not sure he had a face. But the armor packing company would have been delighted with his hands. Here, said the physician in charge, our guests find relaxation from past mental worries by devoting themselves to physical labor, recreation, in reality. There were turning lathes, carpenters' outfits, clay modeling tools, spinning wheels, weaving frames, treadmills, bass drums, enlarged crayon portrait apparatuses, blacksmith forges. And everything, seemingly, that could interest the paying lunatic guests of a first rate sanitarium. The lady making mud pies in the corner, whispered the physician in charge, is no other than, Lula Lullington, the authoress of the novel entitled Why Love Loves. What she is doing now is simply to rest her mind after performing that piece of work. I had seen the book. Why doesn't she do it by writing another one instead? I asked. As you see, I wasn't as far gone as they thought I was. The gentleman pouring water through the funnel continued the physician in charge, is a Wall Street broker broken down from overwork. I buttoned my coat. Others he pointed out were architects playing with Noah's arcs, ministers reading Darwin's theory of evolution, lawyers sawing wood. Tired-out society ladies talking Ibsen to the blue-sweatered sponge holder, 
a neurotic millionaire lying asleep on the floor, and a prominent artist drawing a little red wagon around the room. You look pretty strong, said the physician in charge to me. I think the best mental relaxation for you would be throwing small boulders over the mountainside and then bringing them up again. I was a hundred yards away before my doctor overtook me. What's the matter? he asked. The matter is, said I, that there are no aeroplanes handy. So I am going to merrily and hastily jog the foot pathway to Yon Station and catch the first unlimited soft coal express back to town. Well, said the doctor, perhaps you are right. This seems hardly the suitable place for you. But what you need is rest, absolute rest and exercise. That night I went to a hotel in the city, and said to the clerk, what I need is absolute rest and exercise. Can you give me a room with one of those tall folding beds in it, and a relay of bellboys to work it up and down while I rest? The clerk rubbed a speck off one of his fingernails and glanced sidewise at a tall man in a white hat sitting in the lobby. That man came over and asked me politely if I had seen the shrubbery at the west entrance. I had not, so he showed it to me and then looked me over. I thought you had, M, he said, not unkindly, but I guess you're all right. You'd better go see a doctor, old man. A week afterward my doctor tested my blood pressure again without the preliminary stimulant. He looked to me a little less like Napoleon. And his socks were of a shade of tan that did not appeal to me. What you need, he decided, is sea air and companionship. Would a mermaid, I began but he slipped on his professional manner. I myself, he said, will take you to the Hotel Bonaire off the coast of Long Island and see that you get in good shape. It is a quiet, comfortable resort where you will soon recuperate. The Hotel Bonaire proved to be a 900-room fashionable hostelry on an island off the main shore. Everybody who did not dress for dinner was shoved into a side dining room and given only a terrapin and champagne table d'hote. The bay was a great stamping ground for wealthy yachtsmen. The Corsair anchored there the day we arrived. I saw Mr. Morgan standing on deck eating a cheese sandwich and gazing longingly at the hotel. Still, it was a very inexpensive place. Nobody could afford to pay their prices. When you went away you simply left your baggage, stole a skiff, and beat it for the mainland in the night. When I had been there one day I got a pad of monogram telegraph blanks at the clerk's desk and began to wire to all my friends for getaway money. My doctor and I played one game of croquet on the golf links and went to sleep on the lawn. When we got back to town a thought seemed to occur to him suddenly. By the way, he asked, how do you feel? Relieved of very much, I replied. Now a consulting physician is different. He isn't exactly sure whether he is to be paid or not, and this uncertainty ensures you either the most careful or the most careless attention. My doctor took me to see a consulting physician. He made a poor guess and gave me careful attention. I liked him immensely. He put me through some coordination exercises. Have you a pain in the back of your head? he asked. I told him I had not. Shut your eyes, he ordered put your feet close together, and jump backward as far as you can. I always was a good backward jumper with my eyes shut, so I obeyed. My head struck the edge of the bathroom door, which had been left open and was only three feet away. The doctor was very sorry. He had overlooked the fact that the door was open. He closed it. Now touch your nose with your right forefinger, he said. Where is it? I asked. On your face, said he. I mean my right forefinger, I explained. Oh, excuse me, said he. He reopened the bathroom door, and I took my finger out of the crack of it. After I had performed the marvelous digitonasal feat I said. I do not wish to deceive you as to symptoms, doctor. I really have something like a pain in the back of my head. He ignored the symptom and examined my heart carefully with a latest popular air penny in the slot ear trumpet. I felt like a ballad. Now, he said, gallop like a horse for about five minutes around the room. I gave the best imitation I could of a disqualified Percheron being led out of Madison Square Garden. 
Then, without dropping in a penny, he listened to my chest again. No glanders in our family, Doc, I said. The consulting physician held up his forefinger within three inches of my nose. Look at my finger, he commanded. Did you ever try pears, I began, but he went on with his test rapidly. Now look across the bay. At my finger. Across the bay. At my finger. At my finger. Across the bay. Across the bay. At my finger. Across the bay. This for about three minutes. He explained that this was a test of the action of the brain. It seemed easy to me. I never once mistook his finger for the bay. I'll bet that if he had used the phrases, gaze, as it were, unpreoccupied, outward, or rather laterally, in the direction of the horizon, underlaid, so to speak, with the adjacent fluid inlet. And, now, returning, or rather, in a manner, withdrawing your attention, bestow it upon my upraised digit, I'll bet, I say, that Henry James himself could have passed the examination. After asking me if I had ever had a grand uncle with curvature of the spine or a cousin with swelled ankles. The two doctors retired to the bathroom and sat on the edge of the bathtub for their consultation. I ate an apple, and gazed first at my finger and then across the bay. The doctors came out looking grave. More, they looked tombstones and Tennessee papers please copy. They wrote out a diet list to which I was to be restricted. It had everything that I had ever heard of to eat on it, except snails. And I never eat a snail unless it overtakes me and bites me first. You must follow this diet strictly, said the doctors. I'd follow it a mile if I could get one-tenth of what's on it, I answered. Of next importance, they went on, is outdoor air and exercise. And here is a prescription that will be of great benefit to you. Then all of us took something. They took their hats, and I took my departure. I went to a druggist and showed him the prescription. It will be $2.87 for an ounce bottle, he said. Will you give me a piece of your wrapping cord, said I. I made a hole in the prescription, ran the cord through it, tied it around my neck, and tucked it inside. All of us have a little superstition, and mine runs to a confidence in amulets. Of course there was nothing the matter with me, but I was very ill. I couldn't work, sleep, eat, or bowl. The only way I could get any sympathy was to go without shaving for four days. Even then somebody would say, old man, you look as hardy as a pine knot. Been up for a jaunt in the main woods, eh? Then, suddenly, I remembered that I must have outdoor air and exercise. So I went down south to John's. John is an approximate relative by verdict of a preacher standing with a little book in his hands in a bower of chrysanthemums while a hundred thousand people looked on. John has a country house seven miles from Pineville. It is at an altitude and on the Blue Ridge Mountains in a state too dignified to be dragged into this controversy. John is mica, which is more valuable and clearer than gold. He met me at Pineville, and we took the trolley car to his home. It is a big, neighborless cottage on a hill surrounded by a hundred mountains. We got off at his little private station, where John's family and Amaryllis met and greeted us. Amaryllis looked at me a trifle anxiously. A rabbit came bounding across the hill between us and the house. I threw down my suitcase and pursued it hotfoot. After I had run twenty yards and seen it disappear, I sat down on the grass and wept disconsolately. I can't catch a rabbit any more, I sobbed. I'm of no further use in the world. I may as well be dead. Oh, what is it, what is it, Brother John? I heard Amaryllis say. Nerves a little unstrung, said John, in his calm way. Don't worry. Get up, you rabbit chaser, and come on to the house before the biscuits get cold. It was about twilight, and the mountains came up nobly to Miss Murphy's descriptions of them. Soon after dinner I announced that I believed I could sleep for a year or two, including legal holidays. So I was shown to a room as big and cool as a flower garden, where there was a bed as broad as a lawn. 
Soon afterward the remainder of the household retired, and then there fell upon the land a silence. I had not heard a silence before in years. It was absolute. I raised myself on my elbow and listened to it. Sleep. I thought that if I only could hear a star twinkle or a blade of grass sharpen itself I could compose myself to rest. I thought once that I heard a sound like the sail of a catboat flapping as it veered about in a breeze, but I decided that it was probably only a tack in the carpet. Still I listened. Suddenly some belated little bird alighted upon the windowsill, and, in what he no doubt considered sleepy tones, enunciated the noise generally translated as, cheap. I leaped into the air. Hey! What's the matter down there? called John from his room above mine. Oh, nothing, I answered, except that I accidentally bumped my head against the ceiling. The next morning I went out on the porch and looked at the mountains. There were forty-seven of them in sight. I shuddered, went into the big hall sitting room of the house, selected Pankost's family practice of medicine from a bookcase, and began to read. John came in, took the book away from me, and led me outside. He has a farm of three hundred acres furnished with the usual complement of barns, mules, peasantry, and harrows with three front teeth broken off. I had seen such things in my childhood, and my heart began to sink. Then John spoke of alfalfa, and I brightened at once. Oh, yes, said I, wasn't she in the chorus of, let's see. Green, you know, said John, and tender, and you plow it under after the first season. I know, said I, and the grass grows over her. Right, said John. You know something about farming, after all. I know something of some farmers, said I, and a sure scythe will mow them down some day. On the way back to the house a beautiful and inexplicable creature walked across our path. I stopped irresistibly fascinated, gazing at it. John waited patiently, smoking his cigarette. He is a modern farmer. After ten minutes he said, Are you going to stand there looking at that chicken all day? Breakfast is nearly ready. A chicken, said I. A white Orpington hen, if you want to particularize. A white Orpington hen? I repeated, with intense interest. The fowl walked slowly away with graceful dignity, and I followed like a child after the Pied Piper. Five minutes more were allowed me by John, and then he took me by the sleeve and conducted me to breakfast. After I had been there a week I began to grow alarmed. I was sleeping and eating well and actually beginning to enjoy life. For a man in my desperate condition that would never do. So I sneaked down to the trolley car station, took the car for Pineville, and went to see one of the best physicians in town. By this time I knew exactly what to do when I needed medical treatment. I hung my hat on the back of a chair, and said rapidly. Doctor, I have cirrhosis of the heart, indurated arteries, neurasthenia, neuritis, acute indigestion, and convalescence. I am going to live on a strict diet. I shall also take a tepid bath at night and a cold one in the morning. I shall endeavor to be cheerful, and fix my mind on pleasant subjects. In the way of drugs I intend to take a phosphorus pill three times a day, preferably after meals, and a tonic composed of the tinctures of gentian, cinchona, calicea, and cardamom compound. Into each teaspoonful of this I shall mix tincture of Nux vomica, beginning with one drop and increasing it a drop each day until the maximum dose is reached. I shall drop this with a medicine dropper, which can be procured at a trifling cost at any pharmacy. Good morning. I took my hat and walked out. After I had closed the door I remembered something that I had forgotten to say. I opened it again. The doctor had not moved from where he had been sitting, but he gave a slightly nervous start when he saw me again. I forgot to mention, said I, that I shall also take absolute rest and exercise. After this consultation I felt much better. The re-establishing in my mind of the fact that I was hopelessly ill gave me so much satisfaction that I almost became gloomy again. There is nothing more alarming to a neurasthenic than to feel himself growing well and cheerful. John looked after me carefully. 
After I had evinced so much interest in his white Orpington chicken he tried his best to divert my mind, and was particular to lock his hen house of nights. Gradually the tonic mountain air, the wholesome food, and the daily walks among the hills so alleviated my malady that I became utterly wretched and despondent. I heard of a country doctor who lived in the mountains nearby. I went to see him and told him the whole story. He was a grey-bearded man with clear, blue, wrinkled eyes, in a homemade suit of grey jeans. In order to save time I diagnosed my case, touched my nose with my right forefinger, struck myself below the knee to make my foot kick, sounded my chest, stuck out my tongue, and asked him the price of cemetery lots in Pineville. He lit his pipe and looked at me for about three minutes. Brother, he said, after a while, you are in a mighty bad way. There's a chance for you to pull through, but it's a mighty slim one. What can it be? I asked eagerly. I have taken arsenic and gold, phosphorus, exercise, nux vomica, hydrotherapeutic baths, rest, excitement, codeine, and aromatic spirits of ammonia. Is there anything left in the pharmacopoeia? Somewhere in these mountains, said the doctor, there's a plant growing, a flowering plant that'll cure you, and it's about the only thing that will. It's of a kind that's as old as the world, but of late it's powerful scarce and hard to find. You and I will have to hunt it up. I'm not engaged in active practice now, I'm getting along in years. But I'll take your case. You'll have to come every day in the afternoon and help me hunt for this plant till we find it. The city doctors may know a lot about new scientific things, but they don't know much about the cures that nature carries around in her saddlebags. So every day the old doctor and I hunted the cure-all plant among the mountains and valleys of the Blue Ridge. Together we toiled up steep heights so slippery with fallen autumn leaves that we had to catch every sapling and branch within our reach to save us from falling. We waded through gorges and chasms, breast deep with laurel and ferns, we followed the banks of mountain streams for miles. We wound our way like Indians through breaks of pine, roadside, hillside, riverside, mountainside we explored in our search for the miraculous plant. As the old doctor said, it must have grown scarce and hard to find. But we followed our quest. Day by day we plumbed the valleys, scaled the heights, and tramped the plateaus in search of the miraculous plant. Mountain bred, he never seemed to tire. I often reached home too fatigued to do anything except fall into bed and sleep until morning. This we kept up for a month. One evening after I had returned from a six-mile tramp with the old doctor, Amaryllis, and I took a little walk under the trees near the road. We looked at the mountains drawing their royal purple robes around them for their night's repose. I'm glad you're well again, she said. When you first came you frightened me. I thought you were really ill. Well again. I almost shrieked. Do you know that I have only one chance in a thousand to live? Amaryllis looked at me in surprise. Why, said she, you are as strong as one of the plow mules, you sleep ten or twelve hours every night, and you are eating us out of house and home. What more do you want? I tell you, said I, that unless we find the magic, that is, the plant we are looking for, in time, nothing can save me. The doctor tells me so. What doctor? Dr. Tatum, the old doctor who lives halfway up Black Oak Mountain. Do you know him? I have known him since I was able to talk. And is that where you go every day, is it he who takes you on these long walks and climbs that have brought back your health and strength? God bless the old doctor. Just then the old doctor himself drove slowly down the road in his rickety old buggy. I waved my hand at him and shouted that I would be on hand the next day at the usual time. He stopped his horse and called to Amaryllis to come out to him. They talked for five minutes while I waited. Then the old doctor drove on. When we got to the house Amaryllis lugged out an encyclopedia and sought a word in it. The doctor said, she told me, that you needn't call any more as a patient, but he'd be glad to see you any time as a friend. And then he told me to look up my name in the encyclopedia and tell you what it means. It seems to be the name of a genus of flowering plants, 
and also the name of a country girl in Theocritus and Virgil. What do you suppose the doctor meant by that? I know what he meant, said I. I know now. A word to a brother who may have come under the spell of the unquiet lady Neurasthenia. The formula was true. Even though gropingly at times, the physicians of the walled cities had put their fingers upon the specific medicament. And so for the exercise one is referred to good Dr. Tatum on Black Oak Mountain, take the road to your right at the Methodist Meeting House in the Pine Grove. Absolute rest and exercise. What rest more remedial than to sit with Amaryllis in the shade, and, with a sixth sense? Read the wordless Theocritan idol of the gold-bannered blue mountains marching orderly into the dormitories of the night? The friendly call. When I used to sell hardware in the West, I often made a little town called Saltia, in Colorado. I was always certain of securing a small or a large order from Simon Bell, who kept a general store there. Bell was one of those six-foot, low-voiced products, formed from a union of the West and the South. I liked him. To look at him you would think he should be robbing stage coaches or juggling gold mines with both hands. But he would sell you a paper of tacks or a spool of thread, with ten times more patience and courtesy than any saleslady in a city department store. I had a twofold object in my last visit to Saltillo. One was to sell a bill of goods, the other to advise Bell of a chance that I knew of by which I was certain he could make a small fortune. In Mountain City, a town on the Union Pacific, five times larger than Saltillo, a mercantile firm was about to go to the wall. It had a lively and growing custom, but was on the edge of dissolution and ruin. Mismanagement and the gambling habits of one of the partners explained it. The condition of the firm was not yet public property. I had my knowledge of it from a private source. I knew that, if the ready cash were offered, the stock and goodwill could be bought for about one-fourth their value. On arriving in Saltillo I went to Bell's store. He nodded to me, smiled his broad, lingering smile, went on leisurely selling some candy to a little girl, then came around the counter and shook hands. Well, he said, his invariably preliminary jocosity at every call I made, I suppose you are out here making Kodak pictures of the mountains. It's the wrong time of the year to buy any hardware, of course. I told Bell about the bargain in Mountain City. If he wanted to take advantage of it, I would rather have missed a sale than have him overstocked in Saltillo. It sounds good, he said, with enthusiasm. I'd like to branch out and do a bigger business, and I'm obliged to you for mentioning it. But, well, you come and stay at my house tonight and I'll think about it. It was then after sundown and time for the larger stores in Saltia to close. The clerks in Bells put away their books, whirled the combination of the safe, put on their coats and hats and left for their homes. Bell padlocked the big, double wooden front doors, and we stood, for a moment, breathing the keen, fresh mountain air coming across the foothills. A big man walked down the street and stopped in front of the high porch of the store. His long, black mustache, black eyebrows, and curly black hair contrasted queerly with his light, pink complexion, which belonged, by rights, to a blonde. He was about forty, and wore a white vest, a white hat, a watch chain made of five-dollar gold pieces linked together and a rather well-fitting two-piece gray suit of the cut that college boys of eighteen are wont to affect. He glanced at me distrustfully, and then at Bell with coldness and, I thought, something of enmity in his expression. Well, asked Bell, as if he were addressing a stranger, did you fix up that matter? Did I, the man answered, in a resentful tone. What do you suppose I've been here two weeks for? The business is to be settled tonight. Does that suit you, or have you got something to kick about? It's all right, said Bell. I knew you'd do it. Of course, you did, said the magnificent stranger. Haven't I done it before? You have, admitted Bell. And so have I. How do you find it at the hotel? Rocky grub. But I ain't kicking. Say, can you give me any pointers about managing that, affair? It's my first deal in that line of business, you know. 
No, I can't, answered Bell, after some thought. I've tried all kinds of ways. You'll have to try some of your own. Tried soft soap? Barrels of it. Tried a saddle girth with a buckle on the end of it? Never none. Started to once. And here's what I got. Bill held out his right hand. Even in the deepening twilight, I could see on the back of it a long, white scar that might have been made by a claw or a knife or some sharp-edged tool. Oh, well, said the florid man, carelessly, I'll know what to do later on. He walked away without another word. When he had gone ten steps he turned and called to Bell. You keep well out of the way when the goods are delivered, so there won't be any hitch in the business. All right, answered Bell, I'll attend to my end of the line. This talk was scarcely clear in its meaning to me, but as it did not concern me, I did not let it weigh upon my mind. But the singularity of the other man's appearance lingered with me for a while. And as we walked toward Bell's house I remarked to him. Your customer seems to be a surly kind of fellow, not one that you'd like to be snowed in with in a camp on a hunting trip. He is that, assented Bell, heartily. He reminds me of a rattlesnake that's been poisoned by the bite of a tarantula. He doesn't look like a citizen of Saltillo, I went on. No, said Bell, he lives in Sacramento. He's down here on a little business trip. His name is George Ringo, and he's been my best friend, in fact the only friend I ever had, for twenty years. I was too surprised to make any further comment. Bell lived in a comfortable, plain, square, two-story white house on the edge of the little town. I waited in the parlor, a room depressingly genteel, furnished with red plush, straw matting, looped-up lace curtains, and a glass case large enough to contain a mummy, full of mineral specimens. While I waited, I heard, upstairs, that unmistakable sound instantly recognized the world over, a bickering woman's voice, rising as her anger and fury grew. I could hear, between the gusts, the temperate rumble of Bell's tones, striving to oil the troubled waters. The storm subsided soon. But not before I had heard the woman say, in a lower, concentrated tone, rather more carrying than her high-pitched railings, this is the last time. I tell you, the last time. Oh, you will understand. The household seemed to consist of only Bell and his wife and a servant or two. I was introduced to Mrs. Bell at supper. At first sight she seemed to be a handsome woman, but I soon perceived that her charm had been spoiled. An uncontrolled petulance, I thought, an emotional egotism, an absence of poise and a habitual dissatisfaction had marred her womanhood. During the meal, she showed that false gaiety, spurious kindliness and reactionary softness that mark the woman addicted to tantrums. Withal, she was a woman who might be attractive to many men. After supper, Bell and I took our chairs outside, set them on the grass in the moonlight and smoked. The full moon is a witch. In her light, truthful men dig up for you nuggets of purer gold. While liars squeeze out brighter colors from the tubes of their invention. I saw Bell's broad, slow smile come out upon his face and linger there. I reckon you think George and me are a funny kind of friends, he said. The fact is we never did take much interest in each other's company. But his idea and mine, of what a friend should be, was always synonymous and we lived up to it, strict, all these years. Now, I'll give you an idea of what our idea is. A man don't need but one friend. The fellow who drinks your liquor and hangs around you, slapping you on the back and taking up your time, telling you how much he likes you, ain't a friend. Even if you did play marbles at school and fish in the same creek with him. As long as you don't need a friend one of that kind may answer. But a friend, to my mind, is one you can deal with on a strict reciprocity basis like me and George have always done. A good many years ago, him and me was connected in a number of ways. We put our capital together and run a line of freight wagons in New Mexico, and we mined some and gambled a few. And then, we got into trouble of one or two kinds. And I reckon that got us on a better understandable basis than anything else did, unless it was the fact that we never had much personal use for each other's ways. 
George is the vainest man I ever see, and the biggest brag. He could blow the biggest geyser in the Yosemite Valley back into its hole with one whisper. I am a quiet man, and fond of studiousness and thought. The more we used to see each other, personally, the less we seemed to like to be together. If he ever had slapped me on the back and sniveled over me like I've seen men do to what they called their friends, I know I'd have had a rough and tumble with him on the spot. Same way with George. He hated my ways as bad as I did his. When we were mining, we lived in separate tents, so as not to intrude our obnoxiousness on each other. But after a long time, we begun to know each of us could depend on the other when we were in a pinch, up to his last dollar, word of honor or perjury, bullet, or drop of blood we had in the world. We never even spoke of it to each other, because that would have spoiled it. But we tried it out, time after time, until we came to know. I've grabbed my hat and jumped a freight and rode two hundred miles to identify him when he was about to be hung by mistake, in Idaho, for a train robber. Once, I laid sick of typhoid in a tent in Texas, without a dollar or a change of clothes, and sent for George in Boise City. He came on the next train. The first thing he did before speaking to me, was to hang up a little looking glass on the side of the tent and curl his mustache and rub some hair dye on his head. His hair is naturally a light reddish. Then he gave me the most scientific cussing I ever had, and took off his coat. If you wasn't a Moses meek little Mary's lamb, you wouldn't have been took down this way, says he. Haven't you got gumption enough not to drink swamp water or fall down and scream whenever you have a little colic or feel a mosquito bite you? He made me a little mad. You've got the bedside manners of a Piute medicine man, says I, and I wish you'd go away and let me die a natural death. I'm sorry I sent for you. I've a mind to, says George, for nobody cares whether you live or die. But now I've been tricked into coming, I might as well stay until this little attack of indigestion or nettle rash or whatever it is, passes away. Two weeks afterward, when I was beginning to get around again, the doctor laughed and said he was sure that my friends keeping me mad all the time did more than his drugs to cure me. So that's the way George and me was friends. There wasn't any sentiment about it, it was just give and take, and each of us knew that the other was ready for the call at any time. I remember, once, I played a sort of joke on George, just to try him. I felt a little mean about it afterward, because I never ought to have doubted he'd do it. We was both living in a little town in the San Luis Valley, running some flocks of sheep and a few cattle. We were partners, but, as usual, we didn't live together. I had an old aunt, out from the east, visiting for the summer, so I rented a little cottage. She soon had a couple of cows and some pigs and chickens to make the place look like home. George lived alone in a little cabin half a mile out of town. One day a calf that we had, died. That night I broke its bones, dumped it into a coarse sack and tied it up with wire. I put on an old shirt, tore a sleeve most out of it, and the collar half off, tangled up my hair, put some red ink on my hands and spashed some of it over my shirt and face. I must have looked like I'd been having the fight of my life. I put the sack in a wagon and drove out to George's cabin. When I hallowed, he came out in a yellow dressing gown, a Turkish cap and patent leather shoes. George always was a great dresser. I dumped the bundle to the ground. Such as H. Says I, kind of wild in my way. Take that and bury it, George, out somewhere behind your house, bury it just like it is. And Don. Don't get excited, says George. And for the Lord's sake go and wash your hands and face and put on a clean shirt. And he lights his pipe, while I drive away at a gallop. The next morning he drops around to our cottage, where my aunt was fiddling with her flowers and truck in the front yard. He bends himself and bows and makes compliments as he could do, when so disposed, and begs a rose bush from her, saying he had turned up a little land back of his cabin. And wanted to plant something on it by way of usefulness and ornament. So my aunt, flattered, pulls up one of her biggest by the roots and gives it to him. Afterward I see it growing where he planted it, in a place where the grass had been cleared off and the dirt leveled. 
but neither George nor me ever spoke of it to each other again. The moon rose higher, possibly drawing water from the sea, pixies from their dells and certainly more confidences from Sims Bell, the friend of a friend. There come a time, not long afterward, he went on, when I was able to do a good turn for George Ringo. George had made a little pile of money in Beeves and he was up in Denver, and he showed up when I saw him, wearing deerskin vests, yellow shoes, clothes like the awnings in front of drugstores. And his hair dyed so blue that it looked black in the dark. He wrote me to come up there, quick, that he needed me, and to bring the best outfit of clothes I had. I had M on when I got the letter, so I left on the next train. George was. Bell stopped for half a minute, listening intently. I thought I heard a team coming down the road, he explained. George was at a summer resort on a lake near Denver and was putting on as many airs as he knew how. He had rented a little two-room cottage, and had a chihuahua dog and a hammock and eight different kinds of walking sticks. Sims, he says to me, there's a widow woman here that's pestering the soul out of me with her intentions. I can't get out of her way. It ain't that she ain't handsome and agreeable, in a sort of style, but her attentions is serious, and I ain't ready for to marry nobody and settle down. I can't go to no festivity nor sit on the hotel piazza or mix in any of the society roundups, but what she cuts me out of the herd and puts her daily brand on me. I like this here place, goes on George, and I'm making a hit here in the most censorious circles, so I don't want to have to run away from it. So I sent for you. What do you want me to do? I asks George. Why, says he, I want you to head her off. I want you to cut me out. I want you to come to the rescue. Suppose you seen a wildcat about for to eat me, what would you do? Go for it, says I. Correct, says George. Then go for this Mrs. De Clinton the same. How am I to do it? I asks. By force and awfulness or in some gentler and less lurid manner? Court her, George says, get her off my trail. Feed her. Take her out in boats. Hang around her and stick to her. Get her mashed on you if you can. Some women are pretty big fools. Who knows but what she might take a fancy to you. Had you ever thought, I asks, of repressing your fatal fascinations in her presence? Of squeezing a harsh note in the melody of your siren voice, of veiling your beauty, in other words, of giving her the bounce yourself? George sees no essence of sarcasm in my remark. He twists his mustache and looks at the points of his shoes. Well, Sims, he said, you know how I am about the ladies. I can't hurt none of their feelings. I'm, by nature, polite and esteemful of their intents and purposes. This Mrs. De Clinton don't appear to be the suitable sort for me. Besides, I ain't a marrying man by all means. All right, said I, I'll do the best I can in the case. So I bought a new outfit of clothes and a book on etiquette and made a dead set for Mrs. De Clinton. She was a fine-looking woman, cheerful and gay. At first, I almost had to hobble her to keep her from loping around at George's heels. But finally I got her so she seemed glad to go riding with me and sailing on the lake, and she seemed real hurt on the mornings when I forgot to send her a bunch of flowers. Still, I didn't like the way she looked at George, sometimes, out of the corner of her eye. George was having a fine time now, going with the whole bunch just as he pleased. Yesum, continued Belle, she certainly was a fine-looking woman at that time. She's changed some since, as you might have noticed at the supper table. What? I exclaimed. I married Mrs. De Clinton, went on Belle. One evening while we were up at the lake. When I told George about it, he opened his mouth and I thought he was going to break our traditions and say something grateful, but he swallowed it back. All right, says he, playing with his dog. I hope you won't have too much trouble. Myself, I'm not never going to marry. That was three years ago, said Bell. We came here to live. For a year we got along medium fine. And then everything changed. 
For two years I've been having something that rhymes first class with my name. You heard the row upstairs this evening? That was a merry welcome compared to the usual average. She's tired of me and of this little town life and she rages all day, like a panther in a cage. I stood it until two weeks ago and then I had to send out the call. I located George in Sacramento. He started the day he got my wire. Mrs. Bell came out of the house swiftly toward us. Some strong excitement or anxiety seemed to possess her, but she smiled a faint hostess smile, and tried to keep her voice calm. The dew is falling, she said, and it's growing rather late. Wouldn't you gentlemen rather come into the house? Bell took some cigars from his pocket and answered, it's most too fine a night to turn in yet. I think Mr. Ames and I will walk out along the road a mile or so and have another smoke. I want to talk with him about some goods that I want to buy. Up the road or down the road, asked Mrs. Bell. Down, said Bell. I thought she breathed a sigh of relief. When we had gone a hundred yards and the house became concealed by trees, Bell guided me into the thick grove that lined the road and back through them toward the house again. We stopped within twenty yards of the house, concealed by the dark shadows. I wondered at this maneuver. And then I heard in the distance coming down the road beyond the house, the regular hoofbeats of a team of horses. Bell held his watch in a ray of moonlight. On time, within a minute, he said. That's George's way. The team slowed up as it drew near the house and stopped in a patch of black shadows. We saw the figure of a woman carrying a heavy valise move swiftly from the other side of the house and hurry to the waiting vehicle. Then it rolled away briskly in the direction from which it had come. I looked at Bell inquiringly, I suppose. I certainly asked him no question. She's running away with George, said Bell, simply. He's kept me posted about the progress of the scheme all along. She'll get a divorce in six months and then George will marry her. He never helps anybody halfway. It's all arranged between them. I began to wonder what friendship was, after all. When we went into the house, Bell began to talk easily on other subjects, and I took his cue. By and by the big chance to buy out the business in Mountain City came back to my mind and I began to urge it upon him. Now that he was free, it would be easier for him to make the move. And he was sure of a splendid bargain. Bell was silent for some minutes, but when I looked at him I fancied that he was thinking of something else, that he was not considering the project. Why, no, Mr. Ames, he said, after a while, I can't make that deal. I'm awful thankful to you, though, for telling me about it. But I've got to stay here. I can't go to Mountain City. Why? I asked. Mrs. Bell, he replied, won't live in Mountain City. She hates the place and wouldn't go there. I've got to keep right on here in Saltillo. Mrs. Bell. I exclaimed, too puzzled to conjecture what he meant. I ought to explain, said Bell. I know George and I know Mrs. Bell. He's impatient in his ways. He can't stand things that fret him, long, like I can. Six months, I give them, six months of married life, and there'll be another disunion. Mrs. Bell will come back to me. There's no other place for her to go. I've got to stay here and wait. At the end of six months, I'll have to grab a satchel and catch the first train. For George will be sending out the call. The snowman. Housed and windowpaned from it, the greatest wonder to little children is the snow. To men, it is something like a crucible in which their world melts into a white star ten million miles away. The man who can stand the test is a snowman. And this is his reading by Fahrenheit, Romer, or Moses's carven tablets of stone. Night had fluttered a sable pinion above the canyon of Big Lost River, and I urged my horse toward the Bay Horse Ranch because the snow was deepening. The flakes were as large as an hour's circular tatting by Miss Wilkins's ablest spinster. Betokening a heavy snowfall and less entertainment and more adventure than the completion of the tatting could promise. I knew Ross Curtis of the Bay Horse, 
and that I would be welcome as a snowbound pilgrim, both for hospitality's sake and because Ross had few chances to confide in living creatures who did not neigh, bellow, bleat, yelp, or howl during his discourse. The ranch house was just within the jaws of the canyon where its builder may have fatuously fancied that the timbered and rocky walls on both sides would have protected it from the wintry Colorado. Winds. But I feared the drift. Even now through the endless, bottomless rift in the hills, the speaking tube of the four winds, came roaring the voice of the proprietor to the little room on the top floor. At my, hello, a ranch hand came from an outer building and received my thankful horse. In another minute, Ross and I sat by a stove in the dining room of the four-room ranch house, while the big, simple welcome of the household lay at my disposal. Fanned by the whizzing norther, the fine, dry snow was sifted and bolted through the cracks and knotholes of the logs. The cook room, without a separating door, appended. In there I could see a short, sturdy, leisurely and weather-beaten man moving with professional sureness about his red-hot stove. His face was stolid and unreadable, something like that of a great thinker, or of one who had no thoughts to conceal. I thought his eye seemed unwarrantably superior to the elements and to the man, but quickly attributed that to the characteristic self-importance of a petty chef. Camp Cook was the niche that I gave him in the Hall of Types, and he fitted it as an apple fits a dumpling. Cold it was in spite of the glowing stove. And Ross and I sat and talked, shuddering frequently, half from nerves and half from the freezing drafts. So he brought the bottle and the cook brought boiling water, and we made prodigious hot toddies against the attacks of Boreas. We clinked glasses often. They sounded like icicles dropping from the eaves. Or like the tinkle of a thousand prisms on a Louis XIV chandelier that I once heard at a boarder's dance in the parlor of a ten-a-week boarding house in Gramercy Square. Sick transit. Silence in the terrible beauty of the snow and of the sphinx and of the stars. But they who believe that all things, from a without wine table diote to the crucifixion, may be interpreted through music might have found a nocturne or a symphony to express the isolation of that blotted-out world. The clink of glass and bottle, the aeolian chorus of the wind in the house crannies, its deeper trombone through the canyon below, and the Wagnerian crash of the cook's pots and pans. United in a fit, discordant melody, I thought. No less welcome an accompaniment was the sizzling of broiling ham and venison cutlet endorsed by the solvent fumes of true java, bringing rich promises of comfort to our yearning souls. The cook brought the smoking supper to the table. He nodded to me democratically as he cast the heavy plates around as though he were pitching quoits or hurling the discus. I looked at him with some appraisement and curiosity and much conciliation. There was no profit to tell us when that drifting evil outside might cease to fall. And it is well, when snowbound, to stand somewhere within the radius of the cook's favorable consideration. But I could read neither favor nor disapproval in the face and manner of our pot wrestler. He was about five feet nine inches, and two hundred pounds of commonplace, bull-necked, pink-faced, callous calm. He wore brown duck trousers too tight and too short, and a blue flannel shirt with sleeves rolled above his elbows. There was a sort of grim, steady scowl on his features that looked to me as though he had fixed it there purposely as a protection against the weakness of an inherent amiability that, he fancied, were better concealed. And then I let supper usurp his brief occupancy of my thoughts. Draw up, George, said Ross. Let's all eat while the grub's hot. You fellows go on and chew, answered the cook. I ate mine in the kitchen before sundown. Think it'll be a big snow, George, asked the ranchman. George had turned to re-enter the cook room. He moved slowly around and, looking at his face, it seemed to me that he was turning over the wisdom and knowledge of centuries in his head. It might, was his delayed reply. At the door of the kitchen he stopped and looked back at us. Both Ross and I held our knives and forks poised and gave him our regard. Some men have the power of drawing the attention of others without speaking a word. Their attitude is more effective than a shout. And again it mightn't, said George, and went back to his stove. After we had eaten, 
he came in and gathered the empty dishes. He stood for a moment, while his spurious frown deepened. It might stop any minute, he said, or it might keep up for days. At the farther end of the cook room I saw George pour hot water into his dishpan, light his pipe, and put the tableware through its required levation. He then carefully unwrapped from a piece of old saddle blanket a paperback book, and settled himself to read by his dim oil lamp. And then the ranchman threw tobacco on the cleared table and set forth again the bottles and glasses. And I saw that I stood in a deep channel through which the long damned flood of his discourse would soon be booming. But I was half content, comparing my fate with that of the late Thomas Tucker, who had to sing for his supper, thus doubling the burdens of both himself and his host. Snow is a hell of a thing, said Ross, by way of a foreword. It ain't, somehow, it seems to me, salubrious. I can stand water and mud and two inches below zero and a hundred and ten in the shade and medium-sized cyclones, but this here fuzzy white stuff naturally gets me all locoed. I reckon the reason it rattles you is because it changes the look of things so much. It's like you had a wife and left her in the morning with the same old blue cotton wrapper on, and rides in of a night and runs across her all outfitted in a white silk evening frock. Waving an ostrich feather fan, and monkeying with a posy of lily flowers. Wouldn't it make you look for your pocket compass? You'd be liable to kiss her before you collected your presence of mind. By and by, the flood of Ross's talk was drawn up into the clouds, so it pleased me to fancy, and there condensed into the finer snowflakes of thought. And we sat silent about the stove, as good friends and bitter enemies will do. I thought of Boss's preamble about the mysterious influence upon man exerted by that ermine-lined monster that now covered our little world, and knew he was right. Of all the curious knick-knacks, mysteries, puzzles, Indian gifts, rat-traps, and well-disguised blessings that the gods chuck down to us from the Olympian peaks. The most disquieting and evil bringing is the snow. By scientific analysis it is absolute beauty and purity, so, at the beginning we look doubtfully at chemistry. It falls upon the world, and lo! We live in another. It hides in a night the old scars and familiar places with which we have grown heartsick or enamored. So, as quietly as we can, we hustle on our embroidered robes and hie us on Prince Camaralzaman's horse or in the reindeer sleigh into the white country where the seven colors converge. This is when our fancy can overcome the bane of it. But in certain spots of the earth comes the snow madness, made known by people turned wild and distracted by the bewildering veil that has obscured the only world they know. In the cities, the white fairy who sets the brains of her dupes whirling by a wave of her wand is cast for the comedy role. Her diamond shoe buckles glitter like frost. With a pirouette she invites the spotless carnival. But in the waste places the snow is sardonic. Sponging out the world of the outliers, it gives no foothold on another sphere in return. It makes of the earth a firmament underfoot, it leaves us clawing and stumbling in space in an inimical fifth element whose evil outdoes its strangeness and beauty. Their nature, lo comedienne, plays her tricks on man. Though she has put him forth as her highest product, it appears that she has fashioned him with what seems almost incredible carelessness and indexterity. One-sided and without balance, with his two halves unequally fashioned and joined, must he ever jog his eccentric way. The snow falls, the darkness caps it, and the ridiculous man biped strays in accurate circles until he succumbs in the ruins of his defective architecture. In the throat of the thirsty the snow is vitriol. In appearance as plausible as the breakfast food of the angels, it is as hot in the mouth as ginger, increasing the pangs of the water famished. It is a derivative from water, air, and some cold, uncanny fire from which the caloric has been extracted. Good has been said of it. Even the poets, crazed by its spell and shivering in their attics under its touch, have indited permanent melodies commemorative of its beauty. Still, to the saddest overcoat optimist it is a plague, a corroding plague that Pharaoh successfully sidestepped. It beneficently covers the wheat fields, swelling the crop, and the flower trust gets us by the throat like a sudden quinsy. 
it spreads the tail of its white kirtle over the red seams of the rugged north, and the Alaskan short story is born. Etiolated perfidy, it shelters the mountain traveler burrowing from the icy air, and, melting tomorrow, drowns his brother in the valley below. At its worst it is lock and key and crucible, and the wand of Circe. When it corrals man in lonely ranches, mountain cabins, and forest huts, the snow makes apes and tigers of the hardiest. It turns the bosoms of weaker ones to glass, their tongues to infants' rattles, their hearts to lawlessness and spleen. It is not all from the isolation, the snow is not merely a blockader. It is a chemical test. It is a good man who can show a reaction that is not chiefly composed of a dram or two of potash and magnesia, with traces of Adam, Ananias, Nebuchadnezzar, and the fretful porcupine. This is no story, you say, well, let it begin. There was a knock at the door, is the opening not full of context and reminiscence oh, best buyers of best sellers? We drew the latch, and in stumbled Etienne Girard, as he afterward named himself. But just then he was no more than a worm struggling for life, enveloped in a killing white chrysalis. We dug down through snow, overcoats, mufflers, and waterproofs, and dragged forth a living thing with a Van Dyke beard and marvelous diamond rings. We put it through the approved curriculum of snow rubbing, hot milk, and teaspoonful doses of whiskey. Working him up to a graduating class entitled to a diploma of three fingers of rye in half a glassful of hot water. One of the ranch boys had already come from the quarters at Ross's bugle-like yell and kicked the stranger's staggering pony to some sheltered corral where beasts were entertained. Let a paragraphic biography of Girard intervene. Etienne was an opera singer originally, we gathered, but adversity and the snow had made him non-compass voces. The adversity consisted of the stranded San Salvador Opera Company, a period of hotel second-story work, and then a career as a professional palmist, jumping from town to town. For, like other professional palmists, every time he worked the heart line too strongly he immediately moved along the line of least resistance. Though Etienne did not confide this to us, we surmised that he had moved out into the dusk about twenty minutes ahead of a constable, and had thus encountered the snow. In his most sacred blue language he dilated upon the subject of snow, for Etienne was Paris-born and loved the snow with the same passion that an orchid does. Miserable. Commented Etienne, and took another three fingers. Complete, cast-iron, pussy-footed, blank, blank, said Ross, and followed suit. Rotten, said I. The cook said nothing. He stood in the door weighing our outburst, and insistently from behind that frozen visage I got two messages, via the MAM wireless. One was that George considered our vituperation against the snow childish, the other was that George did not love Dagos. Inasmuch as Etienne was a Frenchman, I concluded I had the message wrong. So I queried the other, bright eyes, you don't really mean Dagos, do you? And over the wireless came three deathly, psychic taps, yes. Then I reflected that to George all foreigners were probably Dagos. I had once known another camp cook who had thought Mons, Sig, and Millie, Trans-Mississippi for MLLE. Were Italian given names, this cook used to marvel therefore at the paucity of Neo-Roman precognomens, and therefore why not? I have said that snow is a test of men. For one day, two days, Etienne stood at the window, fletcherizing his fingernails and shrieking and moaning at the monotony. To me, Etienne was just about as unbearable as the snow. And so, seeking relief, I went out on the second day to look at my horse, slipped on a stone, broke my collarbone, and thereafter underwent not the snow test, but the test of flat on the back. A test that comes once too often for any man to stand. However, I bore up cheerfully. I was now merely a spectator, and from my couch in the big room I could lie and watch the human interplay with that detached, impassive, impersonal feeling which French writers tell us is so valuable to the literateur, and American writers to the pharaoh dealer. I shall go crazy in this abominable, miserable place, was Etienne's constant prediction. Never knew Mark Twain to bore me before, said Ross, over and over. 
He sat by the other window, hour after hour, a box of Pittsburgh stogies of the length, strength, and odor of a Pittsburgh graft scandal deposited on one side of him, and roughing it, the jumping frog. And life on the Mississippi on the other. For every chapter he lit a new stogie, puffing furiously. This in time gave him a recurrent premonition of cramps, gastritis, smoker's colic or whatever it is they have in Pittsburgh after a too deep indulgence in graft scandals. To fend off the colic, Ross resorted time and again to old Dr. Still's amber-colored USA colic cure. Result, after 48 hours, nerves. Positive fact I never knew Mark Twain to make me tired before. Positive fact. Ross slammed roughing it on the floor. When you're snowbound this away you want tragedy, I guess. Humor just seems to bring out all your cussedness. You read a man's poor, pitiful attempts to be funny and it makes you so nervous you want to tear the book up, get out your bandana, and have a good, long cry. At the other end of the room, the Frenchman took his fingernails out of his mouth long enough to exclaim, Humor. Humor at such a time as these. My God, I shall go crazy in these abominable. Supper, announced George. These meals were not the meals of Rabelais who said, The great God makes the planets and we make the platters neat. By that time, the ranch house meals were not affairs of gusto, they were mental distraction, not bodily provender. What they were to be later shall never be forgotten by Ross or me or Etienne. After supper, the stogies and fingernails began again. My shoulder ached wretchedly, and with half-closed eyes I tried to forget it by watching the deft movements of the stolid cook. Suddenly I saw him cock his ear, like a dog. Then, with a swift step, he moved to the door, threw it open, and stood there. The rest of us had heard nothing. What is it, George? asked Ross. The cook reached out his hand into the darkness alongside the jam. With careful precision he prodded something. Then he made one careful step into the snow. His back muscles bulged a little under the arms as he stooped and lightly lifted a burden. Another step inside the door, which he shut methodically behind him, and he dumped the burden at a safe distance from the fire. He stood up and fixed us with a solemn eye. None of us moved under that orphic suspense until. A woman, remarked George. Miss Willie Adams was her name. Vocation, schoolteacher. Present avocation, getting lost in the snow. Age, yum yum, the Persian for twenty. Take to the woods if you would describe Miss Adams. A willow for grace, a hickory for fiber, a birch for the clear whiteness of her skin. For eyes, the blue sky seen through treetops, the silken cocoons for her hair, her voice, the murmur of the evening June wind in the leaves, her mouth, the berries of the wintergreen. Fingers as light as ferns, her toe as small as a deer track. General impression upon the dazed beholder, you could not see the forest for the trees. Psychology, with a capital P and the foot of a lynx, at this juncture stalks into the ranch house. Three men, a cook, a pretty young woman, all snowbound. Count me out of it, as I did not count, anyway. I never did, with women. Count the cook out, if you like. But note the effect upon Ross and Etienne Girard. Ross dumped Mark Twain in a trunk and locked the trunk. Also, he discarded the Pittsburgh scandals. Also, he shaved off a three days beard. Etienne, being French, began on the beard first. He pomaded it, from a little tube of grease hungro eyes in his vest pocket. He combed it with a little aluminum comb from the same vest pocket. He trimmed it with manicure scissors from the same vest pocket. His light and gallic spirits underwent a sudden, miraculous change. He hummed a blithe San Salvador Opera Company tune. He grinned, smirked, bowed, pirouette, twiddled, twaddled, twisted, and torolud. Gaily, the notorious troubadour, could not have equaled Etienne. Ross's method of advance was brusque, domineering. Little woman, he said, you're welcome here. And with what he thought subtle double meaning, welcome to stay here as long as you like, 
snow or no snow. Miss Adams thanked him a little wildly, some of the wintergreen berries creeping into the birch bark. She looked around hurriedly as if seeking escape. But there was none, save the kitchen and the room allotted her. She made an excuse and disappeared into her own room. Later I, feigning sleep, heard the following. Mies Adams, I was almost to perish die of monotony wn your fair and beautiful face appear in this miserable house. I opened my starboard eye. The beard was being curled furiously around a finger, the Svengali eye was rolling, the chair was being hunched closer to the schoolteachers. I am French, you see, temperamental, nervous. I cannot endure these dull hours in this ranch house, but, a woman comes. Ah! The shoulders gave nine Ross and a tiger. What a difference! All is light and gay, everything smile wn you smile. You have, ert, beauty, grace. My, ert comes back to me wn I feel your ert. So! He laid his hand upon his vest pocket. From this vantage point he suddenly snatched at the schoolteacher's own hand, ah! Mies Adams, if I could only tell you how I add. Dinner, remarked George. He was standing just behind the Frenchman's ear. His eyes looked straight into the schoolteacher's eyes. After thirty seconds of survey, his lips moved, deep in the flinty, frozen maelstrom of his face, dinner, he concluded, will be ready in two minutes. Miss Adams jumped to her feet, relieved. I must get ready for dinner, she said brightly, and went into her room. Ross came in fifteen minutes late. After the dishes had been cleaned away, I waited until a propitious time when the room was temporarily ours alone, and told him what had happened. He became so excited that he lit a stogie without thinking. Yeller hided, unwashed, palm reading, skunk, he said under his breath. I'll shoot him full o' holes if he don't watch out, talkin' that way to my wife. I gave a jump that set my collarbone back another week. Your wife? I gasped. Well, I mean to make her that, he announced. The air in the ranch house the rest of that day was tense with pent-up emotions, oh, best buyers of best sellers. Ross watched Miss Adams as a hawk does a hen, he watched Etienne as a hawk does a scarecrow, Etienne watched Miss Adams as a weasel does a henhouse. He paid no attention to Ross. The condition of Miss Adams, in the role of sought after, was feverish. Lately escaped from the agony and long torture of the white cold, where for hours nature had kept the little schoolteacher's vision locked in and turned upon herself. Nobody knows through what profound feminine introspections she had gone. Now, suddenly cast among men, instead of finding relief and security, she beheld herself plunged anew into other discomforts. Even in her own room she could hear the loud voices of her imposed suitors. I'll blow you full o' oh, holes, shouted Ross. Witnesses, shrieked Etienne, waving his hand at the cook and me. She could not have known the previous harassed condition of the men, fretting under indoor conditions. All she knew was, that where she had expected the frank Freemasonry of the West, she found the subtle tangle of two men's minds, bent upon exacting whatever romance there might be in her situation. She tried to dodge Ross and the Frenchman by spells of nursing me. They also came over to help nurse. This combination aroused such a natural state of invalid cussedness on my part that they were all forced to retire. Once she did manage to whisper, I am so worried here. I don't know what to do. To which I replied, gently, hitching up my shoulder, that I was a hunch savant and that the eighth house under this sign, the moon being in Virgo, showed that everything would turn out all right. But twenty minutes later I saw Etienne reading her palm and felt that perhaps I might have to recast her horoscope, and try for a dark man coming with a bundle. Toward sunset, Etienne left the house for a few moments and Ross, who had been sitting taciturn and morose, having unlocked Mark Twain, made another dash. It was typical Ross talk. He stood in front of her and looked down majestically at that cool and perfect spot where Miss Adams' forehead met the neat part in her fragrant hair. First, however, he cast a desperate glance at me. 
I was in a profound slumber. Little woman, he began, it's certainly tough for a man like me to see you bothered this way. You, gulp, you have been alone in this world too long. You need a protector. I might say that at a time like this you need a protector the worst kind, a protector who would take a threaring delight in smashing the saffron-colored kisser off of any yeller-skinned skunk that made himself obnoxious to you. Hem. Hem. I am a lonely man, Miss Adams. I have so far had to carry on my life without the, gulp, sweet radiance, gulp, of a woman around the house. I feel especially doggone lonely at a time like this, when I am pretty near locoed from heaven, to stall indoors, and hence it was with delight I welcomed your first appearance in this here shack. Since then I have been packed jam full of more different kinds of feelings, ornery, mean, dizzy, and superb, than has fallen my way in years. Miss Adams made a useless movement toward escape. The Ross chin stuck firm. I don't want to annoy you, Miss Adams, but, by heck, if it comes to that you'll have to be annoyed. And I'll have to have my say. This palm ticklin' slob of a Frenchman ought to be kicked off the place and if you'll say the word, off he goes. But I don't want to do the wrong thing. You've got to show a preference. I'm gettin' around to the point, Miss, Miss Willie, in my own brick fashion. I've stood about all I can stand these last two days and something's got to happen. The suspense hereabouts is enough to hang a sheepherder. Miss Willie, he lassoed her hand by main force, just say the word. You need somebody to take your part all your life long. Will you mar? Supper, remarked George, tersely, from the kitchen door. Miss Adams hurried away. Ross turned angrily. You. I have been revolving it in my head, said George. He brought the coffee pot forward heavily. Then bravely the big platter of pork and beans. Then somberly the potatoes. Then profoundly the biscuits. I have been revolving it in my mind. There ain't no use waitin' any longer for Swengali. Might as well eat now. From my excellent vantage point on the couch I watched the progress of that meal. Ross, muddled, glowering, disappointed, Etienne, eternally blandishing, attentive, ogling, Miss Adams, nervous, picking at her food, hesitant about answering questions, almost hysterical. Now and then the solid, flitting shadow of the cook, passing behind their backs like a dreadnought in a fog. I used to own a clock which gurgled in its throat three minutes before it struck the hour. I know, therefore, the slow freight of anticipation. For I have awakened at three in the morning, heard the clock gurgle, and waited those three minutes for the three strokes I knew were to come. Allure. In Ross's ranch house that night the slow freight of climax whistled in the distance. Etienne began it after supper. Miss Adams had suddenly displayed a lively interest in the kitchen layout and I could see her in there, chatting brightly at George, not with him, the while he ducked his head and rattled his pans. My friend, said Etienne, exhaling a large cloud from his cigarette and patting Ross lightly on the shoulder with a beady amonded hand which, hung limp from a yard or more of bony arm. I see I muse be frank with you. Furs, because we are rivals, second, because you take these matters so serious. I, I am Frenchman. I love the women, he threw back his curls, bared his yellow teeth, and blew an unsavory kiss toward the kitchen. It is, I suppose, a trait of my nation. All Frenchmen love the women, pretty women. Now, look, here I am. He spread out his arms. Cold outside. I debts the call ll. Snow. I abominate the miserable snow. Two men. This, pointing to me, and this. Pointing to Ross. I am distracted. For two whole days I stand, at the window and, tear my, air. I am nervous, upset, pierro found ly distress inside my, ead. And, suddenly, be old. A woman, a nice, pretty, charming, innocent, young woman. I, naturally, rejoice. 
I become myself again, gay, light-hearted, happy. I address myself to Mademoiselle, it passes the time. That, MCU, is what the women are for, pass the time. Entertainment, like the music, like the wine. They appeal to the mood, the caprice, the temporary men. To play with this woman, follow her through her humor, pursue her, ah. That is the most delightful way to sun the hours about their business. Ross banged the table. Shut up, you miserable yeller pup, he roared. I object to your pursuing anything or anybody in my house. Now, you listen to me, you, he picked up the box of stogies and used it on the table as an emphasizer. The noise of it awoke the attention of the girl in the kitchen. Unheeded, she crept into the room. I don't know anything about your French ways of love making, and I don't care. In my section of the country, it's the best man wins. And I'm the best man here, and don't you forget it. This girl's going to be mine. There ain't going to be any playing, or philandering, or palm reading about it. I've made up my mind I'll have this girl, and that settles it. My word is the law in this neck of the woods. She's mine, and as soon as she says she's mine, you pull out. The box made one final, tremendous punctuation point. Etienne's bravado was unruffled. Ah. That is no way to win a woman, he smiled, easily. I make prophecy you will never win, that way. No. Not this woman. She muse be played along and, then keased, this charming, delicious little creature. One keys. And, then you, ave her. Again he displayed his unpleasant teeth. I make you a bet I will keys her. As a cheerful chronicler of deeds done well, it joys me to relate that the hand which fell upon Etienne's amorous lips was not his own. There was one sudden sound, as of a mule kicking a lath fence, and then, through the swinging doors of oblivion for Etienne. I had seen this blow delivered. It was an aloof, unstudied, almost absent-minded affair. I had thought the cook was rehearsing the proper method of turning a flapjack. Silently, lost in thought, he stood there scratching his head. Then he began rolling down his sleeves. You'd better get your things on, miss, and we'll get out of here, he decided. Wrap up warm. I heard her heave a little sigh of relief as she went to get her cloak, sweater, and hat. Ross jumped to his feet and said, George, what are you going to do? George, who had been headed in my direction, slowly swiveled around and faced his employer. Be in a camp cook, I ain't overburdened with hosses, George enlightened us. Therefore, I am going to try to borrow this feller's here. For the first time in four days my soul gave a genuine cheer. If it's for Lachinvar purposes, go as far as you like, I said, grandly. The cook studied me a moment, as if trying to find an insult in my words. No, he replied. It's for mine and the young lady's purposes, and we'll go only three miles, to Hicksville. Now let me tell you something, Ross. Suddenly I was confronted with the cook's chunky back and I heard a low, curt, carrying voice shoot through the room at my host. George had wheeled just as Ross started to speak. You're nutty. That's what's the matter with you. You can't stand the snow. You're getting nervouser, and nuttier every day. That and this Dago, he jerked a thumb at the half-dead Frenchman in the corner, has got you to the point where I thought I better horn in. I got to revolving it around in my mind and I seen if something wasn't done, and done soon. There'd be murder around here and maybe, his head gave an imperceptible list toward the girl's room, worse. He stopped, but he held up a stubby finger to keep anyone else from speaking. Then he plowed slowly through the drift of his ideas. About this here woman. I know you, Ross, and I know what you really think about women. If she hadn't happened in here during this here snow, you'd never have given two thoughts to the whole woman question. Likewise, when the storm clears, and you and the boys go hustling out, this here whole business'll clear out of your head and you won't think of a skirt again until kingdom come. Just because oh, this snow here, 
don't forget you're living in the selfsame world you was in four days ago. And you're the same man, too. Now, what's the use o' oh, getting all snarled up over four days of stickin' in the house? That there's what I've been revolvin' in my mind and this here's the decision I've come to. He plodded to the door and shouted to one of the ranch hands to saddle my horse. Ross lit a stogie and stood thoughtful in the middle of the room. Then he began, I've a darn good notion, George, to knock your confounded head off and throw you into that snowbank, if. You're wrong, mister. That ain't a darned good notion you've got. It's darned bad. Look here. He pointed steadily out of doors until we were both forced to follow his finger. You're in here for more than a week yet. After allowing this fact to sink in, he barked out at Ross, Can you cook? Then at me, Can you cook? Then he looked at the wreck of Etienne and sniffed. There was an embarrassing silence as Ross and I thought solemnly of a foodless week. If you just use Ha's sense, concluded George, and don't go for to hurt my feelings, all I want to do is to take this young gal down to Hicksville, and then I'll head back here and cook for you. The horse and Miss Adams arrived simultaneously, both of them very serious and quiet. The horse because he knew what he had before him in that weather, the girl because of what she had left behind. Then all at once I awoke to a realization of what the cook was doing. My God, man! I cried, aren't you afraid to go out in that snow? Behind my back I heard Ross mutter, not him. George lifted the girl daintily up behind the saddle, drew on his gloves, put his foot in the stirrup, and turned to inspect me leisurely. As I passed slowly in his review, I saw in my mind's eye the algebraic equation of snow, the equal sign, and the answer in the man before me. Snow is my last name, said George. He swung into the saddle and they started cautiously out into the darkening swirl of fresh new currency just issuing from the snowdrop mint. The girl, to keep her place, clung happily to the sturdy figure of the camp cook. I brought three things away from Ross Curtis's ranch house, yes, four. One was the appreciation of snow, which I have so humbly tried here to render, two, was a collarbone, of which I am extra careful. Three, was a memory of what it is to eat very extremely bad food for a week. And, four, was the cause of, three, a little note delivered at the end of the week and hand-painted in blue pencil on a sheet of meat paper. I cannot come back there to that their job. Mrs. Snow say no, George. I been revolvin' it in my mind, considerin' circumstances she's right. Law and order. I found myself in Texas recently, revisiting old places and vistas. At a sheep ranch where I had sojourned many years ago, I stopped for a week. And, as all visitors do, I heartily plunged into the business at hand, which happened to be that of dipping the sheep. Now, this process is so different from ordinary human baptism that it deserves a word of itself. A vast iron cauldron with half the fires of Avernus beneath it is partly filled with water that soon boils furiously. Into that is cast concentrated lye, lime, and sulfur, which is allowed to stew and fume until the witch's broth is strong enough to scorch the third arm of Paladino herself. Then this concentrated brew is mixed in a long, deep vat with cubic gallons of hot water, and the sheep are caught by their hind legs and flung into the compound. After being thoroughly ducked by means of a forked pole in the hands of a gentleman detailed for that purpose, they are allowed to clamber up an incline into a corral and dry or die. As the state of their constitutions may decree. If you ever caught an able-bodied, two-year-old mutton by the hind legs and felt the 750 volts of kicking that he can send though your arm seventeen times before you can hurl him into the vat. You will, of course, hope that he may die instead of dry. But this is merely to explain why Bud Oakley and I gladly stretched ourselves on the bank of the nearby charco after the dipping. Glad for the welcome inanition and pure contact with the earth after our muscle-racking labors. The flock was a small one, and we finished at three in the afternoon, so Bud brought from the morrel on his saddle horn, coffee and a coffee pot and a big hunk of bread and some side bacon. Mr. Mills, the ranch owner and my old friend, 
rode away to the ranch with his force of Mexican trabajadores. While the bacon was frizzling nicely, there was the sound of horses' hoofs behind us. Bud's six-shooter lay in its scabbard ten feet away from his hand. He paid not the slightest heed to the approaching horseman. This attitude of a Texas ranchman was so different from the old-time custom that I marveled. Instinctively I turned to inspect the possible foe that menaced us in the rear. I saw a horseman dressed in black, who might have been a lawyer or a parson or an undertaker, trotting peaceably along the road by the arroyo. Bud noticed my precautionary movement and smiled sarcastically and sorrowfully. You've been away too long, said he. You don't need to look around any more when anybody gallops up behind you in this state, unless something hits you in the back. And even then it's liable to be only a bunch of tracts or a petition to sign against the trusts. I never looked at that hombre that rode by. But I'll bet a quart of sheep dip that he's some double-dyed son of a popgun out rounding up prohibition boats. Times have changed, bud, said I, oracularly. Law and order is the rule now in the South and the Southwest. I caught a cold gleam from Bud's pale blue eyes. Not that I, I began, hastily. Of course you don't, said Bud warmly. You know better. You've lived here before. Law and order, you say? Twenty years ago we had M here. We only had two or three laws, such as against murder before witnesses, and being caught stealing horses, and voting the Republican ticket. But how is it now? All we get is orders. And the laws go out of the state. Them legislators set up there at Austin and don't do nothing but make laws against kerosene oil and schoolbooks being brought into the state. I reckon they was afraid some man would go home some evening after work and light up and get an education and go to work and make laws to repeal aforesaid laws. Me, I'm for the old days when law and order meant what they said. A law was a law, and a order was a order. But, I began. I was going on, continued Bud, while this coffee is boiling. To describe to you a case of genuine law and order that I knew of once in the times when cases was decided in the chambers of a six-shooter instead of a Supreme Court. You've heard of old Ben Kirkman, the Cattle King? His ranch run from the Nueces to the Rio Grande. In them days, as you know, there was cattle barons and cattle kings. The difference was this, when a cattleman went to San Antonio and bought beer for the newspaper reporters and only give them the number of cattle he actually owned, they wrote him up for a baron. When he bought M. Champagne wine and added in the amount of cattle he had stole, they called him a king. Luke Summers was one of his range bosses. And down to the king's ranch comes one day a bunch of these oriental people from New York or Kansas City or thereabouts. Luke was detailed with a squad to ride about with them, and see that the rattlesnakes got fair warning when they was coming, and drive the deer out of their way. Among the bunch was a black-eyed girl that wore a number two shoe. That's all I noticed about her. But Luke must have seen more, for he married her one day before the cab allard started back, and went over on Canada Verde and set up a ranch of his own. I'm skipping over the sentimental stuff on purpose, because I never saw or wanted to see any of it. And Luke takes me along with him because we was old friends and I handled cattle to suit him. I'm skipping over much what followed. Because I never saw or wanted to see any of it, but three years afterward there was a boy kid stumbling and blubbering around the galleries and floors of Luke's ranch. I never had no use for kids, but it seems they did. And I'm skipping over much what followed until one day out to the ranch drives and hacks and buckboards a lot of Mrs. Summers's friends from the east, a sister or so and two or three men. One looked like an uncle to somebody, and one looked like nothing, and the other one had on corkscrew pants and spoke in a tone of voice. I never liked a man who spoke in a tone of voice. I'm skipping over much what followed, but one afternoon when I rides up to the ranch house to get some orders about a drove of beeves that was to be shipped, I hear something like a pop gun go off. I waits at the hitching rack, not wishing to intrude on private affairs. In a little while Luke comes out and gives some orders to some of his Mexican hands, and they go and hitch up sundry and diverse vehicles. 
and mighty soon out comes one of the sisters or so and some of the two or three men. But two of the two or three men carries between them the corkscrew man who spoke in a tone of voice, and lays him flat down in one of the wagons. And they all might have been seen wending their way away. Bud, says Luke to me, I want you to fix up a little and go up to San Antone with me. Let me get on my Mexican spurs, says I, and I'm your company. One of the sisters or so seems to have stayed at the ranch with Mrs. Summers and the kid. We rides to Encinal and catches the International, and hits San Antone in the morning. After breakfast Luke steers me straight to the office of a lawyer. They go in a room and talk and then come out. Oh, there won't be any trouble, Mr. Summers, says the lawyer. I'll acquaint Judge Simmons with the facts today, and the matter will be put through as promptly as possible. Law and order reigns in this state as swift and sure as any in the country. I'll wait for the decree if it won't take over half an hour, says Luke. Tut, tut, says the lawyer man. Law must take its course. Come back day after tomorrow at half past nine. At that time me and Luke shows up, and the lawyer hands him a folded document. And Luke writes him out a check. On the sidewalk Luke holds up the paper to me and puts a finger the size of a kitchen door latch on it and says. Decree of absolute divorce with custody y of the child. Skipping over much what has happened of which I know nothing, says I, it looks to me like a split. Couldn't the lawyer man have made it a strike for you? Bud, says he, in a pained style, that child is the one thing I have to live for. She may go, but the boy is mine, think of it, I have custody y of the child. All right, says I. If it's the law, let's abide by it. But I think, says I, that Judge Simmons might have used exemplary clemency, or whatever is the legal term, in our case. You see, I wasn't inveigled much into the desirableness of having infants around a ranch, except the kind that feed themselves and sell for so much on the hoof when they grow up. But Luke was struck with that sort of parental foolishness that I never could understand. All the way riding from the station back to the ranch, he kept pulling that decree out of his pocket and laying his finger on the back of it and reading off to me the sum and substance of it. Custody why of the child, bud, says he. Don't forget it, custody why of the child. But when we hits the ranch we finds our decree of court obviated, null prost, and remanded for trial. Mrs. Summers and the kid was gone. They tell us that an hour after me and Luke had started for San Antone she had a team hitched and lit out for the nearest station with her trunks and the youngster. Luke takes out his decree once more and reads off its emoluments. It ain't possible, bud, says he, for this to be. It's contrary to law and order. It's wrote as plain as day here, custody why of the child. There is what you might call a human leaning, says I, toward smashing em both not to mention the child. Judge Simmons, goes on Luke, is an incorporated officer of the law. She can't take the boy away. He belongs to me by statutes passed and approved by the state of Texas. And he's removed from the jurisdiction of mundane mandamuses, says I, by the unearthly statutes of female partiality. Let us praise the Lord and be thankful for whatever small mercies, I begins, but I see Luke don't listen to me. Tired as he was, he calls for a fresh horse and starts back again for the station. He come back two weeks afterward, not saying much. We can't get the trail, says he. But we've done all the telegraphing that the wires'll stand, and we've got these city rangers they call detectives on the lookout. In the meantime, Bud, says he, will round up them cows on Brush Creek, and wait for the law to take its course and after that we never alluded to illusions, as you might say. Skipping over much what happened in the next twelve years, Luke was made sheriff of Mojada County. He made me his office deputy. Now, don't get in your mind no wrong apparitions of a office deputy doing sums in a book or mashing letters in a cider press. In them days his job was to watch the back windows so nobody didn't plug the sheriff in the rear while he was adding up mileage at his desk in front. And in them days I had qualifications for the job. 
and there was law and order in Mojada County, and schoolbooks, and all the whiskey you wanted. And the government built its own battleships instead of collecting nickels from the schoolchildren to do it with. And, as I say, there was law and order instead of enactments and restrictions such as disfigure our umpire state today. We had our office at Bildad, the county seat, from which we emerged forth on necessary occasions to soothe whatever fracases and unrest that might occur in our jurisdiction. Skipping over much what happened while me and Luke was sheriff, I want to give you an idea of how the law was respected in them days. Luke was what you would call one of the most conscious men in the world. He never knew much book law, but he had the inner emoluments of justice and mercy inculcated into his system. If a respectable citizen shot a Mexican or held up a train and cleaned out the safe in the express car, and Luke ever got hold of him, he'd give the guilty party such a reprimand and a cussin' out that he'd probable never do it again. But once let somebody steal a horse, unless it was a Spanish pony, or cut a wire fence, or otherwise impair the peace and indignity of Mojada County. Luke and me would be on them with habeas corpuses and smokeless powder and all the modern inventions of equity and etiquette. We certainly had our county on a basis of lawfulness. I've known persons of eastern classification with little spotted caps and buttoned-up shoes to get off the train at Bildad and eat sandwiches at the railroad station without being shot at or even roped and drug about by the citizens of the town. Luke had his own ideas of legality and justice. He was kind of training me to succeed him when he went out of office. He was always looking ahead to the time when he'd quit sheriffing. What he wanted to do was to build a yellow house with latticework under the porch and have hens scratching in the yard. The one main thing in his mind seemed to be the yard. Bud, he says to me, by instinct and sentiment I'm a contractor. I want to be a contractor. That's what I'll be when I get out of office. What kind of a contractor, says I. It sounds like a kind of a business to me. You ain't going to haul cement or establish branches or work on a railroad, are you? You don't understand, says Luke. I'm tired of space and horizons and territory and distances and things like that. What I want is reasonable contraction. I want a yard with a fence around it that you can go out and set on after supper and listen to whip poor wills, says Luke. That's the kind of a man he was. He was homelike, although he'd had bad luck in such investments. But he never talked about them times on the ranch. It seemed like he'd forgotten about it. I wondered how, with his ideas of yards and chickens and notions of latticework, he'd seemed to have got out of his mind that kid of his that had been taken away from him, unlawful. In spite of his decree of court. But he wasn't a man you could ask about such things as he didn't refer to in his own conversation. I reckon he'd put all his emotions and ideas into being sheriff. I've read in books about men that was disappointed in these poetic and fine-haired and high-collared affairs with ladies renouncing truck of that kind and wrapping themselves up into some occupation like painting pictures. Or herding sheep, or science, or teaching school, something to make em forget. Well, I guess that was the way with Luke. But, as he couldn't paint pictures. He took it out in rounding up horse thieves and in making Mojada County a safe place to sleep in if you was well armed and not afraid of requisitions or tarantulas. One day there passes through Bildad a bunch of these money investors from the east, and they stopped off there, Bildad being the dinner station on the I and G N. They was just coming back from Mexico looking after mines and such. There was five of M for solid parties, with gold watch chains, that would grate up over two hundred pounds on the hoof, and one kid about seventeen or eighteen. This youngster had on one of them cowboy suits such as tenderfoots bring west with them. And you could see he was aching to wing a couple of Indians or bag a grizzly or two with the little pearl-handled gun he had buckled around his waist. I walked down to the depot to keep an eye on the outfit and see that they didn't locate any land or scare the cow ponies hitched in front of Murchison's store or act otherwise unseemly. Luke was away after a gang of cattle thieves down on the Frio, and I always looked after the law and order when he wasn't there. After dinner this boy comes out of the dining room while the train was waiting, 
and prances up and down the platform ready to shoot all antelope, lions, or private citizens that might endeavor to molest or come too near him. He was a good-looking kid, only he was like all them tenderfoots, he didn't know a law and order town when he saw it. By and by along comes Pedro Johnson, the proprietor of the Crystal Palace Chili Con Carn stand in Bildad. Pedro was a man who liked to amuse himself. So he kind of heard rides this youngster, laughing at him, tickled to death. I was too far away to hear, but the kid seems to mention some remarks to Pedro, and Pedro goes up and slaps him about nine feet away, and laughs harder than ever. And then the boy gets up quicker than he fell and jerks out his little pearl handle, and, bing! 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 Pedro gets it three times in special and treasured portions of his carcass. I saw the dust fly off his clothes every time the bullets hit. Sometimes them little thirty-twos cause worry at close range. The engine bell was ringing, and the train starting off slow. I goes up to the kid and places him under arrest, and takes away his gun. But the first thing I knew that Cab Allard of Capitalists makes a break for the train. One of M hesitates in front of me for a second, and kind of smiles and shoves his hand up against my chin, and I sort of laid down on the platform and took a nap. I never was afraid of guns. But I don't want any person except a barber to take liberties like that with my face again. When I woke up, the whole outfit, train, boy, and all, was gone. I asked about Pedro, and they told me the doctor said he would recover provided his wounds didn't turn out to be fatal. When Luke got back three days later, and I told him about it, he was mad all over. Why ain't you telegraphed to San Antone, he asks, and have the bunch arrested there? Oh, well, says I, I always did admire telegraphy, but astronomy was what I had took up just then. That capitalist sure knew how to gesticulate with his hands. Luke got madder and madder. He investigates and finds in the depot a card one of the men had dropped that gives the address of some hombre called Scudder in New York City. Bud, says Luke, I'm going after that bunch. I'm going there and get the man or boy, as you say he was, and bring him back. I'm sheriff of Mojada County, and I shall keep law and order in its precincts while I'm able to draw a gun. And I want you to go with me. No Eastern Yankee can shoot up a respectable and well-known citizen of Bildad, specially with a thirty-two caliber, and escape the law. Pedro Johnson, says Luke, is one of our most prominent citizens and businessmen. I'll appoint Sam Bell acting sheriff with penitentiary powers while I'm away, and you and me will take the 645 northbound tomorrow evening and follow up this trail. I'm your company, says I, I never see this New York, but I'd like to. But, Luke, says I, don't you have to have a dispensation or a habeas corpus or something from the state, when you reach out that far for rich men and malefactors? Did I have a requisition, says Luke, when I went over into the Brazos Bottoms and brought back Bill Grimes and two more for holding up the International? Did me and you have a search warrant or a posse comitatus when we rounded up them six Mexican cow thieves down in Hidalgo? It's my business to keep order in Mojada County. And it's my business as office deputy, says I, to see that business is carried on according to law. Between us both we ought to keep things pretty well cleaned up. So, the next day, Luke packs a blanket and some collars in his mileage book in a haversack, and him and me hits the breeze for New York. It was a powerful long ride. The seats in the cars was too short for six-footers like us to sleep comfortable on, and the conductor had to keep us from getting off at every town that had five-story houses in it. But we got there finally, and we seemed to see right away that he was right about it. Luke, says I, as office deputy and from a law standpoint, it don't look to me like this place is properly and legally in the jurisdiction of Mojada County, Texas. From the standpoint of order, says he, it's amenable to answer for its sins to the properly appointed authorities from Bildad to Jerusalem. Amen, says I. But let's turn our trick sudden, and ride. I don't like the looks of this place. Think of Pedro Johnson, says Luke, a friend of mine and yours shot down by one of these gilded abolitionists at his very door. It was at the door of the freight depot, says I. 
but the law will not be balked at a quibble like that. We put up at one of them big hotels on Broadway. The next morning I goes down about two miles of stir steps to the bottom and hunts for Luke. It ain't no use. It looks like San Jacinto Day in San Antonio. There's a thousand folks milling around in a kind of a roofed-over plaza with marble pavements and trees growing right out of them. And I see no more chance of finding Luke than if we was hunting each other in the big pear flat down below old Fort Ewell. But soon Luke and me runs together in one of the turns of them marble alleys. It ain't no use, bud, says he. I can't find no place to eat at. I've been looking for restaurant signs and smelling for ham all over the camp. But I'm used to going hungry when I have to. Now, says he, I'm going out and get a hack and ride down to the address on this scutter card. You stay here and try to hustle some grub. But I doubt if you'll find it. I wish we'd brought along some cornmeal and bacon and beans. I'll be back when I see this scutter, if the trail ain't wiped out. So I starts foraging for breakfast. For the honor of old Mojada County I didn't want to seem green to them abolitionists. So every time I turned a corner in the marble halls I went up to the first desk or counter I see and looks around for grub. If I didn't see what I wanted I asked for something else. In about half an hour I had a dozen cigars, five-story magazines, and seven or eight railroad timetables in my pockets, and never a smell of coffee or bacon to point out the trail. Once a lady sitting at a table and playing a game kind of like pushpin told me to go into a closet that she called number three. I went in and shut the door, and the blamed thing lit itself up. I sat down on a stool before a shelf and waited. Thinks I, this is a private dining room. But no waiter never came. When I got to sweating good and hard, I goes out again. Did you get what you wanted, says she. No, ma'am, says I, not a bite. Then there's no charge, says she. Thank ye, ma'am, says I, and I takes up the trail again. By and by I thinks I'll shed etiquette, and I picks up one of them boys with blue clothes and yellow buttons in front, and he leads me to what he calls the cafe breakfast room. And the first thing I lays my eyes on when I go in is that boy that had shot Pedro Johnson. He was sitting all alone at a little table, hitting a egg with a spoon like he was afraid he'd break it. I takes the chair across the table from him, and he looks insulted and makes a move like he was going to get up. Keep still, son, says I. You're apprehended, arrested, and in charge of the Texas authorities. Go on and hammer that egg some more if it's the inside of it you want. Now, what did you shoot Mr. Johnson, of Bildad, for? And may I ask who you are, says he. You may, says I, go ahead. I suppose you're on, says this kid, without batting his eyes. But what are you eating? Here, waiter. He calls out, raising his finger. Take this gentleman's order. A beefsteak, says I, and some fried eggs and a can of peaches and a quart of coffee will about suffice. We talk a while about the sundries of life and then he says. What are you going to do about that shooting? I had a right to shoot that man, says he. He called me names that I couldn't overlook, and then he struck me. He carried a gun, too. What else could I do? We'll have to take you back to Texas, says I. I'd like to go back, says the boy, with a kind of a grin, if it wasn't on an occasion of this kind. It's the life I like. I've always wanted to ride and shoot and live in the open air ever since I can remember. Who was this gang of stout parties you took this trip with? I asks. My stepfather, says he, and some business partners of his in some Mexican mining and land schemes. I saw you shoot Pedro Johnson, says I, and I took that little pop gun away from you that you did it with. And when I did so I noticed three or four little scars in a row over your right eyebrow. You've been in Rookus before, haven't you? I've had these scars ever since I can remember, says he. I don't know how they came there. Was you ever in Texas before, says I. Not that I remember of, says he. But I thought I had when we struck the prairie country. But I guess I hadn't. 
Have you got a mother? I asks. She died five years ago, says he. Skipping over the most of what followed, when Luke came back I turned the kid over to him. He had seen Scudder and told him what he wanted. And it seems that Scudder got active with one of these telephones as soon as he left. For in about an hour afterward there comes to our hotel some of these city rangers in everyday clothes that they call detectives. And marches the whole outfit of us to what they call a magistrate's court. They accuse Luke of attempted kidnapping, and ask him what he has to say. This snipe, says Luke to the judge, shot and willfully punctured with malice and forethought one of the most respected and prominent citizens of the town of Bildad, Texas, your honor. And in so doing laid himself liable to the penitence of law and order. And I hereby make claim and demand restitution of the state of New York City for the said alleged criminal. And I know he done it. Have you the usual and necessary requisition papers from the governor of your state? asks the judge. My usual papers, says Luke, was taken away from me at the hotel by these gentlemen who represent law and order in your city. They was two Colts point forty fives that I've packed for nine years. And if I don't get M back, there'll be more trouble. You can ask anybody in Mojada County about Luke Summers. I don't usually need any other kind of papers for what I do. I see the judge looks mad, so I steps up and says. Your Honor, the aforesaid defendant, Mr. Luke Summers, Sheriff of Mojada County, Texas, is as fine a man as ever threw a rope or upheld the statutes and codicils of the greatest state in the Union. But he. The judge hits his table with a wooden hammer and asks who I am. Bud Oakley, says I, office deputy of the Sheriff's Office of Mojada County, Texas. Representing, says I, the law. Luke Summers, I goes on, represents order. And if your honor will give me about ten minutes in private talk, I'll explain the whole thing to you, and show you the equitable and legal requisition papers which I carry in my pocket. The judge kind of half smiles and says he will talk with me in his private room. In there I put the whole thing up to him in such language as I had, and when we goes outside, he announces the verdict that the young man is delivered into the hands of the Texas authorities. And calls the next case. Skipping over much of what happened on the way back, I'll tell you how the thing wound up in Bildad. When we got the prisoner in the sheriff's office, I says to Luke. You, remember that kid of yours, that two-year-old that they stole away from you when the bust-up come? Luke looks black and angry. He'd never let anybody talk to him about that business, and he never mentioned it himself. Toe the mark, says I. Do you remember when he was toddling around on the porch and fell down on a pair of Mexican spurs and cut four little holes over his right eye? Look at the prisoner, says I, look at his nose and the shape of his head and, why, you old fool, don't you know your own son, I knew him, says I, when he perforated Mr. Johnson at the depot. Luke comes over to me shaking all over. I never saw him lose his nerve before. Bud, says he. I've never had that boy out of my mind one day or one night since he was took away. But I never let on. But can we hold him, can we make him stay, I'll make the best man of him that ever put his foot in a stirrup. Wait a minute, says he, all excited and out of his mind, I've got something here in my desk, I reckon it'll hold legal yet, I've looked at it a thousand times, cuz to dy of the child. Says Luke, cuz to dy of the child. We can hold him on that, can't we? Let me see if I can find that decree. Luke begins to tear his desk to pieces. Hold on, says I, you are order and I'm law. You needn't look for that paper, Luke. It ain't a decree any more. It's requisition papers. It's on file in that magistrate's office in New York. I took it along when we went, because I was office deputy and knew the law. I've got him back, says Luke. He's mine again. I never thought. Wait a minute, says I. We've got to have law and order. You and me have got to preserve M both in Mojada County according to our oath and conscience. The kid shot Pedro Johnson, one of Bildad's most prominent N. Oh, hell, 
says Luke. That don't amount to anything. That fellow was half Mexican, anyhow. An unfinished Christmas story. Now, a Christmas story should be one. For a good many years the ingenious writers have been putting forth tales for the holiday numbers that employed every subtle, evasive, indirect and strategic scheme they could invent to disguise the Christmas flavor. So far has this new practice been carried that nowadays when you read a story in a holiday magazine the only way you can tell it is a Christmas story is to look at the footnote which reads, the incidents in the above story happened on December 25th. Ed. There is progress in this, but it is all very sad. There are just as many real Christmas stories as ever, if we would only dig them up. Me, I am for the Scrooge and Marley Christmas story, and the Annie and Willie's prayer poem. And the long-lost son coming home on the stroke of twelve to the poorly thatched cottage with his arms full of talking dolls and popcorn balls and, zip. You hear the second mortgage on the cottage go flying off it into the deep snow. So, this is to warn you that there is no subterfuge about this story, and you might come upon stockings hung to the mantle and plum puddings and hark. The chimes. And wealthy misers loosening up and handing over penny whistles to lame newsboys if you read further. Once I knocked at a door, I have so many things to tell you I keep on losing sight of the story. It was the front door of a furnished room house in West, Teenth Street. I was looking for a young illustrator named Paley originally and irrevocably from Terre Haute. Paley doesn't enter even into the first serial rites of this Christmas story. I mention him simply in explaining why I came to knock at the door, some people have so much curiosity. The door was opened by the landlady. I had seen hundreds like her. And I had smelled before that cold, dank, furnished draft of air that hurried by her to escape immurement in the furnished house. She was stout, and her face and lands were as white as though she had been drowned in a barrel of vinegar. One hand held together at her throat a buttonless flannel dressing sack K whose lines had been cut by no tape or butterick known to mortal woman. Beneath this a too long, flowered, black sateen skirt was draped about her, reaching the floor in stiff wrinkles and folds. The rest of her was yellow. Her hair, in some bygone age, had been dipped in the fountain of folly presided over by the merry nymph Hydrogen, but now, except at the roots, it had returned to its natural grim and grizzled white. Her eyes and teeth and fingernails were yellow. Her chops hung low and shook when she moved. The look on her face was exactly that smileless look of fatal melancholy that you may have seen on the countenance of a hound left sitting on the doorstep of a deserted cabin. I inquired for Paley. After a long look of cold suspicion the landlady spoke, and her voice matched the dingy roughness of her flannel sack K. Paley? Was I sure that was the name? And wasn't it, likely, Mr. Sanderson I meant, in the third floor rear? No, it was Paley I wanted. Again that frozen, shrewd, steady study of my soul from her pale yellow, unwinking eyes, trying to penetrate my mask of deception and rout out my true motives from my lying lips. There was a Mr. Tompkins in the front hall bedroom two flights up. Perhaps it was he I was seeking. He worked of nights, he never came in till seven in the morning. Or if it was really Mr. Tucker, thinly disguised as Paley, that I was hunting I would have to call between five and. But no, I held firmly to Paley. There was no such name among her lodgers. Click. The door closed swiftly in my face, and I heard through the panels the clanking of chains and bolts. I went down the steps and stopped to consider. The number of this house was 43. I was sure Paley had said 43, or perhaps it was 45 or 47, I decided to try 47, the second house farther along. I rang the bell. The door opened and there stood the same woman. I wasn't confronted by just a resemblance, it was the same woman holding together the same old sack K at her throat and looking at me with the same yellow eyes as if she had never seen me before on. Earth. I saw on the knuckle of her second finger the same red and black spot made, probably, by a recent burn against a hot stove. 
I stood speechless and gaping while one with moderate haste might have told fifty. I couldn't have spoken Paley's name even if I had remembered it. I did the only thing that a brave man who believes there are mysterious forces in nature that we do not yet fully comprehend could have done in the circumstances. I backed down the steps to the sidewalk and then hurried away front ward, fully understanding how incidents like that must bother the psychical research people and the census takers. Of course I heard an explanation of it afterward, as we always do about inexplicable things. The landlady was Mrs. Cannon. And she leased three adjoining houses, which she made into one by cutting arched doorways through the walls. She sat in the middle house and answered the three bells. I wonder why I have maundered so slowly through the prologue. I have it. It was simply to say to you, in the form of introduction rife through the Middle West, shake hands with Mrs. Cannon. For, it was in her triple house that the Christmas story happened. And it was there where I picked up the incontrovertible facts from the gossip of many rumors and met Stickney, and saw the necktie. Christmas came that year on Thursday, and snow came with it. Stickney, Harry Clarence Fowler Stickney to whomsoever his full baptismal cognominal burdens may be of interest, reached his address at 6.30 Wednesday afternoon. Address, is New Yorkies for, home. Stickney roomed at 45 West, 10th Street third floor rear hall room. He was twenty years and four months old, and he worked in a cameras of all kinds, photographic supplies and films developed store. I don't know what kind of work he did in the store. But you must have seen him. He is the young man who always comes behind the counter to wait on you and lets you talk for five minutes, telling him what you want. When you are done, he calls the proprietor at the top of his voice to wait on you, and walks away whistling between his teeth. I don't want to bother about describing to you his appearance. But, if you are a man-reader, I will say that Stickensy looked precisely like the young chap that you always find sitting in your chair smoking a cigarette after you have missed a shot while playing pool, not billiards but pool, when you want to sit down yourself. There are some to whom Christmas gives no Christmassy essence. Of course, prosperous people and comfortable people who have homes or flats or rooms with meals, and even people who live in apartment houses with hotel service get something of the Christmas flavor. They give one another presents with the cost mark scratched off with a penknife. And they hang holly wreaths in the front windows and when they are asked whether they prefer light or dark meat from the turkey they say, both, please, and giggle and have lots of fun and the very poorest people have the best time of it. The army gives M a dinner, and the 10 a.m. Issue of the night final edition of the newspaper with the largest circulation in the city leaves a basket at their door full of an apple, a Lake Ronkonkoma squab, a scrambled eggplant and a bunch of Kalamazoo bleached parsley. The poorer you are the more Christmas does for you. But, I'll tell you to what kind of a mortal Christmas seems to be only the day before the 26th day of December. It's the chap in the big city earning $16 a week, with no friends and few acquaintances, who finds himself with only 50 cents in his pocket on Christmas Eve. He can't accept charity. He can't borrow, he knows no one who would invite him to dinner. I have a fancy that when the shepherds left their flocks to follow the star of Bethlehem there was a bandy-legged young fellow among them who was just learning the sheep business. So they said to him, Bobby, we're going to investigate this star route and see what's in it. If it should turn out to be the first Christmas day we don't want to miss it. And, as you are not a wise man, and as you couldn't possibly purchase a present to take along, suppose you stay behind and mind the sheep. So as we may say, Harry Stickney was a direct descendant of the shepherd who was left behind to take care of the flocks. Getting back to facts, Stickney rang the doorbell of 45. He had a habit of forgetting his latchkey. Instantly the door opened and there stood Mrs. Cannon, clutching her sack key together at the throat and gorgonizing him with her opaque, yellow eyes. To give you good measure, here is a story within a story. Once a rumor in 47 who had the Scotch habit not kilts. But a habit of drinking scotch, began to figure to himself what might happen if two persons should ring the doorbells of 43 and 47 at the same time. 
visions of two halves of Mrs. Cannon appearing respectively and simultaneously at the two entrances, each clutching at a side of an open, flapping sack K that could never meet, overpowered him. Bellevue got him. Evening, said Stickney cheerlessly, as he distributed little piles of muddy slush along the hall matting. Think we'll have snow? You left your key, said. Here the manuscript ends. The unprofitable servant. I am the richer by the acquaintance of four newspaper men. Singly, they are my encyclopedias, friends, mentors, and sometimes bankers. But now and then it happens that all of them will pitch upon the same print-worthy incident of the passing earthly panorama and will send in repertorial constructions thereof to their respective journals. It is then that, for me, it is to laugh. For it seems that to each of them, trained and skilled as he may be, the same occurrence presents a different facet of the cut diamond, life. One will have it, let us say, that Madame. Andre McCartes' apartment was looted by six burglars, who descended via the fire escape and bore away a ruby tiara valued at $2,000 and a $500 prize spitz dog. Which, in violation of the expectoration ordinance, was making free with the halls of the Wutapisatakusanoa Tunka apartments. My second chiel will take notes to the effect that while a friendly game of pinnacle was in progress in the tenement rooms of Mrs. Andy McCarty, a lady guest named Ruby O'Hara threw a burglar down six flights of stairs, where he was pinioned and held by a $2,000 English bulldog amid a crowd of 500 excited spectators. My third chronicler and friend will gather the news threads of the happening in his own happy way, setting forth on the page for you to read that the house of Antonio Macartini was blown up at 6 a. m. by the Black Hand Society, on his refusing to leave $2,000 at a certain street corner. Killing a pet $500 Pomeranian belonging to Alderman Rubitara's little daughter, see photo and diagram opposite. Number four of my history makers will simply construe from the premises the story that while an audience of 2,000 enthusiasts was listening to a Rubinstein concert on 6th Street, a woman who said she was Mrs. Andrew M. Carter threw a brick through a plate glass window valued at $500. The Carter woman claimed that someone in the building had stolen her dog. Now, the discrepancies in these registrations of the day's doings need do no one hurt. Surely, one newspaper is enough for any man to prop against his morning water bottle to fend off the smiling hatred of his wife's glance. If he be foolish enough to read four he is no wiser than a higher critic. I remember, probably as well as you do, having read the parable of the talents. A prominent citizen, about to journey into a far country, first hands over to his servants his goods. To one he gives five talents, to another two. To another one, to every man according to his several ability, as the text has it. There are two versions of this parable, as you well know. There may be more, I do not know. When the PC returns he requires an accounting. Two servants have put their talents out at usury and gained 100%. Good. The unprofitable one simply digs up the talent deposited with him and hands it out on demand. A pattern of behavior for trust companies and banks, surely. In one version we read that he had wrapped it in a napkin and laid it away. But the commentator informs us that the talent mentioned was composed of 750 ounces of silver, about $900 worth. So the chronicler who mentioned the napkin, had either to reduce the amount of the deposit or do a lot of explaining about the size of the napery used in those doves. Therefore in his version we note that he uses the word, pound, instead of, talent. A pound of silver may very well be laid away, and carried away, in a napkin, as any hotel or restaurant man will tell you. But let us get away from our mutton. When the returned nobleman finds that the one talented servant has nothing to hand over except the original fund entrusted to him. He is as angry as a multimillionaire would be if someone should hide under his bed and make a noise like an assessment. He orders the unprofitable servant cast into outer darkness, after first taking away his talent and giving it to the 100% financier, and breathing strange saws. Saying, From him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. 
which is the same as to say, nothing from nothing leaves nothing. And now closer draw the threads of parable, precept allegory, and narrative, leading nowhere if you will. Or else weaving themselves into the little fiction story about Cliff McGowan and his one talent. There is but a definition to follow, and then the homely actors trip on. Talent, a gift, endowment or faculty, some peculiar ability, power, or accomplishment, natural or acquired. A metaphor borrowed from the parable in Matt, 25 14, 30. In New York City today there are, estimated, 125,000 living creatures training for the stage. This does not include seals, pigs, dogs, elephants, prizefighters, carmens, mind readers, or Japanese wrestlers. The bulk of them are in the ranks of the four million. Out of this number will survive a thousand. Nine hundred of these will have attained their fullness of fame when they shall dubiously indicate with the point of a hat pin a blurred figure in a flashlight photograph of a stage tout ensemble with. The proud commentary, that's me. Eighty, in the pinkest of, male, Louis the Fourteenth court costumes, shall welcome the queen of the, mythical, pawpaw isles in a few well-memorized words, turning a tip-tilted nose upon the nine hundred. Ten, in tiny lace caps, shall dust Ibsen furniture for six minutes after the rising of the curtain. Nine shall attain the circuits, besieging with muscle, skill, eye, hand, voice, wit, brain, heel and toe the ultimate high walls of stardom. One shall inherit Broadway. Sic venit Gloria Mundi. Cliff McGowan and Mac McGowan were cousins. They lived on the west side and were talented. Singing, dancing, imitations, trick bicycle riding, boxing, German and Irish dialect comedy. And a little sleight of hand and balancing of wheat straws and wheelbarrows on the ends of their chins came as easy to them as it is for you to fix your rat so it won't show or to dodge a creditor through the swinging doors of a well-lighted café, according as you may belong to the one or the other division of the greatest prestidigitators, the people. They were slim, pale, consummately self-possessed youths, whose fingernails were always irreproachably, and clothes seems reproachfully, shiny. Their conversation was in sentences so short that they made Kipling seem as long as court citations. Having the temperament, they did no work. Any afternoon you could find them on 8th Avenue either in front of Spinelli's Barber Shop, Mike Dugan's Place, or the Limerick Hotel, rubbing their forefinger nails with dingy silk handkerchiefs. At any time, if you had happened to be standing, undecisive, near a pool table, and Cliff and Mac had, casually, as it were, drawn near, mentioning something disinterestedly, about a game, well. Indeed, would it have been for you had you gone your way, unresponsive? Which assertion, carefully considered, is a study in tense, punctuation, and advice to strangers. Of all kinships it is likely that the closest is that of cousin. Between cousins there exist the ties of race, name, and favor, ties thicker than water. And yet not coagulated with the jealous precipitations of brotherhood or the enjoining obligations of the matrimonial yoke. You can bestow upon a cousin almost the interest and affection that you would give to a stranger. You need not feel toward him the contempt and embarrassment that you have for one of your father's sons, it is the closer clan feeling that sometimes makes the branch of a tree stronger than its trunk. Thus were the two McGowans bonded. They enjoyed a quiet celebrity in their district, which was a strip west of 8th Avenue with the pump for its pivot. Their talents were praised in a hundred joints. Their friendship was famed even in a neighborhood where men had been known to fight off the wives of their friends, when domestic onslaught was being made upon their friends by the wives of their friends. Thus do the limitations of English force us to repetence. So, side by side, grim, sallow, lowering, inseparable, undefeated, the cousins fought their way into the temple of art, art with a big A, which causes to intervene a lesson in geometry. One night at about eleven o'clock Del Delano dropped into Mike's place on 8th Avenue. From that moment, instead of remaining a place, the café became a resort. It was as though King Edward had condescended to mingle with ten spots of a different suit, 
or Joe Gans had casually strolled in to look over the Tuskegee School. Or Mr. Shaw, of England, had accepted an invitation to read selections from Rena, the snowbird at an unveiling of the proposed monument to James Owen O'Connor at Chinkapin Falls, Mississippi. In spite of these comparisons, you will have to be told why the patronizing of a third-rate saloon on the west side by the said Del Delano conferred such a specific honor upon the place. Del Delano could not make his feet behave, and so the world paid him three hundred dollars a week to see them misconduct themselves on the vaudeville stage. To make the matter plain to you, and to swell the number of words, he was the best fancy dancer on any of the circuits between Ottawa and Corpus Christi. With his eyes fixed on vacancy and his feet apparently fixed on nothing, he nightly charmed thousands, as his press agent incorrectly stated. Even taking night performance and matinee together, he scarcely could have charmed more than eighteen hundred, including those who left after Zora, the Notch girl. Had squeezed herself through a hoop twelve inches in diameter, and those who were waiting for the moving pictures. But Del Delano was the West Side's favorite, and nowhere is there a more loyal side. Five years before our story was submitted to the editors, Dell had crawled from some Tenth Avenue basement like a lean rat and had bitten his way into the big cheese. Patched, half-starved, cuffless, and as scornful of the hook as an interpreter of Ibsen. He had danced his way into health, as you and I view it, and fame in sixteen minutes on amateur night at Creary's, Variety, Theatre in Eighth Avenue. A bookmaker, one of the kind that talent wins with instead of losing, sat in the audience, asleep, dreaming of an impossible pickup among the amateurs. After a snore, a glass of beer from the handsome waiter, and a temporary blindness caused by the diamonds of a transmontane blonde in Box E. The bookmaker woke up long enough to engage Del Delano for a three weeks trial engagement fused with a trained dog short circuit covering the three Washingtons, Heights, Statue, and Square. By the time this story was read and accepted, Del Delano was drawing his $300 a week, which, divided by seven, Sunday acts not in costume being permissible dispels the delusion entertained by most of us that we have seen better days. You can easily imagine the worshipful agitation of Eighth Avenue whenever Del Delano honored it with a visit after his Terpsichorean act in a historically great and vilely ventilated Broadway theater. If the West Side could claim 42 minutes out of his 42 weeks bookings every year, it was an occasion for bonfires and repainting of the pump. And now you know why Mike's saloon is a resort and no longer a simple place. Del Delano entered Mike's alone. So nearly concealed in a fur-lined overcoat and a derby two sizes too large for him was Prince Lightfoot that you saw of his face only his pale, hatchet-edged features and a pair of unwinking, cold, light blue eyes. Nearly every man lounging at Mike's bar recognized the renowned product of the West Side. To those who did not, Wisdom was conveyed by prodding elbows and growls of one-sided introduction. Upon Charlie, one of the bartenders, both fame and fortune descended simultaneously. He had once been honored by shaking hands with the great Delano at a Seventh Avenue boxing bout. So with lungs of brass he now cried, Hello, Del, old man, waddle it be? Mike, the proprietor, who was cranking the cash register, heard. On the next day he raised Charlie's wages five a week. Del Delano drank a pony beer, paying for it carelessly out of his nightly earnings of $42.85-7. He nodded amiably but coldly at the long line of Mike's patrons and strolled past them into the rear room of the café. For he heard in their sounds pertaining to his own art, the light, stirring staccato of a buck and wing dance. In the back room Mac McGowan was giving a private exhibition of the genius of his feet. A few young men sat at tables looking on critically while they amused themselves seriously with beer. They nodded approval at some new fancy steps of Mac's own invention. At the sight of the great Del Delano, the amateur's feet stuttered, blundered, clicked a few times, and ceased to move. The tongues of one's shoes become tied in the presence of the master. Mac's sallow face took on a slight flush. 
From the uncertain cavity between Del Delano's hat brim and the lapels of his high fur coat collar came a thin puff of cigarette smoke and then a voice. Do that last step over again, kid. And don't hold your arms quite so stiff. Now, then. Once more Mac went through his paces. According to the traditions of the man-dancer, his entire being was transformed into mere feet and legs. His gaze and expression became cataleptic, his body, unbending above the waist, but as light as a cork, bobbed like the same cork dancing on the ripples of a running brook. The beat of his heels and toes pleased you like a snare drum obligato. The performance ended with an amazing clatter of leather against wood that culminated in a sudden flat-footed stamp. Leaving the dancer erect and as motionless as a pillar of the colonial portico of a mansion in a Kentucky Prohibition town. Mac felt that he had done his best and that Del Delano would turn his back upon him in derisive scorn. An approximate silence followed, broken only by the mewing of a cafe cat and the hubbub and uproar of a few million citizens and transportation facilities outside. Mac turned a hopeless but nervy eye upon Del Delano's face. In it he read disgust, admiration, envy, indifference, approval, disappointment, praise, and contempt. Thus, in the countenances of those we hate or love we find what we most desire or fear to see. Which is an assertion equaling in its wisdom and chiaroscuro the most famous sayings of the most foolish philosophers that the world has ever known. Del Delano retired within his overcoat and hat. In two minutes he emerged and turned his left side to Mac. Then he spoke. You've got a foot movement, kid, like a baby hippopotamus trying to sidestep a jab from a hummingbird. And you hold yourself like a truck driver having his picture taken in a Third Avenue photograph gallery. And you haven't got any method or style. And your knees are about as limber as a couple of Yale paskies. And you strike the eye as weighing, let us say, 450 pounds while you work. But, say, would you mind giving me your name? McGowan, said the humbled amateur, Mac McGowan. Delano the Great slowly lighted a cigarette and continued, through its smoke. In other words, you're rotten. You can't dance. But I'll tell you one thing you've got. Throw it all off of your system while you're at it, said Mac. What V.I. got? Genius, said Del Delano. Except myself, it's up to you to be the best fancy dancer in the United States, Europe, Asia, and the colonial possessions of all three. Smoke up, said Mac McGowan. Genius, repeated the master, you've got a talent for genius. Your brains are in your feet, where a dancer's ought to be. You've been self-taught until you're almost ruined, but not quite. What you need is a trainer. I'll take you in hand and put you at the top of the profession. There's room there for the two of us. You may beat me, said the master, casting upon him a cold, savage look combining so much rivalry, affection, justice, and human hate that it stamped him at once as one of the little great ones of the earth, you may beat me. But I doubt it. I've got the start and the pull. But at the top is where you belong. Your name, you say, is Robinson. McGowan, repeated the amateur, Mac McGowan. It don't matter, said Delano. Suppose you walk up to my hotel with me. I'd like to talk to you. Your footwork is the worst I ever saw, Madigan, but, well, I'd like to talk to you. You may not think so, but I'm not so stuck up. I came off of the west side myself. That overcoat cost me eight hundred dollars, but the collar ain't so high but what I can see over it. I taught myself to dance, and I put in most of nine years at it before I shook a foot in public. But I had genius. I didn't go too far wrong in teaching myself as you've done. You've got the rottenest method and style of anybody I ever saw. Oh, I don't think much of the few little steps I take, said Mac, with hypocritical lightness. Don't talk like a package of self-raising buckwheat flour, said Del Delano. You've had a talent handed to you by the proposition higher up, and it's up to you to do the proper thing with it. I'd like to have you go up to my hotel for a talk, if you will. 
In his rooms in the King Clovis Hotel, Del Delano put on a scarlet house coat bordered with gold braid and set out Apollinaris and a box of sweet crackers. Max I wandered. Forget it, said Delaware, drink and tobacco may be all right for a man who makes his living with his hands, but they won't do if you're depending on your head or your feet. If one end of you gets tangled, so does the other. That's why beer and cigarettes don't hurt piano players and picture painters. But you've got to cut M out if you want to do mental or pedal work. Now, have a cracker, and then we'll talk some. All right, said Mac. I take it as an honor, of course, for you to notice my hopping around. Of course I'd like to do something in a professional line. Of course I can sing a little and do card tricks and Irish and German comedy stuff, and of course I'm not so bad on the trapeze and comic bicycle stunts and Hebrew monologues and. One moment. Interrupted Del Delano, before we begin. I said you couldn't dance. Well, that wasn't quite right. You've only got two or three bad tricks in your method. You're handy with your feet, and you belong at the top, where I am. I'll put you there. I've got six weeks continuous in New York, and in four I can shape up your style till the booking agents will fight one another to get you. And I'll do it, too. I'm of, from, and for the west side. Del Delano looks good on billboards, but the family name's Crowley. Now, Macintosh, McGowan, I mean, you've got your chance, fifty times a better one than I had. I'd be a shine to turn it down, said Mac. And I hope you understand I appreciate it. Me and my cousin Cliff McGowan was thinking of getting a tryout at Creary's on amateur night a month from tomorrow. Good stuff, said Delano. I got mine there. Junius T. Rollins, the booker for Coon and Dooley, jumped on the stage and engaged me after my dance. And the boards were an inch deep in nickels and dimes and quarters. There wasn't but nine penny pieces found in the lot. I ought to tell you, said Mac, after two minutes of pensiveness, that my cousin Cliff can beat me dancing. We've always been what you might call pals. If you'd take him up instead of me, now, it might be better. He's invented a lot of steps that I can't cut. Forget it, said Delano. Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays of every week from now till amateur night, a month off, I'll coach you. I'll make you as good as I am, and nobody could do more for you. My act's over every night at 10.15. Half an hour later I'll take you up and drill you till twelve. I'll put you at the top of the bunch, right where I am. You've got talent. Your style's bum. But you've got the genius. You let me manage it. I'm from the west side myself, and I'd rather see one of the same gang win out before I would an east sider, or any of the Flatbush or Hackensack Meadow kind of buttinners. I'll see that Junius Rollins is present on your Friday night. And if he don't climb over the footlights and offer you fifty a week as a starter, I'll let you draw it down from my own salary every Monday night. Now, am I talking on the level or am I not? Amateur night at Creary's 8th Avenue Theater is cut by the same pattern as amateur nights elsewhere. After the regular performance the humblest talent may, by previous arrangement with the management, make its debut upon the public stage. Ambitious non-professionals, mostly self-instructed, display their skill and powers of entertainment along the broadest lines. They may sing, dance, mimic, juggle, contort, recite, or disport themselves along any of the ragged boundary lines of art. From the ranks of these anxious tyros are chosen the professionals that adorn or otherwise make conspicuous the full-blown stage. Press agents delight in recounting to open-mouthed and close-eared reporters stories of the humble beginnings of the brilliant stars whose orbits they control. Such and such a prima donna, they will tell you, made her initial bow to the public while turning handsprings on an amateur night. One great matinee favorite made his debut on a generous Friday evening singing coon songs of his own composition. A tragedian famous on two continents and an island first attracted attention by an amateur impersonation of a newly landed Scandinavian peasant girl. 
one Broadway comedian that turns M away got a booking on a Friday night by reciting, seriously, the graveyard scene in Hamlet. Thus they get their chance. Amateur night is a kindly boon. It is charity divested of almsgiving. It is a brotherly hand reached down by members of the best united band of co-workers in the world to raise up less fortunate ones without labeling them beggars. It gives you the chance, if you can grasp it, to step for a few minutes before some badly painted scenery and, during the playing by the orchestra of some ten or twelve bars of music. And while the soles of your shoes may be clearly holding to the uppers, to secure a salary equal to a congressman's or any orthodox minister's. Could an ambitious student of literature or financial methods get a chance like that by spending twenty minutes in a Carnegie library? I do not trow so. But shall we look in at queries? Let us say that the specific Friday night had arrived on which the fortunate Mac McGowan was to justify the flattering predictions of his distinguished patron and, incidentally, drop his silver talent into the slit of the slot machine of fame and fortune that gives up reputation and dough. I offer, sure of your acquiescence, that we now forswear hypocritical philosophy and bigoted comment, permitting the story to finish itself in the dress of material allegations, a medium more worthy. When held to the line, than the most laborious creations of the word milliners. Page of O. Henry's manuscript missing here. Easily among the wings with his patron, the great Del Delano. For, whatever footlights shone in the city that would be amused, the freedom of their unshaded side was Dell's. And if he should take up an amateur, see? And bring him around, see? And, winking one of his cold blue eyes, say to the manager, take it from me, he's got the goods, see? You wouldn't expect that amateur to sit on an unpainted bench sudorifically awaiting his turn, would you? So Mac strolled around largely with the nonpareil. And the seven waited, clamily, on the bench. A giant in shirt sleeves, with a grim, kind face in which many stitches had been taken by surgeons from time to time, i.e. with a long stick, looped at the end. He was the man with the hook. The manager, with his close smoothed blonde hair, his one-sided smile, and his abnormally easy manner, poured with patient condescension over the difficult program of the amateurs. The last of the professional turns, the grand march of the happy huzzard, had been completed, the last wrinkle and darn of their blue silkaline cotton tights had vanished from the stage. The man in the orchestra who played the kettle drum, cymbals, triangle, sandpaper, wang doodle, hoofbeats, and catcalls, and fired the pistol shots, had wiped his brow. The illegal holiday of the Romans had arrived. While the orchestra plays the famous waltz from The Dismal Wife, let us bestow two hundred words upon the psychology of the audience. The orchestra floor was filled by people. The boxes contained persons. In the galleries was the foreordained verdict. The claque was there as it had originated in the Stone Age and was afterward adapted by the French. Every Mickey and Maggie who sat upon Curry's amateur bench, wise beyond their talents, knew that their success or doom lay already meted out to them by that crowded, whistling, roaring mass of Romans in the three galleries. They knew that the winning or the losing of the game for each one lay in the strength of the gang, a loft that could turn the applause to its favorite. On a Broadway first night a wooer of fame may win it from the ticket buyers over the heads of the conoscenti. But not so at queries. The amateur's fate is arithmetical. The number of his supporting admirers present at his tryout decides it in advance. But how these outlying Friday nights put to a certain shame the Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays, and matinees of the Broadway stage you should know. Here the manuscript ends. A fog in Santone. The drug clerk looks sharply at the white face half concealed by the high-turned overcoat collar. I would rather not supply you, he said doubtfully. I sold you a dozen morphine tablets less than an hour ago. The customer smiles wanly. The fault is in your crooked streets. I didn't intend to call upon you twice, but I guess I got tangled up. Excuse me. He draws his collar higher, and moves out, slowly. 
He stops under an electric light at the corner, and juggles absorbedly with three or four little pasteboard boxes. 36, he announces to himself. More than plenty. For a gray mist had swept upon Santone that night, an opaque terror that laid a hand to the throat of each of the city's guests. It was computed that three thousand invalids were hibernating in the town. They had come from far and wide, for here, among these contracted river-sliced streets, the goddess Ozone has elected to linger. Purest atmosphere, sir, on earth. You might think from the river winding through our town that we are malarial, but, no, sir. Repeated experiments made both by the government and local experts show that our air contains nothing deleterious, nothing but ozone, sir, pure ozone. Litmus paper tests made all along the river show, but you can read it all in the prospectuses, or the Santonian will recite it for you, word by word. We may achieve climate, but weather is thrust upon us. Santone, then, cannot be blamed for this cold gray fog that came and kissed the lips of the three thousand, and then delivered them to the cross. That night the tubercles, whose ravages hope holds in check, multiplied. The writhing fingers of the pale mist did not go thence bloodless. Many of the wooers of ozone capitulated with the enemy that night, turning their faces to the wall in that dumb, isolated apathy that so terrifies their watchers. On the red stream of hemorrhagia a few souls drifted away, leaving behind pathetic heaps, white and chill as the fog itself. Two or three came to view this atmospheric wraith as the ghost of impossible joys, sent to whisper to them of the egregious folly it is to inhale breath into the lungs, only to exhale it again. And these used whatever came handy to their relief, pistols, gas or the beneficent muriate. The purchaser of the morphia wanders into the fog, and at length, finds himself upon a little iron bridge, one of the score or more in the heart of the city under which the small tortuous river flows. He leans on the rail and gasps, for here the mist has concentrated, lying like a footpad to garrote such of the three thousand as creep that way. The iron bridge guys rattle to the strain of his cough, a mocking tizical rattle, seeming to say to him, clickety-clack. Just a little rusty cold, sir, but not from our river. Litmus paper all along the banks and nothing but ozone. Clack a twy clack. The Memphis man at last recovers sufficiently to be aware of another overcoat man ten feet away, leaning on the rail, and just coming out of a paroxysm. There is a Freemasonry among the three thousand that does away with formalities and introductions. A cough is your card, a hemorrhage a letter of credit. The Memphis man, being nearer recovered, speaks first. Good all. Memphis, pulmonary tuberculosis. Guess last stages. The three thousand economize on words. Words are breath and they need breath to write checks for the doctors. Heard, gasps the other. Heard, of Tletter. Tletter, Ahia. Cataral bronchitis. Name's Dennis, too, doctor says. Says I'll live four weeks if I, take care of myself. Got your walking papers yet? My doctor, says Goodall of Memphis, a little boastingly, gives me three months. Oh, remarks the man from Toledo, filling up great gaps in his conversation with wheezes, damn the difference. What's months? Expect to, cut mine down to one week, and die in a hack, a four-wheeler, not a cough. Be considerable moanin' of the bars when I put out to sea. I've patronized M pretty freely since I struck my, present gate. Say, good all of Memphis, if your doctor has set your pegs so close, why don't you, get on a big spree and go, to the devil quick and easy, like I'm doing. A spree, says Goodall, as one who entertains a new idea, I never did such a thing. I was thinking of another way, but. Come on, invites the Ohioan, and have some drinks. I've been at it, for two days, but the INF, Ernal stuff won't bite like it used to. Good all of Memphis, what's your respiration? 24. Daily, temperature? 104. You can do it in two days. It'll take me a week. Tank up, friend Goodall, have all the fun you can, 
then, off you go, in the middle of a jag, and SS save trouble and expense. I'm a s son of a gun if this ain't a health resort, for your whiskers. A Lake Erie fogged get lost here in two minutes. You said something about a drink, says Goodall. A few minutes later they line up at a glittering bar, and hang upon the arm rest. The bartender, blonde, heavy, well-groomed, sets out their drinks, instantly perceiving that he serves two of the three thousand. He observes that one is a middle-aged man, well-dressed, with a lined and sunken face, the other a mere boy who is chiefly eyes and overcoat. Disguising well the tedium begotten by many repetitions, the server of drinks begins to chant the sanitary saga of Santon. Rather a moist night, gentlemen, for our town. A little fog from our river, but nothing to hurt. Repeated tests. Damn your litmus papers, gasps Toledo, without any, personal offense intended. We've heard of M before. Let M turn red, white and blue. What we want is a repeated test of that, whiskey. Come again. I paid for the last round, good all of Memphis. The bottle oscillates from one to the other, continues to do so, and is not removed from the counter. The bartender sees two emaciated invalids dispose of enough Kentucky Bell to floor a dozen cowboys. Without displaying any emotion save a sad and contemplative interest in the peregrinations of the bottle. So he is moved to manifest a solicitude as to the consequences. Not on your uncle Mark Hanna, responds Toledo, will we get drunk. We've been, vaccinated with whiskey, and, cod liver oil. What would send you to the police station, only gives us a thirst. SS set out another bottle. It is slow work trying to meet death by that route. Some quicker way must be found. They leave the saloon and plunge again into the mist. The sidewalks are mere flanges at the base of the houses, the street a cold ravine, the fog filling it like a freshet. Not far away is the Mexican quarter. Conducted as if by wires along the heavy air comes a guitar's tinkle. And the demoralizing voice of some senorita singing. En los tard sombrillos del invierno. En el prado a marar mi reclino. Why maldigo mi fausto destino? Una vida la mas infeliz. The words of it they do not understand, neither Toledo nor Memphis, but words are the least important things in life. The music tears the breasts of the seekers after Nepenthe, inciting Toledo to remark. Those kids of mine, I wonder, by God, Mr. Goodall of Memphis, we had too little of that whiskey. No slow music in mine, if you please. It makes you disremember to forget. Heard of Toledo, here pulls out his watch, and says, I'm a son of a gun. Got an engagement for a hack ride out to San Pedro Springs at eleven. Forgot it. A fellow from Noah York, and me, and the Castillo sisters at Rheingelder's garden. That Noah York chap's a lucky dog, got one whole lung, good for a year yet. Plenty of money, too. He pays for everything. I can't afford, to miss the jamboree. Sorry you ain't going along. Goodbye, good all of Memphis. He rounds the corner and shuffles away, casting off thus easily the ties of acquaintanceship as the moribund do, the season of dissolution being man's supreme hour of egoism and selfishness. But he turns and calls back through the fog to the other, I say, good all of Memphis. If you get there before I do, tell, em heard they comin', too. Heard, of Tletter, Ahia. Thus Goodall's tempter deserts him. That youth, uncomplaining and uncaring, takes a spell at coughing, and, recovered, wanders desultorily on down the street, the name of which he neither knows nor wrecks. At a certain point he perceives swinging doors, and hears, filtering between them a noise of wind and string instruments. Two men enter from the street as he arrives, and he follows them in. There is a kind of antechamber, plentifully set with palms and cactuses and oleanders. At little marble-topped tables some people sit, while soft-shot attendants bring the beer. All is orderly, clean, melancholy, gay, of the German method of pleasure. 
At his right is the foot of a stairway. A man there holds out his hand. Goodall extends his, full of silver, the man selects there from a coin. Goodall goes upstairs and sees there two galleries extending along the sides of a concert hall which he now perceives to lie below and beyond the anteroom he first entered. These galleries are divided into boxes or stalls, which bestow with the aid of hanging lace curtains, a certain privacy upon their occupants. Passing with aimless feet down the aisle contiguous to these saucy and discreet compartments, he is half checked by the sight in one of them of a young woman. Alone and seated in an attitude of reflection. This young woman becomes aware of his approach. A smile from her brings him to a standstill, and her subsequent invitation draws him, though hesitating, to the other chair in the box, a little table between them. Goodall is only nineteen. There are some whom, when the terrible god Thysus wishes to destroy he first makes beautiful, and the boy is one of these. His face is wax, and an awful pulchritude is born of the menacing flame in his cheeks. His eyes reflect an unearthly vista engendered by the certainty of his doom. As it is forbidden man to guess accurately concerning his fate, it is inevitable that he shall tremble at the slightest lifting of the veil. The young woman is well dressed, and exhibits a beauty of distinctly feminine and tender sort, an Eve-like comeliness that scarcely seems predestined to fade. It is immaterial, the steps by which the two mount to a certain plane of good understanding, they are short and few, as befits the occasion. A button against the wall of the partition is frequently disturbed and a waiter comes and goes at signal. Pensive beauty would nothing of wine. Two thick plates of her blonde hair hang almost to the floor, she is a lineal descendant of the Lorelei. So the waiter brings the brew, effervescent, icy, greenish-golden. The orchestra on the stage is playing, Oh, Rachel. The youngsters have exchanged a good bit of information. She calls him, Walter, and he calls her, Miss Rosa. Goodall's tongue is loosened and he has told her everything about himself, about his home in Tennessee, the old pillared mansion under the oaks, the stables, the hunting, the friends he has. Down to the chickens, and the box bushes bordering the walks. About his coming south for the climate, hoping to escape the hereditary foe of his family. All about his three months on a ranch. The deer hunts, the rattlers, and the rollicking in the cow camps. Then of his advent to Santone, where he had indirectly learned, from a great specialist, that his life's calendar probably contains but two more leaves. And then of this death-white, choking night which has come and strangled his fortitude and sent him out to seek a port amid its depressing billows. My weekly letter from home failed to come, he told her, and I was pretty blue. I knew I had to go before long and I was tired of waiting. I went out and bought morphine at every drug store where they would sell me a few tablets. I got thirty-six quarter grains, and was going back to my room and take them, but I met a queer fellow on a bridge, who had a new idea. Goodall Phillips a little pasteboard box upon the table. I put M all together in there. Miss Rosa, being a woman, must raise the lid, and gave a slight shiver at the innocent-looking triturates. Horrid things. But those little, white bits, they could never kill one. Indeed they could. Walter knew better. Nine grains of morphia. Why, half the amount might. Miss Rosa demands to know about Mr. Hurd, of Toledo, and is told. She laughs like a delighted child. What a funny fellow. But tell me more about your home and your sisters, Walter. I know enough about Texas and tarantulas and cowboys. The theme is dear, just now, to his mood, and he lays before her the simple details of a true home. The little ties and endearments that so fill the exile's heart. Of his sisters, one, Alice, furnishes him a theme he loves to dwell upon. She is like you, Miss Rosa he says. Maybe not quite so pretty, but, just as nice, and good, and. There. Walter, says Miss Rosa sharply, now talk about something else. But a shadow falls upon the wall outside, preceding a big, softly treading man, finely dressed, who pauses a second before the curtains and then passes on. 
Presently comes the waiter with a message, Mr. Rolf says. Tell Rolf I'm engaged. I don't know why it is, says Goodall, of Memphis, but I don't feel as bad as I did. An hour ago I wanted to die, but since I've met you, Miss Rosa, I'd like so much to live. The young woman whirls around the table, lays an arm behind his neck and kisses him on the cheek. You must, dear boy, she says. I know what was the matter. It was the miserable foggy weather that has lowered your spirit and mine too, a little. But look, now. With a little spring she has drawn back the curtains. A window is in the wall opposite, and lo. The mist is cleared away. The indulgent moon is out again, revoyaging the plumless sky. Roof and parapet and spire are softly pearl enameled. Twice, thrice the retrieved river flashes back, between the houses, the light of the firmament. A tonic day will dawn, sweet and prosperous. Talk of death when the world is so beautiful, says Miss Rosa, laying her hand on his shoulder. Do something to please me, Walter. Go home to your rest and say, I mean to get better, and do it. If you ask it, says the boy, with a smile, I will. The waiter brings full glasses. Did they ring? No, but it is well. He may leave them. A farewell glass. Miss Rosa says, to your better health, Walter. He says, to our next meeting. His eyes look no longer into the void, but gaze upon the antithesis of death. His foot is set in an undiscovered country tonight. He is obedient, ready to go. Good night, she says. I never kissed a girl before, he confesses, except my sisters. You didn't this time, she laughs, I kissed you, good night. When shall I see you again, he persists. You promised me to go home, she frowns, and get well. Perhaps we shall meet again soon. Good night. He hesitates, his hat in hand. She smiles broadly and kisses him once more upon the forehead. She watches him far down the aisle, then sits again at the table. The shadow falls once more against the wall. This time the big, softly stepping man parts the curtains and looks in. Miss Rose's eyes meet his and for half a minute they remain thus, silent, fighting a battle with that king of weapons. Presently the big man drops the curtains and passes on. The orchestra ceases playing suddenly, and an important voice can be heard loudly talking in one of the boxes farther down the aisle. No doubt some citizen entertains there some visitor to the town. And Miss Rosa leans back in her chair and smiles at some of the words she catches. Purest atmosphere, in the world, litmus paper all long, nothing hurtful, our city, nothing but pure ozone. The waiter returns for the tray and glasses. As he enters, the girl crushes a little empty pasteboard box in her hand and throws it in a corner. She is stirring something in her glass with her hatpin. Why, Miss Rosa, says the waiter with the civil familiarity he uses, putting salt in your beer this early in the night. The dream. Murray dreamed a dream. Both psychology and science grope when they would explain to us the strange adventures of our immaterial selves when wandering in the realm of death's twin brother, sleep. This story will not attempt to be illuminative, it is no more than a record of Murray's dream. One of the most puzzling phases of that strange waking sleep is that dreams which seem to cover months or even years may take place within a few seconds or minutes. Murray was waiting in his cell in the ward of the condemned. An electric arc light in the ceiling of the corridor shone brightly upon his table. On a sheet of white paper an ant crawled wildly here and there as Murray blocked its way with an envelope. The electrocution was set for eight o'clock in the evening. Murray smiled at the antics of the wisest of insects. There were seven other condemned men in the chamber. Since he had been there Murray had seen three taken out to their fate. One gone mad and fighting like a wolf caught in a trap, one, no less mad, offering up a sanctimonious lip service to heaven, the third, a weakling, collapsed and strapped to a board. He wondered with what credit to himself his own heart, foot, and face would meet his punishment, for this was his evening. 
he thought it must be nearly eight o'clock. Opposite his own in the two rows of cells was the cage of Bonifacio, the Sicilian slayer of his betrothed and of two officers who came to arrest him. With him Murray had played checkers many a long hour, each calling his move to his unseen opponent across the corridor. Bonifacio's great booming voice with its indestructible singing quality called out. Eh, Mistro Murray, how you feel, all a right, yes. All right, Bonifacio, said Murray steadily, as he allowed the ant to crawl upon the envelope and then dumped it gently on the stone floor. That's good eh, Mistro Murray. Men like us, we must a die like a men. My time come next a week. All a right. Remember, Mistro Murray, I beat a you dat lost game of de check. Maybe we play again some a time. I don't a know. Maybe we have to call a de move damn a loud to play de check where de go and send us. Bonifacio's hardened philosophy, followed closely by his deafening, musical peal of laughter, warmed rather than chilled Murray's numbed heart. Yet, Bonifacio had until next week to live. The cell dwellers heard the familiar, loud click of the steel bolts as the door at the end of the corridor was opened. Three men came to Murray's cell and unlocked it. Two were prison guards. The other was, Len, no, that was in the old days, now the Reverend Leonard Winston, a friend and neighbor from their barefoot days. I got them to let me take the prison chaplain's place, he said, as he gave Murray's hand one short, strong grip. In his left hand he held a small Bible, with his forefinger marking a page. Murray smiled slightly and arranged two or three books and some penholders orderly on his small table. He would have spoken, but no appropriate words seemed to present themselves to his mind. The prisoners had christened this cell house, eighty feet long, twenty-eight feet wide, Limbo Lane. The regular guard of Limbo Lane, an immense, rough, kindly man, drew a pint bottle of whiskey from his pocket and offered it to Murray, saying. It's the regular thing, you know. All has it who feel like they need a bracer. No danger of it becoming a habit with them, you see. Murray drank deep into the bottle. That's the boy, said the guard. Just a little nerve tonic, and everything goes smooth as silk. They stepped into the corridor, and each one of the doomed seven knew. Limbo Lane is a world on the outside of the world. But it had learned, when deprived of one or more of the five senses, to make another sense supply the deficiency. Each one knew that it was nearly eight, and that Murray was to go to the chair at eight. There is also in the many Limbo Lanes an aristocracy of crime. The man who kills in the open, who beats his enemy or pursuer down, flushed by the primitive emotions and the ardor of combat, holds in contempt the human rat, the spider, and the snake. So, of the seven condemned only three called their farewells to Murray as he marched down the corridor between the two guards, Bonifacio, Marvin, who had killed a guard while trying to escape from the prison, and Bassett, the train robber, who was driven to it because the express messenger wouldn't raise his hands when ordered to do so. The remaining four smoldered, silent, in their cells. No doubt feeling their social ostracism in Limbo Lane society more keenly than they did the memory of their less picturesque offenses against the law. Murray wondered at his own calmness and nearly indifference. In the execution room were about twenty men, a congregation made up of prison officers, newspaper reporters, and lookers-on who had succeeded. Here, in the very middle of a sentence. The hand of death interrupted the telling of O. Henry's last story. He had planned to make this story different from his others, the beginning of a new series in a style he had not previously attempted. I want to show the public, he said, that I can write something new, new for me, I mean, a story without slang. A straightforward dramatic plot treated in a way that will come nearer my idea of real story writing. Before starting to write the present story, he outlined briefly how he intended to develop it, Murray. The criminal accused and convicted of the brutal murder of his sweetheart, a murder prompted by jealous rage, at first faces the death penalty, calm, and, to all outward appearances, indifferent to his fate. As he nears the electric chair he is overcome by a revulsion of feeling. 
he is left dazed, stupefied, stunned. The entire scene in the death chamber, the witnesses, the spectators, the preparations for execution, become unreal to him. The thought flashes through his brain that a terrible mistake is being made. Why is he being strapped to the chair? What has he done? What crime has he committed? In the few moments while the straps are being adjusted a vision comes to him. He dreams a dream. He sees a little country cottage, bright, sunlit, nestling in a bower of flowers. A woman is there, and a little child. He speaks with them and finds that they are his wife, his child, and the cottage their home. So, after all, it is a mistake. Someone has frightfully, irretrievably blundered. The accusation, the trial, the conviction, the sentence to death in the electric chair, all a dream. He takes his wife in his arms and kisses the child. Yes, here is happiness. It was a dream. Then, at a sign from the prison warden the fatal current is turned on. Murray had dreamed the wrong dream.